shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Using advanced methods that may ultimately become available to all law enforcement agencies, Cranston is known to the underworld as the shadow. Never seen, only heard. As haunting to superstitious minds as a ghost. As inevitable as a guilty conscience. The identity of the shadow is known only to his intimate friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Blind Beggar Dies. Evening, singing, Jim. Oh. Chilly tonight, isn't it? Indeed it is. Thank you, sir. There are smiles. Hello, Jim. Wish me luck tonight. I'm going out with a new boyfriend. He's awful nice. All the luck in the world, you miss. Thank you. There are smiles which make us happy. Well, well, there well. If it isn't singing, Jim, hold him down the same blue. corner after we told him to pay protection there or move. Smiles. Yeah. He don't pay off and he don't scare. I, I don't make enough to keep body and soul together. Now you, you go away. Let me alone. Well, so you're going to try to buck our record, eh? All right, buddy, bring him back in the alley. Oh, now, wait. Then we make him see things out. Now, take your hands off me. You you let me alone. Come on, don't. We just want to talk to you a minute. We got a proposition for you. Now, I told you, I I don't need protection. I have a license because I'm blind. The police don't bother me none. Bring him back over here, Marty. No, no. Private enough. No. Okay, Spike. Now, wait. Easy on that blackjack. Shut up and hold your mid over his mouth so we don't let him do it. Okay. I'm an old man. I can't stand it. I haven't any money to pay you. I tell you, I'll... <gasps> All right, give me once over. Right. Mm. Now listen, singing, Jim. Next time you fork over a buck a week or you'll get the worst. Oh, yeah. <coughs> okay. Marty, jump over the wall there and let's go. <laughs> Yes. Isn't it amazing how any little thing can get a crowd together? Sometimes those little things turn out to be big things, Margo. That's just Lamont Cranston, the Im- amateur criminologist, coming to the fore. Oh, look. I'm trying to get into that alleyway. Somebody hurt, probably. Oh, yes. All right, move on, move on, move on. That's it, this man, Oh, good evening to you, Mr. Cranston. Oh, what's wrong, Cranston? Oh, that's poor old singing Jim. Somebody found him in the alley all smashed up. Looks like a truck run over him. All right, out of the way. Move on now. Move on. Poor old Jim. Lamont, look at his face and head. He doesn't look like he's been run over. Oh, don't. Don't hit me. I can't pay. I can't. I can't. Okay, Jack, back to the hospital oh. and make it fast. Oh. This old boy's in a bad way. Oh. Oh. Lamont, oh. somebody beat him up. But who'd do a thing like that and why? I don't know, Margo. I've known singing Jim for years. So have I. Everybody knows him and helped him out. Margo, he... He looked pretty bad. I think I'll go to the hospital and see what I can do for him. Come on, listen, meets the eye. Want to come along? Yes, Lamont. I hope we're not too late. Of course you can see singing Jim, Mr. Cranston. How is he, Doctor? Triple concussion. Looks pretty hopeless. Poor old Jim. How did it happen? Well, the police report listed as a hit-and-run case. In my opinion, he was beaten with some blunt instrument. He's a pipe or a blackjack. Hmm. He's right in here. Oh, no. Don't hit me. I'm an old man. No. I'm afraid you won't get much out of him, but you can try. I'll be back in a few oh. minutes. Uh, thanks, Doctor. Oh, I can't pay. I need protection. Not singing, Jim. I don't... Jim, it's Lamont Cranston. Oh. I've come to help you. And Miss Lane is here, too. Oh. You remember her. Hello, Jim. What happened? Who did this? Oh, keep away from me. Let me go. Don't hit me again. I'm afraid he's delirious, Margo. Jim, Jim, listen. We're not going to hurt you. You're safe now. Who hit you? Why did they do it, Jim? Uh, They they told me I had to pay a dollar a week. Or they'd give my corner to somebody else. Some phony that knew how to mooch enough to pay him for protection. No. No, no, no. Jim. Don't. Don't hit me. Lamont, that can't be true. Nobody could be as low as to try to make a racket out of begging, organize them, and make them pay tribute. Oh, it's hard to believe, Margo, but there must be something to it. Wait a minute. Jim, listen to me. Who did this? Who's been trying to make you pay money to them? Oh, no, don't hit me, Spike. Let go of me, Mark. Don't, I can't pay. 
Apple Mary can't pay either. You took Apple Mary's stand. Now you try to take mine. Don't. Don't hit me again. Don't. Margo, I'd better get the doctor. He's unconscious. Yes, Margo, but I'm afraid it's more than that. What? Afraid singing Jim has sung his last ballad. You mean... Yes, Margo. Singing Jim is dead. Oh. Folks, I guess you're all kind of wondering why the word went out over the beggar's grapevine for us to meet here in my place. Yes, there was one. And maybe ain't. Anyway, Apple Mary's got something to say to us. Thanks, Lame Bill. Thanks. Folks, I guess by this time you've all heard that poor old singing Jim is dead. Yeah. And I guess you know why he's dead. Yes, sir. Now, I don't get the idea that I've asked you all here to fight these here scurvy rats that pull Jim into an alley and beat him to death. I ain't asking that. Can't expect no help from the police, Mary. You know that. No, you yes. can't, Mary. It's... Yes, we tried that. And they just laugh at the idea of anybody trying to make us pay for the right to make a living on the streets. The only way we know how. Selling apples like I do. Singing like Jim did. Or selling pencils and shoelaces like lame Bill here. No. No, we can't expect no help from the police. Yeah, but why don't they get the guys that murdered old Jim? They're investigating it, so they say. Yeah, but what are we going to do, Mary? Jim's death was just a warning to the rest of us. It means pay up or get the same... No, no, it don't. Yeah, that's no, what it means, Mary. No, it Because something's happened. Somebody's going to help us what can't help ourselves. Well, who is it, Mary? Now, before I tell you, I want to remind you that I am not a drinking woman. And I ain't given to hearing things. And I ain't easy convinced. But last night, late, somebody talked to me at my stand. Somebody that you've all heard of. Somebody that you that have got your eyesight don't believe in because nobody's ever seen who was it, Mary? The shadow. Shadow? Oh, oh, he wouldn't bother trying to help folks like us, Mary. Oh, you're wrong. You're wrong because he asked me to call all your folks together. He promised that he'd come here tonight and, and tell us how he can help us. When's he coming? Why isn't he here? <laughs> oh. Hey, what's that? Huh? I am here. Why, why? Why, where'd that laugh come from? Oh, it's like it come from right behind Mary. No, it came from back in that corner. Wait, don't be frightened. I am the shadow. I've come here to help you. If you will accept my unseen presence without question, without fear. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We got no reason to be scared of the shadow. We ain't done anything wrong. Yeah, we ought to be glad he's willing to help us out, protect us from fellas like Spike and Marty. Maybe he can help us find out who those fellas are. Yeah. Now, yeah, now, wait yeah, a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute, all of you. I've told the shadow all I know about Spike and Marty. All any of us knows. Now you listen to what he wants us to do. You are victims of the meanest racket in the world. The shadow will help you. If you are willing to help yourself. I have reason to believe that one among you is a spy. An informer. Why? Why, Why where is he? Point him out. No. No sooner or later he will betray himself. There are too many of you for me to single out the one... Hostile mind in this room. What do you want us to do, Shadow? Uh, we'll do anything you say. Go on doing as you have been doing. When these men approach you again, pay them. Or promise payment. And then go to the west wall of the National Armory. And make your sign of distress in white chalk. Using the symbols you use in communicating with one another. The Shadow will understand them. And come to your aid. As for the informer in your midst, let him take this warning to the petty racketeers he serves. If one more cent of tribute is levied, if they so much as lay a hand upon one of you, they will answer to the shadow with their liars. You, Marty? Yeah, it's me, Spike. What took you so long? Hey, you look like the real McCoy with those smoke glasses and that crutch. <laughs> I used to make a living taking this blind and lame gag before you showed me how to make some easy money. Well, what happened at that meeting at Lame Bill's place? Plenty. You look like you've seen a ghost. No, I ain't seen no ghost, Spike. What then? I heard something tonight that I don't want to hear again. 
The voice of a guy you couldn't see. He was right there talking to us. Ah, uh, you've been hearing things. No, it's the truth, I tell you. You've heard about this guy they call a shatter, haven't you? Yeah, I've heard about him all right. So what? He was at that meeting. That's why Apple Mary called it. The shadow got the whole story out of it. How we worked this racket and now he's out to get us. How's he gonna do it? Got it all fixed for the beggars to put their distress signs on the wall of the National Armory. The first time we try to collect any more dough. You say the shadow got all the dough from Apple Mary? Yeah, I tell you, we gotta lay off. And kiss all that money we get from the beggars goodbye? Not on your life. Yeah, but Spike, the shadow's poison. He's caught plenty of big shots with dough and their gangs. What chance have we got against a guy like that? Listen, punk, you're all the gang I got and I ain't in the big dough, but I'm plenty smart. And I got an idea how to get rid of this shadow. All right, all right. How are you going to do it? Listen, all we got to do is get a hold of Apple Mary. Bring her up here to the hideout and keep her here. Yeah, get the shadow plumb on our trail. That's just what I want. And to be sure he does get here, you're going to chalk up a message on the armory wall. You know the signs I use. Yeah, I know them. But supposing you do get Apple Mary here and this shadow comes after her, then what? Then he's going to walk into the sweetest little trap you ever saw sprung. But you can't see the guy. I don't have to see him. All I have to do is hear him talk or laugh, the way they say he always does. All right, Spike. Okay, I hope you know what you're doing. I haven't given you a bad stay yet, have I? We'll grab Apple Mary tonight and bring her down here. Why did you want to drive past the National Army, Lamont? I'm looking for handwriting on the wall, Margot. What do you mean? The shadow made arrangements with Apple Mary and her friends to communicate with them. That way, those racketeers try any more strong-arm tactics. You think they will? Yes. There's a reckless bravado about a petty criminal that you won't find in big-time crooks. Well, they're just as dangerous. Don't forget that, Lamont. I'm not forgetting it for a minute, Margot. There's a saying, little snakes are more deadly than the big ones. Stop the car, Margot. Here's the armory. What is it, Lamont? Mm. There's writing on the wall. Maybe what I'm looking for. You mean those chalk marks, those crosses and circles and numbers? Yes. Yes, it's a message from Apple Mary. She needs help. She's waiting for the shadow in the basement of 19 River Street. I'll drive you there, Lamont. All right, Margot. Not all the way. Stop a block from that address and let me out. Very well, Lamont. Shall I wait for you? Yes, Margot. Wait half an hour. If I'm not back by then, notify the police to raid that house. But why, Lamont? What makes you think... I don't think Apple Mary sent that message, Margot. I have a feeling the shadow's being invited to walk into a trap. That you, Marty? Yeah, it's me. Where are you? How about some light? Okay, I just wanted to be sure. Hey, what's the idea of sitting down here in the dark? Hey, what are you doing with that Tommy gun? When the shadow comes here looking for Apple Mary, I'm going to spray this room with lead from floor to ceiling. It won't matter if I can't see him. I can't miss. But our troubles will be over. I put that message in the armory wall. How long ago? About an hour. Then he'll be here soon. That guy moves fast from what I hear. Hey, how are you going to know when the shadow gets here? What if he don't talk or laugh? He's got to open that door, ain't he? He can't walk through it. He ain't a ghost. He comes as close to being a ghost as anything I ever went on up against. How's he do it? Does he, I mean, how does he keep you from seeing him? By hypnotism, whatever that is. Yeah? I know a guy in a circus that could do that. Leastwise, he claimed he could. Shut up. Go and get Apple Mary in here. She's in the back room. Okay. Hey, you. Apple Mary. Come on out here. I'm coming. And don't think I'm scared of the scum of the earth like you two. Ah, pipe down. What do you want with me? Bring her over here and shove her into this chair. You hide him. Come on. Take your hands off me. Maybe old and blind, but I take no guidance from scavengers. Take that can away from her. She might get free with it. Give me that stick. I'll give it to you. Here, take it. <laughs> Why, you sheep devil? Put her in that chair and hold her there. Get your knife. Come on, sit down there. Yeah, I got my knife. Get it out. She tries and thing when the shadow turns up. Let her have it. Right between her shoulders. Okay. If you know what's good for you, you'll sit still, Mary. The shadow. So you know he's after you. So there was a squealer at the meeting. Now, that was no squealer. It was me. And we're expecting your pal, the Shadow, most any time now. I put a little message from you on the armory wall, telling him to come here. Yeah. Just wait till that door swings open. That's the only way you can get in or out. If this Shadow guy's got a gun, starts blazing away, you'll get yours, Mary. The Shadow doesn't need a gun. Shut him up, Marty. I just heard the basement door close. 
Hey, somebody's in the horse by. Shut up. Watch it, old dame. She opens her mouth, but I have it. Right. Got that Tommy gun ready? Yeah. Spike, he's here. The shutter's here. Do something. Do something. Shoot. Shoot or he'll kill it. I ain't sure if I can only be sure. There is only one certainty in life. What? That is death. It's him. Shoot. Shoot. Spike. Spike, you shut out the light. Yeah. I got the shadow. Come on. Let's get out of here. Yeah, but what about Apple Mary? We haven't got time to fuss with a blind dame. Now listen, Apple Mary. Get out and tell your friends we'll be seeing them. Tell them the shadow's dead. Tell them if we have any more trouble making collections, I'll get what singing Jim and the shadow got. Tell them that for us. Come on, Marty, let's go. Shadow dead. Who can we look to for help now? You can still count on the shadow, Apple Mary. Oh, shadow. They didn't kill you. Didn't they hit you? No, Mary. I suspected a trap, so after I opened the door, I walked across the room and stood behind them. But but your voice, it came from near the door. Ventriloquism. A simple trick of projecting the voice. That doesn't matter now. Get out of here and hurry to Lame Bills. Gather your friends together and wait there for word from me. The Shadow. Margot. Margot. Oh, there you are, Lamont. I was beginning to get worried. Half hour's almost up. What happened? I'll tell you later. Quick, start the car. Those two men hurrying down the street. That tall one and the short, heavy one? Yes, follow them, but be careful. Don't get too close. Who are they? Where are they going? They murdered Singing Jim. They tried to murder the Shadow. We'll find out where they go, Margot, and then I'll telephone Commissioner Weston to surround the place. The Shadow left word with Apple Mary. She wants us at Dugan's pool hall. Dugan's pool hall. The shadows track down Spike and Marty. Apple Mary and Lame Bill want us at Dugan's pool hall. Hey, Lippy. Dugan's pool hall right away. Mary said so. Ah, what's the matter with you, Marty? They thought you could play fool. You missed that shot a mile. I can't keep my mind on the game. Can't stop thinking about it. Hightown. Everything's okay, I tell you. I got the shadow I couldn't have missed. You heard him fall, didn't you? Yeah, but... Yeah, but nothing. We got nothing to worry about, I tell you. The shadow's out of the way, and we got a fix with Dugan for an alibi. We've been here all evening. See? Here comes Dugan now. Hey, Spike, Marty. There's something going on around here I don't like. I know I told you I'd frame an alibi for you, but I don't want no trouble. I don't want my place closed up. Mm-hmm. What's the matter with you? What's going on? It's that bunch you've been working your new ragged on. Apple Mary, Lame Bill, Limpy, the whole lot of them. What? Where are they? They're out in the street, 20 or 30 of them. And more coming every minute. Yeah, who tipped them up when he was here? Is this a double cross? No, Dugan? no, no, honest. Somebody must have uh, tailed you here. Listen to them. Hey. Hey, Spike. They're after us. Come on, let's get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we better... They tear us to pieces if they got their hands on it. You guys better slip out that back door there. It leads into the alley. The crowd may be lame and blind, but I don't give much for your chances if they get hold of you. Come on, Spike, let's go, will you? Yeah, yeah, okay, let's scram. We'll get these monkeys tomorrow, one by one. I'll teach them to try to gang up on us. Come on, Marty, come on. First, Spike, wait. Look down the alley there. Holy cat. Yeah, yeah, half a dozen of them. We can't go that way, Spike. They're laying for us. Hey, Dugan. Ain't there any other way out of this joint? How about upstairs and over the roof? No, that door to the hall's been nailed up for years. It's either the alley or the front way. Hey, Spike. That bunch out front sound like they're coming in. Yeah. We're caught like a couple of rats in a trap. <laughs> what are you going to do, Spike? Shadow. Spike, did you hear that? It's the shadow. You didn't get him. He ain't dead. No. No, you will not go to the electric chair. For the murder of the shadow. Well, so you got away. Well, and the cops haven't got anything on us now. Come on, Marty, we'll go out to the alley. Let the cops pick us up. They can't hold us more than 24 hours. Wait. You've forgotten the murder of singing Jim. Well, you can't pin that on us. What, the door's locked? Yeah. And the key's gone, Spike. Yes. I locked that door, Spike. I have the key. But the front door is unlocked. You can walk out that door. Singing Jim's friends are out there waiting for you. 
Spike, what are we going to do? They are the lame and the halt and the blind, but there's strength in their numbers. The strength of a long-suffering fury that means you're dead. If they get their hands on you... What do you want, Shadow? What's your game? I want your confession to the murder of Singing Jim. Hey. Yeah? If we confess, will you keep that mob away from us? I'm not confessing to anything. I'm not writing myself a one-way ticket to the death house. Take your choice. A chance before a legal jury or... that mob. Quick. Stop him! Stop him, Shadow! I'll confess. I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah, we killed, we killed Singing Jim. There was Spike. He slugged him in that alley, yeah. Ah, uh, you dirty squealer. Right? Don't move, Spike. One false move. Wait a minute, they're going to... These tormented people will kill you. Mary! Lame Bill! Wait! Wait, everybody! This is your last chance. There's a blackboard behind you, Spike. There's a piece of chalk. Write your confession to the murder of Singing Jim and sign it. Write what I dictate to you. You... You win, Shadow. We, Spike Grogan and Marty Nelson... We, Spike Grogan. Confess... Marty Nelson. That on Tuesday night at five o'clock... Confess... That on Tuesday night... We did willfully beat Singing Jim... To death... Willfully beat... With a blackjack. Singing Jim to death. With a blackjack. Sign it. Now you, Marty. Okay. There. Now. Now what, Shadow? Walk to that back door. Open it. Call to the police in the alley. Tell them to come and get you. Where's luck? You locked it and took the key. I unlocked it again. Go with Spike Grogan, Marty. Beyond that door, a blindfolded woman with a sword in one hand and finely balanced scales in the other waits for you. You've mocked her long enough. But she is patient because her name is Justice. And her revenge for your mockery will be Death. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Using advanced methods that may ultimately become available to all law enforcement agencies, Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard. As haunting to superstitious minds as a ghost. As inevitable as a guilty conscience. The Shadow's true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, Murders in Wax. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to step inside and view the illuminating and educational exhibits that are the features of our waxworks. See Bluebeard actually slaying his eight wives. See Custer's last stand. See the capture of George Keegan, public enemy, number one. And many other threading, lifelike tableau. The price of admission is only one dime, ten cents. Our lecture is just starting, and if you hurry, 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 you'll be just in time to witness the complete show on the inside. Step right up now. How many for the uh, Two, please. Uh, all right, how many? How many? How many? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll just step over here to the next platform, I shall describe to you the details of the feature tableau of our exhibit. Say, they look like real people, don't they? Yeah, how do they make them? With wax. Gee. This tableau is a dramatic reenactment of the capture of George Keegan, the notorious gang chief of Prohibition Day. Oh, 
Mr. Kalai was... He was arrested in the manner shown right here. No doubt you all recognize the figures of the brave men who personally led the police squad who made the capture. On the left, the wax figure of our own Mayor Lewis. Better, our District Attorney Armstrong. And right, Police Commissioner Weston. Were they really there when Keegan was caught? Sure he was. George Keegan's arrest put an end to the wave of crime and lawlessness that gripped our city for a decade. He is now imprisoned in the state penitentiary for the rest of his natural life. Gee, the girl in the tableau sure looks lifelike. Yeah. Oh, ask him who she is. Okay. Hey, Cap, who's that girl? Uh, just coming to that, brother. A little lady seated in the chair was Keegan's gun mom, Edna Kelly. Oh, she was with hey. him in the hideout hey, at the time of the raid. Hey, look, hey, look at that. Look, the wax figure fell off the chair. Uh, oh, oh, don't get excited, folks. It's only a wax figure. I'll just set it up again and... Holy cats. It's... It's real. It's a body. A dead body. A dead body of Edna Kelly. It's, it's really Edna Kelly. Edna Kelly, how'd she get here? She's been murdered. Murdered! You do row beautifully, but if you don't pull a trifle harder on that right oar, we'll hit that rock. <laughs> Sorry, right, there we are. A little rusty on navigation, Margaret. This is my first rowboat venture in the park this spring. I'm really enjoying it. I need a little fresh air and sunshine after that experience of the waxworks yesterday. That was pretty terrible. Why don't you ever happen to go to that place, Margaret? <laughs> well, I, I was showing the town to my cousin Jane from upstate. We passed the waxworks museum, and she insisted on going in. She'd never seen a chamber of horrors. And she saw more horror than she bargained for. Yes, and so did I. I'll never forget it. Just what was that wax tableau like? It was set in a replica of a finished room in the house where Keegan was captured. Yes? The figures of Mayor Lewis, District Attorney Armstrong, and Police Commissioner Weston were grouped about Keegan and Edna Kelly. Did anyone notice the figure of the Kelly girl was actually she until it fell from the chair? No. The wax figures were so lifelike that no one suspected I see. Shall I roll the island? Oh, that'd be nice. Lamont... Whom do you think killed Edna Kelly? Well, she was a gunman's girl. They're always the obvious suspects, her lover's enemies, or even members of his gang who might be more comfortable with her out of the way. But, come on, I don't think it was either of these. Why, Lamont? Doesn't it strike you that the substitution of the girl's body for the waxwork in such a spectacular fashion may, may have some deeper significance than the mere bizarre effect? Well, what do you mean? It must have been the girl's connection with the other people represented in that group. Have motivated the murder in bringing her body there. I don't quite understand. My deductions are correct. The taking of Edna Kelly's life is only the first of a series of vengeful murders. But, Lamont, if that's true, isn't there anything you can do to forestall it? Perhaps. I only knew a little more. I only knew where the killer plans to strike next. Surely the Shadow can find that out. With your help, Margot, perhaps he can. A fine bunch of detectives I've got in this department. You call yourselves a homicide squad? That's a laugh. But, Commissioner Weston, we've combed this city. Logan, have you checked on the story of the museum proprietor? Commissioner, you talked to him yourself. Have you verified his statements? Yes, Chief, they're solid. Yeah. The murderer entered the Waxworks Museum by a back door. It was found Jimmy. After he put Edna Kelly's body in a tableau, he took the wax image of her outside and buried it under some trash in the alley. Did you go over the image for fingerprints, Cardona? Yeah, but we couldn't find anything. Tell him about the face. Oh, yeah, Commissioner. Uh, funny thing, the face of the wax dummy had been sliced with a knife across the left cheek. Why didn't you tell me that before? You know what that means as well as I do. That's right. That's the mark of a squealer. Yeah, but it couldn't have been any mob stuff. The probation report shows that Edna Kelly's been going straight ever since Keegan was sent away. If you ask me, I think it was a lunatic that's done it. Yeah. No sane guy had set a dead girl's body up for exhibition in that waxworks joint. No, it, it looks to me like one of them love things. Some guy carrying a torch for Kelly. You're another. both wrong. It was no lunatic that committed that murder. Mm. And Edna Kelly hasn't gone out with anyone since Keegan started his stretch. Then what, Chief? Edna Kelly was murdered for vengeance. By someone who wanted to settle a score with her lover, George Keegan. Keegan can't be reached in the big house, so they take it out on the girl. And what about the mark of the squealer on the face of the wax figure? That what ties it? right in. That was the murderer's way of telling Keegan what he thought of him. Keegan has saved his neck by squealing on a dozen guys. Say, that's right. Yeah. Of course it's right. Cordona, first thing in the morning, I want you and Hogan to conduct a general roundup of every known enemy of George Keegan. That won't do any good, Commissioner. It's the Shadow. Don't Where is he? Don't trouble to find him. Why are you here, Shadow? 
to aid you in capturing the murderer of Ender Kelly. What do you know about the case? I know that you shouldn't be wasting your men's time rounding up possible suspects while the real assassin is left free to strike his next blow. Now, see here, Shadow. Don't tell me how to run my department. Hold on, Weston. I have every reason to suspect that the placing of the Kelly girl's body in the wax tableau was intended as a warning of other deaths to follow. Other deaths? You think there's going to be more killings? Be quiet, Hogan. Tell me what you mean, Shadow. I mean that the other people represented in that wax tableau are in danger of being killed, too. And they're the mayor, the district attorney, and you yourself, Commissioner Weston. That sounds preposterous. Not at all. My advice is that you act quickly. One of you may be at this moment in imminent peril. Oh, come, come, Shadow. What possible motive could the murderer of the girl have for wishing to kill us as well? I think that you're... Excuse me. Hello? Mrs. Armstrong, the district attorney's wife, wants to talk to you. Put her on. Hello? Hello? Yes, Mrs. Armstrong. This is Commissioner Weston. Oh, Commissioner, I'm dreadfully worried about John. Uh, What's wrong? Well, shortly after dinner, he went out. Said he might take a walk. Several hours passed and he didn't return. I must have fallen asleep. And when I woke up a few minutes ago, he he still hadn't come back. Oh, this isn't like John, Commissioner. What time is it now? It's it's after 2 a.m. Well, now, don't be alarmed, Mrs. Armstrong. He's probably detained somewhere on business. I'll try to locate him for you and call you back. Oh, thank you. District Attorney has disappeared. Disappeared? Say, Well, maybe... Commissioner Weston. Do you think, Shadow, that... Yes, Commissioner. I fear that the killer has struck again. It can't be. If I were you, I would go to the Waxworks Museum. At once. You may arrive in time to stop this murderer from completing his monstrous work. <laughs> the wax museum, Commissioner Weston. Sergeant, take some men around to guard the back door. Yes, sir. Cardona, is anyone any keys to this place? No, sir. We'll have to force the lock. All right, go to it. Okay. Oh, I'll help you. Get in there. Get in there. Get in. Okay. All right. All right. There she is. Now, where's the light switch? Never mind that. Uh, Use your flashlight. Okay. Hey. Kind of scary in here, ain't it? Yeah, it gives you the creeps. Hey, what's that? Uh, where? That guy over there. Got a knife. Don't shoot, you fool. That's one of the wax dummies. Oh. Now, where is this Keegan tableau? It's right over here on the left. Oh. So that's it. Well, I guess nothing's happened yet, Chief. Doesn't look like anything's been disturbed. That's the wax dummy of District Attorney Armstrong sitting down in a chair. Sitting down? Hey, it seems to me his dummy was standing up the last time he was here. What? Give me a lift up on the platform, quick. Yeah. Uh, you think it may be this? I don't know. Flash the light over here. Good heavens. It's Armstrong. Is it really District Attorney Armstrong? Yes. Dead. Murdered. And he was brought here just like the shadow said he Yes. Just as I said, gentlemen. I'm sorry that I couldn't have warned you earlier. Who did this thing, Shadow? Do you know? Who did it? I'm not sure. But with your cooperation, Commissioner Weston, together we may bring about his downfall. How? I am positive now that either you or Mayor Lewis the next victim marked to go. Guard yourselves well. I'll attend to that, all right. You will hear from me soon, Commissioner. When the shadow finds out who the killer is, he will be brought to justice. Quite evident now, Margaret, even to Commissioner Weston, that the killer's aimed to do away with everyone concerned in that tableau. Then, Lamont, you, you mean the mayor, the commissioner, and Keegan? They're the only ones left. Exactly. Let me see, I should take a right turn here. Lamont, do you believe these murders are the work of a madman? Not at all. I think that whoever's behind all this is quite sane, Margot, quite sane. What makes you say that? There's some important civic figures in that group. Their removal would be highly advantageous to a political rival. Surely political rivalry wouldn't be sufficient motive for, for these horrible crimes. I wonder. And besides the girl, Edna Kelly, how would she fit into that picture? That's what we're driving up here to find out. Uh, the prison now. A cheerful looking spot. I'll drive you up to the gate and let you out. I shan't go in with you. Why not? The warden, Mr. Driscoll, has never been a particular admirer of mine. Feeling which I reciprocate. Why, Lamont? Well, I had occasion to expose the graft-ridden conditions in this prison a few years ago. 
Naturally, that didn't make me too popular with Mr. Driscoll. Here we are. Now, you remember what I told you? I think so. I'm a reporter from the Daily Globe. I'm to ask for an interview with Edna Kelly's sweetheart, Keegan. And when I see him, I'll try to find out from him. Please tell me something, Mr. Keegan. The readers of the Daily Globe have sent us thousands of letters expressing their interest in your reaction to the tragic death of Miss Kelly. I ain't got nothing to say about it. Do you believe that the killing was executed by one of your enemies? I wouldn't know. You you loved Edna Kelly, didn't you? Hey, what are you giving out with? The Lonely Hearts column? No. No, you see... Lay off that love stuff. Oh, but, Mr. Keegan, I, I was sent up here by my paper to get a human interest story from you. And after all... Well, you you were fond of Miss Kelly. She was your girl. My girl? Oh, no. But I... I'll always... tell you what Edna Kelly was. She was the same as any other Dane. See? She was a double-crosser. But I thought... Wait a minute, when... Wait a minute, I... I didn't mean that. Don't write nothing like I just said there. I, uh... Get a little screwy sometimes when I think about what happened to you. Oh, of course. I understand. So, um... Uh, just don't write nothing, will you, no. No, but... But what about this theory that she was slain by one of your enemies, Mr. Keegan? I wouldn't know. I... I tell you, Lamont, he flared up so suddenly when I asked him if he really loved her. I, I was scared to death. He called her a double-crosser, eh? Yeah, but he, he regretted it the next second. He mm. asked me to be sure and not write anything about it. It's most interesting, Margot, and thank you for your excellent work. But, but has what I told you helped you unravel any... Greatly. Well, what happens now? I think that there are many more interesting facts to be learned there at prison. Yes? This evening, the shadows will pay a call on his old friend, Warden Driscoll. Come in. Uh, can I see you for a minute, Warden? What's the trouble, Carrie? Well, it's about Keegan. Well, what about him? Well, I put him in solitary like you told me. Yes, yes. That was this morning I done that. Hey, Carrie, what are you trying to tell me? Well, um, he ain't ate no food for the last three meals. So? So I was uh, I was wondering if something should be done to make him eat. He just lays quiet on his bunk. And I thought I told you that no one was to go near Keegan's cell without my orders. Well, I thought if he wasn't eating... Carrie, if you just perform your duties as guard around here and let the warden do the thinking, everything will be satisfactory. Uh, yeah, sure, warden, sure. And leave Keegan alone. Yeah, yes, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, good night, Warden. Close that door after you. Yes, sir. Fool. Hello? Yes? Oh, yes, Mac. Oh, did he get away all right? Good. Yeah? Uh-huh. Well, get him back here before daylight, no matter what happens. Yeah, okay. Tell him I hope he does a good job. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, goodbye. <laughs> you seem to be quite yeah. amused, Warden Driscoll. Huh? I want... Who's that? Won't you share your little joke with me? Carrie, are you outside that door? Is that you talking? Carrie, if this is your idea of something funny... This is not Carrie. Well, who are you? I am the Shadow. The Shadow? Yes, Warden. Well, why are you here? What do you want with me? I came in when Carrie left. I overheard your phone conversation, Driscoll. It was very interesting. Really? Yes. I'm more than curious to know who you were talking about. Now, listen, Shadow. What business it have you... It wouldn't have been George Keegan. Oh, now, see here. I have had enough of Wait, this. Wait, Warden. I wouldn't advise you to leave until we've finished our conversation. Well, what are you after, Shadow? I am seeking the murderer of Edna Kelly and District Attorney Armstrong. Well, why look here? Because this is where he is to be found. Who do you mean? George Keegan. Keegan? Oh, that's preposterous. How could a man in prison for the rest of his life suddenly commit two murders in a city 50 miles away? Very simple, Warden. he just go there. Are you inferring that Keegan has escaped? Oh, no. Nothing as crude as that. But if he were allowed to, shall we say, take a leave of absence for a night... Keegan has never left these buildings. Where is he now? In his cell. Oh, no, he isn't. I investigated before I came here. And his cell is empty. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. I, uh, I forgot. 
He's in solitary confinement. You mean his cot is stuffed with pillows to make it appear as if he were in solitary confinement. No, that's not true. I'll tell you where George Keegan is. He's on his way to the city right now to add another link to his chain of cold-blooded murders. He's gone there with your full knowledge and consent. No, no. It would be a great political advantage for you to have the district attorney Armstrong, the Mayor Lewis, and Commissioner Weston out of the way. Wouldn't it, Warden? No, you don't know what you're talking about. It's an easy thing to prey upon the susceptible jealousies of a man like Keegan until you've goaded him into carrying out your evil wishes. Uh, You can never prove what you're saying. I haven't time to right now, Warden. The lives of the mayor and the commissioner at stake, unless I'm able to stop Keegan. I shall present more than enough proof necessary to implicate you to the district attorney's office in the morning. So you'd better think hard and fast, Warden Driscoll. Margot Lane. Calling Margot Lane. Telephone Police Commissioner Weston immediately. There's no time to lose. Tell him that tonight both he and the mayor are in great danger. Even now it may be too late. If they do have time to follow out my instructions, tell them that they must follow my instructions. All right, Mr. Mayor. Stay sitting at that desk and keep your back to me. I got a gun here. Don't turn around. Just listen. I'm George Keegan. Remember me? You was one of the heroes that made the pinch when I was picked up. You must remember. Why, they even got a little statue of you and me down at the wax museum. Now do you know... You'd better know, Mr. Mayor, because I'm sending you down personally to take that statue's place. Well, why don't you say something? Are you scared to talk? Where's all that fancy gab that you hand out at banquets and meetings? Come on, speak up. Come on, what's the matter with you? Speak up, will you? All right, then you'll get yours just the same. (laughs) <laughs> Looks like I just brought about a special election. Now, Mr. Mayor, I'll just take this corpse of yours down to the museum and then... Hey, what's this? This ain't nobody. It's a dummy of plants. <laughs> what? You've gotten your targets mixed, haven't you, Keegan? Who's that? Aren't you surprised to find yourself shooting at a wax dummy? Come on out in the open. Who are you? I'm right here with you. I am your shadow. Come on, can that phony talk? What are you, a copper? No, just your personal nemesis, Keegan. Now I'd advise you to drop that gun. Not a chance. Close in on him, Commissioner Weston. Open your hands, Keegan. Let go of me. Let go of me. Take that gun away from him. This is your waxworks murderer, Commissioner. Thank you, Shadow. You guys ain't got nothing on me. How did you get out of jail? I flew out the window. With the help of Warden Driscoll. Is this true? Did Driscoll aid you in these crimes? Driscoll? Driscoll wasn't in. Uh, Who's that? Ah, I see you've caught him. Good work, Commissioner. Hello, Warden Driscoll. What brings you here? This man, Keegan, escaped from my prison tonight. And I learned that his purpose in leaving was to make good a threat he'd made on the life of our mayor. Hey, what is this baloney you're throwing out, Warden? Yeah, quiet, you... I've just learned that this isn't the first time he's got out either. A very good story, Warden. Only I think that George Keegan could tell us a different one. Shadow, you here? Yes. And I sort of expected you'd come too, Warden. What's this all about, Shadow? Perhaps Keegan can explain that to you, Commissioner. How about that? Listen, I ain't no squealer, see? But that Warden ain't telling the truth, not one bit. That's all I gotta say. Hey, Commissioner, what is this all about? Am I being placed under suspicion here in the testimony of a shadow? Just a minute, Warden. What are you holding back, Keegan? I can answer that for you, Commissioner Weston. Keegan is shielding the Warden as the real instigator of the Waxworks murders. That's a lie. He wanted you all out of the way, Commissioner, so he employed Keegan as his instrument of murder. Don't listen to him. Go on, Shadow. But first, he had to give Keegan sufficient incentive to perform these crimes, so he went to work on his emotions, his jealousy. How? He told Keegan that his girl, Edna Kelly, had been double-crossing him. Right along. Keegan, this was a lie. Huh? 
what? You mean she was on a level? Absolutely, Keegan. Why, Driscoll, you turn. Hey, look out, he's got another gun. Hey, hey, go. Hey, go. Go. Oh. Oh. go on. Oh. Go on, oh. roll in pain. Oh. Just like Edna done before she died. Oh. That's right. Oh. Try to talk. Oh. That's what she done, too. And I laughed at her. Oh. I laughed at her. Laughed at it. That's what I did. Take him away. Laughed at it. Driscoll is dead, Commissioner. Well, perhaps that's for the best. Oh, uh, Shadow, are you still there? Yes, Commissioner. I want to thank you heartily for this night's work. I seek no credit, Commissioner. However, I have a suggestion for you. What's that? If the Wax Museum decides to create a new tableau depicting this present event, it might be wise for you to arrange to be excluded from it. Gives people ideas. <laughs> the weed of crime. <laughs> What evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, the Shadow's latest adventure starts in just a moment. Right now, I want to tell you about a new kind of tire that will stop you quicker, safer on wet, slippery roads than you've ever stopped before. It's the new Goodrich Safety Silver Town with the amazing lifesaver tread that actually dries wet roads. Impartial tests made by the independent Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory prove this fact beyond dispute. Not one of the regular or premium price tires of America's six largest tire manufacturers came up to the new Goodrich Silvertown in resistance to skid. These exhaustive tests also prove that the new Silvertown averaged 19.1% more non-skid mileage than any other tire tested in its own price range, which means you get every six mile free. Equip your car with Goodrich Safety Silvertown. Then you'll know what it means to be saved by a Silvertown stop. The shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Using advanced methods that may ultimately become available to all law enforcement agencies, Cranston is known to the underworld as the shadow. Never seen, only heard, as haunting to superstitious minds as a ghost, as inevitable as a guilty conscience. The Shadow's true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Creeper. Mother, is that you? Is the storm frightening you? Mother! Quiet. I won't hurt you. I'm just going to take you away. Away where nobody will ever find you. Nobody will ever find you. <laughs> and you won't be lonely. There are other fine young ladies like yourself where I'm taking you. They were rich and beautiful too. One. <laughs> one. 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 <laughs> You rush over here to my apartment at this time in the morning. I, I just learned that something's happened to one of my dearest friends, Edith Day. Edith Day? I remember her, Margot. 
came out two seasons ago. Isn't she that beautiful little dark-haired girl I know the Allen does? Yes, that's the one, Lamont. Her mother just told me she's frantic, terrified. Now, Margot, suppose you compose yourself and tell me exactly what's wrong. This is Margot Lane, my assistant in criminal investigation would do as with someone who meant nothing to you. But this is such a shock, Lamont. Edith's missing. Missing? Yes, she disappeared from her bedroom last night. There were signs of a struggle. Where's the house located? In the Mayfair district. Five block section where all those recent robberies have occurred? Yes, and two murders and five other disappearances. That's right, but the paper said every block is a private guard and the finest burglar alarms have been installed in all the houses. But Lamont, it's terrible. People are just disappearing into thin air without, without a trace, without any clue as to what's happened to them. Something awful must have happened to Edith. No ransom note? No, nothing. Police are there, of course. Oh, yes, swarming all over the house. Commissioner Weston himself is conducting the inquiry. Mrs. Day asked me to come over here and stay with her, but I, I want to talk to you first. Oh, poor Edith. Police must have searched the house, I suppose. Yes, we talked about him. She might have been carried across the rooftop. No, the door to the roof was bolted and locked on the inside. It's equipped with a burglar alarm, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You go ahead and console Mrs. Day, Margot. I was hoping you'd come with me. Not at the moment, Margot. But it's... It's a case for you as a shadow. Yes, Margot, the shadow will take a hand in this game of violence and death. Mrs. Day, are you absolutely certain your daughter did not leave the house after midnight? Yes. Yes, Commissioner Weston, you asked me that before. Yes, I know. I'm sorry, but... Come in. Tyler has the watchman said, Commissioner. Oh, have him come in. Morning, Commissioner. Callahan, your report shows you tried all the doors of this house every hour, only hour, last night. Uh, that's right. They were okay. They were all locked. And nobody could have opened a door or a window in this house without setting off the burglar alarm in your agency central office? Yeah, yes, that's right, sir. And Miss Day must still be in this house. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Have your men made a complete search all through the house? Oh, yes, Commissioner, from top to bottom. But ain't the place we haven't looked for that button. I mean, where are Miss Day, My poor baby. Oh, he does it. He does it. Hello? Hello, Century Moving Company. This is Mrs. Claremont. I'm moving out of the Mayfair district. Yes, I want a van today. Yes, I'm moving to a hotel. I won't spend another night in this section. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Spence, but I'm giving notice. I've been your butler for ten years, but all of the things that have happened to me... Hello? Jake, about that Mayfair crime wave story, make it hot. Pour it into Commissioner Weston. Let's the unsolved crime. Soon on dead, six persons missing without a trace. Demand action. Results merit all of the front page. Go to town on it. There you are, Margaret. Lamont, what on earth are you doing here in the public library? I'm discovering things about this fair city of ours that I never knew before, Margot. I don't understand, Lamont. I'm trying to find Edith Day, Margot. It may seem a very roundabout way, but the police and the private detective agencies have proven the futility of direct methods. Then you have discovered something. Oh, Lamont, what is it? And why did you come here to the public library? Because I wanted to look up some old maps and records of the city. But why? What could that possibly have to do with Edith's disappearance? Well, I'm not sure, Margot, but it may have everything to do with it. I'll show you something that may surprise you. Lamont, what are you driving at? That's just an old map. Exactly, Margot. An engineering map, a plan of the proposed water conduits, surveyed and laid out in the year 1896. But Lamont... Wait, Margot, I'll explain. This plan calls for a 12-foot water main from the West Park Reservoir to the Central District, a distance of a mile and a half. Mm-hmm. Margot, one mile of that water conduit was built. Then the Spanish-American War came along and the project was abandoned. It was sealed up. It's all here in the old city records. In some way, the whole project became lost in the tangles of official red tape and forgotten. What are you driving at? I still can't see what this has to do with... I'll show you in just a minute. Yeah. Here's a rough sketch of the Mayfair district, Margot, on tissue paper. I've marked the location of every house in that district where a murder, robbery, or abduction has taken place in the last two months. Here. Place it over this old map. Now, look. See what happened? Oh, why, Lamont! Every one of those houses is located directly over that old abandoned water main. Yes, Margot, and unless I'm badly mistaken, that is the answer to the disappearance of Edith Day, and it'll lead us to the solution of this crime wave in the Mayfair district. Lamont, that water main must be way down underground. The police search the basements of those houses. There'd have to be an entrance big enough for a man to get through. I believe there is, Margot. It's the only possible answer. In every one of these crimes, the story's been the same. No one was seen going into the houses. No one was seen going out. The burglar alarms were intact, yet people vanished. Oh, Lamont, only you're right. 
If there's still some chance, Edith and those other poor people are still alive. Down there in that abandoned hole in the earth. But who could do a thing like that, and why would they do it? Must be the work of a monster, Margot. I checked up on the things that were stolen, the other crimes. Richly upholstered furniture, tapestries, paintings. Never any money or jewelry. Things you would ordinarily expect to see and take. Good heavens, Lamont. Do you think someone has taken those things down into that black hole? Yes, and he's taken something else that is doubly significant. Food. Storerooms have been stripped. Case after case of canned goods has been carried away, Margot. Food enough for a dozen people. And that more than anything else convinces me that the people who vanished are still alive somewhere down there in a labyrinth of tunnels carved out of solid rock. Oh, Lamont, if only you're right. There's only some way we can get down there. I believe there is. I believe there is a way. A way the shadow can get down there with your help. I'll do anything. Anything. You know that, Lamont. Margot, I want you to go straight from here to Mrs. Day's. I want you to stay there tonight. But what about you? Where will you be? Can't I do something to help? Later, Margot, but don't worry. You walk through the door of the Day Mansion, the shadow will be with you. And I'm sure that somewhere the wall, the floor, the basement of that house will yield the answer to this ghastly riddle. <laughs> Something down there in the cellar. Oh, don't go down there, Henry. Don't do it, I tell you. Henry, this house has given me the case. I won't work yet another day. I'm giving notice to Mrs. Day in the morning. She'll have to get another maid. Yes, you're right. I don't hear nothing now. He was just imagining things after what happened last night. I'm a butler, not a detective. Mrs. Day insists on staying in this house. I'm leaving her service, too. Oh, shut the door, Henry. I can't stand the looks of that door, sir. It's just... <laughs> Yes, yes. You have good reason to be afraid to stay in this house. Unless I find what I'm looking for. <laughs> this big stone slab has a hollow ring. This is it. This is the answer. <laughs> You don't know how much it means to me to have you stay here. All my friends want me to leave this house, but I can't. I can't. And the servants, they're afraid. I'm sure they'll leave tomorrow. I'm glad I could be with you, Mrs. Day. But now, don't think any more about it, please. Try, try to get some rest. You're exhausted. Well, I'll try, Margot, but I'm afraid I can't rest. All I can do is think. Oh, think of what's happened to what may be happening to Edith. Oh, my poor darling. Oh, it's so awful, Margot, not to know. What's that, Mrs. Day? Oh, the house phone in the hall, Margot. Will you run? Yes, yes, I'll answer right away. Try to get to there, Mrs. Day, please. Hello? Hello. Margot, Margot. Yes, Lamont. You come down to the basement immediately. Try to get here without being seen. The servants have gone to bed. Hurry, hurry, Margot. Come on. Come on, it's Margot. Where are you? Right here, Margot. Be quiet as you can. I've turned on my flashlight. What have you found? Come over here, Miller. Look, the stone slab. Then you were right, Lamont. This is how Edith was carried away, down through that hole. But how in the world did you get the slab up? Uh, it's quite a while. I found an iron bar. Be careful. Don't get too close to that hole, Margot. There's no telling how deep it is. Lamont, now, now what are we going to do? Had we better notify the police? No, Margot. Calling the police now might mean the death of every one of his victims, if they're still alive. But suppose whoever's doing this heard you tapping down here, heard you lifting the stone. Suppose he's waiting for you down there in the dark somewhere. Oh, I've got to risk that. How, how will you get down? There's no ladder. There's a heavy clothesline in the laundry room. The other end of the cell I noticed it. I was examining the walls in there. I'll get it. All right, but I wish you had... Ladies and gentlemen, before the shadow's exciting adventure continues, I have a word about auto trip. Because there are so many motorists who risk life and limb without knowing it. Yes, the shadow knows. Many a motorist rushes through the rain, puts himself in real danger of skidding, spinning, swerving on wet roads, and stop quick, and stop short, and control his car. Many a motorist faces a death dealing 
accident dealing blowout. Why should you risk your life through skid or blowout when today, without paying a cent extra, you can get life-saving protection against both of these hazards? Yes, motorists, the new kind of tire. The new Goodrich Safety Silvertown with its lifesaver tread grips dry roads, dries wet roads, overcomes the hazard zone of motoring where a slippery film of water on the road and a complete control of your car almost impossible. This means that you stop quicker, safer than you've ever stopped before. And the exclusive Golden Ply gives you real protection against dangerous high-speed blowouts. The new Goodrich Silvertown is the safest thing on wheels. It's here to save your life. Yes, save your life at no extra cost. Don't forget, your car and everyone in it will be safer if you ride on Goodrich Safety Silver Down. Did you hear that? Yes. Yes, do you know what it means? The creeper is bringing you another victim to keep us company in this living tomb. There was only something we could do. We could only get these chains off. No, no, it's no use. We're helpless. Dr. Conrad, do you think there's any chance, any hope? We mustn't give up hope, we say. Sooner or later, the police will trap the creeper, find the tunnel. The police. Listen, all of you. Some of you have been here a day, a week, two weeks. I've been here two months. Nothing but the creeper and rats for company. Chained like an animal half starved. I thought the police would find me. I had hoped too, but now I know. We'll die here. We'll never get out, ever. Never, never get out. Never get out. You can't use that with you. I can't find him all. I will. What difference does it make? Sooner or later, the creek will kill us all. We'll never see the light of day again. Never, never see the light. Oh, why did you hit him? He didn't know what he was saying. I had to. He's unconscious now, and it's better that way. Can't stand much more. Heaven help us if someone doesn't get us out of here soon. <laughs> now, so you'll find out how I catch all the fine, beautiful ladies and bring them down here. Wait, you don't have to put those chains on me. I won't try to get away. Nobody gets away. Nobody ever gets away. Nobody knows about this old tunnel. I found it long ago. How, how long have you lived down here? Who are you? And why have you crawled up into people's homes and dragged them down here? What have you done with them? You, you haven't killed them, have you? No. Only one. And because he wouldn't talk to me. Always kept trying to get away. I killed him so he wouldn't run away. But then there was no one to talk to. I got lonely. That was long, long ago. But the others... And need to say, the girl you carried away last night, where are they? Oh, you'll see them real soon. <laughs> it's not far from here down the tunnel. A great wide place in the tunnel. It's like a big room. You, you shall see. Wait, uh, let me rest here a minute, boy. Then I'll go with you. No, 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 you don't. You, you come now. Quickly. Let go. Let go of me. Let me tell you something. How do you know someone else will find your hiding place just as I did? And you better go up and shout and blow that. Don't no, 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 you come now. You're trying to trick me. I'll come back and fix that when I chain you up with the rest of them. Maybe too late. Someone knows I'm here. He was in the basement when you pulled me down here. Well, let him come. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of any man. All men are afraid of me. <laughs> I make them afraid. I make them my slaves. They call me the creeper. Creeper. <laughs> You are the creeper, and all men fear you. <laughs> Who was that? Who was that? I heard laughter. A voice. Yes, the laughter and voice of the shadow. But there, there's no one here. I see no one, and yet I... Someone is here. Someone you can't see. Someone who's not afraid of you. You're hearing the shadow. Shadow? But shadows do not laugh. They do not speak. No, no, no. For years I have lived among shadows in the darkness. Your crimes have found you out, Creeper. The voice of a man. Why can't I see him? There's no place he can hide, not here. I am here, close to you, Creeper. Even by the yellow light of your lantern you cannot see me, because I have the power to cast a shadow across your mind. 
veil across your eyes. No! No! It's like a dream. Like the dreams I used to have when I lived down here alone. I... I used to pretend. I used to talk to people. Pretend they talked to me. No, Creeper. Those others who spoke to you were fantastic creatures of your imagination. I am here. Watch how close you. <laughs> See? I was close enough to snatch that chain from your hand and throw it away. Now, now you are going to lead me to your other victims. Margo, get back. Get away from me. No, no! Keep away from me. Keep away or I'll kill you. Is that the gun you used to kill Haggerty, the night watchman, Creeper? Yes! Yes, he, he almost caught me. Yes. Yes, I killed him. I killed him. And I'll kill you. Why don't you try? Why don't you shoot, Creeper? Oh, if I could only see you, I... Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. No, that doesn't matter. There's a better way. I can see the girl. Keep away from me, Shadow. You keep away or I'll shoot her. You'll never have the chance. Just let go of me. You'll never take me. Never. <laughs> I told you. I, I told you I'd give her. <laughs> I told you, Joe. Margo. Margo. Oh, the fool I left to expose you to this. Did he get away? No. I knocked him out, but not quite soon enough. Did he shoot you? Nothing, Lamar, nothing. Oh, it hit my shoulder. It's only a flesh wound. I'll be all right. Find me to stay in the other demand. Get him out of here. No, Margo, that can wait. I... Stop the stop this flow of blood. I'm all right. Let me get up. No, no. I'm trying to get up. Let's do it. Soon I get this hatch. Get in, I'll go. It's tight. It's tight. It's best we can do it. I'll get you to the doctor there. Yeah. I've got to find some way of getting you back up that shaft. No, please, Lamont. It's only a flesh wound, I tell you. Please don't know the doctor. I'll be all right. Just leave me here and go help the others. Lamont. What? The creeper. The man you there. Yes. He's gone. You said good. Listen, I, I thought I'd knocked him out. You've got to go after him. Now he knows someone's found his hiding place. He'll kill Edith. He'll kill all the people he's got down here. I'm afraid you're right, Margo. I hate to leave you here like this. Come on, go on, please. I'm all right. I'll try to find a way to get up the shaft and notify the police. All right, Margo. You think you can. There's a ladder, but be careful. It's old and rough, and some of the runs are gone. I'll get off. I'll get help, but it may be too late unless you can find the creeper and stop him from murdering those poor people he's dragged down into this awful place. I could only be sure which way he went. He's going to take me that way, down the tunnel. Hurry, Lamont. Hurry. Take the land. All right, Margo, but get out of here if you can. Notify the police. Tell them the creeper shot you. Tell them you saw him escape down here through the cellar, but don't come back down here, Margo. There's no telling what may happen, what this fiend may do. <laughs> Something's happened today. Maybe the maybe the police have found this horrible place at last. His face is bleeding. His eyes horrible. Being chained up like this. Like animals. We're helpless. If the police are coming, he'll kill us. I know he will. Wait, wait. He's going to that chair. He calls it throne. Do something. Why is he standing here? Turn this way. Something's happened all right. I'm afraid something worse is going to happen. Nothing could be worse. Why don't you get it over with? Oh, you can kill us and be done with it. Yes. yes. Why don't I? Why don't I kill all of you? That's it. That's it. And you won't be able to take me away from my castle in the earth. So easy. <laughs> I have the dynamite. And it's all ready. All I have to do is light the fuse. That's it. That's it. That'll seal the tunnel. And we'll all die. But we'll all be together. I won't be lonely. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late for that, Creeper. Shadow! So you followed me here? Yes, Creeper. You hear that? It's, it's the Shadow. Shadow? Shadow! Listen to me, all of you. You have nothing to fear from me. Nothing to fear from the Shadow. I've come to help you. Get you out of this desert. <laughs> but you won't, Shadow. You'll never take them away from me. Look. Look what I have in my hand. 
<laughs> dynamite, dynamite. I stole that too. I knew that someday I might need it. Someday someone would come. But it'll kill us all. And it'll kill you too, Shadow. No, Creeper, I'm not chained. I can get away from you. Why don't you follow me? Follow my voice. Oh, oh, you're afraid, Shadow. You're running away. But you won't get far. You don't know this color like I do. Then follow me. Follow my voice, Creeper. Follow my voice. I'm following you. You can't go much further. You've come the wrong way. Behind you is the end of the tunnel. The end of the tunnel. <laughs> And the end of you. Yes, this is the end of the tunnel. What are you waiting for, Creeper? Life with you. Now is your chance. Yes. Yes, you're right. Now. Now is my chance. Now. <laughs> you can't get away. Throw the dynamite. Throw it, Creeper. Can't you get where I am by the sound of my voice? Yes. Yes. <laughs> You're caught. You're caught, Shadow. With you out of the way, no one else knows except that girl. And I killed her. She can't tell. And I'll be safe. I'll be safe. <laughs> Yes, Margot, I know. I've read the papers. They gave the shadow a very fine epistle, don't you? Oh, but, Lamont, so what really happened? Well, when the police got there, Edith said Mr. Conrad and the others told them the shadow arrived just as the creeper was going to dynamite the place and kill them all. They said the shadow tricked the creeper into following him down the tunnel away from the others so they wouldn't be killed. And then there was an explosion. They said the creeper and the shadow were blown to pieces. Do I look blown to pieces? Oh, you know? but, Lamont... The old, old trick of voice projection, Margot. Ventriloquism. Easy in that tunnel. The creeper followed my voice, hurled the dynamite where he thought my voice was coming from. Ahead of him. All the time I was behind him. Far enough behind him to be safe. Oh, I'm glad. Oh, I'm so glad, Lamar. I was afraid that this time was true, that the shadow was dead. No, Margot. As Mark Twain once said, the report of my death has been grossly exaggerated. The shadow is still alive. Very much alive as the criminal world has discover to its sorrow. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow magazine. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. of men. <laughs> the shadow knows.
Ladies and gentlemen, today's shadow adventure starts in just a moment. And as usual, it is packed with hair-raising thrills. But none can compare with the thrill and relief that comes from being saved by a Silvertown stop in wet weather driving emergencies. What you need between your car and rain-drenched pavements are the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown tires with the Lifesaver tread. This truly amazing tread actually dries wet roads, protects you against that hazard zone of motoring where a slippery film of water on the road may make complete control of your car almost impossible. That's because the never-ending spiral bars of the Lifesaver tread act like a battery of windshield wipers. They sweep the water right and left, force it out through deep drainage grooves, make a dry track for the rubber to grip. For safety's sake, make your next tires Goodrich Safety Silvertown. The shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Old People. Argentine Flight D-8 calling. Argentine Flight D-8 calling. Go ahead, D-8. Position approximately 80 miles southeast headwaters of the Amazon. Flying 9,000 feet. Visibility good. Airspeed 210. Next report at 4.30. Next report at 4.30. That is all. Calling Argentine Flight D-8. Calling Argentine Flight D-8. What's the matter, D-8? Can you hear us? Can you hear us, D-8? Your 4.30 report, half an hour overdue, D-8. Can you hear us, D-8? Calling Argentine Flight D-8. Second airliner disappears in South America. Second airliner disappears in South America. Get it, get it. Now, gentlemen, if you please, <clears throat> in spite of the disappearance of two planes, D-7 and D-8, as superintendent of this airline, I insist that every effort must be made to establish air contact with South America at once. Consequently, I am sending one more plane to the Argentine in the hope that it will succeed where the D-7 and the D-8 fail. Lamont, are you still craning over those maps? What are you doing, brushing up on your geography? In a sense, yes, Margot. And what country interests you now? Not a country, Margot, a continent, South America. Oh, the, those Argentine planes that disappeared, you're thinking of them. Exactly, there's something very unusual about their disappearance. What do you think happened to them? It isn't probable that three planes, manned by the finest pilots in the world and flying over a well-marked course, should disappear unless they were made to disappear. Made to disappear? Exactly, I'm convinced something other than natural causes made them disappear. But what? That's what I'm trying to figure out. It's possible they received some message over their radios that took them off their course. Caused their disappearance. But how will you find out for sure? By following the course of the three planes that disappeared. You mean go to South America? Exactly. I'm going to persuade the airlines to send through one more plane for the particular convenience of the shadow. So you're planning to go down the Amazon River? Yes. I'm going to pay a call on Superintendent McWade of the airlines and persuade him to send one more plane through to the Argentine. I, as the shadow, will be its sole passenger. Oh, no. You're wrong, Lamont. Wrong? Yes. You and I will be its sole passengers. <laughs> Look here, Superintendent McWade. Let me fly a plane down to the Argentine and try to find those planes that disappear. I'm sorry, Jack. We cancel all South American flights. Yeah, but Terry Kane, the pilot on the D-9, he was my best friend. I've got to have a crack at finding them. No, Jack. We're not going to risk any more planes disappearing. Three are enough. Why don't you let him have a try at it, Superintendent? Well, well, well who are you? 
I am the shadow. The shadow? But, but where are you? As my name implies, Mr. McWade, I'm in the shadows. Right here in this room. Well, I... I don't understand. It's really quite simple. I've merely cast a cloud over your perceptions so that you're unable to see me. Say, I remember. You're that fellow that no one ever sees. I'm flattered that you know of me, pilot. Yes, but uh, uh, what do you want here? I've come to help you find those missing planes. How? Superintendent McWade, I want you to permit the plane that was to have taken off for the Argentine tonight to leave on schedule. Well, that's out of the question. We've officially discontinued our South American service. Then restore the service unofficially for tonight. Why not, Superintendent? Maybe the shadow knows something. I'll take a chance on flying them down. I appreciate your cooperation, pilot. Mr. McWade, I guarantee I'll clear up the mystery of the missing planes within 48 hours. If you will do as I say, have a plane ready to take off tonight at the scheduled hour. A woman will board it. A woman? Yes. Well, who is she? I cannot tell you that. You must make no attempt to discover her identity. All right, but uh, how will we know her? She'll be wearing a long coat with a collar turned up around her face. She'll go right to the plane and board it. You're coming along, too. Oh, certainly, pilot. I shall be hiding in the rear of the plane. The baggage compartment, probably. I want your promise that you will make no attempt to try and find out who I am. All right. I promise. But what's the idea? Just that I am the shadow. And the shadow can only be heard. But never seen. <laughs> Margot, keep your collar up. The pilot can't see you. Turned up, Lamont. Just passed over the headwaters of the Amazon. Whatever's going to happen should happen soon. Tell the pilot to watch his course carefully from now on. All right, Lamont. Tell him to hold on to the radio beam to be sure to report any variation in that beam to me at once. I'm expecting an invitation to our fate, and when it comes, we're going to accept it. Look, look, Imperatore. He makes young American old like us. Imperatore, he is a great man. Young work and he cry like baby. Imperatore <laughs> hates all young people. No, no, no don't you fiend. Get away. Get away. Uh, no good screaming. Oh. Nobody can hear you down here by the Amazon now. Oh. No American ever oh. come by the South American jungle unless I, oh. Anton Freeman, make him come here. Oh. Like I make you come here in your aeroplane. Call off these, whatever they are. Call them off. <laughs> I am oh. clever, huh? I oh. build radio stations. Oh. I send you radio beam signals. Oh. I take you oh. off your course. Oh. I bring you here to my oh. laboratory cave so you are lost to the world. Oh, let me up. Let me up. I am Pix. Hold him to the table. No. Hold him down. Let me go. Now, go. I do my experiment. Uh, what, what are you going to do? I uh, make you very old. You, you what? Yeah, uh, maybe I mean, 90 years. Uh, maybe 100 years old. Then you'd be older than Anton Freeman. Oh, uh, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. Uh, All we found uh, me to our young people. They laugh at me because I am old. So now, I make you old. No. Older no. than me. Then I look at you. Me. And I say to myself... Anton, you are a very young man. Fierce man, older than you. No, no. Come, it is time for the experiment. Get away from me. Get away. I make you very old. Twisted old man. Yeah. I make you very old man. What? What are you going to do to me? What? What is that serum you're giving me? <laughs> it is the serum to make you very old. <gasps> oh, my body. <gasps> What's happening to it? It is what? becoming twisted <gasps> and bent, <gasps> like an old tree <gasps> that lives too long. Oh, my boys. What's happening to yes, my boys? It is old, <gasps> like rusty shutters <gasps> that go creak, creak <gasps> in the wind. <laughs> I, I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. No, <coughs> you are old men. It is hard for old men to breathe. Yeah, you are very old. Now I, Anton Freeman, am young man, and you are old, very old. Imperatore! <laughs> hey, what is it, old pig? On the radio, we heard another airplane is coming. Ah, more people come fly over me, huh? Yeah. Uh -huh, that was good. 
I need more young American for experiment. Come. I go send out to Lady Opim to bring the American here. I trick them. Come here. They think they listen to Radio Beam from the Argentine. But they listen to the Radio Beam. I, Anton Freeman, send out to bring them here. Come. We get more American town from sky for my experiment. Ladies and gentlemen, while you're waiting for the climax to the Shadow's exciting story... Let me ask you one or two very important questions. Are your tires safe? Have you ever experienced that sickening feeling that comes when a car skids out of control? Do you realize the havoc that one blowout can play with life, limb, and pocketbook? The shadow knows. It may take just one skid, just one blowout to end your driving days for good. Yes, riding on flimsy, unsafe tires is a mighty big gamble. You may win, but suppose you lose. Don't gamble. Have your car equipped with those amazing new Goodrich Silver Towns. Because this new kind of tire has what it takes to keep you and your family off the accident list. Inside, it has the famous Golden Ply blowout protection that has already saved thousands of motorists' lives. Outside, every new Silver Town has the sensational lifesaver tread that gives you the greatest skid protection, the quickest, safest wet road stops you've ever had in all your driving days. Yes, the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown is really two great tires in one, but it costs you nothing extra, not a penny. Why guess about the condition of your tires? For safety's sake, ride on Goodrich Safety Silvertown. <laughs> We're 110 miles southeast of the Amazon headwaters now, Shadow. Then our mysterious friend should be sending us a radio message soon. Say, something's happening with the radio beam. The radio beam? Yeah, it's become stronger all of a sudden. So, that's how our unknown friend sends us our invitation. By radio beam. All right, pilot, we accept his invitation. Follow the beam signal he's sending. Yes, Shadow. Better start down now. Okay. Hope I can find a dime to land on. Look down there. I thought so. The three planes that disappeared. Say, my hat's off to you, Shadow. You sure picked the spot. Plenty of room to land, isn't there, pilot? Well, not as much as I'd like. Here we go. Nice landing, pilot. Oh, thank you, lady. Oh. Holy smokes. Look out that window. Look at them. Dozens of tottering old men and women. Hey. Hey, that one there, I know that face. That's the face of Terry Kane, an old buddy of mine. Are you sure? Sure, I'd know his face anywhere, only... Only, what's happened to him? He was six feet four, and now he's little. His features are all shrunken up. Why, Terry couldn't have been more than 30, but now look at him. Why, he's old as Methuselah. All these men and women... All of them must have been transformed into bent, broken old wretches by some monster. They're breaking into the plane. Say, I'm going to try to take off. No. Got to find out what's behind all this. Open the door. Let's go out and face them. Say, it's all right for you to talk, Shadow. You hanging back in the shadows where no one can find you. Huh? My power to throw a cloud over the senses and remain unseen will save you from the same fate that befell these other people. Go ahead. Open the door. I'll be with you. <laughs> Hey, quit pulling us, you mangy old geezers. Hey, pretty lady. Nice lady. Me take her. Hey, that's, that's Terry. <laughs> hey, Terry, don't you remember me? <laughs> Terry! <laughs> Young American. Imperator, make you old. Older than me. <laughs> than me. Terry have pretty lady. Terry, oh, Terry you remember me. <laughs> Terry! Young American, you pig. Come, we show American how much we hate young men. <laughs> hey, Terry, Terry, call these guys off. Get off of me, you warts. Shadow, Shadow, call them off, will you? 
They're swarming all over me. Get them off, I tell you. Get away, all Get of you. Off. Get away. Get, off. Get away. Oh, your voice is frightening. They don't understand where it's coming Get from. Get away, all of you. Get away. Say, oh. it's a good thing you scared them off, Shadow. They were biting and pecking at me like a bunch of toothless mosquitoes. Oh. Fiendish little animals. Their bodies and brains and souls have all been shrunk out of them. Yeah. Fine pigs. Who's that? That must be the gentleman known as Imperatore. I oh, say, he's only a half pint himself. He's a dwarf. No, he's just an undersized man. Must be around 50. Fine pigs! I tell you, bring the American to me. Now I must get from myself. Ah, oh, my American friends. You come see me, Anton Freeman. Now look here, you. Keep I... quiet. First, I talk with pretty lady here. It's a long time since I've seen such fine white skin. Very long time. Oh, don't touch me. Ah, you are like other American ladies, huh? You do not like me because I am not young, huh? Because maybe you like this big pilot, huh? Because he is young, huh? All right, I make him old. Older than me with my serum. You see then what great man Anton Freeman is. Yeah, very great man. Maybe then you would like me more than him. Come, science speaks. Bring the Americans to the laboratory. Throw the American on the table. No, oh, no, you devils can't do this to me. Let me up. Look, look, look at this useless struggles. Let me up, Adam. The young American. Even a young American can do nothing against all the bent over old men. <laughs> Where's your great friend, the Shadow, now, lady? I thought he was going to make everything all right. Like Gulliver in the land of the Lilliputians, eh, Dr. Freeman? Hey, who? Who, who says that? I know the shadow wouldn't fail us, pilot. Our friend, the pilot, is like Gulliver in the land of Lilliput, eh? Small old men swarming over him and fastening him down. Well, who are you? Why, I cannot see you. Because I am hiding in the shadows, Dr. Freeman. You see, I hate youth and its taunts. I am afraid of growing old, too, Dr. Freeman. Ah, you are old and bent, too, huh? Yes, so I learned to live in the shadows, away from human eyes, to conceal my age. Ah, but what I would give for a serum like yours, to avenge myself for the scorn of robust young people by making them older than I am. Ah, you know about my serum, yes, huh? Yes, and I know how you can shrink the bodies of these people you make old, as primitive people used to shrink the heads and bodies of corpses. Uh, you're a brilliant scientist, Dr. Freeman. Yeah, all by myself I found the serum. Here in the jungle, away from where there are young people. Ah, uh, but they find me here too, those young ones. With the airplanes? Yeah, they come flying over me here. So you installed a radio transmitter and sent out radio signals, tricking the planes into flying here and getting lost. So they'd have to make forced landings. Ah, yeah, that is right. And when they landed, I captured the people inside of them and made them into old, bent creatures like you see here. Can they ever be restored to what they were? Never, never. Aren't you afraid they might turn on you, these hideous wretches? Oh, no, no. You see that switch on the wall? I only have to unlock it with this key and I wear my belt. I turn the switch on. I escape. And in a minute, I have to turn a dynamite destroys the old people. Brilliant, Doctor. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I show you now with the pilot how brilliant I am. Hey, get away from me. Dr. Freeman, so brilliant a scientist as yourself must have other medical wonders he's discovered. Ah, yeah. Still another serum I have. Another serum to do what, doctor? A serum to make little men big. To make little men big? Yeah. What effect would your serum have on these old people, Dr. Freeman? It would make them stupid monsters. Because they have no brains. Now, Ethan. Dr. Freeman, have you ever thought of using that serum on yourself? On myself? You could make yourself tall and big. Taller than any young man. Taller than a young man? Dr. Freeman, think. Supposing you were to take the serum yourself, making yourself tall and strong. Yeah. And then, supposing you transformed all your old creatures into monsters. Why, with your brains and their strength, you could conquer the world. Yeah, you, you, you are right. Think. The tall and handsome Dr. Freeman. Yeah. Able to conquer the world. Yeah. Think of it. Come. Try it. Yeah, but but can I give the serum to myself? A great I... surgeon like yourself can accomplish any miracle, Dr. Freeman, even to giving yourself an injection of the serum. Ah, you are right. It is right in this bottle Good. here. There's a mirror on the wall. Stand before it and give yourself the injection. Uh, yeah, but... Think. The... Master of the world, Dr. Freeman. Yeah. 
Certainly that's worth any effort. A little pain. Oh, yeah, you are right. I will do it. How do you start? I show you. I I fill this glass tube with a serum. Oh, no, no, I cannot do this. Come. There's no time to hesitate. The whole destiny of the world is in your hands. Master of the universe. Yeah. Yeah, I will do it. Now what? I I inject the serum. I, I, I am, you see, I am growing, growing, you see. Mother McCree, the guy's growing like a balloon blowing up. You, Look you, at him. you see, man in the shadows, I am growing. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I see, Anton uh, Freeman. Your body is growing, but your mind, is it growing too? Yeah. The inside, my head, it feel like it, it get big, big, like great big rubber ball inside vacuum. Yes, Dr. Freeman, a good description. A great rubber ball inside a vacuum. You forgot that your serum to enlarge the body would enlarge every organ of your body, even your brain. Yeah. I will even be greater genius. No. Your genius will shrink and disappear. You can enlarge the brain, Dr. Freeman, but you can't enlarge the matter that makes for intelligence. The larger your brain gets, the smaller your ratio of intelligence. You're becoming a stupid, heartless, brainless monster, like your wretched creations. No! No, I will show you I... Margot, Margot, quickly. You and the pilot get to the plane, get ready for the takeoff. What about you, Lamont? I'll join you as soon as this monster's destroyed himself. Hurry. Well, Dr. Freeman, your serum works, doesn't it? You're tall now, seven feet, maybe more. But you're stupid. I will kill you, man in the shadow. I doubt that. You're too stupid to defend yourself now, even against your old people. Ah, uh, you forget the dynamite... I will turn the switch, blow them and you to pieces. That is it. I will blow them up and you. First, I unlock the switch. Get away from that switch, Freeman. Ha! The man in the shadows, he is afraid, huh? <laughs> Dr. Freeman, he's not afraid. Dynamite cannot hurt great big Dr. Freeman. See, already more than seven feet I am. Now... I turn the switch. Take your hand off that switch. Make me take it off. You think you can make giant Dr. Friedman do anything? Very well, I will make you take your hand off it. Take off your hand from that switch. Ah, there you are. Now I feel you. Let go. Let go of me. <laughs> Dr. Friedman, find where you are. Let uh, go of my arm. You come to take my hand off the switch. But show me where you are. Now, the great Dr. Freeman, he even can kill someone he cannot see. Let go of me. Now, I turn the switch that set off the dynamite. There, Shadow, in exactly two minutes, all people, they all explode. You'll die too if that dynamite goes off. No, the great Dr. Freeman, he lived even against dynamite. Ah, Shadow, lie to Dr. Freeman. You are big men, young too, huh? Oh, I feel how big you are, but not so big as me. I can crush you like a paper box. Lamont, Lamont, what's he doing to you? He's located me by touching me. Oh. Now he's, he's crushing me in his arms. I can't hold up to his arms. Pretty lady. Carrie like pretty lady. Carrie. Marco, get the plane and leave at once. That dynamite will be going off soon. Harry, you like me? Uh, Harry, like pretty lady very much. I like you too if you'll do something for me. Yeah, i do anything for pretty lady. Then you, you and your friends, let the American alone and attack the Imperatore. Oh, Imperatore, too great. No, no, he's just a big stupid man now. Look at him, he's making himself large so he can destroy you. No, no, no. Don't try to save me, Margo, don't. Save yourself before they die. Then get rid of the Imperatore, Terry. Get rid of Anton Freeman. And then you like Terry? Yes, yes, very much. All right, we do it. We will attack Dr. Freeman. <laughs> and look, look, no more is Imperatore, old man. He's a big man now, so he can hurt us. Come with your Imperatore. He can't hurt us. Come. <laughs> 
Come can we show him, Pinatore, to how much we hate him? Come on, Oh, oh, hey, please, I Hurry, let's go to the plane. The pilot's out there now. Another minute or two with his arms strangling me and I've been finished. Oh. I, I'm afraid I rather overestimated my strength against the strength of a monster. His arms were like bands of steel. Uh, the pilot's ready to take off. Into the plane, quickly. Are you in, Shadow? Yes, yes, I'm with you. All right, pilot, take off. But what about the old people? More merciful that they perish, Marco. It's better that the poor wretches be removed as a scourge from the earth. Okay, here we go. None too soon, either. Just in time, Freeman and his fantastic empire are ended by his own devices, destroyed by the creatures of his own fiendish creation. The creatures he had devised to satisfy his own egotistical hatred. Well, the South American Air Service is safe once again. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. of men. <laughs> the shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start trailing the shadow on his newest adventure, let me remind you that if you haven't yet replaced worn, smooth tires with new, safe, Goodrich Silver Towns, do it now. And the sooner, the safer. For remember, Silver Towns are the only tires that give you the skid protection of the lifesaver tread. The amazing new Goodrich development 
that will stop you quicker, safer on a wet pavement than you've ever stopped before. And motorists, you don't have to take my word for it. The nation's largest independent testing laboratory, you know, tested the Silvertown stopping ability. They tested it against both regular and premium price tires of five other leading tire manufacturers. And their engineers found that no tire tested, regardless of price, came up to this new Silvertown in skid resistance. Motorists, that can mean only one thing. Your car and everyone in it will be safer if you ride on Goodrich, safety Silvertown. A Silvertown stop may save your life. The shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, he died at 12. matter, Commissioner Weston? Nervous? Can't you stand the side of the scaffold? Oh, listen, Cranston. I've been attending executions in the line of duty for more years than I'd like to remember. I tell you, hangings still do things to my insides. Yeah, it'll all be over in a minute. Well, at least I'm not the only one in this room who's nervous. About half the wise newspaper guys here look as if they were ready to pass out. You'll have to start at the death march. Uh, what time is it? Two minutes to twelve. There's a headline for you. He died at 12. If ever a man deserved to die, it's this Nick Barati. Yeah. He sure got it coming to him. It's like something out of a jungle. Killing for the sake of killing. Yes. My department's going to feel mighty relieved when that rope tightens around his neck. Here they come. Huh. That's queer. What? Barretti. He doesn't seem very frightened. No, he doesn't. Yet up to now, he's always shown a real fear of hanging. Up here, Beretti. They build this scaffold up high, eh, Warden? It's the law, Beretti. <laughs> the law. Stand here. Okay. All set, Mac? All set, Warden. Baratti, is there anything you want to say before you are hanged by the neck until you are dead? No. Maybe I... Uh, no. No, I ain't got nothing to say. All right, Mac. Put the hood over his head. Yes, one. Baratti. Yeah? Don't worry, Baratti. Everything's going to be all right. That's a fine. Everything's going to be all right. Put the rope around his neck. Okay, one. Release the trap door. Commissioner Weston, notice what happened before the trap door opened. Hmm? What? The executioner whispered something into Barani's ear. Now he's adjusting a hood over his head. Well, what difference does that make? Beretti's dead. He's hanged now. Yes. Yes, that's the end of Nick Barati. I wonder why he wasn't frightened. Warden, Warden. Yes, what is Braddy's it? relatives are here to claim the body. All right, all right, give it to him. Here's the first one, boss. Okay. Put him against the wall. Oh, no. No, what is this? What, what are you doing to me? Where are you taking me? Stand there, Mug. Kidnapping me? Well, I haven't done any money. I, I'm just a working Shut man. Shut your face. I... Take the blindfold off his eyes, Joe. Okay, boss. Well, well what, what is this? I, I haven't done anything. Now I... you look straight ahead, mister. Well, you... you. Oh, no, no. Don't shoot. Please don't. Don't. Here's the second one, boss. Okay. Take the blindfold off. Okay, fella, you can look now. Where am I? What have I done? You look Why? straight ahead, a rat. Oh! Afraid, oh, eh? Oh, you! Well, you're dead. You can't be alive. 
No, 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 don't shoot. I haven't done anything. Uh, help, help. <laughs> okay, Joe. Now you give me the rest of them. <laughs> Paper, read all about it. Fifth mysterious murder in five days. Another man found murdered. Murder mystery. Read all right, Margot, it. shut the window. All right. It's Lamont. Aren't you going to do anything about them? About what? You heard the news, boy. You've got to make a living. Lamont Cranston, you know perfectly well what I'm talking about. Five murders in five days. Isn't there some way to stop them? You're just going to sit On by... On the contrary, and... my dear Margot, I'm not going to sit. I'm going to ride, and you're riding with me. What are you talking about? Where are we riding? To the place where the dead, even those who are <coughs> hanged by the neck, should be. The cemetery. <laughs> Yes, sir, that, that's the grave, mister. That's the one over there. Come on, Margot. But please, Lamont, please tell me why you brought me out to this cemetery. I'll understand why in a few minutes. Are you sure this is the grave, caretaker? Oh, oh, yes, indeed, sir, yes, indeed. I, I've been in charge of the graves here for 30 years. Know every single one of them, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. You, you see see the headstone? To the memory of Nicholas Baratti. Yeah, you see, I, I told you I'd take you to the right one. Thank you very much. Young lady and I will stay out here a few moments, if you don't mind. Oh, no, not at all, not at all. Uh, are you relatives of this man? No, not exactly. Here, let me your trouble. Eh? Oh, 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 thank you, sir. Th thank you very much indeed. No, wait a minute. Uh, yes, sir. Did you see them bury Barate? Oh, indeed I did, sir. Yes, sir, indeed I did. I, I make it my business to be present at every one of the burials. Quite late in the day it was when they buried him. Yes, yes, remember. And a bad day, too. Uh, thunder rumbling in the sky. So you saw them bury him? Oh, yes, yes, indeed I did. Yeah. Will, will, will that be all, sir? Yes, that's all. Thank you. <clears throat> well, well, uh, uh, see you on your way out. Lamont, why does the burial place of this murderer concern you? I wanted to make sure of something. That he was buried here? Yes. You know that the shadow doesn't always work on facts, Margot. Sometimes he's able to accomplish a great deal more by basing his actions on, well, call it intuition, hunch, anything you will. I know that, but what has Nick Barati's grave got to do with the shadow? I'm very concerned with those five murders which have taken place during the last five days. Well, so have I. That's why we're here. But... What could a man who's been dead for weeks have to do with those killings? Just dead. I wanted to make sure he was dead and buried. But you yourself saw Barati had. I know, but somehow during all those weeks since, I've never been able to forget the confident look on the man's face as he climbed the steps to the scaffold. Well, now you're sure he's dead and buried. Oh, come on. It, it's so dark. Let's get out of here. All right. I never did like graveyards, particularly at twilight. Uh, strange. What's strange? I saw the man hang by the neck until dead, and yet there's a feeling in me that... All isn't what it seems to be. Wait. What is it now? It's the caretaker's house. I want to ask him another question. All right, Lamont, but please make it fast. The longer I stay here, the less I care for this place. Oh, well, well, it's you, sir. You, you leaving so soon? Yes, and before we go, there's another question I'd like to ask you. Well, you just go right ahead. Anything you want, sir. Is the coffin opened before Barati's body was finally lowered into the grave? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed, sir. I, I remember that. Yes, I do. Opened it right up. The relatives did. Weeping and wailing, a lot of them. And there uh, was a body in the coffin? A body in the coffin? But of course there was. <laughs> what else would they want to be burying it for? Thanks. Thanks very much. Oh, not at all, not at all. <laughs> and there'll be plenty more burials, too, if these killings go on. What do you mean? Well, I was just reading this here evening pepper. Another one was murdered back in town. Another one? Yes, yeah, six in six days. Oh, Lamont. This is that paper. Yes, indeed. Here you are, sir. Sure, yeah. sure. Another victim of mysterious murder. Wait, Charles Harrison was found shot to death. Charles Harrison. Why? Did, did you know him, Lamont? I was right. Right. Go on to the car, Margo. But, Lamont, I... Come along. I... Charles Harrison, I knew my hunch was right. Get in the car, quickly. Oh, all right, but please tell me what this is all about. My hunch. It was right. The murder of Charles Harrison definitely proves it. What was your hunch? And what does the murder of this Charles Harrison prove? Six men have been murdered in the last six days. No witnesses. Each of the victims shot through the head. Well? well? 
Each and every one of those murdered men spent a week together in a jury box as jurymen at the murder trial of Nick Barati. You mean someone's been yes. avenging the death of Barati? Yes, exactly. But Nick Barati was a rat. All the members of his own gang hated him. I know that for a fact. They wouldn't revenge him. Then who is committing the murder? Well, Lamont. You don't think that Nick Barati... He's dead. Dead and buried, they tell me. The dead don't come back. But if they do, the shadow is going to find out. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in a moment, we'll again pick up the trail of the shadow. But meanwhile, let me say this. You're reading a lot these days in the newspapers about the hazard zone of motoring. What is this hazard zone? The shadow knows. It's that slippery film of water on the road that may make complete command of your car almost impossible, causing your car to skid, spin, swerve. Remember, motorists, the tire that will give you the quickest, safest, non-skid stops in this hazard zone is the new Goodrich Silvertown with Lifesaver Tread. Every inch of this wider, flatter tread is specially designed to dry the road. In fact, the never-ending spiral bars of this Lifesaver Tread act like a whole battery of windshield wipers. They sweep the water right and left, force it out through the deep drainage grooves, make a dry track for the rubber to grip. That's why you'll stop quicker, safer on a wet pavement than you've ever stopped before. And don't forget... Adding one safety feature to another, Silver Towns also give you the famous golden ply protection against high-speed blowout. Thus, the lives of yourself and family are protected two important ways, against both skids and blowouts. And motorists, don't forget that you get this double protection in Silver Towns at no extra cost. Don't cheat yourself out of this new kind of tire safety. Stay on the sunny side of motoring. Make your next tires Goodrich Safety Silvertown. Now, Judge, Judge, there's no reason to get so excited. Commissioner Weston, I have plenty of reason to get excited. Do you realize what the death of these men will mean to the future administration of justice in our courts? But we're doing everything in our power to protect... Yes, this. to protect the survivors. But what about the six who were murdered? But, Judge, we had no idea there was a plot to exterminate those jurymen... If we had, we'd have taken measures immediately. That's the point. You didn't know. The entire police department didn't know. And you should have known. You should have known at once. How could we? Men are found murdered on lonely roads. I tell you, there wasn't the slightest reason to connect them with the Beretti murder trial. It was a matter of deduction. And certainly the ability to reason things out is one of the things we should be able to expect from our police department. Now, Judge, be fair. There was no reason to tie up the murders with the Beretti trial. How you ever discovered that all six men were on the jury is more than I can figure. Why, there's been hundreds of trials since then... How did you do it, Judge? I didn't do it. But you were the one who discovered that the victims had been jurymen. I repeat, I didn't discover that fact. It was revealed to me by an anonymous letter I received in the mail. Anonymous letter? Yes, here. There it is. Look at the signature. The shadow. Yes. Rather a peculiar signature, isn't it? Peculiar? Judge, why in heaven's name didn't you tell me this before? The shadow. <laughs> No, Commissioner, surely you don't believe the nonsense I've been reading about this... this super being of criminal investigation. So the shadow was the one who worked out the fact that the murdered men were Beretti jurymen. I might have guessed it. Commissioner Weston, stop wasting my time talking about someone who doesn't exist. Your duty is to trace down the murders of those jurymen. If you don't, the entire law enforcement organization of the city may be irreparably damaged. What citizen will want to act on the jury if he thinks that the assassin's gun waits for him as soon as he leaves the courtroom? I tell you, forget about this so-called shadow... Get those murderers. With the shadow on my side, I'm sure I will. Good night, Judge. Good night. <laughs> Imagine Commissioner Weston believing in such rot as a shadow. Nonsense. No, not nonsense, Judge. Who? Who speaks? <laughs> the shadow. I am the shadow. The shadow? I hear the voice. Yet I see no one. It is my will that men should never see me. It, it can't be. And yet your senses tell you that it is so. You hear my every word. Yes, I hear. I have come to ask you a favor. Favor? Of me? Yes. What, what can I do for you? Six men still live. The rest of the men who served on the jury that convicted Nick Barati. Well? You can save the lives of those six. I? How can I save their lives? By doing as I say. Will you help me? What? 
What do you want me to do? There are detectives guarding this house. Well? I want you to send them away. Send them away? But if I do that... Yes, your life will be in danger. Are you afraid? But uh, how would sending the detectives away help save the lives of those six jurymen? The one who caused the murder of the six who died will want to kill you above all men because you were the judge who pronounced the sentence. Well? When he is certain your house is unguarded, he will come here after you. And when he comes, I'll be waiting for him. Are you willing to risk your life to save six men? Yes. Yes. It's... it's getting late. Shadow, are you still here in my room? Yes. Still here, Judge. Seems strange, this talking to empty air. A murderer's feet danced on empty air. What did you say? I was thinking aloud. Oh. Are you sure someone will come here after me? For days, while the Commissioner's men have been guarding this place, there's been someone else watching, and I'm positive that person will soon be here. We've been waiting so long. Believe me, it'll be worth the wait. Yes, if you were sure. But how can you be sure that... Quiet. Don't speak. Don't speak. Pick up your pen and start writing. There's someone at the French windows trying to get in. Someone trying to... Write! Keep your hands on the table, Judge. Why... Uh... Uh, don't make no noise, or I'll let you have it. Who? Who are you? Don't make no difference who I am. What do you want? Money? Sure, I want money, but not from you, Judge. Keep your hands on the table. What do you want of me? Me? I don't want a thing. It's a friend. He wants to see you. Friend? Who? Now, don't ask questions like that, Judge. Why doesn't he come here? I tell you, don't ask questions like that. It ain't smart. It ain't healthy. Now, come on. Get to your feet. I want to know. Get to your feet, I tell you. Now keep your hands up where I can see them. Come on. You and me, we're going places. My hat. Where are you going, you will need a hat. Come on. We'll go out the same way I came in. Get a move on. All right. Willing, ain't you? And here I thought maybe I'd have to slug you. Too bad. I never got a chance to slug a judge before. Shadow, are you still here? What'd you say? I I uh, was talking to myself. Yeah, well, keep your trap shut. Come on. Through this window. The way I came in. Shadow. Shut up, I said. Come on, now. I got a car parked around the side. Now, keep your trap buttoned up or I'll fill you full of slugs right now. <laughs> and, uh, and would that disappoint a certain party? Windy night, ain't it? And dark. Get in the car, Judge. Where you're going pretty soon, believe me, it's a lot darker. Come in. Okay, Judge, get in. Go on, get in there. <laughs> Boss, he's real anxious to meet you. The feeling is... is mutual. Yeah? Okay, boss. Here's the big shot. Bring him a closer. Okay, Judge, you heard what he said. Okay. Far enough. You go sit down, Joe. Sure, boss. How are you, Judge? Who are you? Oh, now, don't tell me you forget me, my friend. I know you. Don't you? So dark in here. That mask over your face. Who are you? Kind of worry, eh, Judge? Stand back by the wall a little bit. That's it. I take off my mask now. I show you. That gun. What are you going to... Look, look at me. Barati! Mick Barati! Ah, you don't forget. But you're dead! 
You're dead. You're going to be dead, Judge. I count three. And you're going to be dead the way you think I am. One. No. Don't shoot. Two. Shadow. What are you? Shadow, Shadow. Shadow. Why you call that a name Shadow? You know, Shadow, it's a me, Nick Barati, and I'm... Oh, no. No, you're not Barati. But Shadow, you are here. Yes, I am here. Who say that? Hey, Joe, you say that? No, boss. I don't say nothing. I spoke. Hey, boss. Somebody's talking. I don't see him. So nobody here. It's a judge. He make a trick with a voice. But I kill him. I kill him like I kill him all. Boss, you shoot me. You shoot me. I shoot Joe. My hand. Something's a knock up in my hand while I shoot. Who do I? Who? I did it. Who? They call me the Shadow. Shadow? Are you afraid now, Nick Barati? No. No, I ain't afraid of nothing. No, not of me. Shadow, how can he be alive? They hanged him, buried him. Yes, tell us, Barati. Why didn't you die? Sure. Sure, I tell you. You don't get out of here anyway. Sure, sure, I tell you. The guy would have put a rope around my neck. I pay him off for plenty. But you did hang. Oh, sure, but he fixed the rope for short so I don't drop far. Ten grand, it's cost. But you hang. Yes, sure, but only a few minutes. I used to be a wrestler in the old country. Neck muscles are strong like iron. I make them stiff when the trap door is open. My neck's no break. And then they cut you down quickly. Yeah, you bet your life quick. <laughs> That's a cost of plenty, too. The hearse they took you away in? <laughs> That's a no hearse. Ambulance, that's what it was. And the doc, he got to work right away. Injection of my heart, the pull motor. Fifty grand everything cost to me, but I don't die. I live to take care of everybody who thinks they can make a nigger barati hang. Then whose body was in the coffin that was buried in the cemetery? It's easy to get a body. The doc can make up the face to look like mine. What's the matter with your voice? The rope, she's a strain something, something inside of my throat. The doc, he don't do a 100% a job. But I do a 100% job on the dock. I kill him. And you killed six men since then? And I kill two more. You and not a shadow. And then I kill six more. And a more. And a more. All of them is a die. But not a Nick Parati. Your voice is getting weaker. Uh, I told you, Doc, he don't do a 100% job. But I fix that. <laughs> Uh, it's there. It's there to fix me up. That mask, what? Oxygen tank. Oxygen so he can breathe without choking. Uh, uh, mm, that's all right. Oxygen. Fix me up good. Good so I kill you too. First to you, Judge. I'm going to put a slugger right in the middle of your fat head. Oh, no. no. Don't you? Don't press the Nick, trigger. Nick, wait. Wait for what? I don't got time. You had seven bullets in your gun. You fired six. There's just one left. If you use that last one on the judge, what will be left for you? Left for me? Yes, for you. What will be left for me? What is left for all criminals and murderers like you? The scaffold with a noose. Hanging. No, no. I'm a don't die by the rope, and not me. Oh, yes. You, Nick Barati. This time you won't be able to escape it. You won't be able to fix the hangman. Huh. There'll be no doctor to save you. Nick Barati's will never die by the rope. I'm going to shoot the judge. You will never kill the judge. I'll knock your arm up again. The bullet will go wild. Huh. Remember, you cannot see me. You cannot prevent me doing it. Huh. And then the noose will get you the way it gets all men who live by murder. No, no, I get away. How? The first step to that door and I stop you. You can't stop me. Look, see, I go. I can't... You see? Huh. A chair suddenly bars your way. I kill you now. Now. You cannot see me. And I kill the judge anyway. If you waste that one bullet, remember what will be left for you, huh? the hangman's rope. No, 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 I know hang. The police will come, the trial, and a jury of 12 men will say, guilty as charged. No. And another judge will say, to be hanged by the neck until dead. No, no, I know hang. Another warden will take you by the arm. No. The walk to the scaffold. No, no, stop. Stop, none of me. I don't hang, I tell you. The walk up to the scaffold. No. This time the rope, a long one. No, stop, stop saying that. The trap will spring. The rope will tighten. No, tighten. No, tighten. No, tighten. no. I don't hang. None of me. I kill myself first. I kill myself. He shot himself. 
never, never hang with Nick Barati. Is he? Is he dead, Shadow? Yes, Judge. He's dead. There'll be no need to try Nick Barati again. He cheated the law on the noose just once with bribery. But all the money in the world cannot cheat justice of the reward it finally meets out to crime and criminals. You can't bribe justice, nor death. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> all the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Ladies and gentlemen, today the Shadow Program has the honor to present a distinguished guest whom all of you will want to hear, Commissioner John H. Morris, in charge of the Juvenile Aid Bureau of the New York City Police Department. Commissioner Morris will be interviewed at the close of today's adventure with the Shadow. First, a few cold, hard facts about your everyday driving safety. Every year, thousands of motorists are killed or injured through skid and blowout accidents. And right now, unless your tires are safe, you too may be headed for a dangerous skid, a costly blowout. Before it's too late, before you're caught in a car-spinning skid, 
Before you hear the dreaded bang of a high-speed blowout, equip your car with the new Goodrich Safety Silvertowns. They're the only tires in the world that have the lifesaver tread to give you the quickest non-skid stops you've ever had and the golden ply to protect you against high-speed blowouts. And think of it. When you invest in this sensational new kind of tire safety, you get both of these great life-saving features at no extra cost. The shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, the reincarnation of Michael. Well, how's ex our experiment coming, Professor Charles? Oh, very well, Michael. Almost all our flying messengers of death are ready. See these cages filled with mosquitoes? Good. I've taken pains that my guests won't disturb you. Yeah, well, they do. Can't open the window for a breath of air, but there they are, chattering like monkeys. I wish you'd stay away from that window. Someone might see you. Do let them. They'll never have a chance to tell anyone what they've seen. These friends of yours. Friends? I have no friends. I hate my guests. Yeah, we'll make them suffer, Michael. Suffer as I've suffered. Those parasites hang around me because I'm Michael Welsh, the millionaire. Every one of them is an enemy. One sold me faulty stock. His bell borrows money and fails to pay it back. A third, a girl, might have been my wife, but she wouldn't listen to me. Uh, never put faith in human nature. That was my mistake. I don't. Every one of those people has done me wrong. They will pay for it. Fine. I will enjoy that. I was a great scientist once, working to save humanity. When the fever struck me down, humanity shrugged its shoulders. Now I work for revenge. Professor Charles... In another age, they wouldn't have dared treat me with such insolence. Another age? Yes. The 12th century knew how to deal with those who were insulting. In those days, I had much less trouble. You had much less trouble? Had, uh, had, that is, men in my position had much less trouble repaying a false friend. And there were no police then. And there are none here on your estate. In this house, you are the law. Yes, I'm aware of that. Uh, don't let anyone in here. Don't worry. Michael Wells, Michael, are you in there? That's Mrs. Bell. Well, whoever she is, keep her out of here. All right, Professor. Coming, Mrs. Bell. Oh, there you are, Michael. Yes, Mrs. Bell. Oh, I've never been in this room. Is anyone in there? No. No one. Oh, well, can't I go in? There's nothing for you to see. You wanted me? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. I nearly forgot. Guess who just arrived? Why, I don't know. All my guests are here already. But these two are friends of mine. They heard I was staying here and dropped over for a chat. Oh, I knew you'd enjoy meeting them. Margot Lane's such a lovely girl. And young Mr. Cranston knows all about art and old things, just like you, Michael. What? A learned man and a young girl? The same two who came before. The pattern never changes. I beg your pardon? Oh, nothing. Uh, they're out on the terrace. Uh, what, what did you say their names were? Margot Lane and Mr. Cranston, Lamont Cranston. Let us go and meet them. I think I'm going to enjoy entertaining these two friends of yours. Beautiful spot, isn't it, Lamont? Mm, lovely, Margot. Michael Welch has taste. Building his home right on the crest of this hill... You can see the whole valley from here. Mm, but the house, it, it's so big. More like a castle than a home. Yes, almost a medieval castle. Lamont, look. There's an old man peering out of the window. Where? Up there. Oh, yes. Lamont, he's staring at us so strangely. Mm, I wonder who it would be. We'll probably find out from, from Margot. Here comes Mrs. Bell now. Oh, yes, I, I suppose that's Michael Welsh with her. Hello, Myra. Oh, Margot, darling, and Mr. Cranston. I've been wanting you two to meet Michael for ages. He knows all about you. Still, you might introduce me, Mrs. Bell. Oh, oh of course. How silly of me. Uh, this is Michael Welch, our charming host. Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston. How do you do, sir? I'm glad you stopped the call. Thank you. We, we can't stay very long. Oh, but my dear, you must. We're having such a wonderful time. You'd love it. 
Make them stay, Michael. Well, uh, you'll stay until after dinner anyway, won't you? Yes, and Michael must show Mr. Cranston his remarkable collection. Mr. Cranston's always interested in that sort of thing. Are you a collector, Mr. Welsh? Uh, yes, uh, medieval art, you know. Uh, Lamont, we really haven't oh, time. Come but... along. Thank you. I'd enjoy seeing your collection, but Mr. Lamont. Welsh. Oh, I knew you would, Mr. Cranston. Oh, you must meet everyone. Come, Michael. We'll go and get the others. Well, Margaret, what's the matter? I don't like this place. That old man in the window. He had hate in his eyes. There's something evil about this house. You really feel that, Margot? Oh, I know it's silly. Go ahead and laugh at I'm me. I'm not laughing, Margot. I'm interested. You see, I feel there's something evil about this house, too. <laughs> Isn't it the funniest story you ever heard, Mr. Grant? Uh, very amusing. More wine, anyone? Uh, no, no, thanks, Michael. Nothing more for me. Oh, well, Mr. Cranston, I want to ask you something. Yes, Mrs. Bell? Uh, do you believe in the transmigration of souls? What was that? Oh, Mrs. Bell just asked if I believed in the theory of soul transmigration. Well, what in the world is that? Reincarnation. Yes, and oh, I do think it's ever so interesting. All about how the great minds of the past ages came back and, uh, oh, well, great minds in the present. I know that some ancient people... Really were convinced that a man returned to Earth after death as another person. You mean we all were someone else long ago? That's the general idea. Oh, I hope I was queen in Babylon. Oh, come, let's, <laughs> let, let's drop the topic. Oh, why, Michael? Uh, Mrs. Bell, you shouldn't discuss things you don't understand. Well, I know all about reincarnation. No, you don't. Every week you have a new religion. To you, the theory of reincarnation is not an established fact. It's just a passing fancy. How do you feel about it, Welsh? I never discuss religion, Mr. Cranston. Um, shall, we, shall we have our coffee in the living room? Oh, there you are, Lamont Have you seen our host? We really ought to be going I think Michael Welsh went to the library a while ago By the way, have you been, where have you been since we had our coffee? I was just wandering around looking for the old gentleman we saw peering out the window mm. Did you find him? No, he's certainly not one of the guests Here's the library Oh, Mr. Welsh What's that? Look out, you wrecked the book, slamming it shut like that. Oh, it's you. Oh, I'm sorry we disturbed you while you were reading. Oh, it's nothing important. I'll just put this back on its shelf. Oh, we won't keep you a minute. Please don't stop. You see, Miss Lena, I like to leave my books in their proper places. He acts as if he was ashamed of what he was reading. Yes, he's certainly tucking it out of sight quickly. There, that's better. Lovely room you have here, Mr. Welsh. I'm glad you like it. Well, I suppose you two will be leaving very shortly. Yes, you see, we... As a matter of fact, I think we'll accept your invitation and stay the night. What? Oh, oh uh, uh, I see. Uh, all right, if you want to, I'll uh, I'll go and tell them to get your rooms ready. Lamont, what on earth do you think you're doing? For one thing, I'm going to find out why friend Welsh hid that book. I watched where he put it. Lamont. Just a minute, Margot. Ah, here it is. Lamont. Come here a minute. I want you to see this portrait. Portrait? Oh. Well, you mean the gentleman over the fireplace? Yes, that dark man in medieval dress. Hmm. Not a pleasant face. No, but there's something very familiar about familiar? it. Familiar? Oh. Well, it seems to me I've, I've seen that face before. Probably in a museum. It's an old painting. Oh, wait. Here's a plate on the frame. I'll read it. I, I'll look through this book of Welsh's. Duke of Ancona, Italian noble, 12th century. Now... I don't recall the name. Nobody ever remembers history lessons. I'd swear I'd seen those eyes on a living person. It's been pretty old, about 800 years. <laughs> no, it, it looks like someone I know, but I just can't place the man. Speaking of age, it's a rare old volume. The book Mr. Welsh was ashamed of? What is it? Yeah, an old Italian history. Very interesting. Oh. Let's see. It's about the place where Welsh had the book open, right here. Yes, somebody's thumbed this page well. Hmm. This is strange. What? It's a story about your, your boyfriend over the fireplace. The man in the portrait? Yes, Michael, Duke of Ancona. Bloodthirsty gentleman, the Duke. Even for the Middle Ages. Mm, those medieval soldiers were butchers. Duke of Ancona was more subtle than that, Margot. This tells how he invited a party of friends to his castle, locked them in, and introduced the plague among them. But, but what? The writer says the Duke was avenging an insult. Did he get his revenge? Yes, with two more deaths than he expected. Two extra victims? Yes, yes, he... He hadn't planned on those two. Had nothing against them. A learned man and a young girl. Fortunately, they sought refuge in the Duke's castle from a storm. And ran into a murder plot. Exactly. Plot. The Duke tried to get them to leave, but when they wouldn't, their host went ahead with his plan. Two hopeless victims perished with the others. I'm glad it was a long time ago, Lamont. Twelfth century. What's this in a leather folder? Hmm. Lamont. Yes? Look, 
A photo of Michael Welch in his youth. Why, it's exactly like... Like the portrait of the Duke of Ancona. I knew I'd seen that face. Michael Welch looks like the Duke. They have it. Yes, they're... They're much alike. Welch is older now and grayer. That's why I didn't see the likeness before. Margot, do you see what this means? What? Why, no. By a twist of fate, although they're not related, Michael Welch is a physical duplicate of Michael, Duke of Ancona, who lived in the 12th century. You mean he And thinks... Welch believes he is the Duke himself reincarnated. He's made a study of it in the Duke's history until he believes it. In his manner, when we're discussing reincarnation at the dinner table, I'm... I'm sure he really believes it. You see, the present circumstances here are parallel to those at the time of the historic tragedy. This is a party. Yes. The guests are all his friends except two. You and me. Oh, the same as the story. It's so similar. Oh. Isn't amusing, Margot, with it. With the two unexpected guests, man and woman. Welch tried to get us to leave. Yes. But we stayed. We followed the pattern of the tale of the Duke in the 12th century. Same situation eight centuries later. The question is, how far does Michael Welch mean to imitate the Duke of Ancona? Are we all in danger? But Lamont, that's fantastic. I've got to find out, Margot. But how? By watching Michael Welch tonight as the shadow going to investigate this house and find out exactly how Michael Welsh intends to reenact the old tragedy. His belief that he is the reincarnated soul of the Duke of Ancona. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back with the shadow in just a moment, and later we'll meet our guest, Commissioner John H. Morris. But first... I want to say something to every motorist listening in. Remember, when you're driving in your car, the road may be perfectly dry one minute, and then... <laughs> down comes the rain. The road that was safe a minute ago may become a dangerous skid track. Yes. The shadow knows that a skid strikes like lightning. Don't take unnecessary chances on wet, slippery roads. It pays to play safe. Before you experience that pit-of-the-stomach feeling... When the car you're driving skids wildly over a wet, slippery road, equip your car with new Goodrich Safety Silvertowns with the Lifesaver Tread. That's the way to get the quickest, safest stops you've ever had in wet weather. And here's why. The Lifesaver Tread of the new Silvertown has a truly amazing action on wet pavements. For as the spiral bars of the tread roll over the pavement, they act like a battery of windshield wipers. Sweep the water right and left from under the tire. Force it out through the deep grooves. Make a dry track for the rubber to grip. You'll never know what the word stop really means until you've felt the grip of the Lifesaver tread on wet pavements. Protect your family against dangerous skids before it's too late. Put Goodrich Safety Silvertowns on your car tomorrow. clock, Mr. Welch. Time for me to get going. Good. Now you understand what you're to do, Tony? Yes, sir. The dynamite's already planted. Enough to do the job easy. Here's the money I promised you. Oh, yeah. Okay. There'll be a bonus if the explosion goes up exactly as we planned. Oh, don't worry none, Mr. Welch. It will. All I gotta do now is throw the switch. All right. Get in the car and be on your way. Yeah. Hey, there's a light in the house, sir. Won't someone hear me drive off? That's my private room. Don't worry about that. Oh, okay. Good luck, Tony. Yeah, thanks. Listen for the blow-off. <laughs> I shall listen, all right. It's too bad that the noise will awaken my guests, but soon, soon, nothing will disturb them. Now to get back to the laboratory. <laughs> so you are planning something, Michael Welch. Still following the pattern set by the Duke of Ancona. The shadow must visit that private room. But first, I must warn Margot on the shortwave radio. Margot! Margot! Shadow calling Margot Lane. I'm in the garden. Fifteen minutes ago, Michael Welch sent a servant to set off an explosion. 
I must get into Welch's private study. I shall need your help. There's the explosion. Welch's man has carried out his orders. Now I must wait and see why the explosion was planned and what it blew up. Look at all that water there. Oh, my goodness. Mr. Hall being flooded. He's swept away. We'll all be drowned. Can you hear that explosion? Mr. Cranston, Mr. Cranston. Yes, Mrs. Bell? Do you think there's any danger? I can't swim a stroke. I'd perish in that rushing water. Calm yourself, Myra. I'm ashamed of you. Well, that's all right for you, Margot. You can swim like a fish. I doubt if the house will be swept away, Mrs. Bell. Where's Michael? Yes, has anyone seen well? Well, here he comes now. Oh, Michael, isn't this the most terrible thing? Steady, everybody, quiet. There's nothing to get excited about. Nothing oh to get goodness. excited about when we may all be drowned at any minute. There's no danger. The house is safe. Up here on the hill, we're out of reach of the waters. But we can't get out of the house. No, no. We're all stuck here for at least three days, three Mr. Days. Cranston. Until the waters subside. Well, let's phone for help. The wires are down. The flood carried the poles away. Margot. Yes, Lamont. Welsh's man blew up the dam and flooded the whole countryside. The old plot is still working out. Now we're all prisoners in the Duke's castle. With no hope of escaping. And next, next should come the plague. Oh, well, that's just the limit. Mosquitoes. What's the matter, Myra? A mosquito bit me. That's the last straw. Margot, I think Welsh is going back to his private room. Yes, Lamont. Stay with the guests. The shadow must follow him. Hard, Professor Charles? Yes. Oh, yes, Michael. I, I'm feeding the serum to the last batch of mosquitoes. Ah. Hey, wait, wait, what was that, sir? Uh, door stuck for a second. There it is. The deadly mosquito I let loose in the hall just bit one of my guests. A lady. Mm, the lady will be sick very shortly. Yes. And then, when the time is ripe, we'll let loose all the mosquitoes in the laboratory and... Add a new game to our weekend party. Mm, there are over ten screen boxes of mosquitoes, all filled with germs, ready for your guests. Good. Now they're trapped by the flood outside, they can't run away. Mm, now we'll have our revenge. My dear Professor Charles, my revenge is written in history. No one can change the course of events. It was all predestined centuries ago. You can let loose the other mosquitoes as soon as it's light. I want to see them swarming through the house. Yes, yes, all will be ready. Take good care of our winged pets. What are you feeding those mosquitoes, Professor Charles? Yeah, uh, what? What is it that will be let loose on the guests in this house? Who, who talked? Where are you? I am here, Professor Charles. I am the shadow. But where? It's just a voice. I I can't see you. I am here, even if you can't see me. And I warn you, the mad plot of Michael Welsh cannot succeed. You and he will be punished for your crime. Why, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't lie. What germs are you feeding all those mosquitoes? Go away, go away. I'm an old man. For a moment you frightened me with your strange voice. But I'm too old for fear. To hold for everything but revenge. No one shall rob me of that. Yes, old man, someone will. The shadow. <laughs> Margot. Yes, Lamont. Margot, the Duke of Ancona's plot is being followed to the very letter. Oh. Welsh's private room is a chemical laboratory. He and the old man we saw at the window have figured out some modern form of plague. Plague? I wonder if that's what's wrong with Mrs. Bell. Is she ill? Yes, I, I was hurrying to her with this medicine. I, I wish you'd take a look I at will. her. I will. Things be the matter. I don't know. She's running a fearfully high fever, and, and she's such a strange color. Strange color? Quick, I'm see her. Well, her room's right down here. Hurry, Margot. If my guess is right, Welsh's form of plague is as deadly as the Duke of Ancona's. Wait. I'll open the door. Is that you, Margot? Oh, I'm so sick. It's all right, Mrs. Bell. Shut the door. I've seen enough. Lamont, what is it? Yellow fever, Margot. Oh. We must destroy those mosquitoes in the laboratory. Michael Welsh thinks that he is the Duke of Ancona, reincarnated. He plans to repeat the tragedy of centuries ago and infect every guest in this house with the disease. Come, Argo, we must hurry. Here, yeah, Margo. Here's the laboratory. The door's locked. Wait, I stole the key. What are you going to do when we get inside? Listen, the row of screen boxes on the table... Get the old man away from them, over by the window. 
I'll be with you as the shadow. All right. Don't speak to me until I speak. Here's the key. Lock the door behind us. Quietly, Margo, quietly. Step in. Yes. Who is that? Who's there? Well, hello. You must be Professor Charles. Oh, you, you, you can't come in here, young lady. This room is private. Get out. Get out. Here, here. Where are you going? I want to see how the flood looks from this window. Come away from there. You must leave this room at once. Look, Professor. You get a wonderful view of the water from here. Will I have to put you out that door by force? Professor, please. Don't mm. cry violence. I'm strong. You're old and weak. Yes, yeah, you're, you're right. I, I can't fight you, young woman. I am too weak. Yeah, but Michael and I have a few tricks left. What do you mean? You'll see. In the morning when I release my mosquitoes from their boxes... Are you sure you will release yes, them? Yes, 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 these boxes here. Here, come, I'll show you. <gasps> Who's been at these boxes? Is something wrong? They're dead. They're dead, our, our messengers of death. Did you watch this? Acid's been poured over every box. Yes. You, you did this. You wrecked my life's work. No, <laughs> Professor, she didn't do it. I did. Who is... The shadow poured acid over your little pets, Professor Charles. The shadow again? <gasps> Open this door. Open it. It's Michael. Michael. Michael, they've been destroyed. Break in the door. Open the door. Shadow, it's Michael Welsh. Yes, Margot, quickly. Hide behind that cabinet. Stay there, Margot. Yes, Shadow. Break it in, Michael. Break it in. Break it in. Oh, Michael. Michael, uh, our plan has failed. Failed? Lie. Can't fail. Yeah, but it has. Look, all our mosquitoes dead. They're dead, dead, Michael. What? Dead. Who poured acid on those boxes? It was you, Professor. Oh, no, 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 Michael. No, it was the shadow. The shadow, what are you talking about? Who is the shadow? A voice, Michael. A man you can't see. But he talks to you. He discovered all about our plan and... And he killed the mosquito. You're lying, Professor. You, with your crazy story of the shadow. You did it yourself. No, oh, no, no, Michael, no. Charles, you betrayed me. You've robbed me, the reincarnated Duke of Ancona, of his revenge. You've ruined the plot, you traitor. Oh, no, Michael, Michael, put down that gun. You won't live to laugh at me, you treacherous old devil. The pattern is broken, Michael Welch. Who's woke? Where are you? I am here, Welch. I am the shadow. The shadow? Then his story was true. You're, you're the one who... Yes, Michael Welsh. The shadow does exist. I have destroyed your plague. Give up your mad dream. You are not the Duke of Ancona reincarnated into the body of Michael Welsh. That's a lie. I am. The pattern of the old tragedy you wanted to reenact is broken. There will be no plague, Welsh. I, I, I must be the Duke come back to life. Didn't I trap my friends here just as I did centuries ago? But there is no plague to inflict upon them, Welsh. The story is not the same. The Duke of Ancona is long dead. No. No. I, I, I'm i the Duke. Reincarnated. You cannot be. There is no plague. The story will not end as the Duke's ended. If I'm not the Duke, why, I'm nothing. Forget this insane theory, Welch. Drop your gun. No, no. The pattern is... is it's not the same. I, I'm not the Duke. You hear? I'm not the Duke. Welch, drop that gun. No. Other than fail, I'll die. I'll die. <laughs> Lamont! Lamont! Yes, is Margot. He... Yes. Don't look. Oh, but Professor Charles... He too is dead. Oh, how horrible. No, Margot. This is a fitting conclusion for the mad plot conceived by a man who thought he was the reincarnated soul of someone who died centuries before. Whether the criminal builds his crime on historic patterns or not, the relentless hand of justice reaches out with a punishment all crime deserves. The punishment of death. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Shadow Program has the honor and privilege of presenting to you today's distinguished guest. He is Commissioner John H. Morris, in charge of the Juvenile Aid Bureau of the New York City Police Department. Commissioner Morris. Thank you. First, Mr. Roberts... Tell me, uh, how does the shadow do it? Well, I'm sorry, Commissioner Morris, but that's the shadow's secret. All right, Mr. Roberts. But now, seriously, I'm grateful for this opportunity to congratulate the sponsors of the shadow for putting on such a fine program. It's not only mighty entertaining, but it's also doing an excellent job of showing young Americans the folly and futility of lawlessness. And that's what your job is, too, isn't it? That's right. Crime prevention is the business of the Juvenile Aid Bureau of New York City. That's a pretty big order. Tell us, Commissioner, how do you do it? 
In brief, by putting into operation measures for the rehabilitation and adequate social treatment of juvenile delinquents and instilling in boys and girls a respect for law and appreciation of good citizenship. Well, tell us, Commissioner, how do the children react to this plan? They love it. Our 120 police athletic league supervised play streets and play centers boil with activity from morning till night. And that's not all. In addition, the league has made the police department uniform a symbol of friendship between those men who wear it and every member of the PAL. Thank you very much, Commissioner Morris. I'm sure everyone listening enjoyed hearing your opinion on this topic of such vital interest to us all. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> all the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, while you're getting set for The Shadow's latest thriller, let me say a few words about that great new Goodrich Silvertown tire. Because believe me, motorists, this new kind of tire is making history. It takes care of skid and blowout problems like they have never been taken care of before. And here's proof positive. The engineers of the famous independent Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory tested the regular and premium price tires of the nation's six largest tire manufacturers. The results? Listen. No other tire tested, regardless of price, came up to the new Goodrich Silvertown in skid resistance. What's more, this great tire gave more non-skid mileage than any other tire tested in its price class, averaging 19.1% more miles before the tires wore smooth. That's the same as saying this new Silvertown gives you every sixth mile free. Ride on the safest thing on wheels, 
the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown. The shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Mark of the Bat. Alexei, come. Come in the house out of the night air. I am coming, Marie. The dogs were restless, whimpering. It must be the storm coming. It is more than the storm, as you know it, Alexei. I'm not sure. Why aren't you in bed asleep? There'll be no sleep in this house tonight. Or any night. Then you've seen the great bats, too? Yes, I've seen the farmer's cattle. Bloodless, dead in the fields. And the white comb of the dead rooster. Ah, it was the same on the farm of my father in Croatia. Alexei. Why did this Dr. Vickers send away his stepfather's servants? Why does he pay us so much to stay in this house? Why do we stay knowing what we know? Jobs are hard to find, Marie. But I think we go soon, when the master of the house dies. It cannot be long, and I am not sorry. It is his own doing. He brought the bats here, set them free to kill. And now they take his life from him, in the night, in the darkness... Only for his daughter am I sorry. She is young. She was beautiful. But each dawn finds her more like those things from the grave. Have you seen the mark of the vampire on her, Marie? Yes. Only this morning. On the throat as she lay sleeping. The sins of the father. It is his punishment. The great bats are children of Satan. He brought them here from the caves he found in that strange country he wrote books about. Yeah. And he laughed at the stories I told him. The vampire bat is a thing of evil, leagued with the devil, stealing the blood of the living, that the dead may go on living in their graves. The storm is coming, Alex. Well, it will drive the bats back into the cave in the mountain. That much is good. <gasps> Marie! What is it? A shadow passed across the moon. Oh, the clouds of the storm, me. No, no. A bat like a great bird. It is an omen, Marie, an omen. The dog howls. Yes, the dog howls. Quick, light the candle at the crucifix. Yes, yes, the crucifix. Uh, here comes Dr. Vickers. Yes, Alexei. It is quite fitting that you light the candle. Say a prayer, Marie. Dr. Vigas, is, is the master. Major Stevens, is he? Yes, Marie. My esteemed stepfather, Major Stevens, is dead. Lamont Cranston, we've come 200 miles up into these spooky mountains. Why? I've been reading the obituary columns, Margot. As a result, we're going to visit the home of a man who once had a very strange hobby. Oh, so Lamont Cranston, the amateur criminologist, has been reading between the lines again. Who died recently? The corpse, Margot, is Major Stevens, a noted explorer and zoologist. Oh. Yes. Before I tell you anything more, let me ask you a question. Yes? Do you believe in vampires? What? Creatures with the power to leave the grave? transform themselves into bats and draw from the flesh of the living blood to feed the bodies of the restless dead? Lamont, are you serious? Quite. Well, of course I don't believe it. What's all this about? Are you guessing or, or do you know? I'm going on a curious mixture of theory and fact. I've known about Stevens for years. He led an expedition of five men into the mountains of Ecuador, came back alone, the cage full of vampire bats, big ones. For years, he's been breeding them. Oh, a cheerful hobby, I must say. It's become an obsession. Six months ago, I read that a neighboring farmer sued him, claiming those vampire bats killed three of his cattle. But Lamont, that's preposterous. No, Margot, it isn't. There are authentic cases where cattle have been killed by blood-sucking vampire bats. And you think Major Stevens' pet bats killed those cattle and, 
And kill the Major as well? It's possible. All of which leads to what, Lamont? Who are we going to call on tonight? Not Major Stevens, I hope. No, the Major is safely interred in his grave. Oh, you make it sound so cozy. Stevens had a daughter, Claire Stevens. I've checked up. She's suffering from the same ailment that supposedly killed her father, anemia. Oh. Stevens was wealthy. Claire's his heir, but she's under age, only 20. And there's a guardian in the picture, Dr. Vickers, uh, who also happens to be the Major's stepson. I think I'm beginning Apparently to see. Apparently, Vickers is running things. He's even discharged the family servants and hired an old Slavic couple. Why? And they're Croats, Margot, not very far removed from the atmosphere of their native land, where for centuries human vampires have been accepted fact. Now, do you see what I'm driving at? Yes. Yes, I'm afraid I do. Claire Stevens is being led to believe that she's a victim of human vampires. Yes. Whereas, actually, she's being bled to death by the giant vampire bats. Is that it, Lamont? That's right, Margot. Oh. It's just a breed of very large bats. I see. Oh, this is a lonely road. We haven't passed a car in ages. My little father, huh? Good heavens. Oh. Oh, what's wrong, Lamont? Look. Look, a man uh, lying there beside the road. Wait here, Margot. Maybe a hold-up gag. Well, what's wrong with him? Has he been hit? Beaten up, I think. Wait, I'll, I'll help you with him. Is he alive? Yes, but unconscious. Lamont, there's a paper clutched in his hand. See what it is. Listen to this, Margot. Dave, if you love me, come and take me away from this awful house. I can't explain, only come. If you don't, you'll never see me alive again. Signed, Claire. Claire Stevens! Oh, Lamont, this boy must have tried to help us. Yes, and failed. What are we going to do, Lamont? Drive him back to the last town we passed? No, Margot, he needs a doctor, and I think the logical man to patch him up is the one who may have had a hand in this. Vickers. You're going to take him to the Stevens house? No, you are, Margot. Oh, but, but you'll be with me in that house. Yes, Margot, but in my role of the shadow. It'd be better if you're not Margot Lane. Pretend to be an old friend of Claire Stevens. If yes. she's in danger, she won't give you away. All right. Help me get the boy into the car. <coughs> then I'll drive. <coughs> Lamont! What's the matter, Margot? Lamont, look on his throat. Good heavens. Oh, a bat. Fasten to his throat. Kill it, Lamont. Yes. Yes, Margot. One of Major Stevens' pets. A vampire bat. Ladies and gentlemen, while we leave the shadow for a moment... Here's a brief reminder that when you want real tire safety, halfway measures don't go. There's no such thing as saving half your life. The shadow knows. Beware. In these days of high speeds and super highways, you need protection against both skids and blowouts every time you get behind the wheel of your car. And motorists, the tire that will give you life-saving protection against both of these driving hazards is the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown. For remember... Only Silvertowns give you the skid protection of the Lifesaver tread. This amazing new Goodrich development protects you against the hazard zone of motoring, where a slippery film of water on the road can make complete command of your car almost impossible. The never-ending spiral bars of this Lifesaver tread act like a whole battery of windshield wipers. They sweep the water right and left, force it out through the deep drainage grooves, make a dry track for the rubber to grip, you stop quicker, safer on a wet pavement than you've ever stopped before. And don't forget, adding one safety feature to another, Silvertowns also give you the famous golden ply protection against dangerous high-speed blowouts. Why ride on anything but the safest thing on wheels, especially when Silvertowns give you these two great life-saving features at no extra cost? Play safe with Goodrich, spelled... G-O-O-D-R-I-C-H. Goodrich, Safety, Silvertown. Alexei, who drove Dave Henderson here? A young girl, Dr. Vickers. She says she's a friend of Miss Stevens. Mm, a friend of Claire's, eh, Alexei? Yes. And young Dave Henderson. Huh. Odd that she should come here tonight... Strange that she should find him on the road. Where are they? In the room where the Major worked with the bats, Dr. Vickers. Good. Nothing could be better. It will save me considerable trouble. I lock the door. Unlock it. Then go back and watch Miss Claire's room. See, she does not leave it. Why? <laughs> What's the matter, Alexei? Your hand is shaking. You're afraid. Yes. Yes, and you would be afraid, too. 
Those caged bats in there, they, they killed the Major. I know, I know. They're creatures of the devil. Nonsense. There's nothing to worry about. I have released the good Major's pets. Taken them out of their cages and sent them back to the bottomless pit in the grotto. Yes, but a bat, like a bird of evil, flew across the moon the night the Major died. It was an omen. An omen of death. <laughs> Tell that to Miss Claire. She'll believe you. And watch carefully, Alexei. Two, perhaps three of those bats may fly across the moon tonight. More omens of death. But now, go upstairs. See that I am not disturbed. Yes, Doctor. The girl is there, at the far end of the room with the young man. Doctor, are you Dr. Vickers? Yes. I understand you brought a young man here, victim of some hit-and-run driver. No, it's been beaten. I'm afraid his skull is fractured, and not only yes, that... Yes, 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 yes. Alexei told me your fantastic story of finding a giant bat drawing his life blood from his throat. But it's true. The marks are still on his throat. Look there. Hmm, hmm. Still unconscious. Has he spoken at all? No, but don't stand there. Do something. You're a doctor, or so I was told. By whom? Oh, yes, you're a friend of Miss Stevens. Of course you would know. Of course. Where is Claire? Sleeping. You were coming to call on her at this late hour. Why? Well, we're old friends. I, I heard of her father's death. I... Do you know this young man? I... No. No, I don't. Hmm, that's odd. This man is David Henderson, Miss Stephens' fiancé. Oh, well... Well, you see, I... I haven't seen Claire for several years. How many? Why, for... Oh, not for... Oh, three years. Oh, but don't stand there questioning me. Do something for him. There'll be plenty of time for that. I'm more interested in you and just why you happened to pick this night to visit such an old and dear friend. A friend who apparently never spoke of Dave Henderson, to whom she's been engaged for many years. A childhood sweetheart. Well, you... Yes, I see. I see you are lying. Who are you? What do you want in this house? I want you to treat that boy. Yes, I will treat him. In good time and in my own way. But first, I think you need my attention. Keep away from me. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to kill that boy. Oh, now I'm beginning to understand. So you know... Yes, I know. You know too much. Too much to ever leave this house. Oh, a lucky interruption for you. It will give you a few minutes' grace, young woman, and a chance to see your dear friend, Claire Stevens. Who's you and Dr. Vickers and Dave? Who is that woman? Let go of me. He's in there. I know he is. Come, Dr. Vickers, you stay in your room. Come. Oh. What's going on out here, Alexei? Uh, doctor, I couldn't stop her. She tricked me. She ran down here. I'll take her back. No, come. I won't go. You've got Dave here. It's all right, Alexei. Let her come in. You wait out in the hall. Oh. oh. Yes, Claire, my dear, Dave is here. You can see him. And there is someone else, an old friend of yours. An old, an old friend? Yes, that young woman there. Oh, well, you don't seem to recognize her. Perhaps it's been so long since you've seen each other. Claire, uh, don't you remember me? Grace Wilson, we, we went to school together. What? I heard you were in trouble. I thought I might be able to help. What? What? Oh, oh, oh of course. Grace. Grace Wilson. I I'm so glad you're here, Grace. But, Dave, you said I could see him. Where is he? There, on the couch. Dave. Oh, Dave, Dave, darling. It's Claire. Claire. Oh, is... is he dead? No, but he may die if we don't get help. Oh. Revive him. This Dr. Vickers won't help. Why won't you do something? Dave's hurt. His head's cut open. Dr. Vickers won't <laughs> help because he did it. What? He wants Dave Henderson to die. Just as he wants me out of the way now that I've discovered his secret. And you, Claire Stevens... You're marked for death. No. I can see it in your face. You're as pale as a ghost already, half bled to death. You're a victim, too. A victim of vampire bats. No. No, it can't be. Not that. I I've been ill. Dr. Vickers has been treating me. Your father died of Dr. Vickers' treatments. Dr. Vickers, you... Why do you look at me like that? Why, my dear child. Oh, then, then it is true. Those sedatives and the open window... That was so the giant bats could come from the well in the grotto oh, and... you've been listening to the fantastic tales of Marie and Alexei, my dear. Monstrous nightmares out of a ghoulish past. Miss Stevens, don't listen to him. He's a murderer. We've got to get your fiancé out of this house. But he won't let us go. The door's locked. He has the key. Yes, my dear, you are quite right. The door is locked. I have the key. The only way out is through that door leading to the tunnel in the cave. 
to the bottomless pit your father so aptly named the well of the bats. Father, seal that tunnel. When the bats escape. Yes, but I opened it again. It will come in very handy tonight. The storms have kept the bats in the grotto for many nights now. They must be very hungry for blood. (gasps) What a feast they will have. Come, Claire. No. The vampires are tired of coming to you. It is time you visited them. Oh, David, get back. Keep away from you. Stupid heroics will not save you. Keep back, young woman, or I shall have to shoot you. (laughs) The bats won't mind. (laughs) Not so long as the blood in your body is still warm. (laughs) Come, Claire. Come with me. No. No. (laughs) Very well. Perhaps you would rather follow your beloved David. I'll take him first. No, no, don't. He doesn't know anything. If you'll only let him go, I'll... Oh, no. I thought that would bring you to me. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Vickers. Dr. Vickers. You are startled, Doctor. (laughs) I see in your eyes and read in your reeling mind... Questions, no. questions beating in your brain like the black wings of your destroyers. Who am I? Where am I? Is this voice you hear real, or the trickery of a mind warped and twisted by the remorse of murder done, and murders yet to come? No, no. <laughs> the gun in your hand trembles, Doctor Vickers. Your lips are dry. But you. Who are you? The Shadow, Dr. Vickers. The Shadow! The Shadow! It would seem you have heard of the Shadow, Doctor. Yes. Yes, I've heard of you, Shadow. Do you believe what you have heard? Yes. I know all about your devilish tricks of mesmerism. Hypnotic influence. I know you're here in this room, but I can't see you. I know my gun isn't any use against you, but that won't stop me. I'm going into the grotto, and I'm taking these girls with me. Both of them. Try to stop me, Shadow, and I'll shoot them both! All right, Claire. And you too, Miss Wilson, or whoever you really are. Quick! Get through this door, unless you want me to use this gun. No, don't! We'd better do as he says, Miss Stevens. Come on. All right. All right, Shadow. Let's see you follow me through this door. (laughs) It bolts on the inside. And by the time you've broken it down, the vampire bats will be feasting on these two women. The only ones who stand between me and Stevens' fortune. It should have been mine in the first place. And now it will be. It will be mine. Don't be too sure, Dr. Vickers. For the grotto will be filled with shadows. Shadows of the living. Shadows of the dead. Listen, David Henderson. You came to save your fiancée. She's in danger. Dr. Vickers has taken her to the grotto, to the well of the bats. Claire gone into the cave? Yes. Who am I talking to? There's no one here. I must be out of my mind. No. There is someone here. The shadow. The shadow? Yes. Yes. Don't be alarmed because you cannot see me. Even to those I try to help, I must remain unseen, unknown, for their own safety. There is no time to explain the whys and wherefores of my presence. I'm here to help you and your fiancé. If we don't get into the grotto and stop him, Vickers will kill Claire Stevens and a girl who is with her. No. Kill them and drop them into the well of the bats. That, that heavy door leads to the pit. Come on. I can't follow that way. I tried. It's bolted on the other side. Is there another way into the grotto? Any other way of reaching the pit? Well, yeah. Yeah, there is. One other way. Major Stevens showed me years ago. Where? Up on the side of the mountain, there's an opening. Shorter that way. Maybe we can get in that way and head Vickers off before he reaches the pit. Come on, I'll show you the way. If I get my hands on Vickers, the, the bats will have their feast tonight on him. Shadow. Shadow. 
We're almost there. Shadow. I am still close to you. Go on. It may be too late. Be careful along here. This ledge is slippery. We're getting near the pit. How deep is this pit, this well of the bats? No one knows. Once Major Stevens and I dropped a weighted kite string down into it. A thousand feet of string. It didn't touch bottom. Shadow, look. There's a light. A torch down the passageway. That must be Vickers. It's in the big chamber. That's where the pit is. We're not too late, see? Your fiancé and the other girl is with him. Wait, stop here. Well, he's forcing them toward the pit. He's going to kill both of them. I tell you, let me go. No, you've done your part. Stay here. No, no, I won't. I won't, I tell you. You must. If you understand if Vickers saw you coming, he'd shoot you down. You'd be signing the death warrant of your fiancé and the other girl. Oh, no, I'll, I'll get him. I'll get him before he sees me. Let, let go of me, Shadow. Let me... Sorry, I had to knock you out like that, Henderson, but... It's the only way. They'll kill you with this, Dr. Vickers. The police will find it out. They'll hang you. (laughs) My dear Claire, you see, to prove a murder has been committed, there must be some trace of the body. The vampires will leave little in the way of evidence. Have you forgotten the shadow, Dr. Vickers? Do you think he'll let you live to enjoy the fruits of this ghastly thing you're about to do? So you're still counting on the shadow to save you. You may not be able to save us. But you'll never get away from him unless you follow us into that pit. Oh, hope and faith die hard. I've been wondering why one of you didn't try to get away from me. So I would have an excuse to shoot you down. Oh, you need an excuse. No, not really. But there is something fascinating about watching the reactions of people who are about to die. (laughs) But now I give you your choice. Turn, take each other's hand, and walk straight ahead into the darkness... Or stand there while I count. Oh, no. (laughs) No. Not ten. That is too definite. Too certain. (laughs) I will merely count number after number until my trigger finger obeys the impulse to shoot. No! No, don't! Oh, Dave! Dave! Oh, she fainted. That should make it easier for you. And for her. That's right. Hold her up. Steady her. One... To what a feast the vampires will have. The the bats. They're waiting for far down in the pit. Five. By the thousands they cling to the clammy walls. Six. Hanging heads downward with folded wings. Seven, waiting. Eight, waiting. <laughs> yes, Vickers, waiting. Waiting for you. For you? You got through. It's useless to struggle, Vickers. Your trigger finger obeys the impulse to kill, but the gun hammer won't fall because my hand is on it. Vickers... You should have used an automatic. Oh, you... You tell me... Yes. If only I... Yes, if you could only break loose, try it and your arm will snap like the stem of a pipe. Let me go. Let's go. I knew you'd find a way, Shadow. You can let go of it now. Well, is she all right? Yes, she just fainted, that's all. Oh. Oh, there you are, Vickers. So the Shadow got you. Well, you'll hang for what you did to Claire's father, but first I'm going to pay her for torturing... No, you won't! No, you won't! Stop! And I won't hang! Stand where you are, I'll shoot! Go ahead! Shoot! Shoot me! The shadow was right! The vampire bats are waiting! Waiting for their feast! For me! And I won't disappoint them! They'll have their feast! They'll have their feast! Now! Now! You like this thing I'm playing, Margot? Yes, Lamont. Lamont? Mm, yes, Margot? Now that Dr. Vickers is dead and Claire Stevens is out of that awful house, what's going to happen to the Major's little pet? Oh, those vampire bats won't kill any more cattle. Or men, Margot. Sort of that while you and David Henderson were getting Claire to the hospital. Yes, but how, Lamont? <laughs> like this. Dynamite. Yes, yes. I found it in Stevens' tool house. The explosion... Filled the well of the bats with hundreds of tons of rock. Sealed forever. There will be no more 
black wings across the moon. No more marks of the bat on the throats of sleeping victims. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Ladies and gentlemen, the shadow can never be sure of what lies ahead of him. But there's one thing every motorist can be sure of, and that's meeting plenty of wet weather driving before the year's over. Well, you can give yourself greater skid protection if you make sure your car is equipped with those new Goodrich Silvertown tires. The tires with the sensational Lifesaver tread. This amazing tread has never-ending spiral bars that act like a battery of windshield wipers. They sweep the water from under the tire force it out through the deep groove, give you a drier, safer road surface for the rubber to grip. And when you're thus protected against the slippery hazard zone of motoring, you get the quickest non-skid stops you've ever had. Furthermore, Silvertowns are the only tires in the world that give you the famous blowout protection of the Goodrich Golden Ply. So why take chances with either skids or blowouts when you can get protection against both of these driving hazards in Silvertown? At no extra cost. The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aid, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Mine Hunters. Zito, let me in. Come. Zito, why you make me come down here to the Panama waterfront in the middle of a foggy night like this? Why is Captain Bogart here? Captain Bogart is no longer satisfied to take orders, Varita. He wants to know why my men spend so much time taking soundings off the entrance of the Panama Canal. Why this fishing trawler he commands does not catch more fish. Aye, and what's the idea of contacting the Trump steamer that's been standing offshore? You are paid well to do as you're told and be silent, Captain Bogart. Not enough for what I think you're mixed up in. And what is that, Captain? Spying. Sounding out the defenses and laying secret mines off the Panama Canal, that's what. 
You know too much, Captain. Much too much. <laughs> and the sharks that infest the waters of the shore of La Boca will welcome you. <laughs> Come in, Riker. We're glad to see you. Did you fix it up for me to get that deckhand job in the trawler? Yes. <laughs> it is all arranged. Say, what's the idea? Why the gun? Just this. We know you are not a deckhand. You are Lieutenant Cartwright of the Naval Intelligence Division. So, you found out about me before I could get the goods on you and your spy ring, eh? So sorry, Lieutenant. It is the fortunes of espionage. <laughs> Major Baker to see you, Commander. Sure, I'm right in. Yeah, good morning, Major. Morning, Commander. I just heard one of your cutters found the body of Lieutenant Cartwright washed up on the beach near La Boca. Yes, one of our best men. I beg pardon, Commander. Another message from the Navy Department. Mm Mm-hmm. It makes the third today. Good grief. Now what? This message. The Navy Department sent two men down here a month ago. They haven't reported in the last ten days. Oh, what use are our elaborate defenses of the Panama Canal if every potential enemy knows as much about them as we do? You're right. We've got to wipe out this spy ring, but how? Every intelligence officer we've put on the job has come back empty-handed. Yes, or dead. There must be some way, some man smart enough and nervy enough to deal with these spies, these killers. Well, Margot, we're almost at our destination. Yes, Sir Mark. Any ideas yet as to how you're going to try and locate the leaders of that spy ring operating in and around the canal zone? Not so loud, Margot. No, I have no definite plan yet. But I thought it was time the Shadow took a part in finding out who is at the head of this spy ring. Hope I can be of some help to you. You've always been a big help to Lamont Cranston, Margot. And this time... You may be helping our country as well. Waiter, waiter. Si, senor. We have a check. Uh, si, senor. Pronto. Muy pronto. Mm, Lamont, I love the way these Panama natives say, quickly, and then take all day. <laughs> Life, life moves very slowly in the tropics, Margo. So does criminal investigation, it would seem. We've been here a week. Yes, and we've haunted every cafe in Panama. The best of the lowest dives along the waterfront. You know, Lamont, if if these international spies are half as clever as you seem to think they are, they may be suspicious of us. (laughs) It's a very old axiom among hunters. If you're after a killer, whether he be a wolf, a tiger or a man, if you can't find him, make it easy for him to find you. Oh, in other words, Lamont, we're just a couple of walking invitations for a shot in the dark or a knife in the back. Is that it? Mm, not quite. I do want people around here to get a bit curious about us. Why? Are you scared? A bit. This waterfront sector gives me the creeps, especially the people in this cafe. Oof. It looked like they'd slit your throat for the fun of it. Uh, well, oh, yes, of course. Armand, who is she? Who? who? Who is who? That Spanish dancer you've been watching for the last ten minutes. Uh, that's, that's Verita. She owns this cafe, and according to rumor, she's one of the most notorious characters in Panama. How did you find that out, Lamont? Well, after Lamont Cranston, the amateur criminologist, has seen his assistant safely to a room in the hotel... The shadow has been prowling the back streets of Panama. Careful, Lamont. The waiter's coming back. Mm, it's about time. Your bill is two dollars fifty cents, American, senor. Here you are. Keep the change. Gracias, senor. Gracias. Uh, you will uh, be back again, senor. Maybe. Why? What makes you ask? Only that for three nights now you have come, senor. You like the cafe of Senorita Varita, see? Si? You have a very interesting place. Yes. I think we will be back. 
long, Margot. Get out of here. Buenas noches, senor, senorita. Buenas noches. Manuel. Senorita Varese. Tell Senor Zito here what the American say. He say you have a most interesting place. He come back again, Senorita. You hear, Zito? Yes. That will be all, Manuel. Go back to your table. See, si, see, si, Senor Zito. Zito, what have you learned of this man and his pretty companion? Very little, Varita. At the hotel, they are registered as John Hardy of New York and Miss Martha Adams of Boston. The rooms, you have had them searched? Yes, the head porter. He's one of our men. Mm. He found nothing. No suspicious papers. Then what makes you think they're government agents? I have good reason to suspect this man, if not the young woman, Varita. So? Why is it so? Each night he has seen the young lady to her room, and then he has left the hotel again. Where does he go? Three nights now my men have followed him, but each night he has walked into the shadows and vanished. You talk like a fool. Men do not vanish in Panama unless we see to it. But this man does. Last night he came to the waterfront, walked out on the fisherman's wharf. Three of my men thought they had him cornered, but when they searched the wharf, he was not there. <laughs> Perhaps he had wings and flew away, or jumped into the water and drowned himself, and it is ghost we saw here tonight. No, he was there. He spoke to my men, but they could not see him, could only hear his voice and his laughter. Laughter such as you might hear from the devil himself. Do not invent lies to cover your stupidity. It is not a lie. This man can move into the shadows, become as a shadow itself, <laughs> unseen. <laughs> Do not laugh, Varita, it is the truth. There is such a man. I have heard of him and of his powers. To those in our profession, he is the most dangerous man alive. And he is here. Here in Panama, I tell you. Who are you talking about? Perhaps. You, too, have heard of him, Varita. He is the terror of the criminal world of America. He succeeds where police and secret service and agents of counter-espionage have failed. He is a man all men fear, yet no one has ever seen. And his name, Varita, it is the Shadow. The Shadow, huh? Yes, the Shadow. And he is here in Panama after us. And unless we find a way of trapping him, he will trap us. And do you think this John Hardy of New York is the shadow? Or an accomplice. Zito, the trawler Vendetta, it puts to sea tonight, yes? In one hour. This girl, it uh, might be well if she went along. <laughs> I see. You think she will make fine bait for a trap to catch the shadow? It can be arranged. It will not be difficult to get her out of the hotel. Good. And um, on board the trawler in the open sea after dawn, there will be no shadows. Get her. Bring her to the trawler. I will meet you there. You go to sea with us? <laughs> see. If the shadow appears, it will be interesting to see if his powers are strong enough. To save him from the tiger sharks that swarm the waters of Panama. Portal, you know what you have to do? Si, senor Zito. When you have taken the girl away, I am to run quick to the room of Senor Hardy, her friend, and tell him some men take her to the steam troll of Vendetta. Yes. Wait five, now ten minutes, and then warn him. I understand. Good. Now, which is the senorita's room? There. I have a key to that open door there to the patio. Unlock it. My men will do the rest. Si, senor. Pedro. Manuel. Quick. Bring the girl. Do not let her cry out. Si, sí, senor. She will not cry out. Ladies and gentlemen, many perilous things may happen to the shadow. 
But do you realize that just two dangerous things can happen to a tire, a blowout or a skid? Unless the tires you ride on give you protection against both of these dangers, you may be heading for trouble. The shadow knows. Beware. Literally millions of American motorists right now are gambling on their tires, taking chances on a dangerous blowout or a car-wrecking skid. Make sure your tires are safe. And the best way I know of to do that, motorist, is to replace smooth, worn tires with the new Goodrich Safety Silver Town. The only tires that give you the skid protection of the lifesaver tread. Remember, this tire won hands down in road tests conducted by Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory, the nation's largest independent testing laboratory. The engineers of this famous laboratory found that no tire tested came up to the Silver Town in resistance to skid. And the tires tested against this Silver Town were regular and premium priced tires of America's five other leading tire manufacturers. Some of them priced as much as 40 to 70 percent more. When you can get Silver Towns at no extra cost, you really get the skid protection of the Lifesaver tread and Golden Ply blowout protection free. Put these life-saving Goodrich Silver Towns on your car now. The sooner, the safer. Nothing, Verita. It is strange he does not come, this shadow. We cannot wait much longer. The trawler must put to sea. What are you going to do with the girl if he does not come? What we did with Captain Bogart, with the lieutenant from the Navy Department and the others. Mm -hmm. Where is the girl? In the next cabin. Perhaps you can make her talk. You know so many ways, Zito. I will try, but women are difficult. They can stand much more torture, more pain than a man. Come, senorita. We talk to you now. Maybe you will talk to us. You can talk all you like. I have nothing to say. Do not be too sure, senorita. This is Mr. Zito. He has had experience in loosening the tongue of those who will not speak freely. I can imagine. Senorita, among my people there is a saying that the tongue is for speech. And those who will not use their tongue for speaking have no need of it. And they will not feel its loss if the tongue is taken away. I really believe you would, Mr. Zito. It has been necessary on occasion. But what good would it do you to have my tongue cut out? None. Therefore, we would both lose if your stubborn courage should force me to go so far, senorita. What do you want to know? Well, this friend of yours, this man John Hardy of New York, what is he doing in Panama? I don't know. Where is he now? I don't know. You lie. You know who he is, what he is, why he's here. I tell you, I don't... Quick, tell me this one thing. They're choking me. Is it not true this friend of yours is the man the whole world knows as the shadow? I tell you, I don't... <laughs> I will answer that question for you, Mr. Zito. The shadow, he's here. He has walked into our trap. No, Zito. It is I who have set a trap for you. Pedro! Manuel, quick! Watch the door! Let no one out of this cabin! <laughs> it will do no good to ring for your cutthroat, Zito. I have disposed of them one by one. Zito? It is true. They do not answer. You are cornered. Trapped, Zito. Trapped! Zito, do not stand there staring. He's here, somewhere in this cabin. We have got the girl. Don't let go of her. What is the matter with you? Surely you've heard of the power of hypnosis, senorita. Look at him. He can't move, can't speak. Listen to me, Zito. Listen to me. Take your fingers from that girl's throat. Release her. Release her. Release her. Zito! Zito! It is useless, senorita. Oh, you have caught him, Shadow. But you will never get me. Never! Never! Come on. Thank heavens you got here in time. 
I'm sure he meant to kill me. I know. Quick, get off this trawler. Put it in the wharf. <laughs> Why did you let Verita get away? Because she will show me the way to the real leader of this firing bent on destroying the defenses of the canal. But what about Zito? Go on, hurry. Uh, I'll join you in the wharf. After I make Mr. Zito tell all he knows to the shadow. <laughs> going in the speedboat? Straight out to sea. Eight miles south-southwest. You better hope I haven't forgotten how to read a compass. I thought you were going to trail Varita. Yeah, it won't be necessary. She'll be where we're going. Did you get that from Zito? Yes, and many other things, Margot. There's a ship out there. And that's where the trawler was going. Yes. Lamont, you're not going to board that ship alone. I must, Margot. It's the only chance of getting the real leader of the spiring. But what can you do against the whole crew of a ship? Why don't you turn your information over to the Navy Patrol? Let them deal with it. They can't without creating an international incident. The ship is beyond the 12-mile limit, carrying the flag of a supposedly friendly country. What kind of ship is it? Mm, a tramp steamer, but actually it's a disguised tender, loaded with mines and capable of converting fishing trawlers like the Vendetta into mine layers in a few hours. Good heavens. Just what are you going to do, Lamont? What can I do to help? Margot, all I want you to do is take the wheel of this speedboat. I'm going to jump overboard and swim to that ship and get near enough. You turn back toward the coast a couple of miles, cut the motor, and wait to hear from me over the shortwave band the shadow always uses. But suppose they hear us and send the boat off. We're running without lights. You stop the motor, they never find you in the dark. All right, Lamont. Only I hope you know what you're doing. You're taking a terrible risk, even for the shadow. No, don't worry about me. Only one thing more. The wind springs up and the sea gets rough. Head back to the coast. This boat won't ride a storm. And leave you on that ship? I will not. You will. I want your promise. We turn back now. All right. I promise. Lamont, look. There's a ship dead ahead without lights. That's it, Margot. Take the wheel, quick. There's a smaller boat alongside. A taller. I thought there'd be one. That means Verita's on board ship ahead of me. Lamont, wait. Let me swing closer. No, this is close enough. Now, remember, Margot, stand off until you hear from me. So, Zita is caught and you, Senorita Verita, become so afraid of the shadow... That you dare disobey my command that you shall never come aboard this ship. But, Dr. Muller... Wait! By coming aboard this ship, you have linked me with the activities of our spies in Panama. You are a fool and a coward, senorita. And I have no use for those who cannot obey my orders. But you do not know this shadow. You have not seen as I have what he can do. I know all about this shadow. It is my business to know everything about those who may sooner or later stand in the way of my plans. You are very clever, Dr. Muller. But how do you know the shadow is not on board this ship? If he has followed you here, I shall deal with him. That speedboat we heard half an hour ago was not cruising around for nothing. I tell you, it is dangerous to stay in these waters after what has happened. We are beyond the 12 mile limit. We are safe here. You are not safe from this shadow. Not anywhere. Yes. Come in. I had the ship searched from bow to stern as you ordered, Dr. Marlowe. I don't believe anyone boarded us from that speedboat. Now, what about the speedboat? Well, I had the trawler cruise around. No trace of it, sir. Must have returned to Panama. Very well. Go to the bridge and wait orders from me. Yes, sir. Now, senorita, I shall consider your case. I... I cannot go back to Panama. It is too bad. For Panama is the only place you are of any use to me. But I have done nothing. I have not betrayed you. You could put me ashore down the coast until it is safe for me to go back. I have a better plan. With this gun. It is easier. Quicker. No. No. You would not shoot me for one mistake. I have been valuable to you. I have found out many secrets for but you. But no more. <laughs> Do not be afraid. Do not cower like an animal. I am not going to shoot you. I am merely going to give you a chance to do it yourself. Hmm. No, 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 I won't do it. I will do anything but that. And why not, senorita? You and Mr. Zito have killed many men. No, I won't. Very well. Then you give me no choice. <laughs> Wait, Dr. Moloff. Before you shoot. The shadow. He's here. Yes, I'm here. I warned you, Dr. Moloff, but you would not listen. So you dare to come even here, shadow? Yes, doctor. I've come for you. Then you are a fool. There is no one here you can call upon to help you, and this ship is beyond the 12-mile limit. But you are going to leave this ship, Dr. Moloff. You are going to leave this ship before 10 minutes have passed. 
or you will never leave alive. Save your bluff for fools like my agent, Shadow. This is not bluff, Doctor. I've not been idle in the half hour I've been aboard. I know the whole of the ship is filled with high explosive mines. Think what will happen when a time bomb goes off in that cargo of death. A time bomb? Ten minutes? Less than ten, Dr. Moloff. Think fast. You still have time to get your crew aboard the trawler alongside. I don't believe you, Shadow. Why should you warn me if this is true? Because the trawler flies our flag, and once aboard, you are subject to the laws of our country. The naval patrol will pick you up after the explosion. Oh, that's it? Yes. You have nine minutes left to decide. Prison for espionage or death. I don't believe you, Shadow. You are a fool if you stay here, Dr. Moloff. I believe him. I'm going. Captain Stone, quick, get your crew on the trawler. I cannot take a chance that you have not planted a time bomb in the hole, Shadow. But if you have... I am going to give you your choice. Try to come through this door before I lock it, and I'll shoot you down, even if I can't see you. Or stay in this cabin and be blown up with the ship. I, I have another choice, another choice, Dr. Moloff. And it's... Margot, Margot Lane, Margot Lane, I've left the ship and safe aboard trawler Black Girl. Return to Panama, return to Panama. The mystery ship will blow up any minute now, but disregard explosion, disregard explosion. Return to Panama, disregard... Radio message, Commander. Came through just now. I don't know what you make of it, sir. The sender wouldn't identify. Let me see. Steam trawler Black Girl, six miles south southwest La Boca. Dr. Moloff and agents aspiring aboard intercept. That trawler's been under suspicion for some time, sir. Yes, and this may be the break we've been waiting for. The destroyer K 17 is in that vicinity, investigating a mysterious explosion. Notify our commanding officer to proceed to the position of the trawler Black Girl and search her. Did he get off the ship before it blew up? I don't know, Verita. We found him on the deck of the gull. Like this. Unconscious. Is he... Nah, he ain't dead. But he took an awful beating from somebody. Uh, it's too bad the shadow did not kill him. Shadow? What are you talking about? What the... Destroyer! Get ahead! The shadow said we would be stopped. We have got to get away. We can't. They blow us out of the water. Stop the engine. Yes, sir. They're sending a boat to board us. Stand by, Black Doll. They cannot stop us. We are beyond the 12-mile limit. <laughs> You're wrong, senorita. This trawler flies our flag. Shadow. You. You saved Dr. Moloff. You won the Navy patrol. Yes, Morita. Your spiring is broken. Your minds have exploded harmlessly. Like your theories. You led me to Dr. Moloff, the chief of this spiring. You and he will suffer the extreme penalty. An example to all spies who seek to discover the secrets of our country's defenses and endanger the safety of our territorial waters. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine... Now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental.
what evil lurks in the hearts of men. <laughs> the shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, before we join the shadow, let me ask you this. Do you realize that before Goodrich developed the amazing skid protection of its new Silvertown tire, they tested tread designs by the hundred for two long years, endless testing, checking, and comparing. It was a battle of wits against wet roads, dry roads, and hairpin curves, until finally they developed a tread that will stop you quicker, safer on a wet pavement than you've ever stopped before. And that tread, motorists, is the lifesaver tread, found only on the new Goodrich Silvertown. Its never-ending spiral bars act like a whole battery of windshield wipers. They sweep the water right and left, force it out through the deep drainage grooves, make a dry track for the rubber to grip. Yet remember, even though this new Goodrich Silvertown costs many thousands of dollars to design and build, even though it gives you the famous golden ply blowout protection in the bargain, there is no extra cost. Play safe. Start riding on these life-saving Goodrich Silvertowns before it's too late. The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Hospital Murder Theory. But Lamont, what's it all about? Margot, my dear, you're, yours not to reason why. Yours, but to make those pretty feet of yours walk fast enough to keep up with me. Yes, but I thought this trip to Egypt was to be a vacation. No more work. No more excitement. <laughs> no more excitement for about two weeks and you'd be having me cut out paper dollies. <laughs> Here we are. Cairo General Hospital. Come on, watch these steps. Will you please tell me what it's all about? All I know is the Dr. Rowling phoned the hotel and asked me to go over here as fast as I could, so here we are. But who is Dr. Rawlin, and, and what's he got to do with you? Dr. Rawling is in charge of this place, old friend of the family's. Hmm. It's quiet, even for a hospital, isn't it? I don't like it, Lamont. Wait out here for me, Margot. I'll call you if I want to. All right, Lamont. Oh, Lamont. Lamont Cranston. Hello, Dr. Rawling. Oh, come in. Come in, do. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, my boy. What's it all about, Doctor? Cranston, our families in America are friends. Perhaps you can help me. There's no one else here I can trust. I don't know where to Wait turn. Wait a minute, Doctor. Wait a minute. How can I help you when I don't know what it's all about? Well, Supposing you calm down, tell me the story. Start where you left off when you phoned me this morning. Oh, yes, yes. I'll tell you everything. Cranston, three of my patients have disappeared. What? Yes, three of them in the last three days. Disappeared right out of the hospital. Well, why don't you go to your Cairo police? Oh, no, no, not the police. The publicity would ruin the reputation of the hospital if this word got around. Cranston, can you help me? No, Doctor, tell me this. How do you know those patients didn't just walk out? Oh, they couldn't. They were bedridden, every one of them. There's no doubt they were kidnapped out of their bed, and the devil only knows why. It is impossible. But it's true, I tell you, true, Cranston, and it's driving me crazy. I, I can't eat, I can't sleep. All I can see is those empty beds. Oh, you're clever, Cranston. Perhaps you can help us. We can trust you, Mr. Kruger and I. We both agreed on that. Mr. Kruger? Who's Kruger? The head of our board of trustees. He and I... Well, we've kept this horrible thing that's been happening from getting into the newspaper. When did the first patient disappear? Three days ago. Then another disappeared and another. Oh. Cranston, you've got to help us stop this terror before someone... before someone important disappears. In other words, the three patients who have disappeared up to date weren't very important, is that it? Oh, no, just natives. Who were they? Well, the first was an Egyptian beggar boy with a broken leg. He had a fracture Never of Never mind the diagnosis. Who disappeared next? An old woman from the bazaar. Broken hip. 
I tell you, she couldn't have moved a step without help. The third? Last night, a single ace in one of the French boats. What was wrong with him? Fractured shoulder. In other words, had... none of the patients were constitutionally ill. Oh, no, no, they, they had no disease, if that's what you mean. And what have you done to prevent any more such disappearances? You posted guards? Oh, yes, yes, indeed, all over the hospital. But I tell you, Cranston, I'm afraid. Now, I, I'm not a superstitious man, but I swear to you there's something supernatural about all this, something not of this world. A strange way for a doctor to talk, Rowling. But it must have been something supernatural. They've disappeared, just disappeared. Three living people. Take it easy, Doctor. Oh, gone, I tell you. Easy. Gone into thin air, and I'm responsible, Cranston. I tell you, if another one disappears... Now, what is this? Yes. Come quickly. Well, what is it? It's happened again, Doctor, again. The girl in room 11, she disappeared. Hurry, Doctor, oh, hurry. the girl is gone. The girl gone. Kidnapped. Now, you see for yourself, Cranston. The bed's empty. Now, when this gets out, we're ruined... My 20 years' work here, gone for nothing. Ruin, ruin. Dr. Roy, for heaven's sake, pull yourself together. Can't sell anything with hysteria. Who's the patient in this room? What is the name? Now, you didn't believe me when I told you it was something supernatural. But now you'll have to believe me. You will. It'll get them all, all our patients. They'll all die. Doctor, stop that. They'll close up the hospital and they'll blame me, me. Stop it, I tell you. No one's blaming you yet. Who is this patient? Another native? No, no. That's what makes it so horrible. This patient was a 16-year-old daughter of the French consul. A young girl? Yes. A guard below the window, a guard in front of the door, and yet she's gone. Gone. It's the end of everything, I tell you. It's the end I of everything. What's going on here? Mr. Kruger, look. Look, it's happened again. The consul's daughter gone. Oh, impossible. She's gone, I tell you. Gone, gone. Look for yourself. Heaven help us. If you men will take my advice, you'll call in your local police. Eh? Oh, who are you? Lamont Cranston is the name. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Kruger. It's, it's Lamont Cranston, my, my friend from America. Make him help us, Mr. Kruger. Make him. Control yourself, Doctor. There may be a very simple explanation for these disappearances. Yes, a very simple, rational explanation that Doctor. We... Yes. Mr. Kruger. Over this window, quickly. Well, well, what is it, Cranston? What did you see out of the window? Mr. Kruger just said there may be a simple and harmless explanation for all these disappearances. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Then look out there on the fire escape. Kruger, look. It's the orderly. The orderly we put out there to guard the room. He's dead. He's dead. And we'll all die. We'll all die. Out. It's fainting. Oh. Cold. Yes, it's his heart. He's had trouble with it. All this but excitement. Yes, yes, he'll be all right. Just needs quiet. Let me help you lift him on the bed. Oh, thank you. Here, just right over here. Thank you very much. I'll ring for an intern. Anything else I can do, Mr. Kruger? Oh, I don't think so. Thank you. Dr. Rawlings must have expert attention immediately. Then perhaps it'll be better if I leave you. Uh, yes, Mr. Cranston. I'll see Dr. Rawlings again when he's recovered. All right, Mr. Cranston. Don't worry about him. He'll be all right. Goodbye, Cranston. I hope so. Goodbye, Mr. Kruger. Goodbye. Oh, Margot. Yes, Lamont. Four people have disappeared. Oh. A guard has been murdered with a six-inch knife in his throat. Oh. Margot, it seems another mystery challenges my attention as the shadow. There's the hospital up ahead. Lamonde, are you sure your scheme will work? I know it's a dangerous undertaking. Oh, especially for you. Yes, but we agreed that there was no other way in which to find out how all these people disappeared from the I hospital. I know, Margot. The, the shadow has got to be doubly watchful. I have every faith in you, Lamont. I, I hope it isn't misplaced this time. Well, I'm not worried about that. Stop here, Margot. All right, Lamont. No. Remember what I told you. Head straight for that lamppost in the front of the hospital. I know. Cut your wheel so you sideswipe the fender. It will make noise enough to bring the emergency squad out of the place. Yes, but they'll see I'm not hurt right away. Oh, no, they won't. You stop over the steering wheel. If you cracked your head on the windshield and call it a concussion. I hope you're right. If I'm wrong, then you won't get a free bed tonight and a chance to act as decoy for one of those body snatchers. Well, see you in the hospital. That's where I leave you. Good luck and be careful. You don't know what we're getting into. Thanks, Lamont. I'll be careful. It's the woman. 
coming. He's dead. The doctor. Here comes the doctor. Hey, let me through. Let me through. Let me through. Well, she's out cold. Sure is lucky. Crashing in front of a hospital. Doctor, is she dead? No, I don't think so. Jim, hurry. Get a stretcher. Okay, now. We've got to get this girl to the hospital right away. Well, here I am. An inmate of Cairo General Hospital. Your plan certainly worked, Lamont. Yes, almost too well. Are you sure you're all right, Margot? I saw you crash the car into the lamppost. I was afraid you'd overdone the accident and hurt yourself. <laughs> it did shake me up a bit, but I'm all right now. Yes. The wind's very strong tonight, isn't it? Oh, it's welcome. Now, this bed's inclined to be warm. The wind from the desert and those body snatchers are quite welcome to come in that window, aren't they? Do you really think someone will come in here after me? Two others were kidnapped out of this room. Oh. Nervous? A little. I guess it's... It's not knowing just... Just what will come through that window. Well, I'm going to leave you now. Must you? Yes, I... I'll look around outside. Whoever intends to make you the fifth victim will meet... The Shadow... I wonder what time it is. I wonder if Lamont will come back. So dark. Like being buried alive in a tomb. Buried alive. I wonder what it would be like to wake up in a coffin. No, I, I mustn't think of such things. Why doesn't Lamont come back? I wonder if anything will happen. That Dr. Rowland said it would be something supernatural. It could be. Egypt. They say anything can happen here. I... I heard something. No. No, it's, it's quiet. Quiet as the inside of a tomb. Why do I keep thinking about tombs? Tombs, Egypt, mummies. They do run together. Oh, the wind's gone. It's so quiet. Too quiet. What if that doctor was right? What if there were something from another world that was... I hear it. Something is coming toward me in the dark. Something coming toward me. What is it? Coming closer. Close. What will it be? Man? Ghost? I've never been afraid. Won't be afraid now. Closer. Closer. Oh, Lamont, where are you? I can't scream. I... Something sweet. My head. Something pressing close to my mouth. It's not a, a ghost. Ghost. Don't give chloroform. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue with the Shadow's exciting adventure, listen to this. Recognize it? That's the sound of a car as a desperate motorist has jammed on the brakes in an emergency. The shadow knows when you have to stop in an emergency, you have to stop fast. That's why I urge you to replace smooth, worn tires with the new Goodrich Safety Silvertowns. Because the new Silvertown Lifesaver Tread is so amazingly different that it gives you the quickest stops you've ever had on any road, wet or dry, curved or straight. And here's proof that the new Silvertown is in a class by itself. In exhaustive road tests made by the impartial Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory of the regular and premium priced tires of America's six largest tire manufacturers, here's what happened. The new Goodrich Silvertown gave greater skid resistance than any other tire tested. And the tires included tires listed at 40% to 70% higher in price. For your sake, for your family's sake, Make it a point to get a demonstration of the amazing Lifesaver Tread in action. 
Discover what it means to be saved by a Silvertown stop. And remember, the new Goodrich Silvertown offers you both Lifesaver Tread skid protection and Golden Ply blowout protection at no extra cost. your eyes. Who, who are you? You are afraid. Who are you? You would not know me. Surgical gown and a white mask. Why do you wear them? I must wear them. My work is very dangerous. Who are you? That does not matter. Only my work matters. My work. You will see. You will see. You, whoever you are, come back here. Come back here. No, no, do not be impatient. I will show you my work. I will show you. An operating table? A black man strapped on. Why? Now you will see. Yes, now you will see my glory. The Sengali is off the French boat. You stole him from the hospital too. But why? What are you going to do with him? You will see. <laughs> yes, well, you will you... see. <laughs> Uh, you hear the uh, black one regains uh, his senses. <laughs> how unfortunate for him. <laughs> oh, those knives. You madman. What are you going to do to him? Black legs. Strong black legs. No, you wouldn't. But I will. Look at this. You see this bottle? Liquid in it is green. Beautiful green. Listen to it sing. <sighs> What is it? Listen to it. Yes, yes, my beautiful liquid. Soon I will feed you flesh to grow on flesh. You will not fail me, will you, my beautiful? What is it? What's in that bottle? Yes, yes, I will tell you. Why not? What harm can you do to me strapped there? You see in this bottle green liquid. I see in it an alchemy of the flesh that will change the world. This... This is the catalyst that grows flesh on flesh. <laughs> and with this, I can graft human flesh to human flesh instantaneously. No, it can't be done. And I tell you, it can instantaneously. His flesh to mine, your flesh to mine. Come on. I tell you, I can take his black leg and graft it on in place of yours. I can take your leg and put it on me. And they won't laugh at me behind my back then. And they won't call me peg leg and limpy. <laughs> yes, I'll laugh at them. All of them, the whole sneering, snivelling pack of them. Uh, oh, sweet. But... Ah, listen. The black sailor awakens quickly. I have time only for another word. I put flesh to flesh an amputated leg to a raw, bleeding stump. Then an injection of my beautiful green liquid through the bloodstream it races. Flesh cells eagerly join the new flesh cells. In a moment, two moments, three moments. Ah, the miracle is done. Old flesh has joined the new flesh. Lamont, you said you'd be here. To whom do you speak to me? I have no time for words. My work... Lying there, you will see the miracle. <laughs> yes, you will see. No, come back here. Loosen these straps. Lamont, Lamont, where are you? <laughs> Almost completely awake, eh, my black friend? <laughs> oh, such a pity. I cannot give you an anesthetic this time. But my beautiful liquid will not work when the patient has been drugged. Boy, white man, what do you do, white man? What'd you do? Lamont, Lamont, where uh, are you? Tonight, 
What's you doing, man? <laughs> your leg. Your right leg, a good, strong uh, leg. No, 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 my leg, no. Adana, no, my leg. Give me my leg. Stop. Shadow. Drop that knife, Kruger. Who? Who spoke my name? <laughs> my mask. You ripped it off my face. You are Kruger. You, Kruger. Respectable Mr. Kruger. Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the hospital. I, I, I hear the voice. I see no one. Loosen the straps around you, Margot. Ah, the straps around you, woman. They loosen how? Why? The answer to that is in your own ears, Kruger. That voice again. The voice of a shadow. A shadow which asks one question. Why have you murdered? My right leg never any good. Kruger is my name. But they've all had other names for me behind my back. Limpy, they called me Limpy and Peg Leg. But I'll show them. I'll show them all. My discovery it'll put a strong leg on my body soon, and voices in the air won't stop me. There's more than a voice now. Look straight ahead, Kruger. Eyes. Two eyes glaring at me from midair. See how the light glitters in these eyes. Look deep in them, Kruger. Eyes. I tell you, you want to look in my eyes. In them you see wonders. Wonders you never dreamed about. Look, Kruger. I... I don't see, see what... See, see how the light glitters in those eyes. Look deep in them, Kruger. Deep in them. They burn deep in your eyes, Kruger. Deep, deep. Yes, deep. Deep in your mind. And they take away your will, Kruger. Take away your will. Yes. Yes. My will is your will, Kruger. My will, your will. No, 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 I won't. I, I worked to do. The work will wait, Kruger. You wanted to wait. All you want to do now is look in my eyes. My will. Your will. My will. Your will. I, I don't know. I... Sleepy. You get very sleepy. Sleepy. Your hand is sleepy. Hand is Your sleepy. hand. It opens. It opens and lets the knife fall to the floor. You hear me, Kruger? Open. Open. Margot, you all right? Yes, I'm all right. But the Negro... Unconscious. Kruger, what have you done with the other people you kidnapped out of the hospital? I used them for my experiments. They are all dead. Oh, horrible. All right, Kruger, you can wake up now. Wake up! Ah! <clears throat> What? Not a knife in your hand. You're quite harmless, aren't you, Kruger? Those eyes. They're gone. There's nobody here. I am still here, though you cannot see me. You, you hypnotize me. Yes, and I say again, I wish I could have done it sooner. Yes, but how? Who, who are you? They call me the Shadow. Shadow what? The name of a man who tries to right a few of the world's wrongs. I am not afraid of you. I'll kill you. You won't hypnotize me again. I'll kill you. Stay back. I'll kill you. Oh, no, you won't, you poor fool. You're coming with me. I'm not going to judge you. I'll let a jury of your peers do that. No. No, my work. I've got to go on with my work. Come with me, Kruger. No, 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 let go of me. Hands out of the air, let go. Come quietly, Kruger. No. No, you're struggling, you see. You haven't got a chance against me. No. No, no, let go of me, let go. All right, I'll drag you along. No. All the fiendish murderers. No, 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 let go of me. Oh, my work. I've got to go on with my work. Look out! The lamp! The ha, ha! I made you let go! I made you let go! Margo! Margo, look out! The oil from the lamp! The flame is going to catch it! Run! You'll never get me! Not me! <laughs> Oh, he's dead all right, and all the rest of them. I never saw a hotter fire. There must have been plenty of inflammables in there. All sorts of liquids. Well, what I can't understand is why some of the bodies were all cut up. It's more than I can figure out. But two got out of it alive, Chief. At least they think so. What? Two alive? Out of there? Sure, Chief. Right after the explosion, as some say that a man and a woman run out. Uh, who were they? No one seems to know exactly. 
They couldn't see him clear. But they say the man, he was, he was more like, well, like a shadow. Yes, a shadow. Yes, he's right, Margot. We did get away. Strange. We come halfway across the world for a vacation, and then this. A poor, deluded creature who thought he could bring himself happiness through murder. <laughs> he gave others a horrible death, but he died a far more horrible one. No, Margot, there's never any profit in murder. It always brings its own reward. I wonder... I wonder if Kruger understands that now. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental.
Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, before the shadow begins his latest adventure, I want to tell you that when you equip your car with the new Goodrich Silvertown tire, you are using the most advanced method to protect yourself against both skids and blowouts. And here's why. On the outside, this new Silvertown has the amazing skid protection of the Lifesaver Tread, the new Goodrich development that will stop you quicker, safer on a wet pavement than you've ever stopped before. And on the inside, it has the famous golden ply invention that protects you against high-speed blowouts. But, you may ask, don't these life-saving features cost extra? Well, the plain truth is that you can get Silver Towns at no extra cost. In fact, many tires cost more than Silver Towns, but no other tire at any price can give you these two great life-saving features. Remember, it pays to play safe. Put Goodrich Safety Silver Towns on your car now. The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, Black Buddha. Magado. Yes, Honorable Master. The infidel dog, has he come yet? Not yet, Honorable One. He is late. You sent him the message as I directed? Yes, Honorable Master. The knife is sharp. Sharp, Master. Someone is coming into the shop. Look through the little shutter on the door, see who it is. Yes, Honorable One. Is it... He? Yes, Honorable Master. It is he. Bring him to me. If you will step in here, sir. Yes, certainly. <coughs> oh, here you are sometime. You honor me, Mr. Burton. You may leave, Makada. Yes, Honorable One. Well, your message seemed to be so urgent, I came as quickly as possible. What's the trouble? It is about the black Buddha that you purchased here the other day that I wish to speak to you, Mr. Burton. What? You mean to say that message was just a trick to get me down here to start that Buddha business all over again? If you will sell it back to me, you will realize much profit, Now Mr. look here, Sontai. Once and for all, let me tell you this. I purchased that statuette here fairly and honestly and paid for it with good, hard cash. The one who sold you, the god, made a grievous mistake. It should never have been sold. The mistakes of your sales help doesn't concern me. I paid a price, a fair price, and by heaven I intend to keep what I bought. You will not sell, Mr. Burton? Not at any price. That's final. Good day, sir. One moment, Mr. Burton. Well? Since you will not give me what I ask, permit me to give you something. You give me something? What? A knife in your heart. No! So must die all who profane the god with their touch. Magada. I come. Remove his body to another vicinity where his infidel brethren can see the vengeance which comes to those who profane our sacred gods. Please, 
Mrs. Burton, try to control yourself. Mr. Cranston wants to help you, but he can't if, if you won't talk to him. And I do want to help you, Mrs. Burton. Believe that. Oh, no one can help me. No one. We can't bring back your husband, Mrs. Burton, but we can bring his murderer to justice. You want that, don't you? But how can you help? The police have been able to do nothing. Nothing. But you, you don't understand, Mrs. Burton. Lamont can do things that the police... Well, I mean to say you're, you're my friend and he wants to help you. Well, what is it you want to know, Mr. Cranston? Simply this. To your knowledge, did your husband have any enemies? No. No, not a one. He was always so kind and thoughtful and good. Oh, who could have killed him? Who? Perhaps the answer to that question is closer to you than you realize. What, what do you mean? Mrs. Burton, I want to hurt you unnecessarily, but you know, of course, that your husband was stabbed in the heart with a knife. Yes. Yes, I know. Well, I saw that knife today at police headquarters, and there's something about it that the police overlooked. Yes? That knife was never made by Western hands. It's a sacrificial knife used by certain cults of Tibetans. Tibetans? Lamont, what could Mr. Burton possibly have to do with them? That's what I would like to find out. Mrs. Burton, did your husband have dealings recently with any Orientals? Oh, no. His law practice was confined almost entirely to corporation law. Perhaps he bought something from an Oriental. Perhaps you did. No, no, there isn't anything that... Oh. You remember something? The little black Buddha. Black Buddha? What Buddha? Mr. Burton bought it about a week before he was... Before it happened. I remember he told me about a little oriental shop over on the east I side. I see. Was there any trouble about the purchase? Uh, yes. Yes, there was. What was it, Mrs. Burton? Tell us. Well, I don't know much about it. I think Mr. Burton bought this statue from one of the assistants in the shop when the owner wasn't there. And when the owner returned, it appears the Buddha wasn't for sale. And he tried to buy it back from Mr. Burton. And Mr. Burton sold it back to him? Oh, no. For some strange reason, my husband became very attached to the little idol. He refused to sell it at any price. I see. Oh, but that couldn't have anything to do with the murder of my husband. Why do you say that? Because the Oriental dealer knew that Mr. Burton had the Buddha put away in a safe place. He must have realized that killing my husband wouldn't help him to get the Buddha back again. You have the Buddha? Yes, in the wall safe. Can I see it? Why, if you wish to... If you'll step over here... Amon, why should anyone want to kill a man like Mr. Burton over a little piece of stone? In the history of man, my dear, there's been far more blood spilled over precious stones than there has been over the love of women. Oh. Here is the Buddha, Mr. Cranston. Now, I'm sure you'll agree with me that it's a work of art. It hasn't much value. Why, it's an ugly little thing. Yes. Do you mind if I hold it in my hands, Mrs. Burton? Oh, why not at all? Oh, it's... So cold to touch. That face, evil, malignant. Yes, and, and how strange. A Buddha with a face like, like death. It's not an image of the real Buddha, Margot. It's one of the lesser Tibetan gods. Tibetan? And you said the knife that killed my husband was a Tibetan knife? Yes. Oh. What's the matter, Mrs. Burton? The Buddha. The Buddha? Oh, yes, I, I thought a sort, of, sort of shadow pass over the statue's face. Did you see it, Mr. Cranston? No. No, but a shadow is going to pass over the shop of the Oriental who sold this thing of death to your husband. Lamont, that must be the store across the street. Yes, Margaret, the Oriental Bazaar. That's the address we found among Burton's papers. Horrible looking place, isn't it? You don't mind going in as we planned, do you, Margot? No, Lamont, but it's not very inviting. I'll be with you as the shadow, Margot. Don't be afraid. I'm not afraid. All right, then, in you go. Remember... Do everything exactly as we planned. Good luck. I'll probably need it. If luck isn't with you, don't forget the shadow will be. Help you, help you, help you, please? Oh, why, why, yes, I, I'm looking for a present to give a friend. A very nice thing. Genuine jet losses, genuine hammered silver jewelry, many fine things. You, you, you look, lady. You say what you want? Well, to be frank with you, what I would like to buy is a Buddha. Buddha? Oh, yes. Yes, we have very fine Buddha. You, you see on the shelf, all, all size, in one jade. Very fine Buddha. You, you, you like it, lady? Mm, no, they're, they're not exactly what I wanted. They're not like the one I saw. What kind of Buddha you, you see, lady? You, you tell, I try get for you. Well, it was at the home of a friend of mine, a little black Buddha. Black Buddha? Yes, about the size of this one. Black Buddha? Could you get me one like it? Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. 
I get for your letter. You, you, you come this way. Where? Next room. Honorable Sung Tai. He will show you a special black Buddha. Sung Tai? Yes, yes. Honorable Sung Tai. He is owner of a bazaar. Oh. You, 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 you come this way, please. All right. If you're sure you can get me the black Buddha, the sort my friend has. You, 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 you come in here, please. It's rather dark, isn't it? I, I, I make a light. I, I, I make a light, a light, a light candle. So, I make, a, make a nice light, lady. Everything will be all light. Oh, there's, there's someone back of that desk. Please, not to be startled. Uh. I sit in the dark because my eyes do not like bright lights. I am Sung Tai. Oh, h- how do you do? Uh, this man here said that you... What? He's gone. Again, I must ask you not to be startled. My assistant has many duties. I will try to be of service to you. I know what you wish. You you know? My ears could not help overhearing what you asked him. If you will come closer, sit here. Thank you. You will find the chair most comfortable. Uh, yes, uh, Mr... Uh, Mr. Sung. Oh, thank you, Mr. Sung. Uh, Have you a black Buddha that you could sell me? I have many things to offer, but first, so that I may help you with intelligence, uh, this other Buddha you mentioned, uh, tell me about it. (laughs) Well, it's small, and and the face of the statue looks as if the god were angry. Angry? I I was very attracted to it. I'd, I'd like to have a similar one. I thought perhaps you had one you could sell me. If you will tell me where you saw the Buddha... At one of my friends. The name of the friend I... Ask this to learn whether I sold it. Oh, as a matter of fact, you did. That, that's why I came here. My friend gave me your address, a, a Mrs. Burton. Ah. Uh, you know her? So many people are kind enough to do business with me, I cannot remember uh-huh. them all. You saw this black Buddha? Well, yes, of course. Perhaps you held it in your hand? Well, yes. How did you know that? You held it in your hand? Yes. You held the god in your hand? Why do you keep repeating that question? Because it is written, the unbeliever who touches the black god with his hand defiles the god. I defile the god? You are an unbeliever, so your touch was defilement. Well, I... And so it is written, you must die. You wouldn't kill me. It is written. Kill me because I touched the little stone image? It is written. You... You can't mean it. It is not for mortal man or woman to question the word of the gods. You mean to say that anyone who touches the statue must die? The touch of the unbeliever is defilement. So he dies. But, uh, but others have touched the statue. And so others have died. Mr. Burton, is that why he... He was an unbeliever. He died like a dog dies, and so you will die. It is written... No, Sung Tai. Who speaks? A voice you've never heard before. I... I see no one. Because I will it that there should be a shadow before your eyes. A will stronger than mine? It cannot be. You cannot? You will not see me. Shadow, he confessed. You heard him? I heard him. You hear a voice too, white woman? There is a voice? Yes, there is a voice, Sung Tai. A voice that is going to bring you to justice for the murder of Jim Burton. He defiled the god and the Black Buddha. The man was innocent of any intentional blasphemy against the Black Buddha. There was no reason to murder him. He died, as must die all who defile the god. There will be no more of that, Sung Tai. All must die. But I also touch the Buddha. Then die by this knife. <laughs> Your knife quivers in the wood, Sung Tai. You live. If you were to throw a thousand knives at my voice, you would not kill me. Your voice is there, and yet you are not. My voice need never be where my body is. Get to your feet, Sung Tai. You're going with us to the police station. And I warn you to do exactly as I say. Yes. Yes, I do as you say. I have lost. I have lost. Shadow! That wall behind him, it's opening! Sung Tai, there we are. Oh, he got away. Through a panel in the wall. Sung Tai! Over this panel! Sung Tai! It is written, you die. 
You all die. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone steers clear of the road hog. But do you realize that if your car suddenly skids, starts spinning, swerving all over a wet, slippery road, your car is the most dangerous kind of road hog you can imagine? Nearby cars and even pedestrians may be caught in its wild plunge. The shadow knows. Last year, thousands were killed or injured by skidding cars. Yes, motorists. That's what happens when worn, smooth tires lose their grip on wet, slippery roads the hazard zone of motoring. But don't risk your neck. Equip your car with the new Goodrich Safety Silvertowns now. For remember, this new kind of tire, with its amazing lifesaver tread, will stop you quicker, safer on a wet pavement than you've ever stopped before. And you don't have to take my word for it. The largest independent testing laboratory in the country tested this new Silvertown against both regular and premium price tires of five other leading tire manufacturers. And did that Silvertown come through with flying colors? Their engineers found that no tire tested, regardless of price, came up to the new Silvertown in skid resistance. And what's more, you can prove it yourself. Just take a free demonstration ride on this tire on a wet road. You can see the difference. You can feel the difference in a Silvertown stop. For safety's sake, make your next tires Goodrich, spelled G-O-O-D-R-I-C-H, Goodrich Safety Silvertown. Lamont, please don't drive so fast. Darn traffic. Don't be angry at yourself, Lamont. Some time moved so quickly, you didn't have a chance to stop it. Well, that poor side enough to keep him away from that wall, Margot. Sliding panels and hidden passageways. I, I thought that sort of thing only happened in books. Nevertheless, it happened in this case, and the faster we get back to Mrs. Burton, the better I'll like it. So Ty wouldn't dare go near her. He knows she must have touched the Black Buddha. He must realize that you'll be setting the police on his trail. My dear, when a man's actions are motivated by religious fanaticism, there is no limit to the risks he'll take. Well, I'm glad you telephoned Commissioner Weston as a shadow after we left Sung Tai's shop. The best I could do to further ensure Mrs. Burton's safety. Huh. Mrs. Burton's house. Lamont, look. Those men. It's all right. They're some of Commissioner Weston's men. Oh. Thank goodness he didn't waste any time. Come on. Hey, just a minute there. It's all right, Mac. Miss Lane and I are friends, Mrs. Burton. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Cranston. I didn't recognize you. Is Mrs. Burton all right? Sure, and why shouldn't she be? Come on. Go and see for ourselves. No, I wouldn't do that. Why not? Well, she apparently isn't feeling very well. What do you mean? The doctor just went in there a few minutes ago. Doctor? Sure it was a doctor? Sure, I'm sure. Said he was a doctor. Little fellow with an accent. Tough as they come when I try to stop him. What do he look like? I don't know. Come on, Margot. Hey, come back here, Mr. Cranston. You can't go into that room. Oh! Hey, what the... Oh! Mac, oh! Quick. Hey, Mr. Look, Cranston, what? Shh. She's dead. Oh. Hey, Cardona. Come here. Oh, Lamont. Look, the wall safe is open. And the Black Buddha. It's gone. Gone? Yes, Margot. Then the doctor... The doctor was Sung Tai. Why come here to the waterfront, Lamont? How could you possibly find Sung Tai here among all these ships? There's only one ship I'm interested in, Margot. One that sails to the Orient tonight. Why should he be on it? Sung Tai has his black Buddha back again, and having gotten back his guard, there's no reason for him to remain here any longer. But he said all who touch the statue must die. And we live? Hmm. Well, Sung Tai is going to try and correct that situation before he sails. That's why we're here. I, I don't understand. There's something you didn't notice at Mrs. Burton's. What was it, Lamont? This piece of paper. I took it before the police saw it, fortunately. Where was it? Close to Mrs. Burton's body. Wait, torn as though it might have been ripped out of the murderer's hand during the struggle. Yes, and there's one word on it, see? Yeah, Okumari, the name of a ship. Exactly. And it's that ship docked right ahead. Oh. I suppose Sung Tai thought he was being very subtle, leaving me a clue like that. You mean he wanted us to come here so he could kill us? And we're being very obliging. What? Well, what are you going to do? Uh, I'm going off to check with the purser whether or not Sung Tai is on the passenger list. Stay here in the car. You'll be perfectly safe. 
He won't be expecting us as soon as this. All right, Lamont. Some tie intended that bit of paper you have in your hand to be our admission ticket to eternity. He's mistaken. It's going to be his passport to the gallows. It won't be long. You are waiting for oh. someone, please. Oh. I frightened you. Sung Tai. You are a strange woman to let your friend walk away and leave you here all alone. Oh, I, I, I'm not frightened. This time you cannot deceive me. Deceive you? Yes. You did not fool me with that voice you called the shadow. Oh, you, you think I am the shadow? There is no need to be clever now. I understand how you did it. By projecting your voice. The trick has been used in our temples for many years. So you you think I did that? And very cleverly. But my reason has explained it all to me. The trick will not work again. Hmm. Come. Where? A place where your friend will never find you. He went and left you here. When he returns... You will be gone forever. No, I... The knife in my hand is hungry. Get out of the car. All right. Come, this way. I will walk close to you. My knife will taste your flesh if you move too quickly. I'll do as you say. Up the gangway, into the ship. Yes, all right. Do not make a sound. I knew when I left that scrap of paper with the name of this ship as bait. I knew then that I would catch a fool. In here. So, you think I'm the voice that spoke to you as the shadow? I do not think. I know. The trick is old. I should have understood it at the time. Down the steps. It's, it's so dark. Perhaps if you fell and broke that small white neck, perhaps that would be a kindness, a fate beyond all price. So, stand where you are, little fool. What do you intend to do with me? Kill me? You are strangely unafraid. That is because you are such a little fool. No. No, I do not kill you. That will come later. Much later. What do you mean by that? Before I answer that, I must know this from you. What are you, detective fool? Friend of the woman whose dog of a husband stole the guard? <laughs> if I'm to die... What does it matter who I am? You are a fool. Even the rabbit squeals for his life when the jaws of the fox are near. What do you intend to do to me? I will show you. I hold the lantern high. Look about you. Coffins. Rows of coffins stacked up to the ceiling. Yes, even your foolish eyes understand that. Coffins. Final dwelling place for the dead. Whose who's are they? Chinese. On their last journey across the seas so that they might lie for all eternity close to their ancestors. What has all this got to do with me? Look. This coffin. See, I lift the lid. Look inside. Look. Empty? Yes, but not. For long. Uh, Ah, your simple little brain understands that too. Yes, foolish one. It is for you. Once again, I say you're wrong, Shung Tai. That voice, you foolish one, I warned you not to do it. It is not a trick of her, Shung Tai. How can it be? You hear the voice of the shadow close to your ear. No. No, it is not she. Her lips are still. But it must be. It must be she. 
You white fool, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. <gasps> Knife. Torn out of my hand. Who did it? I did it. Now you'll believe that it's no trickery, Sung Tai. A god. No, not a god. But a voice of justice. A voice and a power that will bring you to a place where men will put a rope around your neck and swing you high into the air. Come, you are... No. Cardinal! Shadow! He's getting away again. He's hiding among the coffins. No way out. Look out. The ship's been rammed. Look. Look, the coffins. They're falling. They're falling, Mark. Come back here with me. Hurry! I can... I can never forgive myself leaving you alone in the car. <laughs> It's all right, Lamont. But Tsung Tai almost accomplished what he set out to do. If you hadn't left that paper trail... I knew you'd go back to the car. And I had the torn piece of paper you gave me in my hand when Tsung Tai came. I no. made... I made little pieces of it and he no. made me go with him. You tore it into little pieces and dropped them as you walked. Yes. I couldn't think of any other way to show you where I'd gone. Oh, thank heavens you saw them. I saw them, Margot. Yes, the... The false clue Sung Tai left for us became the trail that led to his own undoing. That whole wall of coffins fell on top of him. Yes. Yes, and crushed him to death. Oh, what a horrible way to die. Yes, horrible. Horrible, but... Better this way, perhaps. Sung Tai brought death to people. And the dead, in their coffins, killed Sung Tai. It is seldom that the dead have an opportunity to avenge a criminal who has brought death to innocent people. But, Margot, in this case, who better could administer justice eternal? <laughs> You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> all the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental.
lurks in the hearts of men. <laughs> the shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, The Shadow's latest adventure starts in just a moment. But first, you motorists know that in these days of high speeds and super highways, when you have to stop, you often have to stop fast. Just as fast on wet roads as on dry ones. And if there was ever a tire built to stop you quicker, safer in a wet road emergency, it's the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown with the amazing Lifesaver tread. For remember, this new Silvertown is the tire that won hands down in competitive non-skid road tests conducted by Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory, the largest independent testing laboratory in the country. If you want the quickest, safest stops you've ever had on a wet pavement, if you want the real blowout protection of the famous Goodrich Golden Ply, both at no extra cost, equip your car with these new life-saving silver towns without delay. The shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Witch Drums. gathered here on Gallows Hill to witness the triumph of righteousness over the forces of evil. Hear me, Dame Anna West, recant, repent, that even in this hour of doom thy soul may have escaped eternal hell fire. Uh, Anger! Man the wit! Save our children from their evil cause! Light the fire! Recant, repent, before it is too late. Repent! I am innocent! <laughs> hanger! Hanger! Banner! Banner! Light the fire! Stop! Stop, ye crazed and benighted fools! It is my wife he would hang and burn. What do ye know of witchcraft? By what right do ye condemn the woman of my house, the mother of my children? Dame West has had a fair trial before a jury of her peers, Captain West. Ye must abide by that judgment. Aye. Tried by fools such as you, John Wood, who called my wife a witch for beating the Congo drums, which I, I, Captain Daniel West, brought from Africa be with a cargo of slaves. Lest ye share the fate of your spouse. I'll not be silent. Hear me, hear me, Minister Wood. For the deeds of this day, I'll put a curse on you and your family forever. Let the spirit of my wife, Anna West, who is about to die, Reverend Wood, haunt and torment thy offspring with the madness of the Congo drums, generation upon generation, until the last of thy blood kin shall be dead. Accredit, Voodoo Drum! Dead! Dead! He has brought the Voodoo Drum! Accredit, Voodoo Drum! Stop him! Hang the boot! Kill him! Light the fire! Burn the boot! Burn, burn the Voodoo Drum! Aye, burn us! Burn the Congo drums! It will do you in your good! Let the fire of purgatory, though the march of centuries will wipe out the curse 
or the sound of the Congo drum? And here's another news bulletin. With the 1938 rainy season at its height, the South American crop is being threatened with destruction. The Montcranson. See, no now that we have managed to sneak away for a quiet weekend in Maine, visiting my Aunt Henrietta, do you think you could forget business and news? All right, Margot. Turn off the radio. I just want to get the time. Well, you got it. Did you hear the commentator say it was 1938? Isn't that accurate enough when you're on vacation? What's the matter, Margot? Afraid I'll hear a news report of some crime and go tearing back the city to try to solve it? It wouldn't be the first time, Lamont Cranston. Once an amateur criminologist, always an amateur criminologist. As for the shadow... <laughs> I'll try to keep the shadow in his place in the shadows, Margot. Promise? I promise. Good. Isn't this an interesting town we're passing through, Lamont? Yes. And this is the town where they had the quaint custom of burning witches. <laughs> Seems incredible. Oh, then it was long ago. Less than 300 years ago. Only a few generations, Margot. What a stir the shadow would have caused in this town in those days, Lamont. He might have saved quite a few innocent people from being burned at the stake. Or been caught and burned at the stake himself. Thank heavens this is the 20th... Lamont, look at that crowd in the yard of that old house just ahead. Hmm. Looks like trouble of some sort. Let's stop and see what it is. What a strange old house. All right, but I thought you wanted a quiet weekend. No excitement. I know, but just let's see what's going on. Margot. Margot, wait a minute. They're pulling something out of that old well. Why, it's... It's a little boy, Lamont. It looks like... Yes. He... Dead. He's been dead for a long time, but it looks at the body. I'm going over to see what it's all about. The witch killed him. The witch killed him and threw him in the well. Hey, Tommy, Tommy, now, wait, 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 my boy. You mustn't say things like that. You mustn't call poor Anna West a witch. You mustn't believe the stories people tell about Martha's great-grandmother. But she's a witch, just like her great-grandma. She's always scaring us with those drums she has, she has in the cellar. Now she's killed my brother. She killed him and threw him in the well. Tommy, Tommy, him. my boy, don't, don't make it any harder for me to bear. Don't let Mother hear you talk like this. Dad, and no. his great-granddaddy, old Captain West, put a curse on us. He did, didn't he? And his uncle told us about it. Yes, Tommy, but you mustn't believe in things like that. Why, it happened more than 200 years ago. Yes, but, but Anne, his uncle told us to keep away from here. Not to come near when she was down in the cellar beating those awful sounding old drums. Now look at her, standing there in the window, just staring, watching them taking David out of the well where she threw Tommy, him. Tommy, my boy, where Tommy, don't, him. don't, Tommy. <laughs> I know it's hard losing a little brother like this. I'm sorry, Reverend. Uh, well, we couldn't help overhearing. Is there anything we can do? Take him home, perhaps. Uh, thank you, but we live just across the street next to my church. Uh, come, Tommy, there is nothing more we can do here. We must go break the news to Mother as gently as we can. All right, Dad. But Anna West did it. I know she did it. No, Tommy, don't, don't be bitter. Hatred won't bring little David back to us. Dad! Well? Let's go home. Here comes her uncle, Jonathan West. He told us to keep away. Hold he on a minute, Reverend Wood. I want to talk to you. Not now, Jonathan West. I must go and tell my wife our boy's body has been found. What I have to say will only take a minute and you'll listen now. You know what's good for you and your family. Yes, Jonathan? Just this. I heard your son accusing my niece and ward of murder. I heard him calling her a witch. I'm sorry. He didn't know what he was saying. Try to understand that he's just uh, lost his only brother. I know that more. It isn't the first time the children of this neighborhood have stood in this yard screaming witch. But it's the last. I'm warning you. There'll be no more of it. My ward, Anna West, my brother's child, may not be quite normal, but she's not a witch. Even if she is the great-grandchild of one that was condemned and burned at the stake by your illustrious forefather. I'm sorry for what happened so long ago, but you yourself are to blame if that old legend will not die. Legend? Is it a legend that your house and mine has been cursed for generations by that bloody deed on Gallows Hill 200 years ago? The curse was forgotten until you came back from Africa to rule your brother's home, send his widow to an early grave, and deny his child the right to a normal, happy life. My sister-in-law was mad and her child Anna's cursed for the same affliction. Then why isn't she being treated? Why do you keep her locked up in the dismal house without companionship, with voodoo drums for playthings, with her white face and haunted eyes staring from shuttered windows? Is it any wonder that town children are afraid and call her witch? Say what you like. 
stupid curiosity made one of your sons prowl around the grounds of my property. He fell in that well and was drowned. Now I'm warning you, keep your boy Tom away from here, or, or something may happen to him, and curse that our family has put on yours, the curse of old Captain West will be fulfilled. Remember it. A curse on your house until the last of your blood kin shall be dead. May the Lord forgive you for your mockery and bless him, Jonathan West. Come, Tommy. We must go to your mother now. Remember, Reverend Wood, I've warned you. Keep away from me and mine. Lamont, did you see the look in that man's eyes? Yes, Margot, I did. It's been a long time since I've seen such murderous hate in the eyes of any human being. I wonder if that child's death was accident. I wonder. Look, look at that poor girl. She's still standing by the window watching, Lamont. Something horrible about all this. I... I have a feeling this is the beginning, not the end of a tragedy. Margot, have you forgotten we're on a vacation bound for a pleasant weekend in Maine? You made me promise. Do you want to be released from that promise? Yes. Yes, I agree with you. There's something going on here in that house, something horrible. Do you think the shadow could end it? Do you want him to try? Yes. Do what you can, Lamont. Try. And I'll help you any way I can. All right, Margot. We'll stop here and perhaps the shadow can discover what's masquerading in the guise of madness and witchcraft. <laughs> happened at the coroner's inquest, Lamont? Nothing. A routine verdict of accidental death. No wonder there's so many murders in this country. Why do you say that, Lamont? That child was dead before he ever landed in the bottom of that well, and from the way the body looked, he died of strangulation, not drowning. What did you learn about this man, Jonathan West? Plenty. In my role of inquiring reporter, I found a lot of people willing to talk about him. He managed a trading post in Africa, in the Congo. Came here when his brother died five years ago. What about the girl we saw in the window, his ward? And what about her mother? The mother died a year after her husband. Apparently went insane and killed herself. And the girl? Well, apparently Anna West was quite normal until two years ago. Then she stopped going out of the house. The neighbors began hearing those voodoo drums. And all the neighborhood children became afraid of that house. And the witch stories started. Mm. Find out anything else? Yes, one more thing. It seems that Jonathan West brought an old colored man back with him from the Congo. He's been taking care of the girl. He's always with her. Uh, like history repeating itself. Old Captain West had a Congo slave in that house 300 years ago. He was the cause of his wife's being accused of witchcraft. Well, here we are. Be careful of Jonathan West. If you go in that house, Lamont, he's dangerous. I know, Margot. Even a jackal is dangerous if he's cornered. I'll keep the short wave tuned in on our regular band. If you run into trouble and need help, let me know right away. All right, Margot. But I think this is one case the shadow can handle alone. Lamont, hmm. listen. Do you hear that? Yes, drums. Voodoo drums, all right. Oh, that poor Anna West can't know what she's doing. Beating on those drums in that dark house. Little David Wood lying dead in his coffin just across the street. Margot. How old is this girl, this Anna West? I didn't get a good look at her when she was standing in the window this afternoon. She's 18. Why? I mean, it turned out to be an important factor, Margot. Jonathan West is her guardian, and she'll soon be of age. Maybe it is, Lamont. I, I heard her father left quite a fortune. You wouldn't believe it to look at that house, dismal and dilapidated. Why, they haven't even any electricity, just lamps and candles. So I noticed. Listen, Margot, there's a storm coming up. Don't leave the car. Stay here. The only way I can find out the truth is to go into the house as the shadow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, while we're waiting for the climax of this thrilling shadow adventure, let me remind you that when clouds gather and it starts to rain, every road you travel on may automatically become a skid trap. The shadow knows when thousands are killed or injured every year by crazy car-spinning skids. Don't you owe it to your family to give them the utmost protection against this danger? Motorists, at last you can have real protection on wet, slippery roads. How? By equipping your car with new Goodrich Silvertowns with a sensational lifesaver tread. This tread is new, different from anything you've ever seen. It is wider and flatter with never-ending spiral bars that act on a wet road like a whole battery of windshield wipers. Sweep the water right and left. Force it out through deep drainage grooves. Make a dry track for the husky silver town to grip. And talk about your fast stops. Ask any of your friends who have switched to this new Goodrich Silver Town. They'll tell you that the Lifesaver Tread gives quicker, safer stops on wet roads than they ever dreamed possible. And don't forget, on dry roads too, this new Goodrich Silver Town gives you the utmost in driving security and control. Yes, motorists, 
It hugs dry roads, dries wet roads. It's the safest thing on wheels. Like girl. Hold your tongue. You'll be afraid of this whip if I give you a good taste of it. After this, you come when I call you, and come quick, you Congo devil. Mwambi not afraid for you. Mwambi not afraid for any white man, even in his own land. You are devil too, Mr. West. You hold your tongue and do as you're told, or I'll send you back to Africa. The authorities would like to get their hands on you for what you did to the commissioner's wife. I no kill commissioner's wife. She laugh at Mwambi's magic, and God of voodoo kill her. Yes, but whose hand held the knife that cut her throat? Hmm. Never mind that. I thought I told you to keep my niece Anna away from those drums, from beating those drums, tonight of all nights. I forget. Yes. You're going to forget once too often, Mwambi. Voodoo drums talk to spirit of dead boy. Listen to me, you dirty heathen. Go ahead and talk that rot to Anna. You've got her believing it, but don't try it on me. I know your tricks, you faker. Voodoo drums say boy dead now, but soon white man die. Well, all right. If your cursed voodoo drums know so much, what man's going to die? A white man in this house. Why, you treacherous old man. I'm the only white man in this house, and if there's any more killing, it'll be you that'll get it, not me. More than one white man in this house, Moambi, no. What are you talking about? What's the matter with you? Get down in the cellar and take those drums away from Anna. Take her to her room and keep her there. And another thing. Don't give her any more of that stuff you've been feeding her. You say make her life crazy? That could wait. There's plenty of time. If only you hadn't let that kid get in the house. Maybe white police find out how he died. They won't. They think it was an accident. They're burying him tomorrow, but we've got to be careful for a while. Now get down there and stop those infernal drums. Yes. Mwambi go, but you watch out. Danger close to you. Danger in shadows. White man die tonight. <laughs> Trying to throw a scare into me, are you? Well, I'll be finished with you pretty soon. <laughs> you and your voodoo nonsense, Mwambi. <laughs> Voodooism is a dangerous weapon, Jonathan West. What? Who said that? Mwambi, you devil, if this is one of your treasures! Your servant, Mwambi, has nothing to do with my presence in this house, Jonathan West. And who? He knew, he warned me. Yes. Mwambi is not a faker. His powers told him of another presence in this room. He could not see me any more than you can see me now. But he knew I was here. That's why he left so quickly. No. No, this can't be. I'm hearing things. I must be crazy. No, Jonathan West, you are sane. Quite sane. And I am real, not the fancy of a mind tormented by remorse. Remorse for the murder of an innocent child. <laughs> Who are you? How did you get here? What do you want? I am the shadow, Jonathan West. And I have come to take your ward, Anna West, out of this house before she shares the fate of the child. You murdered and flung in the well. The shadow? Yes. Yes, the shadow. You. Why, you're wrong. I didn't murder the boy. It was an accident. Yes. An accident by design. 
Just as all the things are happening in this house are accidents by design. <laughs> if there is a gun in that desk behind you, don't waste your time. It won't help you. If I could only see you. Many a criminal has made that wish. You are in this room, not just a voice. The lamplight casts deep shadows. Now we'll see if a gun will help me or not. Others have tried and failed. Maybe they have, but I won't fail. Maybe this whip will tell me where you are, Shot. Ah. You handle a bull whip well. Like a man who has used it often. You devil! I'll find you. You're here, somewhere. So you're there. <laughs> Mawambi was right. He was right. He said a man would die in this house tonight. And that man is you, Shadow. You! But there'll be no evidence. Because the house will burn to the ground. I've broken the lamp, Shadow. But you can't hear the crackling of the frame. Mawambi! Mwambi! Where's Anna? Be still. There is death in this house. The gods of voodoo are angry. Where's my ward, Anna? The house is on fire. In a few minutes, the whole town will be here. Let them come. Listen to me, Mwambi. If they get in this house and take Anna away, if they get the truth from her, you won't have to go back to Africa to be hung. She saw you strangle the boy. She'll remember. Where is she? Now, quick, tell me. If Mwambi die, you die too. It is the law of the white man, Mwambi, no. Yes. Yes, I know. That's why we've got to get rid of her. We've got to do it now. We can't wait any longer. The house is on fire, I tell you. Where is she? You let her burn in fire like wife of old Captain West. Yes. No one will know. It's even better than the way I planned. With Anna West out of the way, I'll never have to account for the money her father left her. Hurry up. There's no time to lose. Where is she? Then you give me money to go back to my people? Yes, yes, you'll get what I promised you. The gods of voodoo say no. Say I die soon. You and your voodoo gods, don't try that stuff on me. You know what I think of voodoo. And here's a taste of what you'll get if you don't tell me what you've done with that girl. No, no, no. No one be tell. Where is she? In, in, in the wine cellar. She can't get out. Door he buys. Good. Then the house will burn right overhead. Burn her alive. The fire is catching quickly. In a few minutes, no one will know whatever happened. White man who is in house, he know. <laughs> you were right about that, Mwambi. But there's no need to worry about him. He's lying on the floor, dead. What's left of him? In the room where I started the fire. <laughs> you are wrong, Jonathan West. Fooled by the oldest trick in the world. You shot and heard me fall. But I was not hit. Come back, Mwambi! You are not running out to leave me to with a shadow alone. You have been boasting about your voodoo powers. Use them now! No, no. It is the spirit of the evil one that speaks. Listen. The drums. They speak. But no hands touch them. Listen, Moambi. Hear the message of the drums. Death. Death for Moambi. Listen to me, Moambi. Listen to me. You have committed murder for Jonathan West. Now he means to murder you. You will never get out of this place alive. Never. No. No, don't listen to him, Mwambi. I wouldn't do that. You've served me well. I... But he's through with you. No, Mwambi. You've killed for him. Now he means to kill you. No, no. Hear me, Mwambi. I... I hear you. I hear you, Shadow. The drums foretold. Keep away from me. Drop that knife, you heathen devil. No. You plan to kill me. I kill you. You ask for it, Mwambi. There. We die together. 
I, by you gun, you by my knife. Uh, you, uh, Mwambi, die, but you die first. Drum, speak. get poor Anna West out of that house, Lamont. It was easy once I succeeded in turning Moambi against West. They killed each other. How's the girl when you saw her last? Scared. And she kept talking about a strange voice that led her out of the cellar just before the house caved in. But aside from that, she seems perfectly normal. Anna West would be perfectly normal now that Moambi's dead. Kept the girl in a hypnotic trance. Oh. Only a matter of time before he drove the girl insane with those infernal drums. Well, she's in good hands now. Reverend Wood and his wife have taken her in. Look, Lamont, we're passing the city limit. Yes, Margot. Yes, out of the city. Out of the city where a fanatic tried to perpetuate a curse made 300 years ago, but in so doing met his own fate by the superstitious revenge he himself wished to inflict upon others. Jonathan West and Mwambi met the fate which the forces of justice eventually meet out to all criminals, such as they. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> Characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental.
Ladies and gentlemen, The Shadow's latest adventure starts in just a moment. Right now, here's a short safety reminder. Next week, next month, may be too late to replace smooth, unsafe tires with new Goodrich Safety Silvertown. What if your tires suddenly lose their grip and skid wildly over a wet highway? What if a heat blister forms inside of your tire and bang, without warning, a high-speed blowout throws your car out of control? The sooner you equip with new Goodrich Silvertowns, the safer your family will be. I'll guarantee you'll never know what the word stop really means until you've felt the non-skid grip of the amazing lifesaver tread on a wet road. Yes, and you'll never know what real freedom from blowout worries is until you've discovered the peace of mind that comes from riding on the only tires built with the famous golden ply. Treat your family to two-way protection against skids and blowouts at no extra cost. For safety's sake, ride on Goodrich Safety Silvertown. The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, Professor X. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 3,000 volts on the plate. 6,000 volts on the fourth amplifier. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, now I send a little more current through the millimeter, and we see what... Ugh, knocking, knocking. Why do people bother me all the time? Oh, yeah, 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 I come. Oh, bothering a man. How can I get my work done? Well, well, what is it? What are you... Uh, hiya, Professor. Oh, oh Mr. Martin, I, I did not know it was you. Yeah, that's what I figured. Working late as usual, eh, Professor? Well, yeah, there's so much to do and so little time in which to do it. Yeah. But Mr. Martin, you you didn't come over to take everything away from me. Hey, I sunk a lot of money in this laboratory, Professor. But, but, but please, please, a little more time. Ah, right? take it easy, Professor. All I came over here was for, to see how far you've cut with your work. Now, oh, why don't you show me? Oh, yeah, 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 sure, sure. I, I show you. Over over here, please. Okay. Now, now you see, under this cathode tube, I, I have a large container. I, I open the lid. Watch. It's a cat, so what? Wait, wait I, I, I close the lid. Now, now watch. Watch close. Now, 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 watch, watch close, Mr. Martin. Watch close. Ah, yeah, ah, yeah. You, you see, I, I have done it. Done what? You throw a switch, a lot of sparks fly, a bang like a firecracker. So what? Yeah, yeah but look, look in the box. Okay. The cat. Why, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is gone. Disintegration. Complete disintegration. You mean that cat is gone into thin air? Yeah, yeah. The rays of the tube cause tremendous electronic activity in the living body placed beneath it. With the result that when the potential reaches a high enough peak, the body disintegrates completely. Never under mind the... the scientific stuff. What I want to know is why didn't you tell me about this before? I put up the dough for this place on a crack-brained idea so no one else would listen to. Now you got put it over and you didn't want to tell me about it. What's the idea? Oh, yeah, but, but, but you, you don't understand. My, my work is not done. I saw it with my own yeah, eyes. Yeah, but that is only half of it. Reintegration. The assembly of the body at another point. That is yet undone. Talk <laughs> English. When my work is complete, I will be able to disintegrate living flesh so that it can be sent across space by wires, like, like messages are now sent. You hear me, Mr. Martin? Living flesh by wire. Eh, what good will that be? Why, it, it will change the world. 
Human beings will be able to travel from one place to the other as quickly as radio waves now travel. Oh, I tell you, Mr. Martin, only a few months more work and I will be You'll able be to... You'll be able to do nothing. Well, what, what, what do you mean? Your work is through. Your... True? Yeah, No, true. no, my work... Done, finished. No, no, but my experiments have only begun. And I say they're finished. Well, what do you... Why do you say that, Mr. Martin? You, you mean you, you don't give me any more money? When I first heard about your idea... I said to myself, okay, fella, maybe he's a crackpot and maybe he ain't. But it's worth putting up a little dough. Well, now you've done your work, so finish. Yeah, but, but, but I, I say again, I am not to. And I say, uh, it's true, ain't it, that if I was to put a man in that box, pull them controls, bang, and he'd be gone just like that? Yeah, 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 but the cattle tube expands itself each time the disintegration takes place. You mean you have to put in a new tube every time? Yeah, yeah. Well, put in another one right now. Oh, but alas, I cannot. That was the last one I have here. I have used them all experimenting. Where'd you get them from? A new consignment is coming tomorrow. I placed a permanent order with the company who make them. Tomorrow, eh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you've done what I wanted you to, eh? <laughs> I've got a couple of people I don't like. Oh! Yeah, and I'll put them in there. The box is plenty big enough. Shoot in the juice and, well... No body, no murder, no evidence. How do you like that, Professor? Oh, no, 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 but you, you, you cannot do that. I, I have discovered this for the good of man. I, I will tell the police. So long, Professor. I told you you were finished. Now the machine belongs to me. I'm the only one who knows about it. <laughs> And I'll have no trouble getting hold of the new tubes to make it work. What a strange sort of road this is, Lamont. Mm -hmm. so it's leading us to a very strange man, Margot. What do you mean? Well, Professor Kramer isn't exactly a simple character. The man's been on the faculty of some of the greatest universities in the county. Great inventive mind, yet he's a man whom very few people know about. But why go all the way out here to this place to visit him? Congratulations. Why, well, congratulate Because me. in spite of the fact that you're a woman, you've controlled your curiosity for exactly one hour and 15 minutes of driving. <laughs> All right. Make fun of me. But I do want to know. Why come out here? Professor Kramer was one of my instructors in school. For some reason, he's, well, took a sort of liking to me, and I haven't heard from him for some time. In fact, I haven't even known where he's been. You see, he left the university some time ago and has been conducting some private experiments, something to do with cathode tubes. Whatever they are. Well, to make it simple, call them X-ray tubes. At any rate... I haven't heard from Professor Kramer until, until yesterday. And then? Then I got a rather mysterious note telling me that he had something very important to show me, something that no one else in the world had ever seen. Well? So here we are, on our way. Something that no one else in the world has ever seen? Now, you are interested, aren't you? Oh, I should hope so. But it's so late. H how much further do we have to go? I understand he lives in the house right at the top of this hill we're climbing. Something that no one else in the world has ever seen. It's intriguing, isn't it? Well, here we are at the top, but I don't see any house. If this is a wild goose chase... Oh, no, Lamont, look. Look through the trees. Yes, you're right. This is a house. What a weird-looking place to live, miles away from town. Of course, I never like company. Well, let's go see what's up. All right. Trees are awfully thick, aren't they? A... Uh, come on, take my arm. Almost dark. I can hardly Keep see... Keep hold of me. Come along. Oh, it looks this path. No one's been to visit the professor since last fall. Lamont... How strange. What? It's dark, and yet there are no lights in the house. I noticed that. Could it be the wrong address? Let us said the house on top of the hill. It looks so deserted. Well, we'll find out quickly enough whether I made a mistake. Here, up these stairs. Somehow this place gives me the shivers. Well, after all, Margot, I didn't say I was taking you to a haunted house. Well, it must be the wrong house, Lamont. Look. No, no, you look. Card under the bell, Alfred Kramer. Then it is the right place. Certainly. Find a bell button. No. There's a bell pull. She'd open the door. It's cold out must here. Must be asleep. I'll try again. Not a sound from in there. Strange, you should be asleep so early. I'll try knocking. Lamont, the door's open. Open all the time. Come on. Wait for me, Lamont. Professor? Professor Kramer? It's dark. Professor Kramer, are you here? It's Lamont Cranston. He only had some light. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that does it. Now we'll see. Lamont? What? Well, Lamont, what's happened here? Everything's torn up. Professor Kramer? Professor Kramer, are you here? Professor Kramer? Lamont, is he there? Oh, bedroom's empty. Everything undisturbed. Everything in this room's ripped apart. What happened here? 
Look at the wall over there. What? Those wires torn loose. Look as if someone ripped some equipment out. Yes, that's true, but why should the professor have left so suddenly? Professor Kramer never did anything suddenly in his life. I just don't get this. He isn't here, though. If we were going away, why should he have asked me to come out here tonight? No, we just decided to leave, that's all. You said yourself hmm. he was an eccentric old man. Come on, Lamont, let, let's get out of here. No, wait. What is it? The wall. Look. What is it, Lamont? Over here. See? New plaster, wet. Wet plaster? Yes. Did you see, Margot? This whole section here has been replastered within the last few hours. What does that mean? I'm going to find out what it means. Lamar, what are you going to do with that stick? Stand aside, Margot. I'm going to find out why this wall was replastered. Lamont, you shouldn't. Damaging the wall, Professor Chris. Margot, look out. Oh. New plaster's breaking away from the original wall. Oh! fell out of the wall. Professor Kramer. It's Professor Kramer. Oh. Look. Look, that bullet hole. He's been murdered. Oh, but who? His what? equipment, his experiments. Oh, don't you understand? Whatever it is, he wanted me to come up here tonight and see. Someone murdered him and stole that equipment. How horrible. Oh. A poor old man who spent his entire life devising things to help humanity. And for that he gets this, a, a bullet through his head and a plaster wall for a grave. Well, Professor Kramer, I promise you this. Whoever did this to you will meet the shadow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before we again join the shadow, let me ask you this question. If you're trying to squeeze the last few miles out of your tires, if you're driving around on smooth, worn tires, do you know what a chance you're taking? The shadow knows. It doesn't pay to gamble on tires. Thousands are killed or injured every year when skids throw cars out of control. Yes, motorists. And before you experience that sickening pit-of-the-stomach feeling... Equip your car with the new Goodrich Silvertown tire. Then you'll have the greatest skid protection ever offered. The skid protection of the Lifesaver Tread. And if you're wondering how the new Goodrich Silvertown stacks up against other tires, listen to this. The engineers of America's largest independent testing laboratory tested the regular and premium price tires of America's six largest tire manufacturers with these results. The new Goodrich Silvertown with Lifesaver Tread gave greater skid resistance than any other tire tested regardless of price. It also gave greater non-skid mileage than any other tire tested in its own price range. It averaged 19.1% more miles before the tires wore smooth. And that's the same as saying you'll get every sixth mile free. Right now is the time to replace any smooth, dangerous tires on your car with Goodrich. Spelled G-O-O-D-R-I-C-H. Goodrich Safety Silvertown. The safest thing on wheels. There is no extra cost. Come on. I thought you told me you were an electrician. Sure, sure I am, Mr. Martin, but gosh, I never connected up a rigmarole like this one. Listen, fella. You said yourself it was a simple job to connect this apparatus up following the diagrams in that notebook. Well, sure, Mr. Martin, but I got it almost done. It's just a couple more wires. Well, but... get going. Oh, sure. Hey, sure is a funny setup. Like an x-ray machine and it isn't exactly like any X-ray setup I ever saw. Hurry up, hurry up. Sure, Mr. Martin. Yeah. This wire, yeah. Yes, and this wire. There you are. Got it connected up just like it says in those diagrams. Say, uh, who is this Kramer fellow who's got his name signed on all the pages of the notebook, Mr. Martin? Uh, is he the fellow who built this? Uh... All connected up, eh? Yeah, sure, just... Just like it says right here. The new cathode tube has been put in? Oh, yeah, and the power's ready to be turned on. You're going to tell me now, aren't you? Yeah. 
I'll let the machine itself tell you. Well, what do you mean? Uh, uh, gun? Well, yeah, what, you've what? been asking a lot of questions, fella. Yeah, well, what are you pointing the gun at me for? Open the lid of that box by the machine. Well, why? What are you going to do? Open it. Okay. I don't know what you intend doing, but... Cut the talk and open the box. There. It's open now. Now, get in there and lie down. In the box? Yeah. <laughs> I ain't done nothing, Mr. Hey, Martin. Want I want you get in that box. Now, lie down. Yeah, but, Mr. You but... want me to drill you with a bullet? that would make you lie down fast enough. Oh, no, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, don't shoot. Now. Uh, just don't. Don't shut me in the box. I, I, ain't, I ain't done nothing. Mr. Martin. Hey, let me out of here. I can't breathe. Let me out of here, Mr. Martin. Now we'll see if the Mr. machine Martin. works or not. Let me out of here, Mr. Martin. I told this switch. Mr. Martin. That part of it's all right. You won't kick and yell much longer after this switch is closed. So, maybe it does work. I'll know as soon as I open the box. It works. There's nothing left of them. The box is empty. All right, Margo, this is as far as we ride. We'll uh, walk the rest of the way. Whatever you say, Lamont. Let's go. I don't understand why you came all the way out here, Lamont. What could these farms out here possibly have to do with the murder of Professor Kramer? Well, the man who murdered the old man didn't think it possible that anyone would call on Kramer before that plaster wall dried up. Here, yeah, walk down this road. But what was your finding the professor got to do with this trip, Lamont? I'm not expecting anybody to dig behind that plaster wall. The murder didn't go through the professor's pockets. And in one of those pockets, I found a letter. A letter signed Joe Martin. Martin? Who's he? I checked carefully on Mr. Martin's career, and I find he's a rather strange individual to be having dealings with a man of Professor Kramer's caliber. What do you mean? Martin is a man who made a great deal of money during Prohibition days. And a great number of enemies. Police suspect him of at least half a dozen murders, but there's never been any tangible evidence against him. So many of his bootlegger friends were gunning after him shortly before Prohibition ended. He left the country, turned just a short while ago, and has been living in seclusion. Why he should have been furnishing money to the professors, the letter indicated, is something the shadow wants to know. And Martin lives out here? Right. This farm right ahead. Well, look at that fence. A barbed wire fence all around the place. Don't well, bother with the gate. Come on. Sit through these strands of wires and sort of surprise our host, Mr. Martin. You'll tear my dress. No, I'll hold the wires apart and you can slip through him. Oh, oh, Lamont! What? Oh. No! Oh, no, come here! Why the charge? Lamont! Burning your hand! Can't you get loose? No. The high voltage has paralyzed my muscles. Get a stick. Get a stick. Try to put what are you doing? There's someone coming. Martin, you must see me. Hey, where are you? Get away, Margot. You've got to get away. Oh, I'll get you loose. No, no, get clear of me. Don't touch me. Uh, uh, Margot, you're all right. I'm, I'm all right. You took the whole force of the voltage through your own body in order to pull me loose. Margot, you're the, the Stay brain. where you are, woman. Stay where you are and shoot. I'm not running away. Don't you pull off the wire? Wire? Don't stall. I saw you pull somebody loose. Where is he? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, don't give me that. Something short-circuited the wire. I got the alarm at the house, and I ran out just in time to see you pull someone off. Now, who was it? Where is he? You see, I'm quite alone. Oh, so you're sure about that, are you, sister? Of course. Okay. That's swell. If there's no one with you, you can come along with me. Come, come along where? In the house. <laughs> I need a sort of a guinea pig. A guinea pig? Yeah. A human one. Or an experiment. <laughs> Works okay, don't it? What is it? Not scared much, are you? Why, why should I be frightened? <laughs> yeah. You're a funny one, all right. You're alone, there's no question about that. 
I found your car where you parked it, and nobody else in it. I don't know. Sure can't figure it out. I thought I saw a man on the wire. Tell me why I should be frightened. Well, why not, sister? I don't look like a boy scout now, do I? And this room full of electrical stuff, it don't look like a soda fountain now, does it? Still see no reason to be frightened. No. <laughs> well, something tells me that before you're ten minutes older... Yeah, you know what you're going to be doing? What? You're going to be screaming your head off. Because you're going to be more scared than any dame's been scared in all her life. Do you always talk in riddles? <laughs> Come on. Take a look at this box. Come on, take a look, I tell you. What's in it? Infested, ain't you? Take a look. Why, it's empty. Yeah, but not for long. You see, you're going to be in it. I? Yeah. You remember what I said? A guinea pig? <laughs> yeah, a pretty one, too. What are you talking about? Why should I get in that box? Kind of stalling, ain't you? Hey, who are you expecting? The Marines? The boyfriend on a white horse? You've got to tell me what this is all about. Sure, I'll tell you why not. It's your one-way ticket to hell. The same ticket I'm going to issue to a lot of my pals. You mean kill me and, and others? Yeah. The old professor figured out a sure way to get rid of the rats you don't like. And a way no cop living or dead could figure out. You put them in a box, you pull a switch, and finish. No body, no nothing. <laughs> neat, eh? Too neat, Joe Martin. Hey, who's talking? A voice that should have talked to you a long time ago. Come on out wherever you are. Come on out and I'll let you have it. How can you send a bullet through something you can't see, Joe Martin? A voice? Why, it's right close to me. Hey, who are you? Call me the Shadow. The, the Shadow? From your face, I see you've heard the name. I heard it, yeah, sure. The voice that comes out of nowhere. But it can't be. Voices don't talk out there. It's a trick. I will, men, not to see me. You, woman. That's why you weren't afraid. Expecting him, eh? And now he's here. But he won't get me. Get in there. Uh, uh, Margo! Uh, Are you right throwing her in there? No. I've got my hand on the electric switch. The minute you touch me or try to let her out of the box, I'll throw the switch and she'll be dead. And neither you or the devil will be able to get her back. Margo, it's all right, Margo. Yeah, it's all right as long as you don't touch me or touch that box. <laughs> so you're the great shadow that's got all the smart boys worried, eh? <laughs> well, what are you going to do about this? Don't pull that switch. Now, why shouldn't I? I paid that old boy Kramer plenty for this chance. You murdered him. Oh, you know about that too, do you? Well, maybe that makes me all the more anxious to throw this switch and get rid of your dame. What do you want? Oh, you're ready to make a deal, are you? Well, that's smart. What do you want? First, I want what no one else has ever been able to ask. What's that? Speak up. I want to see you. See me? Yes, yeah, see you. See you in flesh and blood. Nobody's kidding me. You're not just a voice coming out of here. You've got a head and a body and legs and arms. And I want to see them. No one... No one has ever seen me. Lamont, help me! No air! Oh, Lamont, eh? <laughs> well, fella, you heard what she was yelling. No air. Are you going to let me see who you are? <laughs> so maybe I can send a slug through you? Oh, not talking, eh? <laughs> Don't like the idea of me getting the best of you, eh? All right, fella. I'm giving you the counter three to make up your mind. At three, I throw the switch and, sir, help me, there won't be enough left of that dame to put in a matchbox. One. Two. Do I get to see your shadow? Okay, then, here she goes. Three. Come on, come on. Come on, Margaret. It's all right. Oh, Mart, are you all right? Let me help you out of here. Uh, there. Oh, that horrible sound. I no, no, you... no. I'm, I'm all right. But, Martin, where... Look on the floor below the switchboard. Oh. Not a pretty sight, is it? Oh, his face. The what... electricity burned him as crispy as if he had sat in the electric chair. Don't look at him anymore, dear. But, but how did it happen? He was looking around trying to see me as his hand reached out of the switch. 
Instead of touching the insulated handle, his fingers closed on the metal. Oh, but Lamont, why did you let him... Why well, did you let him put me... Well, finish your sentence. You mean, why did I let him throw the switch? Well, because it wouldn't have hurt you anyway. Why not? While he was busy threatening me, I... I disconnected the wires leading to the cathode tube. Oh. Risking your life would have been too high a price, Margot. Even to catch a rat of mountain sort. The rat caught himself in his own trap. Yes. Yes, his own trap. The penalty for murder in this state is... to die by electricity. Well, we can close the books on Joe Martin. The law has taken its course. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. adventurer, The Shadow, mystery man who strikes terror into the very hearts of shopsters, lawbreakers, and criminals. Today on the air, Blue Coal brings you The Shadow's latest adventure, Hounds in the Hills. High in the pine-clad hills of North Carolina, where backwoods living is neighbor to palatial winter homes, there is a haunted mansion, relic of former grandeur. With no visible means of support, old Sadie, haggard, half-demented creature, and Jake, a hunchback son, live in one wing of the dilapidated old house. A pack of great, 
vicious crossbreed hounds guards the old place from intruders. It is early evening. In the dim half-light, two figures led by one of the hounds approach the house. Your golf's improving. So, Cranston, you don't always miss the ball, eh? Well, that's what a vacation in North Carolina does for you. Especially when you're the host, Mr. Rupert. <laughs> I thought you were always on vacations, Lamont. I've never heard of you doing anything except dabbling in that mysterious laboratory of yours. Yes, just a playboy. <laughs> yes, I just dabble. A little science, a little chemistry, a little psychology. I just dabble. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's calling you, Gary. You'd be in a hurry. Well, it's the sheriff. I hope I haven't done anything wrong. Perhaps he saw you drive, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Sorry to bother you. Well, what is it, Sheriff? Another child lost. Gone over the cliff at the border trail. What? Another one? Yes, a little Dickie Nelson this time. Oh, good Lord, Sheriff, this is horrible. Child lost? Is, is that what you said, Sheriff? Yes, sir. A fourth in less than two weeks. Lost? Lost how? On the border trail over the cliff there. Oh, that's awful. Well, what is this trail, Gary? Well, it's a narrow pathway along the rim of a high cliff. It washes out so that a slip on the gravel starts to slide right over the cliff. And you mean to say four boys have been lost there in two weeks? Yes. Four? Yes, but doesn't it strike you there might be something more than just fate causing the disappearance of these children? Well, but what? That I don't know. Gary, I'd like to look at this cliff. <laughs> See how the trail washes out down the cliff? Yes, yes. That's a thousand feet straight down there. The river at the bottom. Yeah. I reckon the current must carry the bodies away. We haven't found a trace of them. I don't suppose there's any doubt about what happened to the boys. No, Miss Lynn. When Bobby Mina disappeared last week, we found a ball he'd been playing with. Did you call that conclusive evidence? Well, this morning we snared up Dickie Nelson's cap that was caught on some shrubbery part way down the mountain. Hmm. Of course, some of the colored folk around here think ghosts done it. Ghost? Yeah. See, they were howling last night about the time Dickie was lost here. What kind of howling, Sheriff? Darn to find no suit. They say they heard it the three times the other boys were lost. But you know how they are. Colored folks up here in the hills are superstitious. Yes. But what kind of a howl does a ghost make in this part of the country, Sheriff? Well, that's what I asked. About near they could describe it, it was like a dog howling. A hound dog. Well, I've generally found that a dog howling means a dog. Perhaps I'd better reverse the usual procedure, the dog trailing a man. It's all very mysterious, Lamont. Yes, it is, Margot. Will you excuse me for a moment, Sheriff? Yes, certainly, Mr. Cranston. Margot, 
I think the shadow will look into this mystery. But how? Go back to the house, Margot. I'll wireless you. I need help. In my invisible state as the shadow, I'm going to follow the clue of the dogs and see where it leads me. Sadie or Jake see you? No, it's dark in here. But even with a light on, people can't see me because I've learned how to make them think they don't see me. I blind their eyes to me. How? Never mind how. You must believe it and don't be afraid of me. I'm your friend. Yes, sir. Trust me, Dickie. Perhaps I can find a way to get you and the other boys out of it. Quiet. Somebody come. Sheriff find these kids here, they'll hang us, you crazy old fool. Now, don't you touch my baby. He's my Jackie. Uh, He's you before you came a hunchback. If you kill him, you'll be killing yourself. He's you, Jake. You keep away from me. Don't you touch me. Jake, don't touch that boy. Who's that? I heard it, too. Give me that lamp. I heard it, too, Jake. Uh, Nobody's in here but us. Us and the kid. He got out. No. I'm still here. The voice. Mm-hmm. Ain't nobody with it. I heard it, too. Well, that's nothing, Jake. I'm always hearing voices. <laughs> and now you're hearing them. Ah, we're both crazy. <laughs> uh, reckon it ain't so crazy a voice can scare me. If I'm crazy like you, then voices ain't real. Now put this shit out of the way, no. and then I'll get the others. No, no, stop. Please don't hit me with that stick. No, 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 Jake. Put down that stick, Jake. Put it down. Now. I ain't scared of voices that ain't real. I said drop it. Ah. Who hit me? Look. Look at that place on my wrist. Look. (laughs) Well, Jake, I've been hearing voices for a long time. But I ain't never been hit by one. You done it. Oh, I did not. I wasn't near you. Then it was the kid. I never moved. Well, then who? I hit you, Jake. Now, I'm going to give you a chance to save yourself. Let this boy go. Bring the other boys here. I'll take them home. No. No, they're mine. They're mine. They're Dickie. No, now, I'll get rid of them my way. Please help me. I want to go home. Trust me, Dickie. There's only one thing for me to do now. Jake, this is your last chance. Right. Who's that? Uh, you reckon it's somebody looking for the kids? Heaven it is. Jake, it must be them. The Duke and Slim coming to hide out. Ah, uh, listen. Yeah. Hit him. Oh, Jake, he'll kill us both. He knows about my baby. Well, what he don't know won't hurt him. Shut the door to the kid's room and lock it. Yeah, hurry up, Jake. Let him in. But don't say a word about my baby. Don't worry. Yeah. Maybe I'm crazy, too, but I ain't that crazy. Well, what took you so long, Jake? Hello, Duke. Come in, Slim. Hurry up. Shut the door. Okay, Duke. Yeah, what a dump this is. It's better than being in jail up north. If we didn't have this hideout, that's where you'd be. Oh, hello, old Sadie. Uh, come in, Duke. <laughs> Cops after you again. Shut up. That half-witted old Dane talks too much. Hey, are you staying for a while, Duke? What's it to you? I don't care. Oh, lay off the guy, Slim. Jake, and you too, old Sadie. Yeah? We're taking a little rest away from the cops. See? 
Turn the dogs loose in the yard around the house so they can chew up anybody that comes here looking for us. Go on, Jake. Do it now. All right, Duke. Just a minute, Jake. Who's that? Somebody's in here, Duke. <laughs> The voice again, Jake. They can't hear it unless they're crazy. That voice again. Yes, Jake, that same voice. And the Duke can hear it, too. Can't you, Duke? Say, what's going on here? Who is that? I tell you, it's in here, Duke. Who's playing tricks on me? Duke, did you ever hear of the shadow? The shadow? I have, Duke. I know, that's the guy that talks to you, but you can't see him. Shut up, you fool. Yes, shadow. I've heard about you. I never believed what I heard, though. You can believe it now. Listen, Duke. I'm here for only one purpose. To save the lives of four little children. Oh, don't believe him. It's a lie. Shut up. I'm handling this. Go ahead, Shadow. Go ahead. Talk some more. All right. Old Sadie and Jake there put you in a tough spot. How, Shadow? Old Sadie is crazy. She's... Well, shall we say... Borrowed... Four little boys from places near here and made it appear that they were killed. Killed, falling over a cliff. Oh, it's a lie. They was killed. I killed them and my daddy took their place. Duke, the old dame is back. Shut up. Jake here is almost as crazy as his mother, but he wants to kill the boys. Uh, don't believe him, Duke. Either way, you'll be arrested for kidnapping. Hey, Duke, we don't want no part in kidnapping. Well, Shadow... What's the proposition? If you let me take the boys away back to their homes, you won't be accused of kidnapping. And give you a chance to tip off the police to where we're hiding out? <laughs> oh, no. Let him have it, Slim. <laughs> Look, Duke, the door. He went out the door. He's gone, Duke. He's gone. We can't get him now. Oh, yes, we can. How? Ah, oh, the dog. <laughs> if the shadow's a man, them dogs can follow his scent. <laughs> if the shadow is a man, you mean the dogs will trail him by his scent? Even though we can't see him? He's right, Duke. But we haven't got anything to give the dogs to smell, to give them the scent. Uh, maybe he left something in the kid's room. Let's go and see. Yeah. Come on, let's, let's see. Yeah. Find out. Yeah, let's, let's look around here. Ah, he's too clever to have left anything behind. Hey, where'd the boy get that handkerchief he's sniffling in the... Handkerchief, huh? Yeah. He never had no handkerchief when he come here. Uh, who gave you this handkerchief, little boy? A man. What man? man who spoke to me in the dark. You couldn't see him? No. He said I had to believe he was here, although I couldn't see him. <laughs> then it's the shadows. Hey, get the dogs. Yeah. Get the dogs. They can get a scent from that handkerchief and trail him. The shadow can't escape this time. again anymore, trying to lose us among the trees in the dark so he can go back to the house and finish off them kids? Let him have it. Okay, boss. I wasn't. Honest, I wasn't. Okay. Then come on. Hey, you, Jake. Ain't those dogs liable to turn on us? Yeah. If you was alone. Yeah, but I'm with you. You hear that, Duke? The dogs have got the shadow. Uh, it's lucky for us he left his handkerchief with the kids so the hounds could get the scent, ain't it, huh? Yeah. Now... There's only one or two things for the shadow to do. Stand and be chewed by them beasts, or else climb a tree. He's not invisible to a dog's nose. They can smell him. If he's climbed a tree, we got him, Duke. Hey, there's the dog jumping around that tree. Right there. See him? Well, what do we do now? Well, we can't do much while it's dark. What do you mean? I mean we got to keep the shadow treed until it's daylight. Yeah, but you can't see him, whether it's light or dark. That's right. Maybe he's beating us after all. Listen, if we wait till daylight, then we can see where he is in the tree. But you can't see where he is. 
Yeah, but when he comes, he has to shake the branch he's sitting on. And when we see any of them leaves shaking, we'll shoot right at that place. It'll be like shooting at nothing. I know. Hey, if we don't get him that way, he has two other things to choose from. Yeah, what's that? We can keep him treed until he gets so weak he can't work his invisibility gag anymore. And he comes down. And then the dogs get him. Well, there's nothing to do but wait till morning then. No, but we got to keep awake. Morning ain't far off. And then we'll see. Hey, Duke. I got to thinking, sitting here last night. What about them kids? Well, Slim, what about them? We didn't do it. But they can pin a kidnapping rap on us. Not without evidence, Slim. No, but she... Oh, I get it. No evidence, huh? That's right. No kids. What do you think? Yeah. Jake here don't want no evidence either. As soon as we dispose of the man who calls himself the shadow, no one will know. And then Jake here gets rid of the kids. That's right. Yeah, but how about Jake and old Sadie? I think they could uh, disappear and not be missed. Yeah, that's what I thought. Hey, Duke, look. We can see the whole tree now. But I don't see nobody. No, of course not. But he's there. Now watch carefully, Slim. There's no wind. Any limb or branch that moves may be the shadow. Yeah. So when something moves, let him have it. I get it. Hey, but how do we know when we get him? He'll come down, Slim. Now you miss, Slim. Take your time. Hey, what's that? I thought I saw a branch move. We're shooting at the shadow, Jake. And when he's unconscious or dead, we can see him all right. And then... <laughs> Didn't do so good yourself, Duke. Uh, those dogs are hungry. Yeah. I bet they look nice from up in the tree, waiting for their breakfast. How can you shoot him if you can't see him? Shut up, Jake. Now, take your time, Slim. Good morning, Duke. He's there. Good morning, Shadow. I hope you slept well. Oh, yeah. And you? Now, watch close, Slim. Yeah, yeah. Would it be too much for me to ask how are the little boys? They're all right, Shadow. So far, that's good. Yeah, but I'll get rid of him. Slim, get around the other side of the tree. I think he's low in the tree, behind the trunk. Okay, Duke. We're taking care of you first, Shadow. You know too much. <laughs> well, what's funny, Shadow? I'm laughing at you, Duke. Oh, yeah? You laugh different when I get my hands on you. Why don't you come up here? I don't have to. You'll come down. You'll have a long wait. Oh, yeah? Can't you say anything but, oh, yeah? You're really quite stupid, Duke. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm smart enough to get you out of that tree. Good. I was getting rather bored. Ah, shut up. Hey, Slim. Go back to the house and get an axe. This tree ain't too big to cut down. Very ingenious. Yeah, but the dog. It ain't safe to leave without Jake. The dogs, they won't touch you. They're after the shadow. And Jake will keep him here. Sure, sure. I'll keep him here, sure. And hurry back, Slim. Now, Slim. Okay, Duke. But don't let them dogs come after me. Jake will keep the dogs here. Okay, watch it. Now, now hurry back, Slim. Hey, Jake. Call the dogs off. They're going after Slim. Yeah, they don't like him. They call him back. Slim, look out. Oh, Jake. The dogs are attacking him. Guess you, you didn't shoot him soon enough, Duke. Well, Jake, your dog's got slim. I'm afraid you've lost most of them. Yeah. Ma'll be awful mad. There's only Big Tom left. But the Duke will shoot him. No, he won't. His gun's empty. Look at him go up that tree. Yeah. Big Tom didn't get him. Now you're both up in the tree, ain't you? No, Jake, I'm standing right here behind you. Now, do what I tell you. Go over to that tree and tie Big Tom to it. So that the Duke can't get down. Why should I? You want to get those kids out of the way, don't you? Duke won't let you. Yeah. He won't, maybe. Yeah, he won't let me, maybe. Hey, I won't tell him what I'm going to do. Jake, call off this dog. Tie him up, do you hear me? Tie him up. No, not to my tree, you dope. Take him away. 
Listen to me. Don't tie him there, you half-wit. Well, Duke, we change places. I'll get you if it's the last thing I do, Shadow. You're going to have plenty to do before we meet again. Jake, come back here. Yeah. You'll yeah. have plenty of time to think about that. Here are some men that may help you out. Who are they? Uh, my Lord, what happened here? I don't know, Sheriff. Say, this is the hunchback, Jake. Hello, Jake. Jukes up in the tree. Yeah, sit down, Sheriff. I... We got him. Reckon that dog won't attack anyone else. You killed him! Now, if our friend will come down out of the tree, I'll be delighted to put a pair of handcuffs onto him. I've been looking for him and his partner for some time. From the looks of things, I won't need to put the cuffs on his partner. Well, Marco, you better go back to the cars. All right. Yes, I think I will. I, I only wanted to see if... Yes, I'll go back. All right, men. Let's take him away. Margo. Margo. Oh, Oh, Lamont. Lamont, are you all right? Yes, but don't speak my name here. Darling, I was so frightened when I got your wireless message. I, I thought it was the end. So did I. Are the boys all right? Yes, all the boys are safe. They've been taken into town. A deputy sheriff took old Sadie along. Dickie Nelson is in one of the cars up the road waiting. Oh, Lamont, I feel so sorry for that poor old woman. So do I, Margot. She's demented. We must see that she's placed in an institution, not a prison. A place where she can satisfy her mother love mania with dolls. Instead of other people's children. Go to the car, Margo. I'll meet you there. What are we waiting for, Miss Lane? I want to go home to my mother. Just a minute, Dickie. I'm expecting someone. Who? Oh, here he comes now. Hello, Margo. Hello, Lamont. Who is this young man? This is Dickie Nelson. Dickie Lamont Cranston. Hello, Mr. Cranston. <laughs> well, Dickie... I hear you had quite an adventure last night. Yes. A kind man came to my room at that terrible house. But I couldn't see him. Maybe you dreamt it, Dickie. Supposing we keep it a secret. Just between us three. Yes, I think that's a good idea. All right. But it was a swell dream. You have just heard a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> As you so evil, so shall you reap. Evil. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station. Blue Coal, America's finest anthracite, will again present another thrilling adventure of the shadow. Be sure to listen. And be sure to burn Blue Coal, the solid fuel for solid comfort. character who furthers the forces of law and order is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the shadow belongs. Today's story, Mansion of Madness. <laughs> Hello! 
anybody home? Well, you didn't expect there would be, did you, Lamont? We did think we saw a light as we came up the road, Margo. Well, then try again. What in the world is a medieval castle doing in this country, Lamont? Oh, you know how castles get around. Well, I guess it's useless, Margo. No one seems to... Well, at last. Come on, Margo. Oh, well, how do you do? We, uh... uh... You will please come this way. <clears throat> Thank you. Come on, Margo. Lamont, do you see what I hope I don't see? Quiet, Margo. I, uh... I hope you'll pardon our intruding on you here. We, uh, we stall down the road. You will please be seated. Yes. Yes, thank you. As, uh, I started to say, we were stall down the road. I will strike a light. Thank you. Our car was so... Now I will call the master. Thank you. <sighs> Margot. Would you be interested in hearing how we were stalled down? You will please be seated. (laughs) Nice, pleasant little man, wasn't he? Did you see his face? I saw half of it. That's all he has. One side is as flat as a coin. No eye, no ear. Yes, I saw it plainly enough, Lamont. Look at this room. Those old tallow flambeaux on the wall. Everything seems so musty and old. Oh, Lamont, let's get out of here, can we? I don't like this. Be careful, Margot. Someone's coming. Look, Margot. Good evening. My man tells me you've had trouble with your car. Uh, yes, we, uh, we're stuck in the mud up the road a bit. I know this is an awfully late hour. Oh, to... no apologies, please. It isn't often that visitors come to Bellhouden, even by accident. Permit me to introduce myself. I am Caldus Madisol, uncle of Millicent Chantelford. Present mistress of Bellhouten Castle. On her behalf and on my own, I welcome you. Thank you. Mr. Montesol, Miss Margot Lane. Charmed, Miss Lane. How do you do? Mr. Cranston, Mr. Montesol. How do you do, sir? Delighted, Mr. Cranston. May I ask him what way I can serve you? Well, I'd like very much to use your telephone. I want to call a garage. Telephone? And... We have no such thing here. No telephone? Nothing new has been put into this castle since it was built in 1640. Nearly 300 years ago. 300 years ago? That's correct. Valhaven was built by Sir Austin Chancellor in the early 16th century. Would you uh, step over here a moment, please? Oh, yes. Yes. Come on, Margot. Yes, Lamont. This is a portrait of Sir Austin. Hmm. Interesting looking character. He was forced to flee his native land because of political differences. He built this castle in the hope that he could create in this new land a replica of his ancestral estates. And, uh, did he find happiness? Come here, to this window. Do you see that tower? It's a bit difficult, surrounded by mist as it is. Right. I don't quite... Oh, yes, 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 I see it. Sir Austin was found hanging by a rope from its rafters. Suicide. Oh, how horrible. There's a superstition that has clung to Balhouten ever since. A superstition? About Sir Austin's death? There are those who claim that the tragedies of Balhouten recur just as they happened originally. Right down to the present day. What was that? Well, now pay no attention, Mr. Cranston. Don't be frightened, Miss Lane. It's a girl. What's wrong with her? Millicent, go back to your apartment, child. Millicent. The mistress of Balhouten. Uncle. It's here, Uncle. It's not in my imagination this time. It started in her dressing room. It moved across the east balcony and down the service stairs. You know there's not been a cat in Balhouten since your mother passed on. Only that one, Uncle. That one. Now, Millicent, have you ever seen a cat here? No, but I hear it, Uncle, wailing just as it did when I found poor Mother. Oh, oh you know, come, my dear, you're frightening our guests. Uh, Miss Lane, Mr. Cranston, permit me to present Miss Millicent Chancellor. Miss Chancellor. My dear, we're intruding horribly. Welcome to you both. I hope you won't think me ill-bred. Oh, not at all, Miss Millicent. Miss Lane and Miss Cranston have had a bit of an accident. They came here for help. An accident. Oh, my dear, you're not hurt. Nothing serious, Miss Millicent. Our car stuck in the mud. We were unable to go any further. Then by all means, you must stay here tonight. Well, that, that's very kind of you, Miss Millicent, but I, I think we'll push on to the nearest village. I'm afraid that's not feasible. The nearest house is ten miles away, well beyond the moor. Ten miles? You couldn't attempt it in this storm. I see only one way out. You must permit us to offer the hospitality of Bellhouse. Why... That's very kind of you, but I think... You're most welcome. I'll have my man prepare rooms for you. And it's very late, Millicent. You must be off to bed. Yes, Uncle Keldus. 
I'm not afraid now that I know there are others in the castle. Good night, Miss Lane. Good night, Mr. Cranston. Good night, Miss Millicent. Good night. I believe I owe you both an explanation. You see, the child had a frightful shock several years ago. A shock? Yes. Her mother was paralyzed during the latter years of her life. Being quite eccentric, she lived here alone, unattended. Millicent was at school in Europe. For many months, Millicent received no answer to her letters. So she came back to Valhauden and found her mother's skeleton oh. in this room. Oh, oh. Seated in a wheelchair, her only companion beside her, a cat. Well, that, uh, that explains this, uh, the, the cat thing. Oh, it explains many things, Mr. Cranston. The voices she hears. The departed Chancellor for two, in her distorted imagination, returned to Belhauden. Oh, the poor girl. Oh, I'm sure this all must be very trying to you both. I'll hurry uh, Cebu along with your rooms. Make yourselves comfortable. I'll be back directly. Yes, uh, thank you. <sighs> well, Marco, not a pretty situation, is it? Definitely not. What can we do, Lamont? I'm not sure, Margo, but... I'd like to stay. In fact, I must stay. Why? Well, Margo, it seems that many invisibles walk the halls of Belhauden. Tonight, there will be one other. The Shadow. Who's there? Don't be afraid, Miss Millicent. I mean no harm. What do you want? To help you. If help is possible, I'm a friend. I don't recognize your voice. You say you're a friend. What's your name? I have no name, really. I'm called the Shadow. Shadow? I don't understand. Are you one of the visions? No, not one of the visions. Please let me explain. I'm a living, breathing mortal just like you. But I possess a hypnotic power through which I can create a mental mist that makes me invisible. Then you're not... You're not one of them. Them? The Chancellorfords. You're not Sir Austin or old Barton. There's nothing supernatural about me, Miss Millicent. These... These Chancellorfords you speak of, they're dead? Oh, yes, but they come back. They come back to Belhauden with every change of the moon. With every change of the moon? Have you seen them? I've seen old Barton. Just as he was, the night his Hindu servant threw the knife at his throat and killed him. A Hindu servant, sir, did yes. you say? Why? Oh, nothing. Uh, tell me about old Barton. Who was he? He was my grandfather, the last male in the Chancellorford line. You say he was killed? Yes, it happened on the main staircase. Old Barton had just come from a hunt on the moors with his mahounds. Now, tell me exactly what it is you've seen. His murder... Just as it happened 18 years ago. First I hear his hounds howling out there on the moor. Then I hear his footsteps on the stairs. Climbs slowly to the first landing. Then he stops short. His hand goes to his throat. He makes a gurgling sound and turns and topples down the stairs. Has anyone else seen this? Anybody but yourself? No. And nobody believes me either. <laughs> I don't suppose you do. I believe you're sincere, Miss Millicent. Everybody humors me like I was mad. Sibu was rude enough to smile when I told him about the vulture. Vulture? Oh, of course. You don't know about that. It perches in the tree just outside that window. It comes when old Barton does. Nothing I do will drive him away. It just sits there. It's hollow eyes staring at me. Emitting horrible sounds. You're positive you see all this, Miss Millicent. I mean, there could be no mistake. Oh. There, you, you see, you doubt me also. You said you wanted to help me. How do you think you can? I don't know. I'd hope there might be a way, but frankly, I'm bewildered. I just don't know. <laughs> Will you please explain to me why we've been called to court? I've told you, Margot. 
Mr. Montessor has asked her to testify to what we saw and heard that night at Belhowden Castle. But why have we been waiting here all this time? Why can't we just go in and tell what we saw and get out of here? Because the court isn't in session. They've declared a recess. Recess? Oh, ridiculous. Schoolboy stuff. <laughs> I'll bet you that if women were running these places, things would happen a lot faster than they do now. Uh, now, wait a minute. I seem to recall a few shopping trips with you, my dear. Oh, well, that's different. And the people that hang around here. Look at them. Pure criminal types, every one of them. Well, who, for instance? Well, that man who just came out of that room, for instance. That man there? Yes. Darling, that's the judge. Oh. The court is reconvening. Let's go inside. <laughs> the testimony of Margot Lane and Lamont Cranston. Two unimpeachable oh, witnesses. Oh, Lamont, this is horrible. We've Think been summoned to this courtroom to help send that poor girl to an institution. We couldn't help ourselves, Margot. We had to tell what we saw and heard at Belhouden that night. Oh, poor Millicent. She looks so alone Your and Honor, deserted. It is quite obvious that the defendant, Millicent Chandlerford, is of unsound mind. The evidence proves that beyond a question of doubt. My client called us Montesol has exercised extreme patience in caring for this unfortunate girl. Now he feels that for her own good, she should be placed in an institution where she can receive proper professional attention. That's not so. That's an infernal lie. What's the matter with you? Phyllis is as sensible as anyone in this quiet, courtroom. Quiet, in the car. Oh, Robert, my darling. Silence. Young man, what is the meaning of this outburst? I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor, but... I just couldn't sit here and listen to all these lies any longer. If the court please... Uh, uh, just a moment, Counselor. Young man, come up here. Yes, sir. Now, what is your connection with the defendant, Millicent Chancelford? Well, she's the girl I love. The girl I hope to marry. Until her uncle, Mr. Montersall, shut her away from me. Your Honor, this boy is simply a disgruntled, rejected suitor. I demand Rejected a... by whom? By Millicent? All right, I'll show you how much of a rejected suitor I am. Millicent, Millicent, tell him you love me. I do, Robert. I love you with all my heart. There. There, you see, Judge? Your Honor, I object to this display. Judge, let me take Millicent away. Let me marry her and give her the protection and affection she deserves. Young man, I wish the problem before the court could be settled that easily. <laughs> if it pleases the court, I would like to proceed with argument on the motion to put this girl in an institution. It pleases the court to recess for ten minutes. Perhaps we can resume in a more sedate atmosphere. Everyone will stand up as the judge leaves the courtroom. Margo, I have an idea. And I think it can be executed yeah. by the shadow. But, uh, shadow, whoever you are, this is an impossible thing you ask. I'd like to do it for you. Lord knows you've done enough for law and order. But I've got to hand down a decision. Sign the girl's commitment papers today. Give me two days' time, Your Honor. Just two days' postponement. But I just can't grant postponement on nothing. Your Honor, you've got to give me some time to accomplish my job. Uh, well... Please, Your Honor. I'll tell you what I'll do. Yes? I'm probably a sentimental old fool, but I'll give you 24 hours. If you're not back with something definite in that time, I'll have to commit the girl. 24 hours? That's all. Perhaps it'll be sufficient. There's a change in the moon tonight. Change in the moon? What in blazes has that to do with the case? Maybe nothing, Your Honor. Maybe everything. <laughs> it's funny, Miss Lane, the way things change in just a few hours. Today, when you and Mr. Cranston were testifying, I was sure I could go on hating you both for the rest of my life. We were in a bad spot, Robert. Oh, I'll say. But I can see now just how Montesol made use of your visit to Bell Houghton. Why, it was the sort of a break he was looking for. Two prominent people like you to bear out his contention that Millicent was mad. Nice fellow, that Montesol. He'd make a nice trophy for a hunting room. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're incorrigible. Oh, say, we're getting near Bell Houghton. Uh, don't you think we'd better go over what we're expected to do, Mr. Cranston? There's not much to it, Robert. You and Miss Lane will wait in the car. I'll get into the castle somehow. Then I'll open the side door under Millicent's apartment for you and Miss Lane. But we must move quickly before Montesol notices us. It sounds simple the way you tell it, but how are you ever going to do it? I'll let you in on a little secret, Robert. I do it all with mirrors. Hardly believe it. 
Mrs. Roberts. However did you manage to get in here without without Uncle Caldas catching you? Now, don't give me the credit, Millicent. Mr. Cranston did it. I don't know how, but he turned the trick. <laughs> well, Mr. Cranston, the important thing is you and Miss Lane are here. And you brought my darling. That's all that counts. Oh, Robert. Darling, I I don't know what we're going to do, but... What was oh, that? Listen. Cat. It's here. It's starting again. Now, don't be frightened, darling. You won't face it alone tonight. There's a change in the moon. They'll all be here soon. Old Barton will be coming across the moors with his hounds. The cat is right here in the castle. Oh, yes. It's in Mother's apartment off the east balcony. Mr. Cranston, look. Look. What is it, Robert? They're in the tree outside the window. It's a vulture. Vulture? Yes, he's right close to the window. He's almost within reaching us. Robert, let me have that letter open up. There on the desk. All right, I'll get it for you. What are you going to do, Lamont? I'm going to try my hand at the gentle art of knife throwing. Here you are, Mr. Cranston. This ought to do it. Sharp and heavy. Yes, fine, Robert. All right. There. Step back, Mongo. Come over here, Millicent. All right, Mr. Cranston, let her go. Oh, a bullseye. You stuck it right in his breast. Yes. But still he sits and squawks. Interesting. Very interesting. I could have told you. You can't get rid of him. There's nothing you can do. He always waits for old Barton's death. Close the window, Robert. Shut him out. No, wait. I hear something out on the moor. Now, you hear that? It's the hounds. They're moving across the moor. Old Barton's with him. He'll be here in a minute. They're coming this way. Oh, Robert. Robert. It's all right, darling. It's all right. I don't see how anyone could live in a place like this and still hold on to their sanity. Others have reasoned that way, Margot. You mean Montessor, I suppose. I don't exclude him. Mr. Crest. Yes? I think I hear somebody moving about downstairs. Yes? Margot, put out that flambeau. I'm going out in the hall. I don't want the light to stream through. All right. There you are. Now, quiet while I open the door. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Cranston. I'm going with you. All right, Robert. Open up. Be careful, Robert. Easy, boy. Step through, Robert. Right. Now, close it. Follow me. Robert. Yes? Drop down behind this balustrade. We can see the stairs from here. Mr. Crest. Yes? Look, look, coming around that car. Ah, that's our man. Now watch it. Old Barton? Maybe. Can, can you see his face? No. Cape hides it. He's near the landing. Be ready to run, Robert. But what are we going to do? Head him off before he can get to that big black stone at the bottom of the stairs. Look, look, he stopped on the landing. Ready now? That's exactly as Millicent described it. Old Barton chokes and then he falls down the stairs. Come on, Robert. Stop! Stay where you are! Show I say! Look out, Mr. Cranston. Grab him! I got him! No use, mister. We're on to your hoax. Out of the way, Robert. No, you don't. There. You've got enough, Mr. Gosher. Oh, no, eh? You got him, Mr. Cranston. You nailed him right in the butt. Robert. Robert. Oh, Millicent, it's all right. Now, don't worry. That was quick work. Who is he, Lamont? I don't know, Margo. We'll see. Strike a match, Robert. I'll turn him over. Sure. Boy, you should have seen that sock Mr. Cranston gave him. All right, now, we'll see who the... The half-faced man. See, Boo. Robert. Yes, Mr. Creston? Take Millicent to her apartment. Margot, you come with me. All right, Millicent, let's go. Come on, Margot. All right. Well, what next? I want to look at that vulture. Tree's right outside this door. All right, Margot. After you. Thank you. There. There's our charming feathered friend. Still perched and still imperturbable. And still possessed of that confounded voice. Margot, take a look at this. What is it? A wire? Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, it... Well, let's give it a yank and see what... <clears throat> My, what a long tail he has. Long copper and properly insulated. Oh, just a minute now. There. There we are, Margot. Mr. Vulture's innards. His heart, soul, and mind are all encased in this little device. Looks like a radio loudspeaker. That's exactly what it is. I had no idea vultures were such deceitful creatures. Margo, you take the car, drive to the village, and phone the police. Don't let them know who you are, but tell them to get out here right away. What are you going to do? I'm going to follow this wire. It'll probably lead to one of those abandoned guardhouses at the edge of the moor. Tell the police to watch for a flashlight signal. Then rush to the location and hold anybody they may find there. 
the shadow is going to find the human vulture at the other end of this line. All right, Stevenson, the vulture wants more. Longer this time. Let's see who's signal to take it down and bring it in. Okay, Montessor. Here goes. Fine. We can disconnect that microphone now. Don't you want me to do the hounds again? Yes, yes, of course. I can sound as if they're coming back across the moor. Go ahead, the speaker's open. <laughs> what was that? Did you do that, Stevenson? No. Came from over there by the door of the hut. That laugh is not in Stevenson's repertoire of impersonation as Montesol. Stevenson, what in thunder is this? You see anybody? I'll answer for him, Montesol. He can't see me any more than you can. Well, who are you? I am the Shadow. Shadow? Oh, yes, I've heard of you. Quite an elaborate array of insanity-producing machinery you have here. What do you mean? This is a simple, portable broadcasting outfit. We're radio amateurs, that's all. Hey, yeah, sure, that's all. Amateurs at radio, but professionals at crime. I'm afraid you're making a mistake. You're the one who's made the mistake, Montesol. You made the mistake of thinking you could drive Millicent Chancellorfoot mad. Or at least make her believe herself mad. This is ridiculous. I don't know what you're talking about. Your denials don't interest me, Montesol. I'm only concerned with destroying your plan. Your control over Mills, not Chancel Ford, and our fortune is at an end. What's that? A couple automobiles coming along the East Drive. The police, Montessor, coming for you and your impersonating confederate. The police? Come on, Stevenson, run for it. Come on, let's go. Run, Montessor, run to your doom. Oh, oh, stop or we'll shoot. Castle looks a lot different than it did the first time we came here, eh, Margot? Mm. So glad those kids are getting married. She looks very lovely in that wedding gown, doesn't she? Hmm. Say, are you listening to me? Yes. Yes, I was just thinking. What about? What would happen if you were ever married? Now, Margot. Oh, don't be alarmed, Lamont. This is pure supposition. I was just thinking of you walking up the aisle just as Robert is now. Yes. Ready to take the sacred vows that would endure for the rest of your life. Yes, Margot. And then all of a sudden, somebody would shoot the best man, the minister would fall down poisoned, and the bridesmaid would be stabbed, and you'd be off again on another case that would bust up the whole darn thing. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to stay at the top and meet the competition of the underworld's keenest minds, the shadow has to be still better than any of them. And it's the same way with tires. For years, Goodrich Silver Towns have given motorists the real blowout protection of the golden ply. Now, like a true champion, Goodrich offers another important safety feature. The amazing new Lifesaver tread that gives you the quickest non-skid stops you've ever had. This new tread is specially designed to overcome the hazard zone of motoring, where a slippery film of water on the road 
They make complete command of your car almost impossible. Its never-ending spiral bars sweep the water right and left, force it out through the deep grooves, make a dry track for the rubber to grip. Wouldn't you be thankful for a tire like that the next time you're faced with a wet road emergency? Put Goodrich Silvertowns on your car now. The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard. His true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, Murder on Approval. Dr. Calanza, I have read your statement. Yes? Frankly, I am interested. I thought you would be, General. Otherwise, I never would have traveled so many thousand miles to see you. You say that you can infect a large number of persons with a deadly disease at will. Yes. That you can cause more deaths in an army than all the guns in the world. Your Excellency, once let loose, this disease would totally destroy an enemy's morale. With its aid... You can easily overcome any nation in the world. The general is already ruler of the east. But he will not stop with his conquest. I am sure his excellency is planning to extend his powers even further. I can give him victory. What is this sickness you can spread, doctor? I am sorry. That I cannot divulge at this time. Uh, Nor the method of infecting the enemy, doctor. Nor that, your excellency. And only I know the cure. Dr. Colanza, your name is not unknown to us. You have been many things. Scientist, adventurer, spy. But you have not always been successful. No. General, may I suggest that you let me try an experiment on troops of your own choosing? Troops? I cannot sacrifice my men. If your disease is fatal... Not on your own soldiers, sir. But why not those of some other power? That is an idea. Soldiers of some country you would be glad to humiliate and hurt. Perhaps even invade. But we are not at war at the present time, Doctor. Does that matter? General, pick any spot in the world, any well-guarded garrison, and in two months, I shall have wiped out that garrison. Choose the spot for my experiment. But perhaps it would be better to choose some country you are interested in, yes? Yeah, I see. Yes. All right, we will select your guinea pig. Captain, the map... Yes, General. Here's the map. Kalanza, do you know this spot on the coast of the United States? Mm, no. But uh, that does not matter. It is one of their army bases. A splendid choice, General. It is well guarded, Doctor. All the better to prove my point. I will leave for America at once. In a short time, many American soldiers will die in their barracks. Then, if you wish me to destroy the whole army of the United States, I can do it for you. Good. Captain, you will make the arrangements with the good doctor, please, to purchase his little methods for murder on approval. yourself, Miss Lane? Oh, very much, Colonel Torrance. I like the army. And so I've noticed, Margot. I think you've danced with every officer at the base. Oh, why not, Lamar? <laughs> the poor boys are due back inside the post at midnight. Awfully glad you could come tonight, Miss Lane. I don't get away from the base often myself. You'd be surprised at the trouble a couple of thousand men can manage to get into. Oh, uh-huh. trouble, Colonel? Yes, if it isn't one thing, it's another. Yesterday, what should crop up but some new fangled disease? Oh, a new disease? Nothing serious, I hope. Is it catchy? Well, nobody seems to know much about it. Fortunately, there are only a couple of cases. 
Dr. Harris isolated the sick men immediately, so the rest of us should be safe enough. Have I met Dr. Harris, Colonel? I think so. He's around someplace with a foreign doctor. Yes, the stocky, red-faced officer coming this way. Oh, yes, I see him. Harris promised to introduce his guest. Uh, evening, Dr. Harris. Uh, good evening, sir. Miss Lane, Dr. Nicholas Harris. How do you do? We met at dinner, Doctor. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Constable. Uh, Colonel, may I present my friend, Dr. Gregor Colanza? You're welcome, Dr. Colanza. Thank you kindly. Oh, Lamont, shall we dance? Oh, I'd love it, Margot. Will you excuse us, gentlemen? Uh, certainly, uh, certainly. Of course. Well, how are those boys in the hospital, Doctor? Well, they seemed a little better when I left, sir. Good. Uh, get him to tell you about that, Dr. Colanza. A couple of soldiers have caught some strange disease. Really? Yes, yeah, seems so. They're pretty sick, too. Oh, sorry, my wife is looking for me. I'll see you later. Yes. That's quite amusing. What? You are to tell me about this strange new disease. Not so loud. Oh, nonsense. There's nothing to fear. No one knows anything about us, Harris. Unless you have done some talking. Is it likely I'd go around telling people that I was betraying my country? You are being well paid. I know, but... Nothing I... can happen, Harris. The disease is unknown. It strikes very quickly. And it is fatal within a week. Well, I had no idea when we started that I was handling such powerful germs. That's why I insisted on shooting antitoxin into you. Without it, we would both get the disease. No, oh, I wish it were over. Oh, don't worry. In a few days, it will be. And you'll be a rich man, Harris. Yes, rich. <laughs> After all these years in the army. You broke the little glass bottles as I instructed? Yes, I dropped one of them in the barracks tonight just before I came away. There are enough germs in those bottles to kill a regiment. You will have some new cases shortly. Mm. Be careful. Here comes one of the lieutenants. The doctor. Doctor, have you seen Colonel Tolerance? Why, uh, yes, yes, he's right over there. Oh, yes. You better come along, sir. You'll be needed. There's trouble at the base. Trouble? Yes, hurry, sir. It seems that our plan is going smoothly, Harris. Be quiet, will you? Get come me. on over to Colonel Tolerance. Get me inside the base. All right, all right. Now keep quiet. Colonel Tolerance. Yes? From the base, sir. Urgent. Uh, yes, Lieutenant. Let's have it. Yes, sir. Let me see. Hey. I... Good Lord. What is it, sir? The whole barracks has come down with that confounded disease, Harris. Two hundred men. They're pretty bad, sir. It's an epidemic, sir. Yes, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. General order. All officers must report back to post immediately. Emergency. Yes, sir. The base is already under quarantine, sir. Good. Announce the recall from the bandstand. Right away, sir. Oh, uh, Colonel, perhaps Dr. Kalanza could give us a hand. We're going to need every doctor we can get. I would be delighted, Colonel. Well, very kind of you. Excitement, Colonel. Uh, Cranston, you'll have to drive us back at once. The base is hit by an epidemic. Oh. An epidemic? Yes. <laughs> Will you have room for Dr. Harris and Dr. Colanza? Certainly. General order! All officers are to report back to post for duty immediately! <laughs> Faster, the colonel's in a hurry. The car's going as fast as it can, Lamont. Yes, we'll be there in a minute, Cranston. Uh, Dr. Harris. Yes? I say, have you any idea what this mysterious disease might be? Well, unfortunately, no. That's why I brought Dr. Colanzo along. From the symptoms described, it is something entirely new in medical science. We've got to save those men and check the disease. I'll do my best, sir. This thing has spread very rapidly, Doctor. It, it might almost be some new form of... Oriental plague. Oriental plague? Here? In the United States? Oh, nonsense. Well, Doctor, I've seen disease spread like wildfire in the Far East. You know, I'd like to take a look at this, Colonel. Well, I'm afraid that's impossible, Mr. Cranston. Well, why, well, Harris? The post has been quarantined by general order, sir. We can't ignore that order. But Colanza's well, going in. Yes. I am a doctor, Mr. Cranston. And besides, Cranston, you might catch the disease. Well, I... I don't mind taking that chance. Well, that's very brave of you, sir, but I'm afraid we can't allow it. The order is definite quarantine against civilians. Yes, I'm afraid the doctor's right, Lamont. In the army, orders are orders. Very well. Just as you say, sir. Oh, it, it, it's just around the bend, Miss Lane. Pull up alongside the gate. You are right here, Miss Lane. All right. <sighs> here we 
we are. Halt! Who goes there? Colonel Torrance. Advance if you recognize Colonel Torrance. Well, thanks for the lift, Lamont. I don't mention it. Come on, Dr. Colenza, hurry. I am ready. Good night, Miss Lane. Good night, gentlemen. I still wish you'd let me go in and take a look around. Well, I'm afraid that's out of the question entirely, Mr. Cranston. Uh, come on, Colenza. Coming? It's nice of you to offer, my boy. Goodbye. Goodbye, Colonel. Well, I suppose we might as well drive back to the hotel. Just a moment, Margot. I'm getting out here. Getting out here? But Lamont... I'm going to take a look at this disease, Margot. You know, there was a queer look on Colanza's face when I mentioned it might have an oriental origin. Yes, but the the sentries won't let you in, Lamont. The the place is quarantined. Well, they'll have a very hard time quarantining a shadow. Lamont, you mean you're going in there as a shadow? Yes, Margot. When the car door slams, I shall immediately become... The shadow. Who's there? Say. Hey, wait a minute, Miss. Oh, uh, well, you want something, soldier? Why, I, I just heard the car door slam. Did somebody get out? Well, you don't see anybody, do you? No. No, ma'am, but I, I thought I saw... Well, I guess it's all right. That's kind of funny. Hey, Joe! Yeah? I could have sworn I saw somebody get out of that car. Anybody go through the gate? Hey, there's enough floodlights here to light up the entire army. I didn't see a soul. I don't know. I thought I saw a man, and then just like that, there wasn't anybody there. Uh, You must be getting punchy. Ladies and gentlemen, while we leave the shadow for a moment, just put yourself in this picture. You're driving along in the rain. The road ahead looks safe, even though it is plenty wet. But suddenly you flash past that familiar warning sign, Road Slippery When Wet. Beware. Look out for skids. Will the tires on your car slip or grip? And motorists, your tires will grip wet roads if they're the new Goodrich Silver Towns with Lifesaver Tread. This fact was proved not alone by Goodrich, but by the nation's largest independent testing laboratory, the noted Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory. The impartial engineers of this great laboratory tested the new Silvertown for three months against both the regular and premium price tires of America's six largest tire manufacturers. And here are the results. They found that no other tire tested, not even those priced at from 40% to 70% more than Silvertown's, came up to the new Silvertown in skid resistance. Furthermore, they found that this Silvertown gave more non-skid mileage than any of the other tires tested in its own price range. In fact, it averaged 19.1% more mileage before the tires wore smooth, which is the same as saying you'll get every sixth mile free. And remember, motorists, many tires cost more than Silvertown's, but no other tire at any price can give you Lifesaver Tread skid protection and the famous Golden Ply blowout protection. Equip your car with these life-saving silver towns now. (laughs) Broken glass. Glass. (laughs) Just lie still. He's raving again, nurse. He was all right a minute ago, Dr. Breslin. My head, it burns. That's yeah, the fever. <laughs> Comes and waves. At moments, he's quite mm-hmm. rational. Who's there? Who broke the glass? I heard a glass break. Yes. I just... Get Dr. Harris. Maybe he can get that fever down. I can. Well, right away, Dr. Brent. I've got to go look after those other patients. Shut the door after us, nurse. I'm, I'm on fire. Water. Water, please. Glass. Hear it? Open glass. Steve. Uh, uh. Steve, can you hear me? Listen to me. Who, who is it? Oh, someone there? You must tell me something, Steve. It's important. Where are you? I can't see. I... Don't worry, even if you can't see me. There's, there's only a voice. I... I'm here, Steve, here in the shadows. Listen to me. Yes? Listen. Quickly, before the fever returns. <laughs> tell me, why do you keep repeating the words? Broken glass. Broken Glass. Yes. You keep saying it over and over. Why? I don't know. I... Think, Steve. Think 
What is there about broken glass? Glass. Think, son. Glass, broken glass. Oh, oh, I know. Yes? Yes, last night in the barracks when when all the fellows were asleep, I... Yes, Steve? I woke up. I thought I heard something, and like glass breaking... In the room, Steve? Yes, yes, just a little tinkle, like someone had dropped a tiny glass. And then a few hours later, we... We were all sick. I... <laughs> oh, my head. Who broke glass? <laughs> all right. Shut the door, Doctor. The nurse tells me this one is quite bad. One of the new ones. Great Scott. What is it? What's the matter? Oh, my head. Why, this boy, he... He's my nephew. Your nephew? Yes, my sister's son, Steve. Steve. Steve, how do you feel, boy? This is unfortunate, Harris. Why, I thought he was home on leave. He wasn't due back this week. Is, is he fatally ill, Calanza? Too bad, Harris. I give him two days at most. Oh, no, 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 he can't die. I am sorry, but it is unavoidable. Uncle Nick. Uncle Nick, help me. Calanza, you've got to do something for him. Nothing can be done. Steve. Steve, it's Uncle Nick, Steve. I'm here. Uncle Nick. Oh, help. Please. Glad. The boy is delirious, Harris. But must save him. Impossible. There is no cure. But Steve is my nephew. Steve. Be quiet, you fool. Come, let us go to your office. No, 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 I must stay here. Come up, I have to drag you. Now brace up, Harris. Don't lose your nerve. Come on, man. Broken glass. Oh, Uncle Nick. Someone broken glass. Yes, Steve. Someone broke glass. And I mean to learn just what your Uncle Nick had to do with it. He and Gregor Kalanza. <laughs> Kalanza, you've got to do something for Steve. What can I do? I told you the disease was fake. I don't care about the others. Steve's different. He's my sister's son. So you said. I am sorry. Kalanza, tell me. Isn't there some sort of serum? No. But you gave me antitoxin. That was to prevent your catching the fever. It is different. Your nephew is already infected. There is no hope now. There's got to be. Harris, pull yourself together. You are being well paid. I know, but money won't give Steve back to my sister. I told you I was sorry. But there is nothing to be done. Nothing. I am going back to the wards. The progress of the disease is very interesting. Oh, don't be so callous. I am a scientist, Harris. Now, get hold of yourself, man. Remember, a soldier died this morning. It is murder now. Murder? Yes. And death is the penalty for that. So you'd better keep quiet about it. I will see you later. Oh, Kalanza! Later. Oh, oh Steve. <laughs> Steve. Weeping won't help Steve. Dr. Harris. Eh? Who spoke? Who's there? The shadow. Your nephew is dying, Dr. Harris. Uh, who are you? Where are you? I am here, although you cannot see me, Dr. Harris. What do you want with me? You and Gregor Kalanza are responsible for this disease. Oh, no, you're wrong. I don't know anything about it. You cannot lie to the shadow, Doctor. I tell you, I know nothing. Then your nephew dies, Doctor. Dies horribly. Oh, stop it! Will you stop it? The voice of the shadow is never silent when there is evil. I won't talk to you. I won't talk to you. I'm getting out of here. You cannot escape from the shadow. Leave me alone. <laughs> we shall meet again, Dr. Harris. And then... <laughs> the test tube you wanted, Dr. Harris. All right, put it down, man. Put it down. Yes, sir. Now, leave me alone. I've got to find the serum that will counteract the effect of this fever. Yes, sir. Good luck, sir. Mm. Let's see, where's, where's that culture? Oh, yes. And uh, now, now this formula will only work. All right, Dr. Harris. Steve is dying. Oh, yeah. oh, you. You dropped your test tube, Doctor. Just the way you dropped one in the barracks. Spread the germs. You know that. But I didn't. I didn't. Tell the truth, Doctor. Think of Steve. Oh, you fiend. Will you leave me alone? I must find a serum that will cure him. Only Gregor Kalanza can give you that in time. Who is he? Where's he from? Uh, I don't know anything about him. Is Kalanza more to you than your nephew? Speak, man. Kalanza got you into this, didn't he? And now Steve is dying. Dying, Harris. Stop dying. it. Dying. Stop it. I tell you, I can't stand it. Let me out of here.
Uh, uh, safe in my room. Oh, wait, I, I must lock the door. Uh, locked and bolted. Now he can't get in. That voice coming from nowhere, always in my ears. Oh, I'm going crazy. Hmm. Where's my bag? I've got to get away. And leave Steve dead behind you, Doctor? <laughs> How did you get in here? I'm with you all the time, Doctor. Oh, please. Go away. Please leave me in peace. There is no peace, Doctor, for a man who will let his nephew die in agony. Oh, I'd save him if I could. Believe me, but I... I don't know how. Alanza knows. But he says there's no cure. Did you believe him? He had an antitoxin, didn't he? Perhaps he has a serum that will cure the disease once it has developed. But he told me... He got you into this crime, didn't he? Yes. Yes, he promised me wealth. I've always been poor. Why did he pick this army base for his crime? Because if he's successful, it means the entire army will be wiped out in this way. United States Army? Yes. This disease would wipe out whole armies. Then invasion would be a simple matter. But you can't isolate the germ. There's no cure. There must be a cure. Kalanza would have one. But he says there is none. There must be. Make him tell you what it is. Otherwise, your nephew dies. But I can't help him. Or this country, either. Steve is dying, and you're afraid to cross the one man who might cure him. What is Kalanza compared to your sister's son? He got you into this. Make him help you. Uh, all right. All right, yes. Yes, I will. But hurry. He's out there now. Watching the soldiers die. Watching Steve and the other men he's poisoned. And enjoying it, Harris. Enjoying it. I'll, I'll get him to my office. And make him give me that serum. That's it. I'll make him. Hurry, Doctor. Hurry. This way, Colonel Torrance. Tell me, who are you? I am known as the Shadow Colonel. Please do not waste more time in wondering that you cannot see me. I told you I could clear up the mystery of this epidemic. I will keep my promise, sir. Just step in here, please. All right. Wait a minute. This is Dr. Harris' office. Yes. You'll know the whole story in a few moments, Colonel. Get behind the screen, please. Don't move until I give the word. Ah. Here they come. Come in here, Colonel. Harris, have you lost your mind? Maybe. Dragging me out of the wards like that? You must be mad. Now, you'd be crazy, too. If that... If that thing followed you around all day... That thing? What are you talking a about? A voice, Colanza. A voice. Something that you can't see. But you can hear him, all right. He keeps talking, talking. Oh, Harris, snap out of it. I tell you, I heard him. He knows all about you and me and the disease. Who knows all this? That voice, the voice. He knows everything. Oh, ah, you're dreaming. Seeing your nephew sick has upset you. Yes. We we made my nephew, Stephen, get the disease, Colonel. Well, he is not the only one. But he's got to be cured. Oh, no, don't start that again. There isn't any cure. You're lying. Harris, don't be a fool. I can't afford Then to. there is a serum that will cure the disease. Well, what if there is? I am not wasting it on your precious nephew. Oh, yes, you are. Harris, put down that gun. You listen to me, Colanza. Either you give me the formula for that serum or I'll kill you. I mean it. The formula is worth a fortune, Harris. It will make us both rich. If you will only use your head. Never mind the talk. And don't try reaching for your gun either. I'm watching you. But the formula for the serum, quick. All right. Where is it? In my pocket. It never leaves my wallet. Give it to me. Oh, just a minute. Here. Take it. Ah, thanks. Now I can save Steve. If you know enough medicine to read that formula. I must read it. I must read it. Yes. Yes, it's plain enough. I can make this serum. Look. It says you take... This goes with it. Harris, you fool. Did you think I really meant to have you get my serum... Die like the others. Now, I will take back my formula. No, I'll take that paper, Kalanza. What? Who snatched that paper? I did, Dr. Kalanza. A hey, voice. Harris was right. Dr. Harris was quite right. Give me back my formula. I'll shoot. What will you shoot at, Doctor? You've enough shooting, Kalanza. Throw up your hands. Senator Torrance. Drop that gun. Never. Take it, then. Ah. Ah. Kalanza's dead, Colonel. Ever a man deserved to be shot. It's that murderer. Yes. Yeah. Take the formula from the laboratory. Get the serum made up and hurry. Well, what about you, Shadow? My work is finished, Colonel. Rest is up to your medical staff. 
Galanza and Harris dreamed of power and wealth to be acquired through mass murder. Such dreams are dearly bought. The price of Colanza's dream and Harris's traitorship was death. The hidden menace to the armed strength of our country has been uncovered and destroyed. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. (laughs) The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> all the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. character who furthers the forces of law and order is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the shadow belongs. Today's story, Phantom Fingerprint. <laughs> You must understand, Lord Hawley. I am a woman. No. Mm -mm. Let's see. Uh, I am a lady. No. Mm -mm. I am... I am... You am crazy. Hmm? Did you say something, Margot? Oh, Lamont, you're marvelous. Well, what do you mean? You've been sitting at that typewriter for the past three hours, mumbling, I am a lady. I am a woman. Margot, you just don't understand how an author must search for the right word. Search? That was a manhunt. Well, now, tell me, do you think she should say, I am a woman, or I am a lady? Well, that depends on what she is. Well, she's both. Why don't you play safe and just call her a female? Oh, now, there you go again. Now, how do you think it would sound for her to stand up and say, I am a female? Well, I was only trying to help. No. Say, haven't you a date with Commissioner Weston to take him to your rehearsal tonight? Oh, that's so. I did want to rewrite this scene and take along with me, though. Well, then call her a woman and let it go at that. Well, a woman isn't bad. It's very good. Yes. I am... A woman. Hmm. Say, that is good. I am a woman. Sheer genius. I am a woman. Now, come on. Let's get down to police headquarters. All right, Commissioner Weston. 
Ready to see the rehearsal? Well, Cranston, as a matter of fact, I'm, uh, well, I don't care much for mystery plays, and as for rehearsal... Oh, oh grab him quickly, Lamont. He's slipping through our fingers. Uh, now, Commissioner, uh, I want your opinion on the play. After all, I am, as you've told me so often, merely an amateur criminologist. I'd appreciate the judgment of an expert. You really want my opinion? Your invaluable opinion, Commissioner. Well, in that case, Miss Lane, since you put it that way... Uh... And the publicity agent thinks it'll be good for the show if you come to see a rehearsal. Oh, so that's it. So I'm just being used as a publicity gag. But good publicity, Commissioner. Yes, here's your hat, Commissioner. And your coat, Commissioner. Well, I've... Uh... Come in. Uh, good evening. Oh, I... I didn't know you had visitors, Chief. Oh, come in anyway, Doc. Come on in. This is Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston, Dr. Kilgore. How do you do? How do you do? We've met before, Doctor. Yes. Doc Kilgore is our medical examiner. He's been with the force for how long is it, Doc? Uh, Forty years. Next Thursday, Commissioner. Yes, of course. And by the way, Doc, the men on the force are throwing a little party for you to celebrate your long service. Yes, I I know. And I appreciate your thinking of me, really, but I... You know, I just hate to be reminded that I'm getting old. Well, I, uh... Doc, I've been thinking things over, and I thought that the party would be a good place for you to uh, announce... Uh... My retirement? Uh, yes, Doc. Now, I have your pension papers in the drawer of my desk here. I haven't signed it yet because I wanted to talk to you first. Well, uh, hasn't my work been satisfactory, Commissioner? Doc, you're the best medical examiner in the country. But we're thinking of you. You've worked hard all your life. Now you can retire at full salary and enjoy yourself. Oh, why? If I retired, I'd, I'd be dead in six months. Now, Doc, that's no way for you to talk. I'm an old fire horse, Commissioner. I, I wouldn't know what to do with myself if I didn't have my work to do. <laughs> but, of course, if you want me to retire, I'll do it. I wouldn't think of it, Doc. I was only doing it for your sake. Well, then, shall we forget it for the time being? <laughs> You see, I don't want to retire yet, Commissioner. Oh, uh, forget it then, Doc. <laughs> All right. Well, I... Now, I, I guess I'd better get along. Oh, uh, what is it you came in to see me about, Doc? Oh, what? Uh, would I... you rather we left the room, Dr. Kilgore? Oh, no, no, indeed not. It, it can wait until morning. Well, we'll miss the first act unless we hurry. Uh, you see, Doctor, Mr. Cranston's play is in rehearsal tonight, and he wants my critical opinion. But if you want to talk to me, I'll be glad no, to. No, but... no, indeed. What I have to tell you can wait, Commissioner. Oh, well, let's go then. Oh, uh, by the way, Doc, those reports I wanted you to look at are right here on my desk. Yes. Now, you sit right down and go over them. There'll be no one around here to bother you at this time of night. <laughs> All right, Commissioner. We've got exactly 16 minutes to get there. We'll never make it. We will with a police escort, Miss Lane. Police escort? Whoa! Did you hear that, Lamar? Yes, Margaret. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Goodbye. Goodbye Dr. Kilgore. Yeah, uh, don't work too hard, Doc. No, I won't. Have a nice time. Thanks, we will. <laughs> I'm going to work the siren. <laughs> oh, well... Now to work. Now, let me see. Where did he say those reports were? No, they're not here. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Here they are on the desk. Now, let me see. Oh, yes, indeed. This is going to be a mighty interesting case. Well, that, that's odd. I thought I heard something. A... Who's there? Uh, who's there, I said. I I can't see you over there in the dark. Oh, no. No, not you. No, 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 don't look at me that way. No, no, you... You could not. I'll call for help. Oh, please, please, you... You couldn't. What, what have I done to you? Please speak to me. Just, don't just keep looking at me that way. Well, you... You wouldn't kill me. Why, you couldn't. That's a, It's impossible. I, I'll call for help. And the door is locked. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Well, Commissioner Weston, what's your opinion? Well, I think you've got a mighty nice theater here. A mighty nice theater? I think Lamont's more interested in your opinion of his play, Commissioner. Well, of course. Oh, that. Well, uh, now look, Cranston, your villain is supposed to be a master criminal. Yes? He makes a foolish blunder, for one thing. Well, then, you don't think a master criminal would leave his fingerprints around, even by accident? Emphatically, no. Well, I don't see why. Mr. Uh, Weston. You're being paged, Commissioner. Yes, one Mr. of my Weston. men from headquarters. Guy, what are you doing here, Giles? Well, Dr. Giles, hello. Chief... I've got bad news for you. Doc Kilgore is dead. Dead? What? Why, we just left him two hours ago in my office. He's been murdered. I 
I know how you feel, Giles. I know how we all feel. Who did it? Who would want to kill him? I wish I knew, Giles. Step on it, Murphy. Yes, sir. Dr. Giles, you were Dr. Kilgore's assistant, weren't you? Oh, he was more than just my superior. He was the best friend I ever had. He put me through medical school, got me the job as his assistant. Why, oh, he was so good to everyone. Why? Why should anyone want Come on now, come on. Pull yourself together. Oh, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Have you had a chance to examine the body? Uh, yes, I have. What did you find? Doc had been stabbed at the base of the skull with a sharp instrument. Yeah. Death resulted almost immediately, Commissioner Weston. Poor old man. At least he never knew what happened. Chief, if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to bring the Doc's murderer to justice. Uh, who did you say was with you when you discovered Doc Kilgore's body, Molly? Uh, no one, sir. What time was it? You've asked him that question at least four times, Mr. Weston. And you've interrupted this investigation at least 50. Oh, Commissioner, you're exaggerating. I haven't said more than a dozen words in the last two hours. Please, Miss Lane. All right, but I just wanted to be helpful. Uh, what time was it when you discovered the body, Molly? About 11 or uh, just before 11. You were off duty at 8 o'clock. What were you doing at the office at that hour? Is this the third degree, Commissioner? No, this is not the third degree. We don't use the third degree. We don't believe in third degree methods. Well, you don't have to shout at me and you needn't leave your office. I'm not leaving my office, but you are. What? Giles, Giles, where's Cranston? He's out here examining the body. He is, is he? We'll ask him to come in here immediately. Speaking about me, Commissioner? Now look, Cranston. I don't mind you and Miss Lane being here, but she's interfering with my investigation. I am not. I was just... <laughs> I was... All right, Margo. I think it's time you went home anyway. Yeah. It's two o'clock in the morning, then. No, I'm not going home. I'll wait outside for you, Lamont. And as for you, Mr. Weston, it wasn't necessary to be so rude. Good night. Rude. Now maybe I can get somewhere. Uh, Dr. Giles, tell Commissioner Weston what we've just discovered. What? That's your idea, Mr. Cranston. You tell him. Well, all right. I... Uh, Commissioner... Do you uh, need me any longer? I, uh, I'd i like to go home. Go ahead. But I haven't finished questioning you yet. I'll see you tomorrow morning, Molly. Uh, yes, sir. Good night, sir. Well, what is it, Cranston? Commissioner, do you remember Killer Norvelli? I remember him. I certainly ought to. I sent him to the chair in 1931. That's right. He was a tough customer, all right. Murdered about five people with his knives. Commissioner, before he started on his career of crime... He was a knife thrower in vaudeville, is that right? Yes, that's right. He... Now, what are you driving at? And Dr. Giles tells me he performed the autopsy on him. Right, Giles? Yes, I'll never forget. It was the fall of 1931. My first big assignment after Doc Kilgo got me my job in the department. What's a murderer electrocuted eight years ago got to do with the death of the doctor? I don't know the answer to that, Commissioner. But there's an odd similarity in the murder technique. And as Dr. Giles pointed out, the weapon used on Dr. Kilgore left the same tri-cornered mark as found on Novelli's victims. Yes, everything is the same. Why, if I didn't know Novelli was dead and buried, I'd say he was our man. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, gentlemen. I can see exactly what you're thinking. Killer Novelli comes back from the dead to kill a man he never had anything against. Oh, no, no, Grant. All right, all right, Commissioner. Now, uh, what about fingerprints? As I told you before, Cranston, a smart criminal doesn't leave his prints around. Oh, but O'Reilly found a clean cut set of prints right in the center of your desk, Chief. He's down on the files right now, checking up on them. What? On my desk? You say a complete set of prints was found? Four fingers and a thumb, all perfect. No smudges. Perfect? Well, you're very fortunate, Weston. We'll have the murderer within an hour, Cranston. I wish you luck. Uh, Chief, I've got the murderer. Here's the rat who killed Doc Kilgore. Molly, I knew your story sounded funny. I didn't do it. Dr. Kilgore was a friend of mine. You've got to believe Shut me. Shut up. Now, what is all this, O'Reilly? Well, I was developing the photographs of the fingerprints we found in your office, Chief, when I heard a noise in Doc Kilgore's office. Yes? I rushed in and caught Molly red-handed going through the Doc's papers. And this paper was in his hand when I jumped him. Let's see it. Sure, I was going through his papers. But I didn't kill Doc. I, I can swear it. Well, he was the best friend I ever had. This is getting to be most interesting. What does the paper say, Weston? Uh, it's a note for $850. Made out to Doc Kilgore and signed Charles Molly. Well, that doesn't mean anything. I, I, I can, I, I can explain that. Yes, I'd like to have you explain this, Molly. Well, I, I did owe Doc eight hundred and fifty dollars, but I, but I paid him back early this evening. He was busy in the lab and didn't have time to get the IOU for me. After he was dead, I realized how bad things would look for me if the note were found, and so I went to his office to get it. Go on, Molly. Well, that's about all there is to tell. He lent me the money to pay off the men I'd been gambling with. I didn't want to lose my job, and I knew I would if you found out that I'd been gambling. You say you paid the money back to Dr. Kilgore? Yes, early this evening, and I swear I did. No money was found on Dr. Kilgore. Now I'll tell you what I think, Molly. 
You owed Dr. Money and you couldn't pay him. He threatened to come to tell me about it and about your gambling. You got desperate and killed him to save yourself. I gave him the money, I tell you. I'll get you for this. Keep him away from me. None of that, Giles. I know how you feel, but... Doesn't anybody believe I didn't do it? Take him away, O'Reilly. All right, Chief, come on. I'm telling you. Give him a hand, Giles. All right, Chief. Ah, well, there you are, Cranston. You're convinced you have Doc Kilgore's murderer? Absolutely. Motive and all. I don't think you have, Commissioner. There are too many loose ends. What about the fingerprints in the center of your desk? Why was the knife thrown instead of... How do you know it was thrown? Just a hunch. You can't convict a man on hunches. I've got proof and a motive. What happened to the money? There never was any. That was part of Moley's phony story. Oh, I see. (laughs) You know, Commissioner, those fingerprints intrigue me. Well, go to work, Sherlock Holmes. For me, I'm going home and get some much-needed sleep. Come in. I'm sorry to bother you, Chief. But is O'Reilly here? No, he's busy. What did you want? Well, it's about the prints, Chief. The ones we found on your desk. What about them? Well, I've checked them, and I've rechecked them. And they don't make sense. What are you talking about? The fingerprints we found on your desk, Chief, belong to Killer Norvelli. But he's been dead since 1931. Please, Cranston, go away and don't bother me. I'm too busy to spend my time watching Bordeville Axe. After all the excitement last night, I had about two hours sleep. Look at this desk, piled with mail. I'll never get through it all. You're missing something, Commissioner. There's a woman knife thrower on the bill who's simply terrific. I don't care if she is simply terrific. I can't... Knife thrower. A most interesting woman, Commissioner Weston. Madame Maria Novelli. Killer Novelli's widow, you know. Ah, Killer Novelli again. Cranston, if I hear that name again, I'll begin throwing things and it won't be knives. But, Commissioner, don't you think that... Think. Think. I... I'll... Go away, Miss Lane, please. Cranston, go write another mystery play or anything you want, but don't bother me. I got the murder of Doc Kilgore, and I got a motive, and that's all I need. I hope so, old man. I sincerely hope so for your sake. As for me, I've got a hunch. Come on, Margot. Bye, Commissioner. Goodbye. Margot, the shadow is going to pay Madame Maria Norvelli a visit backstage at the Lyceum Theater. What? Who is there? I can see no one. It is I, the shadow. You cannot see me, but I can see you. And you must answer my questions. Who are you? What do you want here, Mary and Novelli's dressing room? Who murdered Doc Kilgore, Madame Novelli? I don't know what you mean. Is it Killer Novelli? Novelli? No. No, it could not be. He is dead. Novelli was your husband? Yes, but he is dead. Dead, I tell you. That is the truth? That is the truth. He was evil. He killed with the knives, the beautiful knives. I teach him the great art to throw the knives, and he uses it to kill. Who else have you taught to throw the knives? Ah, oh, many. But there was one last year I taught him. He was very good. He learned quick. He learned as good as Novelli. I want him to join the act with me, but he... he... Go on. Go on. He say no. He say he got other reasons. Other uses for the knives. Ah. Oh. He is evil, too, like Novelli. You aren't lying to me? No, it is true. Everything is true. What is this man's name? His name? Oh, no. That I cannot say. He make me promise not to tell. He say I kill you if you tell. You must tell me his name if I'm to help you. Oh, please. Please do not ask that. Quickly, Madame Novelli, his name. All right. I will tell. His name... His name is... (laughs) Madame Novelli. She's dead. That's the story, Margot. According to Dr. Giles' report, the same weapon that killed Doc Kilgore also killed Madame Novelli. Any fingerprints found this time, Lamont? Oh, yes. The ever-present fingerprints were there. Perfect set, as usual. And, of course, they belonged to our friend, the late Killer Novelli. But how could a dead man go around killing people? He couldn't, Margot. That's just it. The murderer is merely using a very clever device to throw the police off his trail. Yet the fingerprints do match, Lamont. Yes, confound it. That's the confusing part of this whole thing. If I knew how the murderer performed this neat little trick, I'd know better where to look for him. Well, darling, at least you were smarter than Commissioner Weston. He thought Moley was the guilty party. (laughs) Oh, boy, was a bit upset that the killer should have struck again and Moley safely guarded miles away under lock and key. Still, I can't be too hard on Weston. 
My record hasn't been too good on this case either. All I know, maybe Killer Novelli is alive. Maybe he's the man we're after, after all. Uh Oh, I know that mood of yours when I hear it. Come on, Chief. You and I are going out for a nice, brisk walk. Oh, it's getting pretty late, Margo. Besides, I've No, got... I won't take no for an answer. Now, come on. Here's my right. hat and my gloves and... Oh, dear, look at them. Just look at them. Mm-hmm. Look at what? Oh, your gloves. Well, what's the matter with them? Well, they're ruined, that's all. Ruined. I just got them back from the cleaners, and they washed them instead of dry cleaning them. <laughs> now, look. Yeah. They've ripped. Of course they've ripped. All the oil's been washed out of the leather. If they had any sense, they'd Hey, wait a minute, Margo. Know... Oil, leather, preserve... Margo, if the oil was still in the leather, the preserving oil, they'd still be good. Uh, the gloves, I mean. The mom, sometimes that's I That's it, think... Margo. Of course that's it. You've just given me the one link I need to solve the case. But how? I don't understand what Remember you... I told you if I knew how the murderer performed his trick, I'd know where to look for him? Yes, but what... Well, Margo, right now the shadow has to make a call on a gentleman in a dissecting laboratory. Who's there? Answer me or I'll... (laughs) It's the shadow, Dr. Giles. The shadow? So sorry to interrupt your labors, but I must ask you to give me a very unusual pair of gloves you possess. What? Where are you? I can't see you. No. Unfortunately, you can't see the shadow. I asked you for the gloves. No, no. What do you mean... You can't know anything about me. I know this, Giles. That only you and Dr. Kilgore would have been able to get the fingerprints of Killer Novelli after he was electrocuted. Mm -hmm. And with Dr. Kilgore dead, it was pretty obvious who the murderer was. You know a little too much, Shadow. I have a knife in my hand. I can't see it, but I can hear you. Why don't you throw your knives? Yes, Shadow. (laughs) There. There. <laughs> I kill you. No, Dr. Giles. I'll not be another of your victims. Yeah? Well, what do you want of me? I want your confession to the murder of Doc Kilgore and Maria Novelli. I also want that pair of gloves you made of human skin. Huh? The skin you took from the tips of Killer Novelli's fingers when you performed the autopsy and then kept in preserving oil. You know too much, Shadow. But I can talk plainly to you. Because you won't live to tell. You killed Doc Kilgore? Yeah, yes, I kill him. But why? Why, Giles? Because he stood in my way. I should have been head of the department long ago. But I had to wait for him to die. He also had found out that you had Killer Novelli's fingerprints and was going to tell Commissioner Weston the night you murdered him. Is that right, Giles? <laughs> That's right. But he can't tell now, can he? Madame Novelli's dead, too, because she knew too much. Everyone thought Novelli did it, didn't they? You were very clever, Giles. <laughs> yes. I've prepared for years to do this. First, I stole the fingerprints from Novelli's hands when I performed the autopsy on his body. Then I got Novelli's own wife to teach me to throw the knife the way he did. No one would catch me. No one would suspect me. My crime was perfect. No crime is perfect. In some way, the criminal slips up and is brought to justice. Well, what is all this? Huh? Why did you send for me, Giles? I sent for you, Commissioner. The Shadow. The shadow? Here in headquarters? Yes, Commissioner. And this is the man you want. The murderer of Doc Kilgore and Madame Novelli. What? Giles? Yes, Giles. Surprise, eh, Commissioner? Yes, I did it. I did it, but you couldn't catch me. You'd never have found out. And now that you have, you're not going to... You're not going to take me alive. Not alive, you Quick, hear Preston, me? stop him. Stop him. Giles, drop that knife. Stop it. Uh, afraid it's too late, Shadow. He's dead. Killed himself. Come in. Hello, Commissioner. Remember us? Huh? Oh, hello, Miss Lane, Cranston. I'm busy. Sit down. Uh, say, Commissioner, I wanted to see you this morning because I have another idea about the Kilgore case. What? Hey, wait a minute. Don't you read the papers? Uh, the, the papers? I broke the case wide open last night with Giles. I knew it all the time. Giles? Yeah. Well, what do you know about that? Giles? Well, well. Do tell us, Commissioner, why did Giles do it? Go out and buy yourself a paper, Cranston. I'm sorry, I've got a luncheon date with the mayor, and I'm late now. 
<laughs> you know, Commissioner West will actually get to hate you if you tease him too much. <laughs> you notice, Margo, he didn't give the shadow any credit for the solution of the crime whatsoever. <laughs> I broke the case last night, Cranston. I. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Lamont, that was a horrible case. How could Giles kill the man who was his best friend, who helped him through school, got him his job here? How could he? Well, Margo, Giles was obviously suffering from a persecution complex. He imagined the world was against him. He thought his friends were his enemies. But his twisted brain was a brilliant one. He was devilishly clever. But he paid for his crimes, as all criminals do, eventually. Say, that isn't bad. What? That line. I can use that in my second act. You mean just before the heroine says, I am a woman? Yes. Uh, no, no. Oh, Margot. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand. Does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, Revenge on the Shadow. Mike Matthews talking. Hello, Mike. This is Slick Scarpel. Oh, yeah? What do you want? Okay, start talking. Now, listen, Mike. I know you and I haven't been on the best of terms, but there's something we've got to talk over. Yeah, what? We've got to do something about this guy who calls himself the Shadow. Oh, that's different. Well, what's the dope? Come to my place, the Club Monte Carlo, midnight tonight. We'll talk it over. Okay, I'll be there. Hello? Hello, Dutch. This is Slick Scarpel. Why, you've got a nerve calling me after your mouth trying to chisel in on my territory. Hello, Dutch. I'm sorry about that. Yeah? Listen, Dutch. We've got to call a truce. What for? We've got to get together to protect ourselves. Against what? The shadow. Oh. Oh, well, that's different. Now, listen. Big Mike Matthews is coming to my place midnight tonight to talk it over. Can you be there? Yeah. You bet I'll be there. Oh, say, that's funny. Isn't that big Mike Matthews coming in the door? It looks like him. I've seen his picture in the papers. But what's so unusual about that? Oh, nothing much, I guess. But this club is owned by Slick Scarpell, and I always understood that Mike and Slick were deadly enemies. Well, it's none of our business. No, Major Bench, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Lamont, are those the three men you told me about? Yes, Margot. They look like gangsters, all right. They are, and usually mortal enemies, but tonight it looks very much as if they're banding together. But I wonder why. I imagine because they're afraid of me. Of you? Then why do you come here and expose they're yourself? They're only afraid of me as the shadow. They do not know Lamont Cranston. Oh, who, who are they? Slick Scarpell, Dutch Broder, and Big Mike Matthews. Three of the human vermin who've been slowly throttling this city, and right now they're probably trying to digest a piece of bad news that I had a hand in. Pretty black and even. Now listen, Mike. I'm on the level about this meeting, and you'd better play square too. Do you think I'd walk into your place alone like this if I wasn't Scarpell? 
We've got to do something about this shadow. Right. Say, Dutch, I heard your boys ran into a little trouble today, huh? A little trouble? Them cops picked up five of my boys today. Caught them with a hot load of furs worth 15 grand. I know where they got the tip from, too. Now, we got to do something. That's all. That shadow is regular. Hey, not so loud. Um, These are society people out here. Okay. Take it easy now. Come on. In the office. Okay, Dutch. Now we can talk. You got any ideas? Listen, Slick, how can you think of a way to get a guy which you don't know who he is? Well, the first thing we got to do is lay off each other. Team up. Get the shadow and get him right. If it's dough that's needed, I'll add it ten grand to the kitty. But dough isn't going to help us find the shadow. Oh, and nothing else will. Unless we can figure a way to get him to come to us. <laughs> oh, yeah? Better guys than you have tried to do that, and where are they? Never mind. I think I got a plan. And it's a honey. So what? Uh, this it. is what. We'll put the snatch on the mare. What? That ought to uh, bring Mr. Shadow trotting right over to the rescue. What? Kidnap Mayor Collins? Why, that's playing with dynamite. Uh, yeah, isn't? yeah. But maybe dynamite's the only thing that'll do us any good. I'll phone the mayor and I'll tell him I want to uh, give him the inside on where Big Mike gets his dope supply. Squeal on me, why and you... And now, wait a minute. I didn't say I would tell him. I just say I'm going to tell him. What do you mean? I'll make a day to see the mayor late at night, see? Tell him I'm afraid someone might recognize me and squeal. The mayor will see me, and he'll be alone. Oh. Hey, that's neat. But if we get the mayor, then what? How you going about getting the shadow on his trail? I've got that end of it all figured out. The shadow's got a lot of uh, hypnotism stuff. Okay. We'll beat him at his own racket. Both of you guys have done business with Vandange, the Hindu. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you sold him some hot pearls on last week, didn't you, Dutch? Yeah, and for the last time, too. That Hindu gives me the creeps. When he looks at you, it makes you feel like there was something behind you he was really seeing. That's it. Hypnotism stuff. Anangi shot me once. <laughs> he'll beat the shadow with his own game. We'll promise him those Canterbury pearls if he'll make the shadow show himself so we can plug him. And Angie will do everything and anything for pearls. He's nuts for them. Okay, if you say so, Slick, but me, I'm plenty scared of that, but thank you. Well, Dutch, maybe you'd rather have it out with the shadow by yourself. Eh, nix on that. But if we got to take our choice, I'd sooner take the hinder. If he gets the poils, he'll be on our side. Well, then it's all set, boys. I'll go see Vandangi and make an appointment with the mayor tomorrow night. In his office. When he is alone. Just leave it to me and Van Dange. I have got an appointment with you, Mayor Collins. Uh, yes? Uh, about Big Mike Matthews? That's right. Uh, what's the information you have to give me? Uh, you'll have to come along with me. If you want to get the low down on Big Mike. Well, it so happens I got word about an hour ago that Commissioner Weston expects to arrest him tonight. Arrest Big Mike? Yes. So you see, I'm hardly in need of any information concerning him now. However, Listen, you it... stop gabbing. I got a gun here. What good will that do you? Plenty good if you start any trouble. You're coming with me. You can't get away with this. The minute we reach the street, I merely have to raise my voice and the... I know all that. But when we reach the street, you're not going to be able to yell. What do you mean? You'll see. Banangi. Come on in. Give him the work. Uh, so you have an accomplice? Yeah. His honor, the mayor. Who are you? Why do you stand there and stare at me like... You, like... my friend, will stare at me. Eh, that is right. No, no, I... Look into my eyes. No. Deeper. Deeper. No. You are becoming the slave of the triad of the ages. No. Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva. You are our slave. Oh. After I release you from this hypnotic spell in which I am binding you, you will remember nothing. Nothing. Yes. Do you hear me? Answer. Yes, Master. I do, as you say. You will do even as I think. Slave. Yes, Master. I will do even as you Okay, Vandangi? Yes, Mr. Scarpelli. The mayor is now the slave of the master of Vandangi. He will go and do as I order him. Okay. Let's take him to the Club Monte Carlo. We've got our bait. 
Now we have to wait for the shadow to bite. <laughs> and when he does... I, Vadange, will conquer him. Extra, extra, may a column kidnap. Read all about it. May a column kidnap. Extra, Just a moment. Oh, good morning, Lamont. Good morning, Margaret. Come on in. You heard about Mayor Collins? Yes, isn't it horrible? What do you suppose could have happened to him? I've got a hunch this is the work of Six Scarpell and Company, and I'm going to find out. In the meantime, they're coming. Something I want you to do, Margot. Yes, Lamont, what? You have to be very careful and do exactly as I say. Go to the Club Monte Carlo on Hemlock Street, where we were the other night. Yes, and then? And watch outside. If you see anything that looks at all suspicious, get in touch with me. Be careful to keep out of sight and don't, under any conditions, go inside that house. All right, Lamont, I understand. Remember, keep out of sight and don't go inside that house. Hey, listen, Slick, I just heard Big Mike and four of his gang was picked up last night. Yeah, hauling dope? Yeah, that's too bad. It means 20 years. And there's no way to beat that dope rap. Now we got to get the shadow. Where's Hodangi and the mayor? Upstairs. Say Slick, hmm? yeah? Look here out the window a minute. Yeah, what? See that dame standing in the doorway over there? Yeah, what about her? She's been hanging around out there most of the day. Yeah? That's kind of funny. Yeah. Hey, Vanangi. Come here a minute. Funny about Big Mike being picked up like that just when we were all set to get the shadow. You call huh? for me? What do you want? Vanangi, take a look at that girl standing in the doorway over there. That says she's been hanging around all day. You ever seen her before? Mm, no. What difference does it make whether or not he knows her or not? We are playing with dangerous game, Mr. Scalpel. It is possible she has been sent to watch us. We can't take any risks, Dutch. You're telling me. Supposing you go out and talk to her, Vandangi. Dutch and I can't be seen until we get this shadow business settled. All right. I will go and question the girl. Watch your step, Vandangi. Don't worry about me. I have my own way of getting information. Ah, there she is, over there. Oh, young lady. Yes? Have you seen a little lad of about eight years old wearing a brown sweater? I sent him off to the corner about an hour ago. Why, no, I, I haven't seen him. I'm just passing by myself. Why, why do you stare at me like that? Possibly you are tired and would like to step inside and sit down for a moment. No, I'm not tired. I, I... I mustn't. He said I mustn't go into that house. That is right. Stare at me. No. Into my eyes. Deeper. Oh. Deeper. Oh. I am the voice of the holy triad of Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva. You will do my bidding. Follow me into this house. Yes, Master. I follow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as we leave the shadow for just a moment, it looks like trouble ahead. But think of the trouble you may be headed for if a skid throws your car out of control. Because when tires lose their grip on a wet, slippery road, who knows what may happen? The shadow knows. Beware. Thousands are killed or injured every year by runaway cars sliding, spinning crazily over glistening pavements. Motorists, I've already told you that the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown will stop you quicker safer in a wet road emergency than you've ever stopped before. That's why it will pay you to make your next tires Goodrich Safety Silvertowns. I... I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I've been working on it ten minutes for Dengue. I can't stand no more of it. Quiet, Dutch. Slave. Yes? What was your name? My name... Who told you not to enter this house? Who told me? Same old answers for Dengi. Why won't she talk? Oh, she has succumbed too far to my spell. Her mind is a blank. Either that or someone else has control over her mind. You mean the shadow? Possibly. But we shall find out if it is the shadow. You take her upstairs and wait there for my father commands. Take her, Dutch. I'll stay here with Dengi. Okay, Slick. Come along, you. Uh, Go with him. Yes, Master. Badangi, 
If she was sent by the shadow, then... Then she shall serve as additional bait to lure him into our trap. Now I am ready to talk to him. Talk to him? How are you going to do that? You don't know who he is? I do not have to know who he is. I will send out thought waves. Eh? Well, how do you do that? Uh, I see you are unfamiliar with the higher branches of Hindu mysticism, my friend. To the initiated, it is quite possible for mind to talk to mind regardless of distance. Eh? Thus, space becomes non-existent. You give me the creeps. I don't know how you do it. Uh, you, an infidel, can never know. Attend to matters in which you are proficient. Procure for me the Canterbury Pearls. I will do the rest. We'll get the pearls for you, just like we said the night. Good. Now I will send out my thought waves. The shadow must be receptive to be able to do what it does. Our minds will commune. Now leave the room. I must concentrate. Okay. Now we shall see if this girl is under control of the shadow. If she is, then his own power of subjecting people to his will shall be his downfall. Shadow. Shadow. I call upon you in the name of the triad who are all powerful Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva. Shadow. I command you to come to me in thought. Who speaks? Who speaks? It is I, Vadange. Who commands the shadow by the secret and all-powerful method of thought transmission? It is I, Vadange, disciple of the great yoga of India and the temples of Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva. Can you hear me, Shadow? Yes, Vadangi. I hear you. Listen carefully, Shadow. This delicate thread of thought communication is easily broken. I am listening. What do you want? You will come to me, Shadow, if you are interested in Mayor Collins. So, the abduction of Mayor Collins was your work, Vadangi. I warn you, release him. So, Shadow, you are interested in Mayor Collins. Possibly you are also interested in a certain girl. A certain girl, Vadangi? Yes. Read my mind, Shadow. I will make it crystal clear for you. She is pure, my friend. Pure as a lovely pearl. Read my mind. What do you see? I see the names of Slick Scarpel and Dutch Broder. They are the ones who are behind the kidnapping of Mayor Collins. You read well, Shadow. And the girl. Do you know her? The girl? The image of her is pictured upon my brain, Shadow. Do you know her? The picture of the girl slowly becomes visible to my mind's eyes. I... Ah, then you do know her. Yes. I have her, Shadow. A prisoner of my hypnotic power. I know where you are, and I'm coming to visit you. You've done a foolish thing, Vadangi, in telling me these things. And you, Shadow, have done a foolish thing in accepting the challenge of the great Vadangi. I await you, Shadow. You shall not wait in vain, Vadangi. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Slick, vadangi has been upstairs half an hour now. Should we see if he's all right? Nah, better not disturb him. He said he'd be down before the shadow got here. Well, I wonder when the shadow's coming. I'm not even sure he'll show up at all. Maybe Vadangi scared him off. But keep your hands on the tommy gun, just in case. Well, I'd be plenty happy if I knew the shadow had took a run out powder. I say, maybe... Maybe he's here now and we don't know it. Wonder what his voice sounds like. Possibly it sounds like this, well, Dutch... He... A shadow. He's here. Yes, here in the shadows. Trying to throw a scare into us with that stuff, eh? Well, Shadow, we don't scare. I'm sure you don't. It must take brave men to murder all the defenseless people you two have. Yes, Shadow, we bump plenty. And we're going to give it to you, too. Let him have it, Dutch. Where are you, Shadow? Speak up. Over here, Dutch. You can't hit me, but I'm right over here. Ah! Dutch! 
But the shadow's voice had come from you, Slick. I... A little ventriloquism, Dutch. And you'll hang for killing Slick Scarpel. Now, where are you? Where are you? Right behind you, Dutch. Where are you? Oh. Blow on the head will take care of you for an hour or so, Dutch Broder. Now for Vendange. <laughs> Slick, Dutch, what is the matter? Where is it? Oh, fools, what have you done to each other? Victory was in our grasp, and now you... There is a presence here. Is it you, Shadow? Very clever, my friend. But perhaps you are not so... <laughs> so it is you. Yes, Vendangi. You are clever, Shadow. But perhaps not so clever as I. Vendangi, I've come for Mayor Collins and the girl. Can you think I, Vendangi, will give them to you just like that? They are both under my hypnotic spell... They are my slaves. I'll have no trouble breaking the hold you have over them. Because I know your strength, Vadangi. My strength is greater. Greater? You, the dog of an infidel, stronger than I, a true disciple. I, who have made the pilgrimage to the tomb of Genghis, the great Khan. Fool! Also remember, my friend, that I am the first to gain control of the girl's mind. Your influence cannot enter until mine has left. Vadangi, I'm going to strip you of all your powers. Your threats are useless, Shadow. I command the girl to appear. In just a moment, she will enter by that door. She, who is pure as a pearl, will perform a deed at my command. A deed which will finish the work I set out to do. A deed which will bring madness to her for the rest of her life. You sent for me, Master. Margot. Oh, she is the girl, Shadow. Yes, Madame. But she is no longer your friend. She is my slave. I know what you've done to her. A simple trick and a simple one to remedy. After I've disposed of you. Slave. Pick up that machine gun. Yes, Master. Uh, stop her if you can, Shadow. But Dange, the powers of Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva were never intended for evil. Slave, point the gun at the Shadow. He is here in this room, and I will you to see him. His mind is in the same hypnotic plane as yours. I will you to see him. Yes, Master. Fargo, don't point the gun at me. Do you see him now, Slave? Yes, I see him. Then, Margo, recognize me. You know me. I know you. Margo, you won't shoot me. No, I won't shoot Stop you. Stop pointing the gun at me, Margo. I can't. Slave, I command you to pull the trigger. Margo, you will not pull the trigger. Fight Vadangi's spell. Fight it, Margo. Slave, in the name of the terrible Vashtar, destroy this infidel dog. Pull the trigger. Margo, Vashtar is evil and has no glory. I command you. Put down the gun. Slave, never again will you look to the east. I command you to shoot. Master. Master. Mayor Collins. Mayor Collins, stay outside. Master, Master, where are you? I feel your spirit leaving. Badangi, your power is slipping away from you. Shadow, never before have I used the forbidden chant of Genghis the Great Khan. You are strong, Shadow, but no one is stronger than the chant. <laughs> Margo? Margo, the chant of Genghis is also evil. You must fight, Margo. Fight! I am trying. I am. I am. Lamond! Lamond! in the street. I mustn't enter the house. Three shots. Badangi! Three shots! It was Lamont I saw. The gun. Oh, Lamont, I've killed no, you. No, Margot, no, I'm here. Oh, Lamont, oh, my dear. Take it easy. <laughs> but I, I thought Vadangi had made me kill no, you. No, Margot, it was Vadangi who was killed. Oh, then, then I killed Vadangi. No, Murdered no, him. no, Margot. Mayor Collins shot Vadangi. Mayor Collins? Yes, when I broke Vadangi's power, his control over Mayor Collins was ended. Oh. Leaving only hysterical hate. Mayor Collins picked up the other gun and shot Vadangi. Oh, but where is the mayor? Is he hurt? The strain was too much for both of you. You both fainted. The mayor is sleeping in the next room. When he woke, he won't remember anything that happened from the time he awake was kidnapped. Mayor Collins is not to blame. The distortion of his mind and its results were of Vadangi's own doing. I must call Commissioner Weston. 
Tell him to come here. But what are you going to tell him? The message you received from the shadow is this. Dutch Broder murdered both Slick Scarpell and Vadangi the Hindu, his accomplices. Commissioner Weston will find Broder unconscious and Mayor Collins asleep and unhurt. This attempted revenge on the shadow has failed, as must fail every scheme to overthrow those who administer justice. No matter how cunning the plot, how clever the criminal... You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> all the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow, the mystery man who strikes terror in the very hearts of shopsters, lawbreakers, and criminals. Today, the Death Triangle. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, The Shadow will be with you in just a moment. In the meantime, I'd like to remind you of a well-known fact. Coal colored blue means better heat at less cost. For when you buy blue coal, you're getting the cream of all Pennsylvania anthracite. The harmless blue coloring with which blue coal is trademarked is your guarantee of clean, even, safe, dependable heat all winter long. Such heat ensures the health of your entire household. So when you order coal, specify blue coal. Ask for it by name. Phone your order to your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program of organ music to bring you a special news flash from our affiliated press service. 
New York, December 12, 1937. The shadow has been found. Dr. James Evans, world-famous child surgeon, told reporters this afternoon that a wounded man who claimed to be the shadow forced his way into Dr. Evans' private clinic and at the point of a gun forced him to remove a bullet. The wounded man then revealed that he was none other than that mysterious character who has waged a one-man war against crime, the shadow. Before Dr. Evans could report the case to the police, however, the shadow mysteriously disappeared. The famous surgeon believes the shadow has little chance of surviving his wound. Our organ recital now continues. Hello? Dr. Evans speaking. <laughs> Dr. Evans, the man you claim to have operated upon was a fake. The real shadow has not been wounded. The shadow? You are the shadow? Yes, Dr. Evans. You don't seem surprised. I'm not. I've been hoping you'd get in touch with me. That statement I issued was false. False? Come now, Dr. Evans. A man of your high standing in the medical world does not issue false statements without very grave reasons. There was a very grave reason. I need your help. An old acquaintance of mine, Raymond Dubril, the financier, has received a death threat. Have him notify the police. No, he refuses to do that. Then let him take the consequences. Unless... Dr. Evans... Have you also received a death threat? Yes, I have. Before I made this call, I investigated your past, Dr. Evans. My past is a matter of public knowledge. You were once a political prisoner on Devil's Island. You escaped 20 years ago with three other men. Raymond Dubril, the banker, and Pierre Martin, the concert pianist. Yes, but our convictions were reversed by a high court a year after we escaped. I know it was proved that you three were innocent. But what about the fourth man who escaped with you? A murderer. Jacques Covey. He was caught and sent back to Devil's Island. After the escape, one of you betrayed him to the police. I don't believe that. Why else should he mark you for death? Then you know Covey escaped from Devil's Island a second time six months ago? Yes, Dr. Evans. Then you're interested. You'll help? Yes, I will help. But only because your life is in danger, Dr. The world can ill afford to lose the skill and genius that has saved the lives of countless children. You overestimate my important shadow, but will you help? Yes. When and where does Covey's warning say he will strike first? At Dubriel's Long Island estate tonight. How do you know this warning came from Covey? Dubriel received a miniature music box in the shape of a coffin in the mail this morning. A musical coffin? Yes. And when the lid of the coffin is raised, the music box plays a tune. Atune, Dubril, Martin, Kobe, and myself whistled as a danger signal when we were planning our escape from Devil's Island. Where is Dubril, Dr. Evans? At his Long Island estate. Martin is staying with him, and I am driving out there to spend the night. I had hoped you'd come and help. I will help you, Dr. Evans. Tell Dubril and Martin that the shadow will be there tonight. Miss Lane. Is Mr. Cranston at home? Uh, no, Miss Lane, he's not. Do you know where I can reach him? Well, he may be at his club. No, I've tried there. Uh, his office? Yes, everywhere. Nobody's seen him all day. Uh, is there anything I can do? Uh, be sure and stay here in case he comes home. I'll call you on the phone later. Uh, yes, miss. I've got to find him. I've got to. I've just got to. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Evans knows more than he told the newspapers. His office said he might be at home. Number 33. Yes, this is it. Oh, Lamont, I knew they'd shoot you someday. 
Yes, miss? Is Dr. Evans here? I must see him. I beg your pardon, miss, but are you another reporter? Yes, and I must see Dr. Evans. It's important. It's a matter of life or death. I'm sorry, miss, but Dr. Evans has nothing to say to the press. He's not at home. But I must see him. I must find him. I'm sorry. That car. That's Dr. Evans' car. Yes, miss. Where's he going? I'm not at liberty to say, miss. Never mind. I'll find out myself. Taxi. Taxi. Okay, miss. Where to? Follow that big black limousine, the one with the green cross on the license plate. That's well, a doctor's car, miss. I may have to break a lot of traffic laws if it goes through red lights. Never mind, I'll pay the fine. Don't lose sight of that car for a minute. Okay, lady, but this is going to be one fast ride. Driver, yes? driver, slow down. That car's turning in at that estate. What do you want me to do? Go through the gates after? No, no, stop here. Okay. Here's five dollars. Hey, thanks, ma'am. I wonder if this is just a wild goose chase. Lamont couldn't be way out here, not if he's wounded, dying. That car, it sounded like... Oh, but it couldn't be. It is. It's... It's Lamont. Lamont! Margot? Margo, what, what in heaven's name are you doing here? Oh, Lamont, then it wasn't true. You weren't shot. Dr. Evans didn't operate on you. Oh, no, so you heard that news flash, too. The papers are full of it. I tried to find you out the office at home, at your club, everywhere. I'm sorry, Margo. I should have known you'd worry, but I've had a very busy afternoon. Uh, how did you get here? I followed Dr. Evans' car. He just drove through those gates. What's happening, Lamont? Are you trying to find out why he said he operated on the shadow? Is, is someone impersonating you? No, uh, Dr. Evans did that, knowing I'd get in touch with him. He needs my help in a very special manner. But why? Is someone after him, threatening him? Yes, also the owner of this estate, the banker Dubril and Martin, the concert pianist. And you're going to help them? I'm interested in helping Evans. He's a great doctor and a great humanitarian. His life is in danger. Lamont, now that I'm here, is there anything I can do? Yes, Margo, wait in my car. Keep your eye on the house. If you see a light go on and off twice in one of the windows, drive to the nearest payphone and notify the state police to come to the Debril estate. I'll watch for the signal. Fine. I suppose there's no use my asking you to be careful. No, Margot, but uh, I'll try. I'll try to avoid really putting Dr. Evans to the trouble of removing a bullet from the shadow. Gabriel, stop pounding on the table and cursing Covey. Oh, that's all very well for you to say, Evans. Your turn hasn't come, but it will. If we three sitting here, you or me or Martin, don't get Covey when he comes here tonight, you will be the next on his list. You or Martin. Oh, don't concern yourself about my fate, Gabriel. I am not afraid of Covey. Oh, you'll change your mind if he manages to kill me, Martin. <laughs> I wonder what it's like to die. What do you think, Gabriel? Or do you ever think of anything but your fat stomach and your money? I, you... Gentlemen, this is no time to argue. I have something more important to tell you. What is it, Evans? I hear you had quite an experience today. Operated on this man who calls himself the Shadow. Yes. That's what I want to talk to you about. Ah, there's a man, Dubril, the Shadow. He might save you from Covey. Ah, uh, what could he do? I've had the best private detectives in the country trying to find some trace of Covey ever since he escaped from Devil's Island again six months ago. By the way, Dubril, I've always wondered who tipped off the police when Covey was hiding after he helped us escape 20 years ago. Covey was a murderer. We were innocent men. And also, who betrayed me, Dubril, the time I tried to escape alone the first time? Matt Town, Dubril, now listen to me. A moment ago, we were talking about the shadow. Well, he isn't dying. I didn't operate on him. I announced that, hoping the real Shadow would get in touch with me. And did he? Yes. And he's coming here tonight to help us. I've always been curious to see this Shadow. You won't see him. No man has ever seen him, but he'll be here. Oh, Evans, for a man of intelligence, you're talking like a fool. The age of ghosts and mystic presences is... You're past. wrong, Gabriel, you're wrong. Because I am a doctor, I can readily accept the fact that the Shadow is a master of the powers of mental suggestion, of mass hypnosis. Recent experiments have proven conclusively that... Ah, rubbish. <laughs> Allow me to convince him, Dr. Evans. Hey, what? What was that? Who spoke then? The shadow, Dubril. You do not accept the theory of my power of invisibility. But perhaps you will accept the fact. For I am here. Sit down, Dubril. You look rather pale. If I am to help you, you will all sit down. Sit at that table there. I understand there is little time to lose. I must know the whole story. 
the truth if I am to help you. Do as the shadow says. Sit there, Matt Tarrant. And you, there, Dubriel. Well, why don't you talk back, Dubriel? Be quiet, Martin. Dr. Evans, I will help you if I can. But there is one gap in the chain of events leading up to this moment. I'll tell you anything I know, Shadow. Then tell me this. When and under what circumstance did Covey first threaten your lives? It was the last day we spent in the open boat in which we escaped from Devil's Island 20 years ago. Storms had blown us off our course. Our food was gone. Our water was exhausted. Covey, the only one who knew how to navigate, was... Well, he was slowly dying from hunger and thirst. He'll remember his cry. Water! Water! Oh, be quiet, Covey. There is no water. The cask is empty. You're lying, Dubril. All of you. You've been drinking my share. Give me that bucket. Give me a drink of that bucket. Don't let him have it, Don't let him have it. Salt water will kill him. Oh, what does it matter, Dr. Evans? Seventeen days in this open boat. Nights of storm and days of blazing heat. Water. Water. I'm dying, I tell you. Dying. You're not giving me my share. You're stealing my water. Where will you be if I die? I'm the only one that knows navigation. Be patient, Kobe. It may rain tonight. Oh, we might as well be back on Devil's Island. At least there was bread and water there. Bread. Bread. A crust. Just a crust of bread and water. Water. There's no bread, Kobe. The last crust went three days ago. You're cheating me. Killing me. You only brought me along to steer the boat. Now you're starving me to death. You don't want me to live. But I will live. I'll get you for this. I'll live to kill every one of you for this. You, Dubril. You, Martin. You, Evans. Oh, shut him up, Evans. You're a doctor. You know what to do. Look. Martin, Dubril, look. Seagulls. Oh, what does it matter if we have no guns? I know, but don't you see? The gulls never go far from land or a ship. Oh, you, you're right, Evans. Look. Look to the west. It's land. Land at last. All right. There, to the southwest. You can see the sun of the mountains. We're saved. Free at last. Come back, come back. Sit up, sit up. Look, look. We've sighted land. There'll be food and water plenty for everybody. You tried to kill me. Starve me to death. But I'm going to live. I'm going to live until the last one of you is dead. 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 Yes, he threatened all three of us. And so you see, that's how it all began. And now Covey is free and out to get us, Shadow. But what makes you so sure... It is Covey. Well, it couldn't be anyone else. It's Covey, all right. He said you breathe that thing on the table. That oblong box? Yes, Shadow. Notice its shape. It's a miniature coffin, beautifully carved. Covey was a woodcarver. He was always handy with a knife. But still, it does not follow that he was the one. Except for one thing, Shadow. When the lid of the coffin is raised, it's a music box. And that tune it's playing was the warning signal we used while planning our escape from Devil's Island. Remember, only the four of us knew it. You Dubriel, Covey, Evans, and myself. Oh, stop it, Evans. Stop that curse of thing. Stop it, I tell you. I can't stand it. <laughs> so you have a conscience, eh, Dubriel? That danger refrain recalls the past, doesn't it? Stop talking about it. It looks as though Covey meant business, doesn't he? Don't sit there conniving over me. You forget your turn, maybe next, maybe tonight even. I am not forgetting anything, Dubriel. You better study yourself, Dubriel. I'll get you a drink. Oh, never mind. Here's the decanter. I'll pour it myself. Oh, that tune! Where is it coming from? I smashed the coffin. Good heavens, Dubriel! It's the decanter in your hands. Someone, someone changed the decanter. Covey! He did it! He's here! He's been in his house tonight! Dubriel, where are you going? To my room! I don't trust anybody! I'd be safe there behind locked doors, alone! And if Covey comes, I'll be ready for wait, him! Wait, Dubriel, wait! Let him go, Dr. Evans. But he shouldn't be left alone! Covey may carry out his threat. Are you sure it is, Covey? What do you mean? It must be. It couldn't be anyone else. The coffin, the decanters, are his warning. I know. But you said the four of you knew the signal. Are you sure it isn't one of you? <laughs> of course not. I thought you said the shadow was here to help us. I am. But I am content to let events lead themselves to a logical conclusion. You mean you won't use your power to save us from him? I shall use my power at the moment it is required, Dr. Evans. Right now, for instance. 
Look on the table. Huh? There's a note where the decanter was standing. Good heavens. Coupe has been here. Listen to this, matter. You are the first. And you will die tonight, Raymond Dubril. Ladies and gentlemen, the shadow will return in a moment. There are thousands of families living around snowbound Buffalo today who are as snug as a bug in a rug thanks to blue coal. You have read how the whole city of Buffalo has been literally snowed in. In that entire area, business practically came to a standstill for several days. But those families who laid in their supply of blue coal kept comfortable. The icy, biting winter blowing outdoors made no difference to them. Bee storms are reported to be coming eastward, so take a tip and get ready. Put in a supply of blue coal tomorrow. It is the most economical fuel that you can use. Furnaces, parlor stoves, and cooking ranges in New England were designed to use anthracite. And blue coal is America's finest anthracite. Blue coal is mined by the Glen Alden Coal Company and is especially prepared for home use. It is available in all domestic sizes, egg, stove, chestnut, and pea. Every carload of blue coal is laboratory tested for purity and sizing before shipment from the mine. Blue coal burns steadily and evenly, sending a full supply of heat to the living quarters of your home, even in the most severe weather. Get set for winter tomorrow by ordering blue coal. You will find the name of your nearest blue coal dealer in the Where to Buy It section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. Dubril, wake up. I have come for you. <laughs> so you've come, Cove. Oh, you poor deluded fool. Do you think I'd let you kill me in my sleep? I've been awake, waiting here in the dark for you to come. <laughs> a little light helps. <laughs> so you've grown a beard since I saw you last, Cove. And your hair is gray. That gun in your hand won't save you, Dubril. If I die, I will take you with me. Listen, Cove. I didn't steal your food in the open boat. I swear it. No? You also betrayed me to the police. You told them where to find me. And I am not the only one you betrayed, am I, Dubril? You betrayed Martin the time he tried to escape alone, didn't you, Dubril? Yes, yes, but what do you care, Corvée? He wouldn't take me with him. But I did not betray you. Have you paid Martin for those hundred lashes and those hundred days of bread and water he got because you betrayed him? Oh, he doesn't know. He will never know it was I. Dubril, you remember how we passed the long days in that open boat... Throwing knives. Don't raise that knife, Covey. We got so good, we seldom missed. I'll shoot if you move. But Martin was the best. You may shoot me, Dubril, but my knife won't miss. Oh, wait. Wait a minute, Covey. I will make a deal with you. Listen, Covey. You're out to get Evans and Martin, too. If you throw that knife, I'll shoot you and you will never get them. Oh, you would help me kill Evans. I know he's here in the house. Yes, 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 sir. I hate Evans and Martin, too. I will help you get them. <laughs> Dr. Evans, to save yourself, to Dubriel. The shadow. Covey, don't be afraid. He's only a man. By some trick, he can make himself invisible, but he's flesh and blood. Quick, lock the door. We'll deal with him first. He won't get out. Now, now, shadow, what can you do to stop us? Speak up. I dare you to speak. Listen where his voice comes from, Dubriel. Then shoot quickly. No, no, no. The shot would bring Evans and Martin. Throw your knife, Covey. Make him speak. I won't miss. Speak up, shadow. We will find you anyway. You can't get out. I am here in the corner. In the far corner. Throw your knife, Covey. I heard him. <laughs> oh, you missed. But he was there. No. Only my voice was there. Ventriloquism. He's there in front of you, Dupreel. Shoot, shoot. Yes, yes, I will shoot now. Yes, I will shoot. But not the shadow. He came here to help us catch you, Covey. And he has... Your knife, it's gone. Now, Corvée, you are helpless. And now I'll deal with you. Oh, you treacherous snake. You fool. You think I carry only one knife? This one is for you. Oh, you devil. But I, I take you with me, Corvée. Where is he? Look there, on the floor by the window. Covey? That Covey? Do 
tried to save his life by promising to help that man kill you. Gabriel? Gabriel offered offer to help Kobe kill me? Look closely, Dr. Evans. Remove the gray wig and the false beard. Wig? Beard? It's Martin! Yes. Martin disguised as Kobe. He's still alive, breathing. Get away from me, Evans. Don't touch me. I'll hit you. I hate you both. Why did you do this, Pierre? Why? I hated you, Briel, because he betrayed me on Devil's Island. I hated you, Evans, because you have got the things that I always wanted. Success, fame, glory. It was I sent the musical coffin. The warning note. I knew you'd think it was Kobe. I've got you, Briel, but Kobe will get you, Evans. He's after you. He will get you. He will kill you. He will... Mata, Mata! Stop breathing. Dead. Yes, Dr. Evans. He is dead. You are quite safe now. You forget Kobe. No, Dr. Evans. I knew, even when I phoned you today, that it was not Kobe who sent the musical coffin. What? I knew it was not Kobe. It had to be Martin or Dubriel. Why didn't you stop them? Martin and Dubriel were both criminals plotting to kill you. If I had stopped them, your life would have been in danger as long as they lived, hating you always for having attained the things that life denied them. But you forget, Shadow. Kobe may find me. Succeed where Martin fails. Never. I learned the whole history of all of you before I saw you. Yes? Everything, Dr. Evans. Your escape from Devil's Island after Dubriel's betrayal of Martin that resulted in the hundred lashes and his resolve for vengeance. And from the authorities at Devil's Island, I learned the truth about Kobe's last escape. Yes, I see now. I see now why he hated us. But what about Kobe? You are safe now, Dr. Evans. Safe from Kobe. The chain of logic is complete. Three months ago, a bleached skeleton was found on a deserted beach at Trinidad. It has just been identified as the body of Kobe. <laughs> Before we tell you of the Shadow's next exciting adventure, here's John Barclay, Blue Coal's famous heating expert. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Barclay. Good evening, friends. While you're doing your Christmas shopping, why not get a gift for your own home? Something will not only make it a cheerier, happier place in which to live, but also make it easier to run. To my mind, the perfect gift for any home is a blue coal heat regulator. This marvelous thermostat provides the last word in comfort. For example, there's no running up and down stairs to open and close dampers. The blue coal thermostat does that tiresome job automatically. Keeps your home at just the temperature you want from morning till night. It can be attached to any kind of heating equipment. Steam, hot air, hot water, even a parlor heater. It will give you more uniform heat, more economical heat than you can get with the most expensive oil burner. In fact, this blue coal heat regulator will completely modernize your present heating equipment. And yet it costs only $18.95 plus a small installation charge. You'll be amazed at the amount of fuel it saves you. So this Christmas, give your family the gift of a lifetime, a blue coal heat regulator. Your nearest blue coal dealer will be glad to give you complete information regarding it. Phone him tomorrow. Thank you, Ken Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Barclay. And friends, take Mr. Barclay's good advice. Make this Christmas a memorable one by having a blue coal heat regulator installed in your home. You'll save it small cost time and time again in fuel consumption. And you'll make your home a happier, healthier place in which to live. So don't wait. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. The story you have just heard is copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters in this story are entirely fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. And at this time, they will remind you to mail your Christmas presents and cards early to secure delivery before December 24th. There will be no post office service on December 25th. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> Next week, same time, same station, Blue Coal, America's finest anthracite, will again present another thrilling adventure of the shadow. Be sure to listen. Don't forget, next week, same time, same station, another thrilling adventure of the shadow presented by America's finest anthracite, Blue Coal. And be sure to burn Blue Coal, the solid fuel for solid comfort. of men. <laughs> the shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, before we join the shadow, let me ask you this. Do you realize that before Goodrich developed the amazing skid protection of its new Silvertown tire, they tested tread designs by the hundred for two long years, endless testing, checking, and comparing. It was a battle of wits against wet roads, dry roads, and hairpin curves, until finally they developed a tread that will stop you quicker, safer on a wet pavement than you've ever stopped before. And that tread, motorists, is the lifesaver tread found only on the new Goodrich Silvertown. Its never-ending spiral bars act like a whole battery of windshield wipers. They sweep the water right and left, force it out through the deep drainage grooves, make a dry track for the rubber to grip. Yet remember, even though this new Goodrich Silvertown costs many thousands of dollars to design and build, even though it gives you the famous golden ply blowout protection in the bargain, there is no extra cost. Play safe. Start riding on these life-saving Goodrich Silvertowns before it's too late. The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Hospital Murder. But Lamont, what's it all about? Margot, my dear, you're yours not to reason why. Yours but to make those pretty feet of yours walk fast enough to keep up with me. Yes, but I thought this trip to Egypt was to be a vacation. No more work. No more excitement. <laughs> no more excitement for about two weeks and you'd be having me cut out paper dollies. <laughs> Here we are. Cairo General Hospital. Come on, watch these steps. Will you please tell me what it's all about? All I know is the Dr. Rawling phoned the hotel and asked me to go over here as fast as I could, so here we are. But who is Dr. Rawling and, and what's he got to do with you? Dr. Rawling is in charge of this place, old friend of the family's. Hmm. It'd be quiet even for the hospital, isn't it? I don't like it, Lamont. Wait out here for me, Margot. I'll... Call you if I want to. All right, Lamont. Oh, Lamont. Lamont Cranston. Hello, Dr. Rowling. Oh, come in. Come in, do. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, my boy. What's it all about, Doctor? Cranston, our families in America are friends. Perhaps you can help me. There's no one else here I can trust. I, I don't know where to Wait turn. Wait a minute, Doctor. Wait a minute. How can I help you when I don't know what it's all about? <laughs> Both of you calm down. Tell me the story. Start where you left off when you phoned me this morning. Oh, yes, yes. I'll tell you everything. Cranston, three of my patients have disappeared. What? Yes, three of them in the last three days. Disappeared right out of the hospital. Well, why don't you go to your Cairo police? Oh, no, no, not the police. The publicity would ruin the reputation of the hospital if this word got around. Cranston, can you help me? No, Doctor, tell me this. How do you know those patients didn't just walk out? Oh, they couldn't. They were bedridden, every one of them. 
There's no doubt they were kidnapped out of their bed, and the devil only knows why. It doesn't seem possible. But it's true, I tell you, true, Cranston, and it's driving me crazy. I, I can't eat, I can't sleep. All I can see is those empty beds. Now, you're clever, Cranston. Perhaps you can help us. We can trust you, Mr. Kruger and I. We both agreed on that. Mr. Kruger? Who's Kruger? The head of our board of trustees. He and I... Well, we've kept this horrible thing that's been happening from getting into the newspaper. When did the first patient disappear? Three days ago. Then another disappeared and another. Oh. Franson, you've got to help us stop this terror before someone, before someone important disappears. In other words, the three patients who have disappeared up to date weren't very important, is that it? Oh, no, just natives. Who were they? Well, the first was an Egyptian beggar boy with a broken leg. He had a fracture. Never the... mind the diagnosis. Who disappeared next? An old woman from the bazaar. A broken hip. I tell you, she couldn't have moved a step without help. The third? Last night, a Sengalese from one of the French boats. What's wrong with him? Fractured shoulder. In other words, had... none of the patients were constitutionally ill. Oh, no, no, they, they had no disease, if that's what you mean. And what have you done to prevent any more such disappearances? Have you posted guards? Oh, yes, yes, indeed, all over the hospital. But I tell you, Cranston, I'm afraid. Now, I'm not a superstitious man, but I swear to you there's something supernatural about all this, something not of this world. A strange way for a doctor to talk, Rowling. But it must have been something supernatural. They've disappeared, just disappeared. Three living people. Take it easy, Doctor. Oh, gone, I Take tell you. Easy. Gone into thin air, and I'm responsible, Cranston. I tell you, if another one disappears... Now, what is this? Yes. Come quickly. Well, what is it? It's happened again, Doctor, again. The girl in room 11, she disappeared. Hurry, Doctor, oh, hurry. the girl is gone. The girl gone. Kidnapped. Now, you see for yourself, Cranston. The bed's empty. Now, when this gets out, we're ruined... My 20 years' work here, gone for nothing. Ruin, ruin. Dr. Roy, for heaven's sake, pull yourself together. Can't sell anything with hysteria. Who's the patient in this room? What is the name? Now, you didn't believe me when I told you it was something supernatural. But now you'll have to believe me. You will. It'll get them all, all our patients. They'll all die. Doctor, stop that. They'll close up the hospital and they'll blame me, me. Stop it, I tell you. No one's blaming you yet. Who is this patient? Another native? No, no. That's what makes it so horrible. This patient was the 16-year-old daughter of the French consul. A young girl? Yes. A guard below the window, a guard in front of the door, and yet she's gone. Gone. It's the end of everything, I tell you. It's the Why end of everything. Doctor, what's going on here? Mr. Kruger, look. Look, it's happened again. The consul's daughter gone. Oh, impossible. She's gone, I tell you. Gone, gone. Look for yourself. Heaven help us. If you men will take my advice, you'll call in your local police. Eh? Oh, who are you? Lamont Cranston's the name. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Kruger. It's, it's Lamont Cranston, my, my friend from America. Make him help us, Mr. Kruger. Make him. Control yourself, Doctor. There may be a very simple explanation for these disappearances. Yes, a very simple, rational explanation. That Doctor. We... Yes. Mr. Kruger. Hold this window quickly. Well, well, what is it, Cranston? What did you see out of the window? Mr. Kruger just said there may be a simple and harmless explanation for all these disappearances. Uh, yes, yes, Absolutely. Then look out there on the fire escape. Kruger, look. It's the orderly. The orderly we put out there to guard the room. He's dead. He's dead. And we'll all die. We'll all die. Stop. It's fainting. Oh. Cold. Yes, it's his heart. He's had trouble with it. All this but excitement. He... Yes, yes, he'll be all right. Just needs quiet. Let me help you lift him on the bed. Oh, thank you. Here, just right over here. Thank you very much. I'll ring for an intern. Anything else I can do, Mr. Kruger? Oh, I don't think so. Thank you. Dr. Rawlings must have expert attention immediately. Then perhaps it'll be better if I leave you. Uh, yes, Mr. Cranston. I'll see Dr. Rawlings again when he's recovered. All right, Mr. Cranston. Don't worry about him. He'll be all right. Goodbye, Cranston. I hope so. Goodbye, Mr. Kruger. Goodbye. Oh, Margot. Yes, Lamont. Four people have disappeared. Oh. A guard has been murdered with a six-inch knife in his throat. Oh. Margot. Seems another mystery challenges my attention as the shadow. Slow up, Margot. There's the hospital up ahead. Lamonde, are you sure your scheme will work? I know it's a dangerous undertaking. Oh. Especially for you. Yes, but we agreed that there was no other way in which to find out how all these people disappeared from the I hospital. I know, Margot. The, the shadow has got to be doubly watchful. I have every faith in you, Lamont. I, I hope it isn't misplaced this time. Well, I'm not worried about that. Stop here, Margot. All right, Lamont. 
No. Remember what I told you. Head straight for that lamppost in the front of the hospital. I know. Cut your wheel so you'll sideswipe the fender. It will make noise enough to bring the emergency squad out of the place. Yes, but they'll see I'm not hurt right away. Oh, no, they won't. You slump over the steering wheel. I feel you cracked your head on the windshield and call it a concussion. Hope you're right. If I'm wrong, then you won't get a free bed tonight and a chance to act as decoy for one of those body snatchers. Well, see you in the hospital. Here's where I leave you. Good luck and be careful. You don't know what we're getting into. Thanks, Lamont. I'll be careful. No, I don't think so. Jim, hurry, get a stretcher. Okay, now. We've got to get this girl to the hospital right away. Well, here I am, an inmate of Cairo General Hospital. Your plan certainly worked, Lamont. Yes, almost too well. Are you sure you're all right, Margot? When I saw you crash the car into the lamppost, I was afraid you'd overdone the accident and hurt yourself. <laughs> It shake me up a bit, but I'm all right now. Yes. Wind's very strong tonight, isn't it? Oh, it's welcome. Now, this bed's inclined to be warm. Wind from the desert and those body snatchers are quite welcome to come in that window, aren't they? Do you really think someone will come in here after me? Two others were kidnapped out of this room. Oh. Nervous? A little. I guess it's, it's not knowing just just what will come through that window. I'm going to leave you now. Must you? Yes, I... will look around outside. Whoever intends to make you the fifth victim will meet the shadow. wonder what time it is. wonder if Lamont will come back. It's so dark. Like being buried alive in a tomb. Buried alive. Wonder what it would be like to wake up in a coffin. No, I I mustn't think of such things. Why doesn't Lamont come back? I wonder if anything will happen. That Dr. Rowland said it would be something supernatural. It could be. Egypt. They say anything can happen here. I... I heard something. No. No, it's, it's quiet. Quiet as the inside of a tomb. Why do I keep thinking about tombs? Tombs, Egypt, mummies. They do run together. Oh, the wind's gone. It's so quiet. Too quiet. What if that doctor was right? What if there were something from another world that was... I hear it. Something is coming toward me in the dark. Something coming toward me. What is it? Coming closer. Closer. What will it be? Man? Or ghost? I've never been afraid. Won't be afraid now. Closer. Closer. Oh, Lamont, where are you? I can't scream. I... Something sweet. My head. Something pressing close to my mouth. It's not a, a ghost. Ghost. Don't you chloroform? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue with the Shadow's exciting adventure, listen to this. Recognize it? That's the sound of a car as a desperate motorist has jammed on the brakes in an emergency. The Shadow knows when you have to stop in an emergency, you have to stop fast. That's why I urge you to replace smooth, worn tires with the new Goodrich Safety Silver Towns. 
because the new Silvertown Lifesaver Tread is so amazingly different that it gives you the quickest stops you've ever had on any road, wet or dry, curved or straight. And here's proof that the new Silvertown is in a class by itself. In exhaustive road tests made by the impartial Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory of the regular and premium priced tires of America's six largest tire manufacturers, here's what happened. The new Goodrich Silvertown gave greater skid resistance than any other tire tested. And the tires included tires listed at 40% to 70% higher in price. For your sake, for your family's sake, make it a point to get a demonstration of the amazing Lifesaver Tread in action. Discover what it means to be saved by a Silvertown stop. And remember, the new Goodrich Silvertown offers you both Lifesaver Tread skid protection and Golden Ply blowout protection at no extra cost. woman, dead. Her legs hacked off. Oh, Lamont, where are you? Someone coming. Now I'll know who... Coming closer, whoever it is. Closer. Got to wait. You do not fool me, my friend. I know you are awake. Open your eyes. Who, who are you? You are afraid. Who are you? You would not know me. Surgical gown and a white mask. Why do you wear them? I must wear them. My work is very dangerous. Who are you? That does not matter. Only my work matters. My work. You will see. You will see. You, whoever you are, come back here. Come back here. No, no. Do not be impatient. I will show you my work. I will show you. An operating table? A black man strapped on. Why? Now you will see. Yes, now you will see my glory. The Sengali is off the French boat. You stole him from the hospital, too. But why? What are you going to do with him? You will see. <laughs> yes, well, you will see. <laughs> uh, you hear the black one regains his senses. <laughs> How unfortunate for him. <laughs> oh, those knives. You madman. What are you going to do to him? Black legs. Strong black legs. No, you wouldn't. But I will. Look at this. You see this bottle? Liquid in it is green. Beautiful green. Listen to it sing. What is it? Listen to it. Yes, yes, my beautiful liquid. Soon I will feed you flesh to grow on flesh. You will not fail me, will you, my beautiful? What is it? What's in that bottle? Yes, yes, I will tell you why not. What harm can you do to me strapped there? You see in this bottle green liquid. I see in it an alchemy of the flesh that will change the world. This... This is the catalyst that grows flesh on flesh. <laughs> and with this, I can graft human flesh to human flesh instantaneously. No, it can't be done. And I tell you, it can instantaneously. His flesh to mine, your flesh to mine. Come on. I tell you, I can take his black leg and graft it on in place of yours. I can take your leg and put it on me. And they won't laugh at me behind my back then. And they won't call me peg leg and limpy. <laughs> yes, I laugh at them. All of them, the whole sneering, snibbling pack of them. Uh, oh, sweet. But, uh, 
Uh, listen, the black sailor awakens quickly. I have time only for another word. I put flesh to flesh an amputated leg to a raw, bleeding stump. Then an injection of my beautiful green liquid through the bloodstream it races. Flesh cells eagerly join the new flesh cells. In a moment, two moments, three moments. Ah, the miracle is done. Old flesh has joined the new flesh. Lamont, you said you'd be here. To whom do you speak to me? I have no time for words. My work... Lying there, you will see the miracle. <laughs> yes, you will see. No, come back here. Loosen these straps. Lamont, Lamont, where are you? <laughs> Almost completely awake, eh, my black friend? Oh, oh, such a pity. I cannot give you an anesthetic this time. But my beautiful liquid will not work when the patient has been drugged. White man, what do you do, white man? What'd you do? Lamont, Lamont, where uh, are you? Tonight. So what'd you do, white man? <laughs> your leg. Your right leg, a good, strong uh, leg. Oh, no, 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 my leg, no. Another my leg. Give him another steady. Shadow. Drop that knife, Kruger. Who? Who spoke my name? Uh, my mask, you ripped it off my face. You are Kruger. You, Kruger. Respectable Mr. Kruger, chairman of the board of trustees of the hospital. I, I, I hear the voice. I see no one. Loosen the straps around you, Margot. Ah, the straps around you, woman. They loosen how? Why? The answer to that is in your own ears, Kruger. The voice again. The voice of a shadow. A shadow which asks one question. Why have you murdered? My right leg, never any good. Kruger is my name. But they've all had other names for me behind my back. Limpy, they called me Limpy and Peg Leg, but I'll show them, I'll show them all. My discovery is to put a strong leg on my body soon, and voices in the air won't stop me. There's more than a voice now. Look straight ahead, Kruger. Eyes. Two eyes glaring at me from midair. See how the light glitters in these eyes. Look deep in them, Kruger. Eyes. I tell you, you want to look in my eyes. In them you see wonders. Wonders you never dreamed about. Look, Kruger. I... I don't see what... See, one. see how the light glitters in those eyes. Look deep in them, Kruger. Deep in them. They burn deep in your eyes, Kruger. Deep, deep. Yes, deep. Deep in your mind. And they take away your will, Kruger. Take away your will. Yes. Yes. My will is your will, Kruger. My will, your will. No, 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 I won't. I, I work to do. The work will wait, Kruger. You wanted to wait. All you want to do now is look in my eyes. My will. Your will. My will. Your will. I, I don't know. I... Sleepy. You get very sleepy. Sleepy. Your hand is sleepy. Hand is sleepy. Your hand. Sleepy. It opens. It opens and lets the knife fall to the floor. You hear me, Kruger? Open. Open. Margot, you all right? Yes, I'm all right. But the Negro... Unconscious. Kruger, what have you done with the other people you kidnapped out of the hospital? I used them for my experiments. They are all dead. Oh, how horrible. All right, Kruger, you can wake up now. Wake up! Ah! <clears throat> What? Not a knife in your hand. You're quite harmless, aren't you, Kruger? Those eyes. They're gone. There's nobody here. I am still here, though you cannot see me. You, you hypnotized me. Yes, and I say again, I wish I could have done it sooner. Yes, but how? Who, who are you? They call me the Shadow. Shadow what? The name of a man who tries to right a few of the world's wrongs. I am not afraid of you. I'll kill you. You won't hypnotize me again. I'll kill you. Stay back. I'll kill you. Oh, no, you won't, you poor fool. You're coming with me. I'm not going to judge you. I'll let a jury of your peers do that. No. No, my work. I've got to go on with my work. Come with me, Kruger. No, 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 no let go of me. Hands out of the air, let go. Come quietly, Kruger. No. No, you're struggling, you see. You haven't got a chance against me. No. No, no let go of me, let go. All right, uh, I'll drag you along. No. All the fiendish murderers. No, have... no, no, let go of me. Oh, my work. I've got to go on with my work. Look out! Uh, the lamp! The ha, ha! I made you let go. I made you let go. Hargo! Hargo, look out! 
The oil from the lamp. The flame is going to catch it. Run! You'll never get me. Not me. <laughs> Oh, he's dead all right, and all the rest of them. I never saw a hotter fire. There must have been plenty of inflammables in there. All sorts of liquids. Well, what I can't understand is why some of the bodies were all cut up. It's more than I can figure out. But two got out of it alive, Chief. At least they think so. What? Two alive? Out of there? Sure, Chief. Right after the explosion, as some say that a man and a woman run out. Uh, who were they? No one seems to know exactly. They couldn't see him clear. But they say the man, he was, he was more like, well, like a shadow. Yes, a shadow. Yes, he's right, Margot. We did get away. Strange. We come halfway across the world for a vacation and then this... A poor, deluded creature who thought he could bring himself happiness through murder. (laughs) He gave others a horrible death, but he died a far more horrible one. No, Margot, there's never any profit in murder. It always brings its own reward. I wonder... I wonder if Kruger understands that now. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> Crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. of men. (laughs) The shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, while you're getting set for the Shadow's latest thriller, let me say a few words about that great new Goodrich Silvertown tire. Because believe me, motorists, this new kind of tire is making history. It takes care of skid and blowout problems like they have never been taken care of before. And here's proof positive. 
the engineers of the famous independent Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory tested the regular and premium price tires of the nation's six largest tire manufacturers. The results? Listen. No other tire tested, regardless of price, came up to the new Goodrich Silvertown in skid resistance. What's more, this great tire gave more non-skid mileage than any other tire tested in its price class, averaging 19.1% more miles before the tires wore smooth. That's the same as saying this new Silvertown gives you every sixth mile free. Ride on the safest thing on wheels, the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown. The shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Mark of the Bat. Alexei, come. Come in the house out of the night air. I am coming, Marie. The dogs were restless, whimpering. Must be the storm coming. It is more than the storm, as you know it, Alexei. I'm not sure. Why aren't you in bed asleep? There'll be no sleep in this house tonight. Or any night. Then you've seen the great bats, too? Yes, I've seen the farmer's cattle. Bloodless, dead in the fields. And the white comb of the dead rooster. Ah, it was the same on the farm of my father in Croatia. Alexei, why did this Dr. Vickers send away his stepfather's servants? Why does he pay us so much to stay in this house? Why do we stay knowing what we know? Jobs are hard to find, Marie. But I think we go soon, when the master of the house dies. It cannot be long, and I am not sorry. It is his own doing. He brought the bats here, set them free to kill. And now they take his life from him, in the night, in the darkness. Only for his daughter am I sorry. She is young. She was beautiful. But each dawn finds her more like those things from the grave. Have you seen the mark of the vampire on her, Marie? Yes. Only this morning. On the throat as she lay sleeping. The sins of the father. It is his punishment. The great bats are children of Satan. He brought them here from the caves he found in that strange country he wrote books about. Yeah. And he laughed at the stories I told him. The vampire bat is a thing of evil, leagued with the devil, stealing the blood of the living, that the dead may go on living in their graves. <laughs> Storm is coming, Alexei. Well, it will drive the bats back into the cave in the mountain. That much is good. <gasps> Marie! What is it? A shadow passed across the moon. Oh! oh. The clouds of the storm, maybe. No, no. A bat, like a great bird. It is an omen, Marie, an omen. The dog howls. Yes. <gasps> the dog howls. Quick! Light the candle at the crucifix. Yes. Yeah. Yes, the crucifix. Uh, here comes Dr. Vickers. Yes, Alexei. It is quite fitting that you light the candle. Say a prayer, Mary. Dr. Vickers, is, is the master, Major Stevens, is he? Yes, Mary. My esteemed stepfather, Major Stevens, is dead. <laughs> We've come 200 miles up into these spooky mountains. Why? I've been reading the obituary columns, Margot. As a result, we're going to visit the home of a man who once had a very strange hobby. Oh, so Lamont Cranston, the amateur criminologist, has been reading between the lines again. Who died recently? The corpse, Margot, is Major Stevens, a noted explorer and zoologist. Oh. Yes. Well, I tell you anything more, let me ask you a question. Yes? Do you believe in vampires? What? Creatures with the power to leave the grave? transform themselves into bats 
and draw from the flesh of the living blood to feed the bodies of the restless dead? Lamont, are you serious? Quite. Well, of course I don't believe it. What's all this about? Are you guessing or, or do you know? I'm going on a curious mixture of theory and fact. I've known about Stevens for years. He led an expedition of five men into the mountains of Ecuador, came back alone, with a cage full of vampire bats, big ones. For years, he's been breeding them. Oh, a cheerful hobby, I must say. Become an obsession. Six months ago, I read that a neighboring farmer sued him, claiming those vampire bats killed three of his cattle. But Lamont, that's preposterous. No, Margot, it isn't. There are authentic cases where cattle have been killed by blood-sucking vampire bats. And you think Major Stevens' pet bats killed those cattle and, and killed the Major as well? It's possible. All of which leads to what, Lamont? Who are we going to call on tonight? Not Major Stevens, I hope. No, the Major is safely interred in his grave. Oh, you make it sound so cozy. Stevens had a daughter, Claire Stevens. I've checked up. She's suffering from the same ailment that supposedly killed her father, anemia. Oh. Stevens was wealthy. Claire's his heir, but she's underage, only 20. And there's a guardian in the picture, Dr. Vickers, uh, who also happens to be the Major's stepson. I think I'm beginning Apparently, to see. Apparently, Vickers is running things. He's even discharged the family servants and hired an old Slavic couple. Why? And they're croats, Margot, not very far removed from the atmosphere of their native land, where for centuries human vampires have been accepted fact. Now, do you see what I'm driving at? Yes. Yes, I'm afraid I do. Claire Stevens is being led to believe that she's a victim of human vampires. Yes. Whereas, actually, she's being bled to death by the giant vampire bats. Is that it, Lamont? That's right, Margot. Oh. It's just a breed of very large bats. I see. Oh, this is a lonely road. We haven't passed a car in ages. My little father, huh? Good heavens. Oh. Oh, what's wrong, Lamont? Look. Look, a man uh, lying there beside the road. Wait here, Margot. This may be a hold-up gag. Well, what's wrong with him? Has he been hit? Beaten up, I think. Wait, I'll... I'll help you with him. Is he alive? Yes, but unconscious. Lamont, there's a paper clutched in his hand. See what it is. Listen to this, Margot. Dave, if you love me, come and take me away from this awful house. I can't explain, only come. If you don't, you'll never see me alive again. Signed, Claire. Claire Stevens! Oh, Lamont, this boy must have tried to help us. Yes, and failed. What are we going to do, Lamont? Drive him back to the last town we passed? No, Margot, he needs a doctor, and I think the logical man to patch him up is the one who may have had a hand in this. Vickers. You're going to take him to the Stevens house? No, you are, Margot. Oh, but, but you'll be with me in that house. Yes, Margot, but in my role of the shadow. It'd be better if you're not Margot Lane. Pretend to be an old friend of Claire Stevens. If yes. she's in danger, she won't give you away. All right. Help me get the boy into the car. <coughs> then I'll drive. <coughs> Lamont! What's the matter, Margot? Lamont, look on his throat. Good heavens. Oh, a bat. Fastened to his throat. Kill it, Lamont. Yes. Yes, Margot. One of Major Stevens' pets. A vampire bat. Ladies and gentlemen, while we leave the shadow for a moment... Here's a brief reminder that when you want real tire safety, halfway measures don't go. There's no such thing as saving half your life. The shadow knows. Beware. In these days of high speeds and super highways, you need protection against both skids and blowouts every time you get behind the wheel of your car. And motorists, the tire that will give you life-saving protection against both of these driving hazards is the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown. For a member... Only Silver Towns give you the skid protection of the Lifesaver tread. This amazing new Goodrich development protects you against the hazard zone of motoring, where a slippery film of water on the road can make complete command of your car almost impossible. The never-ending spiral bars of this Lifesaver tread act like a whole battery of windshield wipers. They sweep the water right and left, force it out through the deep drainage grooves, make a dry track for the rubber to grip, you stop quicker, safer on a wet pavement than you've ever stopped before. And don't forget, adding one safety feature to another, Silver Towns also give you the famous golden ply protection against dangerous high-speed blowouts. Why ride on anything but the safest thing on wheels, especially when Silver Towns give you these two great life-saving features at no extra cost? Play safe with Goodrich, spelled... G-O-O-D-R-I-C-H Goodrich Safety Silvertown Alexei, who drove Dave Henderson here? 
young girl, Dr. Vickers. She says she's a friend of Miss Stevens. Uh, a friend of Claire's, eh, Alexei? Yes. And young Dave Henderson. Huh. Odd that she should come here tonight. Strange that she should find him on the road. Where are they? In the room where the Major worked with the bats, Dr. Vickers. Good. Nothing could be better. It will save me considerable trouble. I lock the door. Unlock it. Then go back and watch Miss Claire's room. See, she does not leave it. Why? <laughs> What's the matter, Alexei? Your hand is shaking. You're afraid. Yes. Yes, and you would be afraid, too. Those caged bats in there, they, they killed the Major. I know, I know. They're creatures of the devil. Nonsense. There's nothing to worry about. I have released the good Major's pets. Taken them out of their cages and sent them back to the bottomless pit in the grotto. Yes, but a bat like a bird of evil flew across the moon the night the Major died. It was an omen. An omen of death. <laughs> Tell that to Miss Claire. She'll believe you. And watch carefully, Alexei. Two, perhaps three of those bats may fly across the moon tonight. More omens of death. But now, go upstairs. See that I am not disturbed. Yes, Doctor. The girl is there. At the far end of the room with the young man. Doctor, are you Dr. Vickers? Yes. I understand you brought a young man here, victim of some hit-and-run driver. No, he's been beaten. I'm afraid his skull is fractured, and not only yes, that... Yes, 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 yes. Alexei told me your fantastic story of finding a giant bat drawing his life blood from his throat. But it's true. The marks are still on his throat. Look there. Hmm, hmm. Still unconscious. Has he spoken at all? No, but don't stand there. Do something. You're a doctor, or so I was told. By whom? Oh, yes, you're a friend of Miss Stevens. Of course you would know. Of course. Where is Claire? Sleeping. You were coming to call on her at this late hour. Why? Well, we're old friends. I, I heard of her father's death. I... Do you know this young man? Why, no. No, I don't. Hmm, that's odd. This man is David Henderson, Miss Stevens' fiancé. Oh, well, well, you see, I, I haven't seen Claire for several years. How many? Why, for, oh, not for... Oh, three years. Oh, but don't stand there questioning me. Do something for him. There'll be plenty of time for that. I'm more interested in you and just why you happened to pick this night to visit such an old and dear friend. A friend who apparently never spoke of Dave Henderson, to whom she's been engaged for many years. A childhood sweetheart. Well, you... See. Yes, I see. I see you are lying. Who are you? What do you want in this house? I want you to treat that boy. Yes, I will treat him. In good time and in my own way. But first, I think you need my attention. Keep away from me. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to kill that boy. Oh, now I'm beginning to understand. So you know. Yes, I know. You know too much. Too much to ever leave this house. Oh, a lucky interruption for you. It will give you a few minutes grace, young woman, and a chance to see your dear friend, Claire Stevens. What did you and Dr. Vickers done to Dave? Who was that woman? Let go of me. He's in there. I know he is. Come, Dr. Vickers, you stay in your room. Come. Oh. What's going on out here, Alexei? Uh, doctor, I couldn't stop her. She tricked me. She ran down here. I'll take her back. No. Come. I won't go. You've got Dave here. It's all right, Alexei. Let her come in. You wait out in the hall. Oh. Yes, Claire, my dear. Dave is here. You can see him. And there is someone else, an old friend of yours. An old, an old friend? Yes, that young woman there. Well, you don't seem to recognize her. Perhaps it's been so long since you've seen each other. Claire, uh, don't you remember me? Grace Wilson, we, we went to school together. What? I heard you were in trouble. I thought I might be able to help. What? What? Oh, oh, oh of course. Grace, Grace Wilson. I I'm so glad you're here, Grace. But, Dave, you said I could see him. Where is he? There, on the couch. Dave. Oh, Dave, Dave, darling. It's Claire. Claire. Oh. Is... Is he dead? No. But he may die if we don't get help. Oh. Revive him. This Dr. Vickers won't help. Why won't you do something? Dave's hurt. His head's cut open. Dr. Vickers won't help because he did it. What? He wants Dave Henderson to die. Just as he wants me out of the way now that I've discovered his secret. And you, Claire Stevens... You're marked for death. No. I can see it in your face. You're as pale as a ghost already, half bled to death. You're a victim, too. A victim of vampire bats. No. No, it can't be. Not that. I I've been ill. Dr. Vickers has been treating me. Your father died of Dr. Vickers' treatments. Dr. Vickers? You... 
Why do you look at me like that? Why, my dear child. Oh, then, then it is true. Those sedatives in the open window. That was so the giant bats could come from the well in the grotto oh, and... you've been listening to the fantastic tales of Marie and Alexei, my dear. Monstrous nightmares out of a ghoulish past. Miss Stevens, don't listen to him. He's a murderer. We've got to get your fiancé out of this house. But he won't let us go. The door's locked. He has the key. Yes, my dear, you are quite right. The door is locked. I have the key. The only way out is through that door leading to the tunnel in the cave. To the bottomless pit your father so aptly named the Well of the Bats. Father sealed that tunnel when the bats escaped. Yes, but I opened it again. It will come in very handy. Tonight. The storms have kept the bats in the grotto for many nights now. They must be very hungry for blood. Oh. What a feast they will have. Come, Claire. No. The vampires are tired of coming to you. It is time you visited them. Oh, Stevens, get back. Keep away from you. Stupid heroics will not save you. Keep back, young woman, or I shall have to shoot you. <laughs> the bats won't mind. <laughs> not so long as the blood in your body is still warm. <laughs> Come, Claire. Come with me. No. No. <laughs> Very well. Perhaps you would rather follow your beloved David. I'll take him first. Oh, no, no, don't. He doesn't know anything. If you'll only let him go, I'll... I'll, 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 I'll... I thought that would bring you to me. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Vickers. Dr. Vickers. You are startled, Doctor. <laughs> I see in your eyes and read in your reeling mind... Questions, no. questions beating in your brain like the black wings of your destroyers. Who am I? Where am I? Is this voice you hear real or the trickery of a mind warped and twisted by the remorse of murder done and murders yet to come? No, no. <laughs> the gun in your hand trembles, Dr. Vickers. Your lips are dry. But you... Who are you? The shadow, Dr. Vickers. The shadow! The shadow! It would seem you have heard of the shadow, Doctor. Yes. Yes, I've heard of you, shadow. Do you believe what you have heard? Yes. I know all about your devilish tricks of mesmerism. Hypnotic influence. I know you're here in this room, but I can't see you. I know my gun isn't any use against you, but that won't stop me. I'm going into the grotto, and I'm taking these girls with me. Both of them. Try to stop me, Shadow, and I'll shoot them both! All right, Claire. And you too, Miss Wilson, or whoever you really are. Quick! Get through this door, unless no. you want me to use this gun. No, don't! We'd better do no. as he says, Miss Stevens. Come on. No. All right. All right, Shadow. Let's see you follow me through this door. <laughs> it bolts on the inside, and by the time you've broken it down, the vampire bats will be feasting on these two women, the only ones who stand between me and Stevens' fortune. It should have been mine in the first place. And now it will be. It will be mine. Don't be too sure, Dr. Vickers. For the grotto will be filled with shadows. Shadows of the living. Shadows of the dead. <laughs> Listen to me. Wake up. Listen. Oh, oh my head. It aches. Listen, David Henderson. Uh, you came to save your fiance. She's in danger. Uh, Dr. Vickers has taken her to the grotto, to the well of the bats. Well, Claire gone into the cave? Yes. Well, well who am I talking to? There's no one here. Oh, I must be out of my mind. No. There is someone here. The shadow. The shadow? Yes. Don't be alarmed because you cannot see me. Even to those I try to help, I must remain unseen, unknown, for their own safety. There is no time to explain the whys and wherefores of my presence. I'm here to help you and your fiancé. If we don't get into the grotto and stop him, Vickers will kill Claire Stevens and a girl who is with her. No. Kill them and drop them into the well of the bats. That that heavy door leads to the pit. Come on. I can't follow that way. I've tried. It's bolted on the other side. Is there another way into the grotto? Any other way of reaching the pit? What? 
Yeah. Yeah, there is. One other way. Major Stephen showed me years ago. Where? Up on the side of the mountain, there's an opening. It's shorter that way. Maybe we can get in that way and head Vickers off before he reaches the pit. Come on, I'll show you the way. If I get my hands on Vickers, the, the bats will have their feast tonight on him. Shadow. Shadow. We're almost there. Shadow. I am still close to you. Go on. We may be too late. Be careful along here. This ledge is slippery. We're getting near the pit. How deep is this pit, this well of the bats? No one knows. Once Major Stevens and I dropped a weighted kite string down into it. A thousand feet of string. It didn't touch bottom. Shadow, look. There's a light. A torch down the passageway. That must be Vickers. It's in the big chamber. That's where the pit is. We're not too late, see? Your fiancé and the other girl is with him. Wait, stop here. Well, he's forcing them toward the pit. He's going to kill both of them. I tell you, let me go. No, you've done your part. Stay here. No, no, I won't. I won't, I tell you. But you must. To understand if Vickers saw you coming, he'd shoot you down. He'd be signing the death warrant of your fiancé and the other girl. Oh, no, I'll, I'll get him. I'll get him before he sees me. Let, let go of me, Shadow. Let... Sorry, I had to knock you out like that, Henderson, but... It's the only way. They'll kill you with this, Dr. Vickers. The police will find it out. They'll hang you. I think not. <laughs> My dear Claire, you see, to prove a murder has been committed, there must be some trace of the body. <gasps> the vampires will leave little in the way of evidence. Have oh, you forgotten the shadow, Dr. Vickers? You think he'll let you live to enjoy the fruits of this ghastly thing you're about to do? So you're still counting on the shadow to save you. He may not be able to save us. But you'll never get away from him unless you follow us into that pit. Oh, hope and faith die hard. I've been wondering why one of you didn't try to get away from me. So I would have an excuse to shoot you down. Oh, you need an excuse. No, not really. But there is something fascinating about watching the reactions of people who are about to die. <laughs> but now I give you your choice. Turn, take each other's hand, and walk straight ahead into the darkness... Or stand there while I count. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Not ten. That is too definite. Too certain. <laughs> I will merely count number after number until my trigger finger obeys the impulse to shoot. No! No, no! Oh, Dave! Dave! Oh, oh she fainted. That should make it easier for you. And for her. That's right. Hold her up. Steady her. One... Two. Oh, what a feast the vampires will have. Three. The bats. They're waiting. Four. Far down in the pit. Five. By the thousands they cling to the clammy walls. Six. Hanging heads downward with folded wings. Seven, waiting. Eight, waiting. <laughs> yes, Vickers, waiting. Waiting for you. For you. You got through. It's useless to struggle, Vickers. Your trigger finger obeys the impulse to kill, but the gun hammer won't fall because my hand is on it. Vickers... You should have used an automatic. Oh, you... You tell me... Yes. Yes, if you could only break loose, try it and your arm will snap like the stem of a pipe. Let me go. Let's go. I knew you'd find a way, Shadow. You can let go of it now. Well, she's she all right? Yes, she just fainted, that's all. Oh. oh, there you are, Vickers. So the Shadow got you. Well, you'll hang for what you did to Claire's father, but first I'm going to pay her for torturing... No, you won't! No, you won't! Stop! And I won't hang! Stand where you are or I'll shoot! Go ahead! Shoot! Shoot me! The shadow was right! The vampire bats are waiting! Waiting for their feast! For me! And I won't disappoint them! They'll have their feast! They'll have their feast! Now! Now! like this thing I'm playing, Margot? Yes, Lamont. 
Lamont. Mm, yes, Margot? Now that Dr. Vickers is dead and Claire Stevens is out of that awful house, what's going to happen to the Major's little pet? Oh, those vampire bats won't kill any more cattle. Or men, Margot. Thought of that while you and David Henderson were getting Claire to the hospital. Yes, but how, Lamont? <laughs> like this. Dynamite. Yes, yes, I found it in Stevens' tool house. The explosion filled the well of the bats with hundreds of tons of rock. Sealed forever. There will be no more black wings across the moon. No more marks of the bat on the throats of sleeping victims. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> all the characters and all the places named are fictitious and a similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental Man who strikes terror into the very heart of shopsters, lawbreakers, and criminals. Today we present the Shadow in one of his most remarkable adventures a modern mystery of science and crime, The Phantom Voice. This way, Margot. Lamont Cranston, where on earth are you taking me? We're on our way to the criminal court, Margot. The criminal court? Oh, a murder trial. Mm, this isn't a murder trial. But unless I'm badly mistaken, we're going to witness an assassination. What? An assassination. The assassination of the character and reputation of one of the most outstanding public men in America today. Oh, you mean Senator Durham? Yes. Say, I've been reading about his trial in the papers. They've certainly unearthed plenty of evidence that he accepted that bribe. Well, unless I've made a mistake in character analysis, that evidence is forged. Durham is more than a political figure, Margot. He's a statesman. He has an independent income. He's devoted his life to unselfish public service. Oh, he's a very wealthy man. Yes, Margot. Senator Durham has given away ten times the amount of money he's accused of taking as a bribe. Well, if that's true, Lamont, the whole thing doesn't make sense. Why should a man like that take a 15-year prison term for taking a bribe he didn't need? That's the point that worries me. Incidentally, didn't I see that the prosecution expects to spring a surprise bit of evidence today? Exactly. That's why we're here. Come along, Margot. Court's already in session. <laughs> such outbursts on the part of the spectators at this trial, and I shall order the courtroom cleared. 
Proceed, Mr. Defense Attorney. Your Honor, I have stated the case for my client. I have shown that by his record, it would have been impossible for him to act as the prosecution claims he has acted. And I have yet to see any proof that Senator Durham has committed any crime. I will now call Senator Durham himself to the stand to deny these lies in person. Senator Durham to the stand. Here I am. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, sir, of your God? I do. Proceed with the examination. Senator, you have heard the prosecution's accusations that you did at some time during last December accept a bribe from the late Mario Rinaldi. Yes. What is your answer? I never accepted a bribe from anyone. My answer is the whole thing is a pack of lies. Order! Order in the court. Your witness, Senator Durham. Do you deny that on the 16th of December last, you received a visit from the late Mario Rinaldi in your room at the Maximilian Hotel? Why, no. He came to see me and I... Confine told... yourself to specific answers. Gentlemen of the jury... The defense has made much of the senator's long and seemingly illustrious career of public service. They would have you believe that, like Caesar's wife, the defendant, Senator Durham, is above suspicion. They've paraded witnesses to the stand who've told you of his philanthropies, of his unselfish devotion to public service, of his blameless personal life in the past. That we do not contest, refute, nor deny. But unfortunately for Senator Durham, he is not being tried for his past. We, the prosecution, need but one more bit of evidence to complete our case. We have that evidence. Order. Order in the court. I beg leave to show the jury a soundtrack motion picture of a meeting between the defendant and the late Mario Rinaldi, whose bribe of $50,000 paid to the defendant is the basis upon which this case was brought to trial. Order. Order in the court. Has this motion picture a direct bearing on this case, Mr. Prosecutor? It has, Your Honor. Has the counsel for the defense any objection to the introduction of this type of evidence without due notice? Senator Durham has nothing whatever to fear from the introduction of any authentic motion picture record of any meeting of Mario Rinaldi and himself, even though the picture was made without the senator's knowledge. Very well. The projection equipment is in the courtroom. Will you order the shades drawn and the lights extinguished? Court attendants will please draw the shades. Again, I caution the spectators against any outbursts of any kind. Furthermore, no one will be allowed to leave the court until the introduction of this evidence is complete. You may proceed, Mr. Prosecutor. With the court's permission, we will place the screen in full view of the jury. Your Honor. Counsel for the defense has a question. For the sake of the record... Will the prosecution state at whose request this motion picture was made? It was made at the request of Anthony Vogel, an attorney of this city. For what reason? As a citizen interested in public welfare. Ready to roll, Mr. Prosecutor. Very well. Now, if the attendant will turn out the light. Certainly, Your Honor. Order. Silence in the court. The prosecution will submit affidavits to prove that this is an authentic film record of a meeting between Senator Durham and Mario Rinaldi on the evening of December 16th. You may turn on the machine. Yes, sir. Yes? Come in. Oh, hello, Rinaldi. I've been expecting you. Look here, Senator Durham. Why haven't I got the contract award on that Dr. Street building? The money's been appropriated. You said you'd use your influence if we pitched you up. Of course. Of course, Rinaldi, I told you you'd get that contract for a consideration. But you didn't send me my present of 50000 for swinging it your way. So naturally, I... Oh, sir, so that's it. Do you want to be paid off first, huh? Yes. And in cash. No checks. Okay. You'll get your 50 grand. Get me that contract. I'll be back in an hour with your money. Order. Order. Order in the court. Order! Order in the court! That's the end of the film, gentlemen. It's a lie! A lie, I tell you, I never said that! Order! Order in the court! Your Honor! I object! My client never had such a conversation with Mario Rinaldi! 
That picture is a fake. One moment. The attendants will please turn on the light. Your Honor, allow me to remind the counsel for the defense that pictures do not lie. Your Honor, we do not deny that the meeting between Senator Durham and Mario Rinaldi did take place in the manner shown in this film, but we deny that any such conversation took place. Have you any proof of that? There are only two people who could know what went on in that room. Senator Durham and Rinaldi. And Rinaldi is dead. Do you deny the voice was the voice of the defendant? My client admits that it sounds like his voice, but it cannot be, since he never asked or received a bribe from the late Mario Rinaldi for any reason or purpose whatever. Your Honor, I ask a recess of this trial in order that the defense may have an opportunity to study this film and soundtrack. I object. I do not see how the due process of law will be impaired by a 24-hour delay. Objection overruled. Court adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Lamont, after seeing that talking picture of Senator Durham meeting Rinaldi and practically demanding a bribe... How can you, how can anyone doubt his... Margot, the Greeks had a philosophy that ran something like this. Only believe half that which you see and nothing you hear. Oh, but Lamont, that wasn't hearsay evidence. That was the senator speaking. That was his voice. Even he couldn't deny No man knows the sound of his own voice, Margot. Besides... Durham never spoke those words to Rinaldi. But you saw him. You saw the motion picture. Exactly. Because I did see him speak, I know he didn't say the things that were on the soundtrack of that film. What do you mean, Lamont? Have you ever watched the movement of a man's jaw muscles when he speaks certain words? You mean you know what he really said? No. Now, his face was half averted from the camera. I couldn't see his lips. I don't know just what he did say, but I know he didn't utter the words we just heard. Oh, but Lamont, it was still the senator's voice saying those other things, demanding that bribe. I, I'd swear to you. Yes, it. and so will the jury, Margot. Unless something is done within the next 24 hours, one of the finest men in this country, an innocent man, Senator Durham, is going to be railroaded into prison for 15 years by his political enemies. I'm stopping here, Margot. I uh, want you to wait in the car, please. No. The lawyer's building. What are you going to do here, Lamont? I'm going up to the 25th floor, Margot. The shadow has an appointment with one of the most crooked lawyers in this city. Anthony Vogel who was so interested in the public welfare that he went to the trouble of having a sound camera planted in Senator Durham's hotel suite the night of... December 16th. While we are waiting for the shadow to return, I would like to ask all homeowners a question. Do you want to save money? Of course you do. And you begin real saving when you cut down on the cost of heating your home. Here's the easiest and surest way to do this. Decide now to cook and heat with blue coal. Here's why blue coal is more economical. It is prepared especially for use in the home. And blue coal is Pennsylvania anthracite, the fuel that furnaces cooking ranges and parlor stoves in this section of the country were especially designed to burn. It is mined by the Glen Alden Coal Company, the world's largest producer of specially prepared home fuel. And every carload of blue coal is laboratory tested for purity and size before shipment. And you can always be sure of getting this superior home fuel because it is tinted with an unmistakable blue color so that you can easily identify it at a glance. In Waverly, New York, and vicinity, blue coal sales so far this winter are 27% ahead of sales for the same period a year ago. This increase in sales is because Waverly families have found out that blue coal does all I say it will do. So I urge all families throughout this region to try blue coal. Order a trial ton tomorrow. Ask for a blue coal by name in any one of four sizes. Egg, stove, chestnut, or pea. You will find the name of your nearest blue coal dealer listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. That's well, Mr. Vogel. You 
certainly put it over. That sound picture sure turned the trick. Yes, but I'm still worried, Travis. Well, there ain't nothing to be worried about. None of the Durham's as good as on his way to the pen right now. Well, I won't feel happy until he is. When are you going to get me a wrestling bout, boss? A wrestling bout? Yeah, it's about time I was getting in the ring again. And, well, I could stand the extra dough. Forget you're a wrestler, Travers. You'll make more money in this racket as my bodyguard. Any calls while I was down at court? Yeah, Wilson phoned a couple minutes ago. Why didn't you say so? Well, you didn't ask me. What did he want? I wanted to talk to you. Hey, what do you suppose he wants? Dough? I've paid him all he's going to get. And maybe he's read in the afternoon papers what we're really using that soundtrack for. If he gets white-livered and talks... Well, maybe we should fix him so he can't talk, huh, boss? What do you mean? Well, he could fall out of that 15-story apartment of his, accidental-like. He'd only have to fall once. It um... might be a good plan. Okay, you want me to go over there now and take care of it, boss? No. No, there's no sense doing anything about him until we have to. But the first sign of anybody getting wise to what we're doing, then we'll arrange a neat little accident for friend Wilson. Well, now, but now let's take a look at that Wesley murder case. <laughs> One case at a time, Mr. Vogel. What, what was that? Suppose we review the evidence of the case against Senator Durham. What, what sort of devil's trick is this? Who are you? I am the shadow, Vogel. But I, I can't see you. Nevertheless, Vogel, I am here in the shadows. Gee, what? Somebody's talking and nobody's here. Shut up, Travis. I'll handle this. Oh, so you're the shadow. You come here to play your hypnotic tricks on me. What do you know about Senator Durham's business? I know everything about it. I've been listening to your interesting conversation about this Mr. Wilson. He seems to play an important part in your case against Senator Durham. Listen, Shadow, I've heard plenty about you. I don't want to fight you. How much do you want to keep out of this? Always the fixer. How much, Shadow? There isn't enough money in the world to cover up what you're trying to do, Bogo. Who is this man? Wilson. What part did he play in this scheme of yours? Oh, so you don't know. You're just trying to find out, are you, Shadow? Travis, lock the door. Okay, boy. That's locked. Melodrama won't help you, Vogel. What, if I could only see this guy, I Come on, Travis. We don't need to see him. What do you mean, Come over here. Give me a hand. Well, okay, but it don't make much sense. You'll see. All right. Stand up with me against this wall. Now, stretch out your arms. Can you touch the side wall on that side? Yeah, I can touch it. Good. I can touch it on my side. Now, walk slowly to the other end of the room and don't let your fingers leave the wall. Oh, I get it. Then the shadow can't get past us, huh? You're quick. Now, walk forward slowly. Slow, you fool! Okay. Well, I... I don't feel nothing... We're almost to the end of the room, boss. Maybe he got away. No, no, he, he couldn't go through the door. It's locked. The window is locked, too. Hey, boss, I felt something. Huh? I got him. I got hold of him, boss. Uh, I can't see him, but I got him. I got the shadow around the throat. He's a man after all. Gee, Strong. Would kill him, Travers. Maybe. Maybe he can. He's choking me. Give me your gat, boss. I'll shoot him. You don't need a gun. It'll make too much noise. He's weakening, boss. Kill him, Travers. Give him your famous stranglehold. If he doesn't let go, he'll kill me. Yes, yes, Shadow. This is where you die. Finish him off, Travers. I've got to hurry and take care of Wilson before he gets a chance to talk. trying to get hold of me earlier this evening. Yes, that's, that's right. I uh, want to talk to you. Won't you come in? Are you alone? Oh, yes. Good. 
Mr. Vogel, when you asked me to do some work for you, I I didn't ask to know what you were going to do with it. I needed the money for my wife, Alice, and kids, and I... You just paid, didn't you? Yes, but... I mean... Well, all this stuff in the papers, Mr. Vogel, about the... Frankly, I, I don't like it. Oh, you don't? Having a little attack of conscience, Wilson? Well, doing a job is one thing, but sending a man away to prison on a false charge is, is something else. So I, I intended to tell you that... Tell me what? Well, uh, tell you that I refuse to let it go on any further. Oh, you refuse? Yes. After all, Mr. Vogel, if I tell what I know about... Well, what are you going to do about it? Just this. Don't move, Wilson. Put that gun down. Don't be a fool, Vogel. I'm not the fool, Wilson. No. Turn your back to me. That's right. What are you going to do? I'm going to assist at a little accident. No. Walk to that window. Wait. You can't do this to me. You can't. Walk. Okay. No. Open the window. All right, Wilson. Climb up on the windowsill. Just a moment, Mr. Vogel. The shadow. I... I thought Travis took care of you. You thought Travis took care of me, did you, Vogel? Well, I admit he's a good wrestler. But there was one little hole, Vogel, I learned in the Orient. But he didn't know. He had me beaten for a moment. It was my one chance to get you to lead me to Wilson. You mean you followed me here? Yes. Yes, I followed you here. It wasn't very difficult to get away from Mr. Travers. It seems I arrived just in time for my proof. In time? No! Oh. There, Shadow, there's your proof lying dead on the floor. <laughs> You're crazy, Vogel. You're a fool. You'll get the chair for this. I'm not as crazy as you think. <laughs> so I'm a fool, am I, Shadow? Now, you're the fool for coming here. You're the fool the police will find locked in this room with Wilson's dead body. They'll find you. I'll see that they do. And here's the gun you killed him with. <laughs> Why don't you try the window, Shadow? It's only 15 stories to the floor. <laughs> Shadow. Shadow. Wilson. Wilson. Tell me. Quick. I am. I'm done for. Quick. Oh. Quick, Wilson, give me the proof. The proof, Wilson. Yeah. Proof. The proof that you framed Senator Durham. Senator. Proof. Senator Durham. Come on, Wilson, come on. Tell me. How did you frame Senator Durham? Durham. Alice, darling. My baby. Wilson. <coughs> I saw Vogel running out, so I couldn't wait. What happened? I hadn't been so stupid. Waited so long. I wanted to find out their secret before I spoke. And now... Now it's too late. Wilson is unconscious, I'm afraid. Dying. Vogel has outwitted me. After all... Vogel. That's it, Vogel. Shot me. In cold blood, he shot me. I burned for it. Wilson. Wilson. Wilson, listen to me. Listen and think. Think. Tell me. How did you frame Senator Durham? Tell me that, Wilson. Tell me that, and I'll see that Vogel pays for doing this to you. Durham. Senator Durham, now I remember. I'll show you. Help me into the next room. I'll show you. We'll help you. Easy now. Easy. I'll get on the other side. Yeah. Why, look. It's a recording studio. Yeah, that's right. It's my hobby. I'm an actor, an impersonator by profession. An, an impersonator? Yes. Yeah. Help me with that chair by the turntable. I impersonate people. I've imitated Senator Durham's voice dozens of times. I. <coughs> Quick. Hand me the microphone. Turn on the switch. There. I can't hold out much longer. Here's the microphone. Drop that needle on the wax record. Turn the switch. This is you, Wilson, speaking. I've just been shot by Anthony Vogel. He hired me to... Order, order in the car. Your Honor, I move 
that the case against my client, Senator Durham, be dismissed. On what grounds? On the evidence contained on this record found in the apartment of the late Hugh Wilson, the radio and stage impersonator who was found shot in his apartment last night. I ask the court's permission to play it at this time. Permission granted. You may start the record now. Yes, sir. This is Hugh Wilson speaking. I've just been shot by Anthony Vogel. He hired me to impersonate the voice of Senator Durham. It's my voice on the soundtrack of the picture shown at Senator Durham's trial. I, I'll show how I did it. Listen. Of course. Of course, Rinaldi, I told you you'd get the contract for a consideration. But you didn't send me my present of $50,000 for swinging it your way. So naturally, that, that's how it was done. That's how I did it. Durham's innocent. You never heard those words. I did it. I... amazing, incredible. Your Honor, there is one more voice on the record at the end. Listen. The voice you have heard is that of Hugh Wilson, murdered by Anthony Vogel. He is the man who sought to frame Senator Durham. But Vogel failed. Just as in the end, all crime must fail. And all criminals pay the penalty of death. Order, order in the court. Whose voice was that? That, Your Honor, is the voice of the man to whom Senator Durham owes his vindication. The voice of the shadow. Ladies and gentlemen, before the shadow leaves you, here's John Barclay, Blue Coal Heating Expert. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Barclay. Thank you, Ken Roberts. Good evening, friends. Just now, I'd like to offer you a friendly suggestion. To lose no time in sending for your free copy of my book, How to Reduce the Cost of Heating Your Home. This little book is attractively illustrated, and each of its 24 pages holds valuable heating information that is of interest to every homeowner. Problems such as the importance of clean furnaces, putting coal on the fire how to bank a fire, and how to light a fire, are dealt with in the fullest detail. For example, on page 16, you will find steps to follow in getting the best results from your furnace in the morning, during the day, and at night. And friends, these are only a few of the 36 topics covered in my book. There is no charge for this book. It will be sent to your home absolutely free and postpaid. It is a part of Blue Coal's famous free service. So I earnestly recommend that you send a postcard tonight for your free copy of How to Reduce the Cost of Heating Your Home. Address Blue Coal, 120 Broadway, New York City, or to Blue Coal in care of the station to which you are listening. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barclay. Friends, these books are going like wildfire. So write for your copy tonight. Address a postcard in a clear, legible hand to Blue Coal, 120 Broadway, New York City, or to Blue Coal in care of the station to which you are listening. Right now for your copy of How to Reduce the Cost of Heating Your Home. You have just heard a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> As you sow evil, so shall you reap evil. Crime does not pay. A shadow nose. (laughs) 
Next week, same time, same station, Blue Coal, America's finest anthracite, will again present another thrilling adventure of the shadow. Be sure to listen. And be sure to burn Blue Coal, the solid fuel for solid comfort. of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> Once again, your neighborhood blue coal dealer brings you the thrilling adventures of the shadow, the hard and relentless fight of one man against the forces of evil. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcefully to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Friends, we want to salute the retail coal dealers of America who, under the most difficult conditions, have done an outstanding job of spreading deliveries of coal this winter. We want to salute the American railroads who have been hampered by the heaviest snowfall in years. But most of all, we want to salute the judgment of five million hard coal users whose home have been warm and healthy. We want to say thank you to those hard coal users who are giving their local dealers several days' notice when a delivery is required. And we want to say thank you again to those wise consumers who continue to keep warm by accepting the advice of their local blue coal dealer as to the proper size of coal to have delivered at this time. The shadow who aids the forces of law and order is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Terror at Wolf's Head Knoll. In the desolate wastes of the Rutland Hills, high atop the bald summit of Wolf's Head Knoll, stands the weathered and dilapidated mansion, Windward House. The hands of the clock in the dusty hallway stand at precisely nine o'clock as an old woman comes slowly down the stairs. An oil lamp clutched in her gnarled hand to answer the violent pounding on the outer door. Who's that? Who's out there? Open the door, Mrs. Baker. Open it, I say. Mr. Danforth. Well, it's a good time, I must say. I'm sorry, sir. Have you been knocking long? Till the skin's off my knuckles. Oh, I didn't dream it was you, sir. You've not been here in such a long time. Did I haven't. Little pleasure in visiting a house that's cost a quarter of a million in money and ten years of your life in aggravation. Windward house, indeed. Danforth's folly it is. No mistake about it. I've taken the best care of it I could, sir. And by all odds, you're the world's worst housekeeper. Look at the place. Dust and decay from top to bottom. Well, I've done my level utmost, sir. Ah, well, no matter, no matter. Any luck at all, I'll be rid of this eye so within the hour. Rid of it, sir? I'm getting out from under, Bleaker. I'm going to unload. It's as good as settled if I'm to believe this letter I received yesterday. Well, who is it from, sir? Medical man, Dr. Goddard, he signs himself. Dr. Emil Goddard of the Goddard House for nervous disorders. Should be here any minute now. But what does he want with the place, sir? Who knows? And who cares? He says it'll suit his purposes and I shall be delighted. Ah, that should be him now. Well, Blaker, what are you waiting for? Open it. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Is the master of the house in? Right there, sir. Are uh, you Dr. Goddard, I presume? Dr. Goddard? No, my name is Williams. Terence Williams. And to what do I owe the inconvenience of this visit? You've got to help me, for your own sake as well as mine. 
What? I led them here because I'd heard of this house. They're on my heels. They'll kill us. They'll kill us all. Who will? The two of them, the doctor. What? And his friend Lasher. I don't understand. Don't try, but if you value your life... They're here. Oh, Mr. Danforth, what's happening? Don't open that door. Oh. I know you're in there, Williams. Open up. Oh. The police here the hour. What's this all about? I'll explain later. I prefer to find out now. No, wait. Don't open that door. Get out of my way, you fool. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Island, pardon me. Be a good bird. I shall have a pull at your tail feathers. Who are you? Don't let them in here. Ah, Williams, there you are. I demand an explanation. All in good time. All in good time. Come along inside, Lasher. Come on, Lasher. Yes. I suppose you know, sir, that you are harboring a fugitive. Don't listen to them. Lasher, I do believe Williams is trying to create a disturbance. A hand over his mouth, you know, might work wonders. Uh, uh, Yes, sir. Don't let him... Excellent, excellent. (laughs) Ah, this door off the hall seems to latch from the outside. It might be well to store him in there for the nuns. Yes, sir. Come along, you. You stay there till you want. Let me out of here. Let me... Good man, Lasher, good man. What's the meaning of this? I demand an explanation or by heaven... I don't like the tone of your voice, sir. And either you change it at once, or I shall leave you to your own devices, depriving you of a rather profitable association with myself. Profitable? Profitable? You're... You're not Dr. Goddard. One and the same, sir. This is my, uh, traveling companion, Lasher. How are you? And my parrot, Bartlemy. Uh, 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 Bartlemy, Bartlemy. And Williams uh, uh, uh. is a patient under your care? Precisely correct. Lasher and I were conducting him to my sanitarium for examination and therapy. And he's... Unbalanced, shall we say, sir. He broke away from us as we parked the car on the mountain road. I see. I'm terribly sorry, Doctor. Uh, w- would you like to see the house? Quite. I think I shall purchase it as a special ward, if it suits my needs. Uh, follow me, sir. Uh, Mrs. Bleeker, do you want to come along? If I might, sir. No need of that. Lasher will look after Mrs. Bleeker very nicely, won't you, Lasher? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, very nicely, very nicely. Uh, this way, then, Doctor. Thank you. You must pardon the slowness with which I move, sir. Gout and rheumatics. Ah. Uh, most distressing. I understand. As you see, the house is weather-beaten, no. but uh, well worth the price I'm asking for it. Ah, here we are. Ah. This is the second story. Twelve bedrooms on this floor, each complete with bath. Charming, charming. And what are these doors here, sir? Uh, they open onto the terrace over the hillside. A terrace, eh? May I see it? Of course. <laughs> What was that? Ah, sounds like trouble, eh? Lasher! Lasher! I'll go down and see. That won't be necessary, sir. Lasher's quite capable and very strong. Lasher! Lasher! Yes, sir. Ah, there we are. What was that sound we heard? Oh, nothing, sir. Williams broke out and frightened the old woman. Obstreperous, eh? Give him a good sharp crack. Very good, Mr. Bull. Two, if needs be, Lasher. I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. You, you use violence on your patients? Indeed, sir. It does them good. I'd apply the treatment myself if I was able to descend the stairs more rapidly. Well, if, uh, if you'd like to see the terrace now, Doctor. Uh, the terrace? Oh, yes, by all means. This way. Here we are. Ah. Handsome view we have here, sir. Very handsome view. Uh, how high up is this terrace from the valley below? Uh, 200 feet. So far, really? I like your establishment, Mr. Danforth. I do indeed. I think I shall take possession at once. Uh, you uh, realize that uh, I must have something on account? What do you mean? I mean you'll have to put something down. What can you put down, sir? Now, let me think. I haven't considered this. Why, I... Th- well, will you look? Where? There, below, coming across the valley. I don't see anything. Don't you really now? <laughs> ah, 
I've put you down, sir. 200 feet into the valley. <laughs> not a bad down payment, eh? Bartlemy? Not, not, not bad, not bad. <laughs> Master of this house, but a scant two hours left. Oh, and already I'm quite at home. Well, I always said you was a gentleman born. <laughs> gentleman born, gentleman born. Ah, uh, have a biscuit, Bartlemy, dear bird. And for myself, I shall have another slice of the goose and a glass of wine. Oh, the wine ain't good for your gout, sir. My gout is of no consequence, boy. Boy, ignore it. Ah, uh, charming and stately of old leisure. But, uh... We lack company. Guests. Well, I'm afraid there won't be many people coming along this way, oh, sir. Oh, there's occasional traffic on the road below. Well, will that just go by? Not necessarily, Lasher. You see the large mirror suspended in the hallway? Yeah. Think now. What would happen if we took it down and suspended it over the road in the dark instead Why, of... Why, cars would come around the curve. Quite right. And see their own headlight reflected. And swerve to miss hitting themselves and... <laughs> I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> What's the matter, darling? You look worried. I don't like this road, Lamont. Why? It's a perfectly good mountain road, Margaret. Oh, I don't care. I don't like it. It's a wonderful shortcut to the hunting lodge. It's so lonely and deserted. The better, no traffic to deal with. Well, there may not be any traffic to deal with. But... Look out, Lamont. There's a car right in front of us. Yes, I see it. Ah! I don't know. I... Ooh, my foot, I can't move it. Well, let me see. It's caught in the underbrush. Hold still. Oh, what are you doing? Cutting the loose with a hunting knife. Mm. There. I'll try and stand up. All right. I... Ooh, be careful. My ankle is killing me. You'll be on my arm. Oh, must be sprained or broken. Lamont, what are we going to do? Oh, steady now. Oh, we're miles from nowhere, out here all alone. No, we're not all alone, darling. What do you mean? See those lights for the trees there? Where? Oh, yes. Yeah. Where are they coming from? I did a little scouting around before you came to. There's a mansion, an old mansion right on top of the hill. Right this way, mister. Bring the lady in here. Yes, we had an accident on the road below. You did? <laughs> Too bad. Oh. Yes. I think her ankle's sprained. Oh, sit down now. Thanks, come on. Now, we can just phone for a doctor. Well, you won't have to phone for a doctor. We got a doctor right here. Oh, huh? really? Yeah. Dr. Emil got it. Was this his residence? Well, uh, no. It's more like a hospital for nervous patients. Dr. Goddard just took it over. Hospital, Margot. <laughs> Looks like our luck is changing. Yeah. You bet it is. I'll tell the doctor you want to see him. Thank you. Well, what do you know? It's probably private sanitarium. <laughs> Anyhow, it's better than limping around the woods, eh, Margot? Yes. How are you feeling, darling? A little faint. It's a nervous strain. If I only had a glass of water. Well, I'll see what I can do. There might be water in here. It's latched. Maybe I better take a chance and open it. Probably. Who are you? Shh. My name is Williams. Terence Williams, and I'm being held prisoner. What? There's no time for explanations. These men will kill us all. What are you talking about? Lamont. What, dear? Remember what kind of hospital this is. Oh, oh yes. Uh, We've all got to stick together. Of course, Williams, you're perfectly right. We'll all stick together. Williams, what are you doing out of your room? It's him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Follow me. Yes, get Williams out of here. Yes, sir. Come on, outside you. Help me, help! Good man, Lasher. Oh, good man, good Just man. so, Bartlemy. Sorry you had to see us at our worst, but Williams is a difficult case. Most difficult. I understand, Doctor. Now then, how can I serve you? Uh, this is Miss Lane, Doctor. I'm afraid she's hurt her ankle. Oh, too bad, too bad. I can hardly walk. I see. If you would just lend her your arm, Mr. Cranston. Yes, uh, there we are. Now then, just across the room. Where are we going? Right here. Into the examination room. Uh, may I come along, Doctor? I'd uh, rather you didn't, sir. Uh, I'll take over now. I'll be all right, Lamont. I say, young man, you look a bit pale yourself. You'd better have a drink. It's not a bad idea. You'll find one in the bar behind you. Come along, Miss Lane. I think I will have a small one. There's no bar behind me. What's he talking about? There must maybe men from one of these closets. There's nothing in this one. This one, all right. It's an old woman. She's dead. And what's going on here? What happened to her? Let me see. There's a locket around her neck. Mrs. Augusta Bleeker. Who in the name? Hello? Hello. Is Mr. Denford in? Danforth. I, I, I don't know any Mr. Danforth, but you I, see... I just want to tell him how sorry I am that I couldn't get over this evening. Uh, this is Dr. Goddard. Who? Dr. Emil Goddard. You see, there was an emergency at my sanitarium tonight, and I had to assist... What kind of an emergency? Uh, two rather serious cases ran away from here. What? Yeah, yeah. Taking my most effective young intern with them. Poor fellow by the name of Williams. Williams! Hello? 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 What is it, young man? I want to see Miss Lane. I'm afraid you can't. I haven't completed my examination. I want to see her, and I want to see her now. Very well, if that's the way you feel about it. I don't advise it, mind you, but if you insist, there's nothing I can do except... Uh... Oh. Oh. Well done, Lasher. Thanks. Good work. Good work. Oh, good work. Good work. We'll return to the shadow in just a minute. Friends, is your home heated with a type of fuel now hard to get? If so, I would like to ask you three questions. One, would you like to cut your fuel bill in half? Two, would you like to be sure of plenty of fuel for steady, uninterrupted, healthful warmth in every room of your home? Three, would you like to continue to enjoy the convenience of fully automatic home heat? I'm sure your answers are all yes. And there is only one way these things can be accomplished. Switch to the smaller sizes of hard coal and install an automatic stoker. At current price levels, stoker size hard coal will cut your fuel bill in half. Stoker sizes of hard coal are plentiful, and enough can be stored to carry you through the winter. Modern, efficient automatic stokers are available right now, and they soon pay for themselves in fuel savings. With a hard coal stoker, the fire is fueled automatically, and ashes are removed automatically. The healthful, steady coal fire warmth is automatically controlled by a thermostat in your living room. Your neighborhood blue coal dealer can give you information and advice on stokers. You'll find him listed in the classified phone directory under blue coal. Now, back to the shadow. When their car mysteriously skids off the road and Margot's ankle is sprained, she and Cranston take refuge in a dilapidated old mansion. There, a strange doctor claims to be treating Margot's injury. But when Lamont tries to see her, he is struck down from behind by the doctor's friend, Lasher. Now a few seconds later in the room with Margot. Doctor? Yes, my dear? What was that noise outside? Nothing, my dear. 
Nothing at all. I thought I heard Lamont's voice. Nonsense. You mustn't concern yourself with these trifles, Miss Lane. Particularly not now, when you have so much else to worry about. What do you mean? I have made my examination. Yes? The condition is very serious. I'm afraid neurological distortion of the metatarsal area has set in. What's that? A rather serious malady. Uh -oh. Serious malady! Serious malady! I'd better inform my family. Uh, that won't be necessary. I shall proceed here and now to do what's called for. What's that? I'm afraid surgery. Oh, no. Yes, my dear. Surgery. Uh -oh. Surgery! Surgery! <laughs> You're okay now, Cranston. Huh? It's dark. I can't see. Who are you? Williams. Williams? Oh, yes. Where are we? Locked in the gatehouse. Lasher? Yes. He brought me here first, right after I talked to you. He's very powerful. And the other one, the one who pretends to be a doctor? He was a doctor before he had his nervous collapse. Jeffrey Boland, his name was. Master Surgeon. Surgeon? Surgeon? Margot? Williams, we've got to get out of here. The chances aren't too good. Not a window in this place, and the door is three-inch iron plate. There's just one slim possibility. Yes? Lasher comes around about every ten minutes. Well, overpower Oh, him. no, that's out of the question. Besides, he seems to have found a revolver somewhere around the house. How do we operate? I'm not sure yet. It's no simple matter dealing with a psychoneurotic. What's wrong with him? His illness, I mean, what's it like? He isn't insane, but he has an obsession with sharp, cutting instruments. What do you mean? He's fascinated with them. Not uncommon phenomenon in the neurotic structure. I see. Williams. Yes? Would he be fascinated with a hunting knife? He certainly would. Why? Because I've got one. You have? Yes. Give it to me, and I think I can get you out of here. How? When Lasher comes around, I'll try to get his attention with the knife. And once I have, you can sneak out and go to your lady's rescue. Leave you here with a neurotic with a phobia for knives? It's your only chance. My chance, I know, but why should you risk your life like this? For one thing, for the sake of the lady. For the other... Shh, here he comes. Give me the knife. No, Williams. Give it to me. I... Okay, Williams. Oh, thanks. Williams. How you feel? I feel... All right. How's your little friend? He's... He's still unconscious. Lasher, please... Could I have some water? Water? You don't want no water? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. What do you want with water? Look, I'll... I'll make a deal with you, Lasher. Mm -hmm. I'll... I'll give you something if you bring me some water. Uh, what do you give me? This? What? A knife. A knife. It's for you, Lasher. All for you. A knife. Yeah, here. Here, take it. Knife. Now's your chance, Cranston. Okay. Good luck. Knife. You're the one who needs the luck, Williams. Knife. Nice sharp knife. Nice sharp knife. I'm afraid your gentleman friend is otherwise engaged, Miss Lane. Please, oh, please let me out of here. I fear, my dear girl, that would be impossible. <laughs> impossible. Try to understand, my dear. I shall perform the operation with admirable dexterity. I shall prove to those fools who would keep me in a sanitarium that I'm not ill. But I'm indeed a great and clever surgeon, a skilled master of the scalpel. I will not return to captivity to waste my talents under a bushel. No, no. That I will avoid at all costs. <laughs> What's that? The shadow. Who? Who laughed? There's no one here. I'm here, though you cannot see me. Who, Who are you? I am the shadow. Go away. Leave me. Go. If you've come to take Miss Lane from me, I won't allow it. Make one move, whatever you are, and I will plunge the knife. Shadow! You don't understand, Jeffrey Boland. I'm not here to help Miss Lane. No? 
No. I am here to warn you. Warn me? Dr. Goddard and his friends are on their way to this house. No! Yes. You've no time to waste. No, no, I best... <laughs> Let them come! They will never reach me. Oh, but they will. Oh, but they won't. There is a mirror hung across the road, and when they turn the bend, they will wreck themselves to avoid their own headlights. The mirror has been removed. Re removed? Who removed it? You! You did it! Listen to me, Bolin. Listen to me instead. Miss Lane will pay with her life for this effrontery of yours. What's that? They found you, Bolin. No, no! The house is surrounded. The grounds are covered. Let me out of here! Lasha, Lasha! Heaven, you came. Come on, Margo, quickly. I've got to get back to the gatehouse before Lasher uses my hunting knife. Williams! Williams, you're all right. Yes, they've broken the gatehouse just in time. Lasher, they've got him. Where's Boland? He's trapped in the house. Good. We'll proceed with caution. You men, just move in casually and encircle the house. I'll go in and try to lure him into... And where you are, Gentlemen! Well, that's Boland's voice. Look, up there. Where? On the terrace over the hillside. Boland! Yes, Williams? We've come to take you home. My home, sir, is here. Boland, we have to take you back. That you will never do. Please come quietly, Boland. We'll make you well again. You'll make me well? Ha, 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 ha. I'm the doctor, sir, not you. I'm a surgeon as skillful as ever I was. And not be kept within walls like a dangerous madman. Do we have to come and get you? Or will you come down alone? I will come down alone. Look, he's climbing over the railing. Boland, stop in 7 eight. I will come down, Williams. But you are not taking me back. Stop. That is one thing I promised myself to avoid at all costs. Don't jump, Boland, don't. Thanks for getting us to lift home, Williams. Oh, don't mention it, Cranston. We're lucky to be coming home at all. Here's my house. Oh. Good night. I don't know how I can ever thank you. You can, darling, so don't try. Good night, old man. See you again, Cranston. Oh, it's been quite a night. Well, of all things. Hmm? Jeffrey Boland was evidently quite a doctor in his time. What do you mean? realize I just ran up those stairs? Margo. That must have been quite a treatment he gave me. My ankle. It's completely well. Now here is Blue Coal's distinguished heating authority, John Barkley. Thank you, Andre Baruch, and good evening, friends. I'd like to point out how you can get longer firing periods from the larger sizes of hard coal and save money, too, by using about one-half buckwheat size along with your regular coal. It's a simple matter to keep an excellent fire using low-cost buckwheat and your regular size coal together. Just put the coal on in layers, first the larger size and then the buckwheat, which filters down into the gaps, giving you a deeper, hotter fire bed. And buckwheat, which is slow burning, is ideal for banking the fire overnight or to use in mild weather. So order your share of money-saving buckwheat from your blue coal dealer. You can be warm and comfortable all winter long and save money in the bargain. I thank you. This story is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Again next week, the shadow will demonstrate that the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. The Shadow is presented by the DL&W Coal Company, distributors of blue coal. 
Lamont Cranston is played by Brett Morrison. Margot by Grace Matthews. Your announcer is Andre Barouche. Remember, it's blue coal for finest heating service. It's blue coal for finest modern equipment. It's blue coal for the best home heat money can buy. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. moment, the shadow will be on the air with a thrilling new adventure. But first, let me tell you about a new kind of tire that makes wet weather driving safer than you've ever dreamed possible. It's the new Goodrich Silvertown tire with the lifesaver tread. Next time it rains, just notice the way your windshield wiper sweeps the water right and left to give you clear, safe vision. Well, that's how the amazing lifesaver tread on the new Goodrich Silvertown tire performs on a wet road. It sweeps the water right and left forces it out through the deep drainage groove, makes a dry track for the rubber to grip, gives you the quickest non-skid stops you've ever seen. And you get this life-saving skid protection plus golden ply blowout protection at no extra cost. So play safe. Equip your car with Goodrich Safety Silvertown. <laughs> Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard. The Shadow's true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Tomb of Terror. And so, gentlemen, we are gathered here on the grounds of the City Museum to pay tribute to those who have successfully brought to this country the building that stands before you, the authentic tomb of the Egyptian pharaoh, King Kupratep. It is my pleasure to present to you now the man who is largely responsible for its discovery, transportation, and reassembly, the director of the expedition, Dr. Romney Hale. Thank you. Thank you. Directors of the museum and fellow workers, I am very grateful. It has been through your cooperation that this work has been made possible. Although perhaps we owe a vote of thanks to good King Kupratep himself. <laughs> In spite of the legendary curse that all who gaze upon King Kupratep's mummy shall die, the bulk of our job is finished. Where? Now, uh, before you are admitted for the inspection... Will you excuse Mr. Avery, Mr. Johnson, and myself while we make a brief check of the interior of the tomb? <laughs> Harry, uh, Jack, will you come with me? Surely, Doctor. Well, certainly, Doctor. Well, gentlemen, how does the place look to you? Why, Doctor, you've done an amazing job. It looks exactly as it did when we first unearthed it in Egypt. Thank you. Would you like to pay your respects to His Majesty? Oh, yes. indeed I would. Uh, very well. Uh, will you help me with the lid of the mummy case? Oh, sure. There you are. Kufra kept the key. Lord of Egypt. My magnificent face. Yes, wonderfully preserved. We are defying the ancient curse by looking upon that face. Oh, come, Dr. Hale. Surely you don't believe Look. Those... Look at the mummy's eyes. Why, that's strange. They seem to glow. Yes, I see a tour of sort of unearthly life. What is this, Dr. Trick? No, gentlemen, I, I give you my word. I, I don't know what it could be. The light's growing brighter. I don't like this. It's, it's uncanny. Close that case. Let's get out of here, yes, Doctor. Yes, 
I can't understand it. If we hadn't all seen it, I would... Oh, no! That doesn't help. Oh, What's the matter? Take his arms out. Let's get him outside. Where did you... Oh, what's wrong? What's the matter with Dr. Hale? I don't know. He suddenly collapsed. He, he was... <coughs> Jack! Jack, what's the matter with you? Someone get a doctor, quick. These two men are very ill. Harry, what happened in there? Well, Mr. Rafferty, I was... Uh, Harry! Uh, catch him, catch him. He's falling. Harry. Look, look, Here, man, tell me what happened. Mr. Rafferty, it was... The eyes. The eyes. Yes, yes. It's... It's King Kufritep's... Curse. <laughs> Doctor. Doctor, tell me, how are they? All three of these men are dead. All those messages? What do you got, Chief? A terrific yarn. Dr. Romney Hale, the archaeologist, and two of his assistants died mysteriously an hour ago in King Cooper's F's tomb. Play up the curse angle and spread it for all it's worth. Right, Sue. Three minus five. Some of those donuts, too, for you. Oh, donuts? <laughs> now, Mark, you suppose we can dunk? Well, certainly, Margot. Lunch wagon etiquette not only allows dunking, it encourages it. <laughs> As you thought it, Chief. That'll be 26. Here you are. Just keep the change. All right, thanks. Say, bud, is there anything new on them guys that kicked off over at that uh, coffee or the kipper? Uh, you know, that Egyptian king? No, nothing new. Hey, how about my ham on rye? Right with you, right with you. Well, what do you make of that tumor, Fella Mark? That's amazing. The newspapers are playing up the superstition, Fella Sim. You don't think that all three deaths were due to coincidence? Hardly well, that, but I the certainly don't like hold to the Kufatep curse, theory. But something strange must have happened in that tomb. Unquestionably. Oh, According to the newspaper report, one of the three men before he died was heard to mutter something about eyes, terrible eyes. And his last words were King Cooper Tep's curse. They were undoubtedly terrified by something they saw in there. It's not die of fear. Oh, I know. According to the doctors, they all died natural death. Yes, that's quite true. One of pneumonia, one of typhoid, and one of heart disease. That's the way the doctors had to write their death certificates. Perhaps when the truth is known, they'll have to be changed. Changed? What? Well, what do you mean, Lamont? You finished eating? Oh, yes. Shall we take a walk? Oh, all right. Let's go. Good night, boss. Good night. Good night. Lamont, what did you mean the death certificates will have to be changed? Three men do not die within seconds of one another of different diseases without a single underlying cause. Oh, that's true. Margot... The mysterious death of those three men has challenged the imagination of the shadow. I must find out the medical details of the death of those men. Then you think there's more in it than the papers have printed? I know there is. I can get those details for you. Good. As soon as you have the necessary information, communicate with me. The shadow will await your call. Hello. Mark, this is Margot. Oh, yes, Margot. What you find out? I just talked to Dr. Burley, who he's in charge of the case. Yes? He said that the three men actually died, as the paper said. But there was one detail that was not printed. What is that? Well, the doctors themselves don't seem to understand it, but an examination of the victim's blood has shown in each case a complete absence of leukocytes. Leukocytes? Yes. Yeah. Those are white corpuscles. Yes. Do you realize what that means? Without white corpuscles in the blood, the human system would have nothing with which to combat disease. No wonder they died. Margot, this is the first key to the mystery. Perhaps the shadow can find the answer to the next question within the museum walls. I tell you, we must go through with the public opening of the tomb, as originally planned. But will the public be there? We'll have to take that chance. Gentlemen, I wish we had never started this project. Now, see here, Kent. You've been acting like an old woman about this whole thing. But, Mr. Rafferty, I... We've poured thousands of dollars of the museum's money into the tomb. And it's up to us to dispel this nonsense about the Cooper Tep curse. I am not so sure that it is nonsense. Rubbish. Oh, you can't dismiss the fact that three men died. They all died natural death. I wouldn't be too sure about that, Mr. Rafferty. Who's speaking? Who is that? I am called the Shadow. The Shadow? What's I've heard of you. What do you want of us? I've been investigating the deaths of your three colleagues. And I've come to warn you that no one must be permitted within the walls of the tomb. Hmm. Why do you say that? Because anyone who enters may not come out alive. Are you implying that there is truth 
In the Kufratep curse? I am telling you, Mr. Rafferty, I have reason to believe that the name of the curse of Kufratep is cold, premeditated murder. Uh, nonsense, nonsense. Not nonsense, Mr. Stevenson. And with all respect to your unsolicited information, we are not going to be intimidated by an unknown voice. Speak for yourself, Mr. Stevenson. I am inclined to respect the Shadow's warning. Quiet, Kent. On what grounds, Shadow, do you base your statement? You will have to accept what I've said on faith. I've had enough of that. Uh, wait, Mr. Stevenson. We may le- learn more. No, no. I'm going to rid us of this hocus-pocus once and for all. Yes. What do you propose to do, Stevenson? I'm going into that tomb tonight, right now. Don't do that, Mr. Stevenson. I know what I'm doing, Shadow. Well, who'll accompany me? Don't tell me that you're all afraid. Why, no, no, not at all. But perhaps none of us should be too hasty. Very wisely spoken, Mr. Rafferty. Very well. Then I shall go alone. You are very foolhardy, Stevenson. We shall see. Who has the key to the tomb? I I have, Mr. Stevenson. But now, give it to me. Mr. Rafferty, can't you persuade him to change his mind? Uh, don't you think, Stevenson, Can't we might... give me the key. Very well. Here you are. Thank you. Now, wait, wait. We'll accompany you to the door of the tomb. All right. You may be going to your death, Stevenson. I'll chance that. Come along, man. Well... Here we are. Have any of you changed your mind? Mr. Rafferty? No, thank you. Hawkins? I prefer to wait outside. I know. There's no use asking you, Kent. Don't go in there, Mr. Stevenson. Something horrible waiting for you in there. Give me that flashlight. I'll find that out for myself. He's in the tomb. Nothing horrible has happened in here yet. Don't touch the mummy case. Why not? Might as well make the investigation complete. Don't. Don't, Stevenson. You mustn't. I can't tell if you stop him. Now, what can we do? I'm opening the mummy case. We've got to get him out of there. I'll go myself. Here, here. Come back here, Ken. Stevenson. Stevenson. I'm looking at the mummy's face. Hey, that's strange. There's something peculiar here. Come away from that mummy, Stevenson. Ken. Stevenson. I insist that you both come out of there at once. But there's something here that I don't understand. There seems to be... Kent, help me. Help me. It's happened. He's choking. Kent, bring him out here. I'm trying to. Here. All right, Stevenson. Here, now just lean on me. Stevenson. Man, what happened? Yeah. I look, I look, I look at Gufka. Oh. He's dead. He's dead. It's not possible. The shadow was right. Yes, gentlemen. Stevenson ignored my warning. But perished. This should convince all of you... There is a ruthless killer masked behind the Kufratep curse. Ladies and gentlemen, one warning from the shadow strikes fear into the hearts of his adversaries. Yes, and just one skid is enough to put the fear of wet, slippery roads into any motorist's heart. The shadow knows. The thousands of motorists who are killed or injured every year when slithering skids throw cars out of control, would never risk the danger, grief, and expense of riding on unsafe tires if they had another chance. Motorists, I've already told you that the new Goodrich Silvertown tire will stop you quicker, safer on wet pavements than you've ever stopped before. But you don't have to take my word for it. Here are the facts. Exhaustive road tests of both regular and premium-priced tires of America's six largest tire manufacturers were made by the nation's largest independent testing laboratory, the Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory. And here's what they found. The new Goodrich Silvertown with Lifesaver Tread gave greater skid resistance than any other tire tested. Yes, and that included those tires listed at from 40% to 70% higher in price. The Goodrich Safety Silvertown gave more non-skid mileage than any other tire tested in its own price range. Average, 19.1% more miles before the tires wore smooth. That's performance in any car owner's language. The kind of performance that spells safer, more economical driving for you. Remember, there's double protection in these life-saving Goodrich Silvertowns at no extra cost. Margot. What did you learn about Stevenson's death? Well, Lamont, the, the doctors officially called it influenza. What about the blood test? It was the same as the others. The white corpuscles had been destroyed. Just as I thought. That proves that Stevenson was murdered, too, and by the same instrument. But, Lamont, what can that instrument be? It may be a serum, poison gas. I don't know. 
More important than the killing device is to find the killer's motive. You found out something, Lamont? Not exactly, but I saw a man at the museum about whom I should like to know more. Who is he? Aldous Kent, an assistant curator. I'm sure that he has more knowledge of this affair than he allows himself to show. Why do you suspect him? For several reasons. His apparent concern for Stevenson's safety was a bit overdone. For a scientist, he was surprisingly naive about the Kufratep curse and, most important, in spite of his outward fear, he followed Stevenson into the tomb. I'd like to know more about that man, Margot. And that's where you can help me. Yes, Lamont, but how? By visiting Kent as a newspaper woman. Interview him about his career. Find out whether he's interested in any branch of science other than archaeology. <laughs> Yes? He, ha- he hasn't always been an archaeologist. He worked at many things. For instance? Well, before he went to work for the museum, he was employed as an assistant by Dr. Faber. You know, the well-known biologist. Very interesting, Margot. I think that's all I'll have to know. But Lamont, does that have any bearing on the murder? may have everything to do with them. i be able to answer that question after the shadow pays a call on Dr. Faber. <laughs> Faber. Mm-hmm. Huh? What? Who's that? Don't be startled, Dr. Faber. Who are you? I am the shadow. Are you in this room? I can't see you. I regret that I must remain in the shadows. But uh, what do you want? I am seeking information. Well? I would like to have you tell me what you know of Aldous Kent. Kent? Aldous Kent? Well, he worked for me. He was my assistant for several years. Yes, I know that, Dr. Faber. What kind of a man was he? Very efficient laboratory man. Why did he leave your employ? Well, frankly, because he was dissatisfied. Kent was a very moody man. He felt that his work should be more fully recognized. What sort of work did he do? He was active in all the routine laboratory experiments. Can you recall what some of those experiments were? Well, let me see. Well, he made some really brilliant contributions to our work with the Rodkin ray. That's the X ray, of course. Yes, I know. Exactly what were those experiments? We were varying the ray to determine its effect on animal life. What was that effect? Well, at one stage of the game, it was destructive. We developed a ray that was capable of destroying the white corpuscles in the blood of the laboratory animals. It's enormously interesting, Doctor. Tell me, does such a ray have the same effect on human beings? Oh, yes, yes, it probably does. Thank you, Dr. Faber. You have given me the solution to the mystery of the Kufratep curse. certain, Margot, that the machine of death is concealed somewhere within Kufratep's tomb. But why must you go there tonight? Because I can investigate without danger of interference. There's no time to be lost. Well, can't you confront Kent with the information you already have? No, Kent's a clever man. He might give him time to destroy the evidence. And we could pin nothing on him. Yes, I see. If I can uncover the deadly ray and positively identify Kent with it, he can be tricked into capture. Mm, here's the museum. I'm turning this driveway. It's a precaution. I'll switch off the headlights. Lamont, I I hate to have you going into that tomb alone. It's an eerie-looking place. Well, nothing will happen to me. Yes, that's what the others thought. The others weren't aware of the real dangers. I am. Hand of the flashlight, Margot. Here you are. Thank you. Wait. What's that over there among the trees? It appears to be someone carrying a lantern. He's approaching the tomb. Lamont, who can it be? Wait. I think I recognize him. Yes. The old watchman. Oh, oh. Shall you wait now until he goes? I'm not sure that he's going. He seems to be entering the tomb. Lamont, isn't it strange after all that's happened that he should dare to enter there alone? Very strange, and I'm going to find out why. Who need this flashlight, Margot? What are you going to do? It is the shadow who will enter that tomb for a little conversation with the old watchman. Shall I wait for him? No, no, take the car and return home. Stand by for the shortwave wireless. I may need your help in communicating a message of vital importance. <laughs> Good evening, Your Imperial Majesty. I've come again to see that you are resting well. Your work is nearly done. Only one more. 
One more to gaze into your eyes. And then... <laughs> then the vengeance is complete. You have served me well. I, who speaks? Who indeed would speak within the resting place of the king? But are you... Are you the... Yes. It is I, Kufratep, Pharaoh of Egypt. Oh, your majesty. Rise up. You need not kneel in my presence. Yes. Yes, your highness. Do not tremble. You have nothing to fear. You are not angry? Angry. Why should I be angry toward one who serves my interests? I have come to reward you. To reward me? Yes. But first, I must have an accounting. Mm, well, uh, what do you mean? You must tell me how you brought death to the defilers of my tomb by the curse which bears my name. Oh, the, the credit is not mine, Your Majesty. Who is then? Aldous Kent. Aldous Kent? It... Why should he concern himself with me? It is not your vengeance alone that he seeks, but his own as well, and mine. <laughs> Kent is a great man, but no one would recognize him. They keep him slaving in the museum day after day, doing all the real work. Well, some others get the glory, just as they did to me. And now he's evening his score. Hale, Avery... Johnson, Stevenson, all those have paid for their stolen fame. <laughs> but one more must die. Hawkins. And then Kent will achieve the position that is rightfully his. Do you know how Kent destroyed those men? <laughs> of course. <laughs> I helped him, Your Majesty. Yeah, it was clever. So clever. They all scoffed at the legend of your curse, but but it was really you who killed them. I killed them? Yeah, no one would dream that within your mummy there lies concealed the generator of the ray. What ray? The ray that shines from your eyes and destroys all who look upon you. Show me how this is done. <laughs> it's, it's so easy, Your Majesty. Here, hidden here in the wall is a switch. You see? It is thrown... Like this. Then whoever approaches the mummy case, as I'm doing, and lifts the lid, so... And gazes into your eyes. The gleam of death shines upon them. And, uh, oh, what have I done? I, I, I didn't mean to look. I... I couldn't save me. Who saved you? I cannot save you. Your own evil knowledge has destroyed you. But by your death, you have pointed the way to Aldous Kent's undoing. Margot Lane. Calling Margot Lane. Calling Margot Lane. Communicate with Rafferty, the director of the museum, at once. Tell him to arrange the public opening of the tomb tomorrow at Strand. Be sure that both Kent and Hawkins will be there. This is important, Margot. Tell Rafferty that he must follow my directions implicitly. A man's life is at stake. Before admitting the public, I have invited you gentlemen of the press gather here to dispel once and for all this nonsense about the legend of the Cooper Tep curse. Well, just how do you propose to do that? Yes. Well, Mr. Burke, as you know, the tradition is that everyone who looks at the face of the mummy dies. Sure, sure, I know yeah, that. I know that. Now, this is Mr. Hawkins, gentlemen. He is the sole survivor of the Cooper Tep expedition. Yeah, we know Hawkins. Yeah. He has volunteered to show you that there is no truth in the stories that your newspapers have played into national prominence. What's he going to do? The mummy case will be opened in your presence. And Mr. Hawkins will personally gaze on Kufratep. Now, this ought to be good. Are you ready, Mr. Hawkins? Well, I... Now, very well. You may proceed. So, uh, Mr. Rafferty, I... Well, I... Go ahead, Hawkins. Mr. Rafferty, I... I can't. 
Uh, I changed my mind. What? Uh, what do you know? But, Mr. Hawkins, do you realize what this means? Yes, Hawkins, you must go further. I'm afraid not, Kent. I, I've lost my nerve. The prestige of the museum is at stake. Well, you seem to have changed your attitude, Kent. Well, I, I disapproved of this plan at the beginning, but as long as you've gone this far, I think you should carry it out. Well, Kent is right. Well, I, I'm sorry, but, well, when I think of the others, what happened to them, and seeing them die... I just well, can't. Well, boys, looks like the show's over. Let's yeah. go. Uh, wait, gentlemen, don't leave. Now, Mr. Hawkins, if I volunteer to look on the mummy's face first, will you follow me? Well, I... That's certainly fair enough, Hawkins. Very well. Have I your permission to open the mummy case, Mr. Rafferty? Yes, you have. You're very brave, Mr. Kent. Who's that? It's the shadow. The shadow? Boy, what are you on? This is going to be. Shadow? Why are you here? I anticipated your performance, Mr. Kent. And I came to see that it was carried out properly. What do you mean by that? Before you proceed, I suggest that somebody throw the switch concealed in the carving on the wall. I don't know what you're talking about. You do know, Mr. Kent. I want your demonstration to duplicate Hales, Stevenson's, and the others. The switch was thrown oh, then. this is absurd. I... Uh, here it is. I found the switch. Please turn it on, Mr. Rafferty. There you are. It's on. Good. Now you may continue your little performance, Mr. Kent. This whole thing is ridiculous. I refuse to be made a fool of. Are you trying to back out? I will not continue under these conditions. I thought you wouldn't. You know that to look on the mummy's face when the switch is on would mean death. That is not true. But it is. And no one should know better than you. Concealed within that mummy is a murderous ray. That ray is your own conception. That's a lie. There is no way. Then why don't you look on Cooper attempt now? Because I... Then you I... shall be forced to do so. Oh, no, no. Ramsey Hawkins, leave the mummy case. Come on, man. No. I won't. I won't. Let go of it. Let go. Somebody left the lid of the case. Let go. I won't look. I won't look. Now, Aldous Kent, stare long into the eyes of Cooper attempt. Do you see the evil light that glows within them? That's what the others saw. No, no. I didn't. I could have, I confess. I killed them, but don't. Don't make me look at it. Ah! He's, he's dead. Then it's true. There is a ray. Not any longer, gentlemen. I removed the machinery that generated that ray. All that you have just seen was carefully staged to trap Aldous Kent. He is dead. He died of fear fear of the thing which he himself created. You have all witnessed the end of the curse of Kufratep. A curse which fell justly on the true desecrator of the tomb. You have a listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> young man about town. Years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Werewolf 
of Hamilton Mansion. And I was saying to Mr. Hamilton only the other day... Wait a minute, Scotty. Hi, Jones. What is it? Oh. Huh? Small spots in the snow. Dark red spots. Blood. There's a trail of it leads right to them bushes there. Let's have a look. Aye. Oh, the poor, poor thing. Mm. Dead, all right. Aye, Jonas, that it is. Dead as them other two dogs we found last week. The thing that's responsible is the thing we've heard howling away in the night. The wolf? Wolf. <laughs> wolf. I, I wish it was a wolf. What are you trying to say, Scotty? I know more about these things than you do, Jonas. I've heard about them in the old country. Wolves that howl at night. Killing like this one is doing. They're werewolves. That's what they are. Werewolves. You mean like a man that's supposed to change himself into the shape of a wolf? Ah, the next time the werewolf strikes, it'll be a human being. Lamont, really, darling, sometimes I think there should be a limit to the bounds of friendship. <laughs> oh, Margo, don't be angry. Scotty's a very good friend of mine. I've known him for years. What a fantastic story about a werewolf and you rushing out, leaving a perfectly delightful party. And a nice, warm, blazing fire. Now, don't tell me you're cold in that fur coat of yours, darling. By the way, it's very becoming. Never mind the soft soap. My feet are like ice. What in heaven's name are we stopping for, Lamar? <laughs> you won't believe me when I tell you. That's so funny. We've run out of gas. Out of... Lamont, if this is your idea of a joke... No, darling, I'm serious. All right, I think it's very cute, very romantic. But ten miles out of the city on a deserted side road on a cold, snowy winter night... I'm not joking, Margot. The tank is absolutely dry. It's my own fault, I suppose, rushing away just because Scott had cold. Lamont, but... look up ahead. Right. Well, that's lucky. I knew it was near here. That must be the Hamilton place where Scotty works. Then let's get started. I'm frozen. <laughs> I don't know why I allow you to drag me all over places like this. We're almost at the house now, darling. Look, Margo, here in the snow. Oh, the prince of an animal. But look at this. Well, they probably have two or three dogs around here, thing. These look like wolf tracks. They stop right here, Margo. Oh, yes. Yeah. But when they continue, they're the footprints of a man. Scotty's story about the werewolf. Prince is going right toward that little shack there. But it's ridiculous. How could he? Ah! What is that? Man screaming and coming right from that shack, too. Come on, Margo. Stay behind me, darling. I'm going in. Well, at least the lights are on. Everything seems to be in ah! order. What is it? Over there. Good Lord, it's Scotty. Oh, his throat. Yes. I'm afraid we're too late. Oh, how horrible. Who could have done something like this, Lamont? Who? I'm afraid that's your answer, Margo. Here's the front door to the Hamilton place. You'd better let me do the talking, darling. You think that... Shh, wait a minute. Someone's coming. Well? Is Mr. Hamilton in, please? Who shall I say is calling? It's all right, Jonas. I'll take care of this. Oh, okay, Mr. Hamilton. I'm Hamilton. What is it? My name is Cranston. This is Miss Lane. One of your employees is an old friend of mine, Scotty. He's not here. I know. We just found him in the tool shed, his throat ripped open. Scotty? Dead? There also were prints in the snow, a wolf's prints. And then they suddenly seemed to turn into what looked like the footprints of a man. Oh, no. What did you say? Oh, forgive me, both of you, my manners. Letting you stand out in the cold like that. Come in, please. Thank you. The living room is right this way. Did you say your name was Cranston? 
Yes, Lamont Cranston. Oh. You're an, uh, what is the word? Amateur criminologist, aren't you? I suppose that's what you could call it. I suppose you'll notify the authorities the moment you leave here, won't you? Well, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I hope we might stay here tonight. I'm afraid that would be quite impossible. Well, our car is stuck on the road. We ran out of gas. That is very unfortunate. There's no reason why we shouldn't stay. Is there, Mr. Hamilton? Reason? Mm-hmm. I know. Of course not. Only I thought after what happened, this would be the last place you would want Or to... is it that you don't particularly care for criminologists? My dear Mr. Cranston, my feelings about them are entirely neutral. Of course you and Miss Lane may stay. And since I shall be the host, I shall do everything I can to make your visit an interesting one. Well, you can't say that Hamilton isn't a good host. Your room's even more attractive than the one he gave me. He certainly wasn't very anxious for us to stay, though, was he? No, and I'd like to find out why. Well, I managed to get myself a rough layout of the house, and I know where Hamilton's study is. If there's any snooping to be done, Mr. Cranston, I want to be in on it. That's why I came to get you, darling. Oh. Hamilton left his study just a moment ago. Well, it was considered of him to leave the lights on, wasn't it? Probably plans on coming back here soon. Better stand by the door, Margot. Let me know if you hear anyone coming. All right, darling. Uh, everything looks in order. Big walnut desk. Papers neatly arranged. Hello, what's this? Did you find something, Lamar? Look at these books, Margot. Let's see. Study of lycanthropy. What is lycanthropy? Lycanthropy is the technical term given to the study of werewolves. Werewolves? From their condition, I say these books have been read quite frequently. Look, he even has pages marked. Let's see, case histories of dogs attacked by werewolves. Why, Lamont, that's exactly what's been happening here. Yes. Yeah. Quick, Margo, I hear someone coming. It's all right, Lamont. It's Jonas, the caretaker. Oh, good. I... Let's step out into the hall. I want to talk to him. Uh, Jonas. Where? Oh, it's you, Miss Cranston. You want to see me? Yes, Jonas. Tell me, how long have you worked for Mr. Hamilton? Well, about ten years, I reckon. Does he live here all alone? No, his son's staying here, too. I didn't know he had a son. George is a sickly kid, about 25, stays in his room, mostly. Stays in his room? Do you know why, Jonas? No. Are you sure you don't know why, Jonas? No, look here, Mr. Cranston. I like this place. Hamilton's been mighty good to me. I, I don't want to cause no trouble. You won't get into any trouble if you tell me, Jonas. But if you don't tell me, you may. Well, all I can tell you is I... I've heard George screaming in his room. Screaming? Hamilton never lets me in at that time. Keeps me downstairs. He even brings up George's nightly milk himself. That's all. Have you any idea of why George screams? No, sir, no idea. Jonas? I just know when he screams. Well? Every time one of them dogs was killed by that werewolf. That's when you heard George screaming. Let's sit down the hall. Yes, Jonas said George's room was the fourth door. The door's open. Quick, Margo, against the wall here. Somebody's coming out of the room. Shh. My pants. Seems to be carrying some clothes. Mr. Hamilton. What? Friend. Just a moment, Mr. Hamilton, please. What are you doing prowling around the house this time of night? I might ask you the same thing. This is my house, sir. Are those your clothes? Clothes? No. These are my son's clothes. I'm taking them to the laundry. At this time of night? Yes, at this time of night. Now, if you'll allow me Your to... son must have had quite an accident. Accident? His clothes are badly torn. Yes, well, so they are. And they're also stained with blood. Blood? That's not blood, it's, it's wine. Now, if you'll allow me, please, fast. What was that? My son, George. He must have awakened. Does he always wake up with a scream? My son is... He's ill. He's sick. I'm very anxious to meet this son of yours. Stay where you are, Mr. Cranston. I won't allow you in that room. I'm afraid I'll have to go in anyway. Cranston, will you leave us alone? Will you mind your own business? Let me by, Hamilton. Stop, Cranston. For the love of heaven, don't go in that room. The room's empty. It can't be. 
Lamont, that open window there. Yes, that's your answer, Hamilton. George climbed out the window. Can't see you. Stay in your chair by the window, Hamilton. The shadow is invisible to the eyes of man. What, uh, What do you want, Shadow? Information about a werewolf. I don't know what you're talking about. No? Let me refresh your memory. Three dogs were killed right here at Hamilton Mansion, and each time the cry of the werewolf was heard. So why come to me? And after each one of those killings, your son George was heard screaming in his room. That's a lie. Tonight, a human being was killed. Again, the werewolf howled, and again, George screamed in his room. That's not true. You tried to burn some clothes tonight, which belonged to George. No. Clothes which were torn and soaked with blood. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I can't stand anymore. Well, will you tell me the truth now, Hamilton? All right, Shadow. I suppose I should have told someone about this a long time ago. Too much for one man to bear. But I never thought that Scotty would... It's too late for that now, Hamilton. I want the truth. Everything you said is true, Shadow. George did scream. Every time those dogs were killed, just as he screamed tonight, I'd go to him. And I'd find him, my own son, covered with blood. What explanations did George give? He said he couldn't remember anything. He said he always awoke from a heavy sleep, saw the blood, then made him scream with fright. I tried everything. Nothing helped. Did George remember leaving his room tonight? No, no, he didn't. But it's not his fault. He can't be blamed... Why can't he be blamed, Hamilton? Nothing, Shadow, nothing. Out with it. What did you mean? There's... There's been insanity in our family. My wife died in an asylum. I'm afraid it has suddenly come over George. Do you believe that your son turns into a wolf? Such things have happened before. I have books in my room downstairs. Did you ever witness this transformation from man to wolf? No, but is it necessary? Do I need any more evidence? Why haven't you done something about George before this? Stupid family pride. Man doesn't like going around broadcasting insanity in his own family. Lamont! Lamont! Oh, that sounded like Miss Lane. Get away from that window, Hamilton. But Miss Lane? Manson will take care of her. I'm going now, Hamilton, to find your werewolf. I want you to stay here in your room where you can cause no harm. Where no harm can come to you. Margo? Margo, what is it? I thought you'd never come, darling. It's Jonas. Somebody tied him up here outside the house. Easy, Jonas. I'll have that gag loose in a minute. There. Oh, much obliged, Mr. Cranston. I'll have the rest of the ropes in a second. Who did this to you, Jonas? I can't rightly say, Miss Lane. I was going back to my shack. I seen somebody leaping out a window up there. When I came to, here I was... Tied up like a Christmas package. Well, didn't you see who attacked you? All I can tell you is I saw him running up the old abandoned mine. That's all I know. Where is this mine? Straight up there where I'm pointing. It's been abandoned eight years now. Lamont. Yes, I hear it. That was the wolf. It's coming straight from the mine. Suppose you take us up there, Jonas. Me go up there? To the werewolf? Not, not me, Mr. Cranston. Jonas, we must have your help, Jonas. But... All right, Mr. Cranston. Let's go. Now, this 
here is the entrance to the mine, Mr. Cranston. I wish the moon would come out from behind those clouds. The black as pitch. Is that the flashlight I gave you, Jonas? Yeah, I got it right here. And this is the only entrance to the mine? A uh, landslide closed up all the others. The whole place is full of passageways inside, though. That's what I figured. Jonas, suppose you investigate the one off to the left in here. Miss Lane and I will try the one over there to the right. You mean you want me to go in there by myself? Remember, you're doing it for Scotty, John. Oh, I guess you're right, Miss Lane. I'll go. If you come across anything, just shout. Don't worry, I will. Well, all set, darling? Uh, I guess so. What's the matter, darling? Well, frankly, I... I guess I'm just scared. Walls are damp and mossy. Every time I touch them, I can feel spider webs getting to creep. Careful where you step, Margot. Awful lot of loose rocks underfoot. How far does this tunnel extend? No idea. Can't be too far, I suppose. Still scared, darling? Well, a little, I guess. Now pull yourself together. There's nothing yet. <gasps> I don't know. It seems to come from around this bend here. I'll know in a moment. Oh, come on, look. Get behind me, Margaret. Somebody's crops there in the corner. What? What do you want? Must be George. Oh, get out of here. Leave me alone. Get out of here or I'll kill you. Stay back, Margaret. We may be violent. All right, Lamont. George. Get out of here. George. Leave me alone. I'm sorry I had to do that. Who are you? My name is Cranston. I'm visiting your house. I know the whole story, George. I... I guess it's all over now, isn't it? What's all over? Well, you said you knew the whole story. You know that I'm the werewolf. Why are you so sure it's you, George? Oh, it must be. I kill in my sleep. I, I wake up with blood all over me. It's horrible. Horrible. Why did you leave your room and come to this mine? Oh, when I saw the blood again and heard about Scotty, I, I just couldn't face anybody. Don't you see? Nothing helps me anymore. Send me away, Mr. Cranston, before I kill anymore. Easy, George, easy. Now tell me, why did you attack Jonas and tie him up? Attack Jonas? I didn't attack Jonas. George, are you telling me the truth? Why, I swear it, Mr. Cranston. Now listen to me very carefully. When you woke and discovered the blood, did you have a strange taste in your mouth? Think hard, George. Everything depends on it. Come to think of it, yes. Yes, I, I remember a funny taste after every killing. And you had this taste only after a killing? Yes, but what... And that is the explanation. George, you've been the victim of a very vicious plot. On the night of those killings, you were drugged. You mean somebody drugged me and then sneaked into my room and smeared the blood on my clothing? Exactly, and one more thing. Who always brought you that glass of milk every night? Your father? I know, it was Jonas. Jonas? Yes, Jonas. Did you hear that, Margo? Margo? Margo! Lord, Margo's disappeared. Snuck up on you like I did, Miss Lane, while Cranston was listening to George yapping away. Hope my hand across your mouth didn't hurt too much. What, what was that? Yeah. I'll flash my light over that way and you can see for yourself. A wolf! Yeah, a wolf. Not a werewolf, Miss Lane, just a wolf. Keep him chained up all the time. He's just about the only friend I got. Then you're the one. Yeah. My wolf here killed those dogs. I killed Scotty myself. He insisted on bringing you and Cranston up here. John, you're not going to let the wolf in. Yes, Miss Lane, when Cranston comes here, he'll find you dead. I'll tie myself up again like I did at the house. Easy, boy, easy. I'll have this catch loose here in a minute. John, listen I'll have clear sailing with you and Cranston gone. Hamilton will send George to an asylum. Yeah. That's enough to break the old man's heart. Jonas, don't let that wolf loose. Now, that catch is stuck here. What? 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 Who's got hold of me? This is the shadow, Jonas. <laughs> Where are you? Here beside you, Jonas, but you'll never see me. Okay. You're invisible, but without this flashlight, you can't see me neither. Ah. Now we're even, Shadow. You can't get away with this, Jonas. Well, we'll see about this. You may be invisible, but my pet here can smell you. 
There, now he's loose. Now go get him, boy. Go get him both. Stop him, Jonas. Stop him, I said. But who, who turned on that light? Where'd that flashlight come from? You forgot about me, didn't you? Turn that light off. Turn it off. The wolf's coming for me. Turn off the light, Jonas. Why didn't you let the wolf kill him, Shadow? He deserved to die. He will, George. The law will see that Jonas dies in the electric chair. Well, aren't you glad we're on our way back to the city at last, Doc? Certainly am, Lamont. So Jonas was behind all this, just for revenge. Yes, apparently he bore some insane grudge against Hamilton. I guess his mind snapped planning his revenge all these years. Mm. Darling, mm. there's still one thing that puzzles me. Those prints we saw in the snow, changing from a wolf into those of a man. Well, Margaret, you see, there was soft snow under the foot where the wolf was. Mm-hmm. Where Jonas was walking, there was a stretch of hard ice that had been cleared by the wind of all the snow. Mm-hmm. Naturally, the light steps of the wolf didn't leave any marks on the ice. But Jonas did. Right. And we thought the wolf prints had changed into those of a man. Well, that's the way it is with all superstitions, Margot. No matter what they are, once you hold them up to the light of logic, they vanish into the air. Adventurer, The Shadow. Mystery man who strikes terror into the very hearts of shopsters, lawbreakers, and criminals. Today, Blue Coal brings you The Shadow's latest adventure, The White Legion. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, our last adventure with The Shadow for this season will begin. In the meantime, let's give a thought to the special heating problems of the spring season. Springtime means warm days, cool days, Showers and uneven temperatures that bring colds and sniffles. So guard against uncertain weather. Burn blue coal in your heating plant, for blue coal protects against varying temperatures. Its harmless blue color is your guarantee of steadier, more dependable heat at less cost. So when you're buying fuel, insist on blue coal, Pennsylvania's finest anthracite. Order a trial ton from your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. And listen for the shadow's important message at the end of the program. Smith, will you bring me those papers? Yes, Mr. Devins. Which one of you is William Devins? Right here. What can I do for you? We want you, Devins. Huh? Drop that ledger and get your hat. I've got you all covered. Set him against the wall. Oh, they've got that so. That calls me. What do you mean, barging into my office? Do as you're told. The White Legion wants you, Devons, and we go in wherever we have business. Move. Why, are you... Shut up. <laughs> On the left of you, stand back. We're the White Legion, and Mr. Devons is going to learn a lesson he'll never forget. The prisoner, William Devons has confessed his part in a conspiracy against the sacred institutions of the White Legion. We give him to the All-High Commander. Let the accused know his fate. Have you anything to say, Devins? I plead with you, don't kill me. I've got a wife and children. Neither. Ah, please, let me go. Give him another taste of the whip. Ah! That's better. Now secure the prisoner and stand him over the trap door. No, don't. Open the trap. Ah! Well, glad to find you in, Margot. And up. How about a little shopping with me this morning? I'd love it, Lamont. But isn't 10 o'clock a trifle early for you? Not this morning, at any rate. I've already paid a call on Commissioner Weston on my way over. 
poor man's up to his neck as usual. What's the trouble now? Well, he's got quite a few things on his mind. One of them being William Devon. William Devon? Yeah. Isn't he the chief of the Bureau of Market? He was. But this morning his body was found far out at sea, bound hand and foot, and apparently thrown from a ship. Oh. Peculiarly atrocious murder. Good heavens, Lamont. Any clues? So far, none. Another thing bothering the commissioner is the matter of this White Legion. The White yes. Legion? It's a band of men calling themselves Avengers of Injustice. Who are taking the law into their own hands. Terrorizing, assaulting, and abducting, often in broad daylight and in the most unexpected places. Well, that's strange. I haven't seen anything about it in the papers. So far, it's been kept out of the papers. But in spite of that, enough has gotten out through the demands of being made of Weston that something be done immediately. Poor Commissioner Weston. He's got his hands full. And on top of all that, young Alton Parker's life has been threatened. He's the assistant district attorney, you know. His life threatened? Why? Well, Parker's prosecuting the case against Red Collins, the gangster accused of killing Boss Houseman a couple of months ago. The trial comes up this week. Oh, it's all sinister politics, I suppose. Weston seems to think the White Legion was mixed up in that, too. Then the White Legion has some connection with politics? It's possible. However, if we're going to start suspecting people, we could begin at the top of the city hall crowd and go to the bottom. It's Weston's problem, not ours. Want to go shopping with me? Why not? What are we going for? Oh, a little exercise and a few shirts. <laughs> Come along. <laughs> Linens and embroidery, the next aisle over, madam. Look, darling, don't you think this airplane luggage is just the thing for our trip south? Oh, it's nice, dear, but I can't seem to enthuse about this trip somehow, Alton. We've planned so many times before, and now this latest development. Oh, I, I'm terribly worried, dear. Oh, now, please, Helen. District attorneys are always getting threatening letters. They don't mean a thing. <laughs> yes, but... And, and Mr. Lawrence promised just as soon as this Red Collins case is finished, I can pack up and go. We start trial tomorrow. It can't last more than a week. I know. I, I'm sorry to be so silent. Oh, Alton! What's the matter, dear? Those two men I saw when we came in the store, they're coming this oh, way. Helen, please don't let right, me imagine... Parker, there's a gun in my pocket. Shut up and come with us. You keep your mouth shut, Mrs. Parker, and stand right here. What are you trying to do? The White Legion wants to ask you some questions, Parker. Is that so? Well, take this. Stop it! Stop it! All right, stand back to the audience. This is an arrest. Drag him out, Keith. Okay. Get back there. We're off. They arrested somebody. Must be his wife. I think she's fainted. Look out. There she is. Will you please clear the aisle, please? Get yeah, the aisle. Kill him. They put that guy in the car and drove off with him. The cop at the corner went after him. Oh, will somebody please look after her? I'd better phone the police. Yes, I'll take care of that. Is she all right, Margot? I think so, Lamar. Just fainted. I beg your pardon. This must be her husband's briefcase. Papers scattered all over. I'll pick them up. Here. Oh, Alton. Let me help you. Oh, Alton. Oh, my husband. There now. David. They've notified the police. Who is your husband? He's the assistant district attorney. Alton Parker. Alton Parker? Those men who took them away. They're from the White Legion. I heard them say it. Oh, please, please, do them. Will you come to the first aid room, madam? They're sending over detectives. Oh, yes. Please, I... Oh, I feel so weak. Well, excuse me, Mrs. Parker. I'm Hartley Clay, owner and publisher of the Globe. Is this your husband's briefcase? Yes. Well, yes, I'll, be, I'll be very glad to deliver it to the district attorney's office if you say so. There uh, may be valuable papers, you know. Oh, yes, if you will, please. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Now, if you'll come right this way, please, Mrs. Parker. Thanks. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Craig. Oh, who are you? Yeah, Mr. Montcastle. Oh, well, uh, what do you make of this? If what she says is true, it's more of the White Legion's handiwork. Oh, you think so? I understand they were mixed up in the murder of Boss Houseman. Oh, that's pure hearsay. There was no real evidence. Still, Red Collins is going to trial for shooting Boss Houseman, and Alton Parker is slated to prosecute. It all hangs together, doesn't it? Well, I suppose so. Anyway, I intend to take this matter up editorially in my paper this very afternoon. The Globe has kept away from the White Legion up to now. So much politics mixed up in it, you know. Yes, I know. Yes, but this is terrible. I'll see what Commissioner Weston is doing about it. Well, I must go along now. Oh, wait, let me see. Is that paper on the floor out of this briefcase? Oh, yes. No. Seems to be nothing to a sales folder. <laughs> Special today. White goods sale. <laughs> oh, yes, I see. <laughs> Well, uh, I'll get this briefcase down to the district attorney's office. Uh, glad to have met you, sir. Very glad to have met you, Mr. Clay. Oh, there you are, Margo. Sure right now? Yes, but suffering from shock, poor woman. Oh, this is an outrage, Lamont. You ought to do something. The shadow ought to do something. I imagine you're right. Hmm. Where did you get those papers? I think they fell out of Alton Parker's briefcase. They're rather important, I believe. You see the title on them? Yes. Evidence, the state versus Red Collins. But why are you... Oh, I'm beginning to see Yes. The shadow is doing something about the White Legion, Margot. What's more, I expect to have a very busy afternoon. (laughs) 
Hmm. The message from the commander, isn't it? Yeah, I've got it, Mr. Clays. S U N M A R two O one one. There you are, sir. I'll put it on your desk. Thank you. Go see who that is at the door. Yes, sir. Right here, Mr. Clay. Right here. I'll take it. Thank you. A telegram for you, Mr. Clay. Telegram. Well, what can this mean? Oh, yes. Congratulations on your splendid editorial in this afternoon's Globe. It was almost convincing. What? Signed, The Shadow. What? The Shadow? Stop trembling, you fool. Uh, but if The Shadow is that... We'll take no... care of The Shadow just as we take care of the rest of them. He can't bluff me. Wait, wait. The door's opening. Pardon the intrusion, Mr. Clays. Are you... Who is that? Who speaks? I am the one they call the Shadow. He's here. In this room. I've heard of you and your tricks, Shadow. Where are you? Here. In the shadows. But don't be alarmed because you can't see me. I've only come for a short visit, Mr. Clays. Why honor me with your presence? As a newspaper editor, I thought you might like to hear the news. What news? The White Legion is about to be exposed. The White Legion? Exposed? I presume you'll want to run an extra on that. Why, yes, of course. I'm sure I'll be very pleased. The fair-minded citizens of this city and state can force an expose of that organization. You sound like your own editorials, Mr. Clays. If you're insinuating that I have some connection with the White Legion, you're very much mistaken. I never insinuate, Mr. Clays. I simply wanted to keep you posted. The next time you hear my voice, Clays... Be ready to run your extras. It will be the signal that the White Legion is doomed. <laughs> Before the shadow continues its adventure, I want to give you a message from blue coal dealers throughout the country. As announced earlier, this is the final shadow broadcast of the winter series. Blue coal dealers take this opportunity to express their great appreciation for the many letters they have received praising these broadcasts. They are also deeply grateful to New England families who have favored blue coal with a volume of business which has created a sensation in the fuel industry in New England this winter. We are, of course, happy that so many families have learned through experience that blue coal, an American product, is Pennsylvania's finest anthracite. It is the best quality fuel that can be used. For not only is blue coal safe, clean, and convenient, it is economical, too. The Glen Alden Coal Company, who mine blue coal, have prepared it especially for home use. No wonder blue coal sales in New England have increased more than 28% this winter compared to the same period a year ago. You may be sure that the high standards of quality which have been responsible for this increase in business will be maintained at all times. So take a tip from blue coal families and for better, more economical heat, switch to blue coal tomorrow. Ask for it by name. Order a trial ton from your nearest blue coal dealer. His name is listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. see those notes, Margot. What makes you think Hartnick Clays is mixed up with this White Legion, Lamont? A mm, little deductive reasoning, Margot. I've noticed that since this White Legion stuff has broken the papers, Clay's paper, the Globe, has been deliberately playing it down. Clay's editorial policy seems to be that the atrocities of the White Legion have been greatly exaggerated. It does sound peculiar. Exactly. Clay seemed rather confused when I appeared to him this afternoon as the shadow. Well, this may clean up matters. What have you got there? It's a copy I made of a memorandum that was on Clay's desk. Let's see. Oh, what in the world does it mean, these two words? Convocation Water Chapel. Then this string of letters and numbers. S-U-N-M-A-R-2-0-1-1. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> yes, it does. S-U-N is Sunday. M-A-R is March. Yes. And then 20 and 11, Convocation Water Chapel, Sunday, March 20th at 11. But that's today. Yes, probably at 11 tonight. And I have an idea that... The water chapel is the place where they're holding Alton Parker prisoner. We're going to find out. Bring the car and meet me in the block next to Clay's house at 8 o'clock, Margo. Yes. If Clay's is going to that meeting, we'll follow him. It's no 
slow down, Margo. I want to get too close to Hartley Cray's cars. This fog rolling in. We'll be lucky if we don't lose them entirely. Can you see their car through the field glasses, Lamont? Yes, it's turned down that side road toward the bay. There's a small shack on the edge of the water. The fog's getting heavier. It makes it hard to see. Mm. That shack must be the place they call the water channel. Yes. It's apparently right on the edge of the channel. It goes out to sea. Uh. You better stop here, Margo. Let's get out. All right, Lamont. There's a small inlet here. Yes. We can see better now. This is that fog doesn't get any thicker. There's a motorboat tied up the wharf. Three cars parked nearby. Wait. Please, my man, William, are getting out. They're going toward the shack. I don't see any light in the place. Someone's opening the door. Yes, there's a figure dressed in a long white robe and a mask with a white cap on his head. Oh. They're going inside. Bloods that fog. It's getting so thick I can't see the place any longer. What are you going to do now? Somehow I've got to get out there. And I'd just as soon not go by the front door. Oh, uh, look, Lamont. There's a rowboat lying in the inlet. Good idea, Margaret. There seems to be only one oar, but I can paddle with that. This inlet apparently leads down into the channel. Oh, Lamont, please be careful. There's a terrible current rushing out to sea, and in that fog you won't be able to see anything. Oh, I'll be all right, but if you don't hear from me by 6 o'clock in the morning, get in touch with Commissioner Weston. Give him the location of this place and warn him to bring a few men with him. Yes. If I get what I expect, I won't need him. What do you expect to get? Enough evidence to wipe out the White Legion from top to bottom. All right, Parker, get yourself ready to meet the judgment of the White Legion. What judgment? A judgment of death. I'll be back for you in a minute. Judgment of death. Oh, no, Parker. Who? Who's that? Quiet. I am the shadow. I've come to help you. The shadow? Keep your chin up and do what they tell you. We'll see this through. Careful. Step out, Parker, and follow me. This meeting of the comrades of the White Legion will come to order. First offender, present the accused. The accused stands before you all, High Commander. First recorder, the prisoner, Alton Parker, having committed acts against the order of the White Legion, acts that we consider detrimental to the good of our city, we have signed his order of punishment. With the consent of the comrades, we give him into your hands. Let the accused know his fate. Alton Parker, have you anything to say? Yes, yes I have. I was to have prosecuted a murderer tomorrow, a man known as Red Collins, who by your help and instigation killed Al Hausman, your political rival. Well, it's common knowledge that this white legion of yours sides with the party in power at City Hall. And all your sanctimonious chatter about the good of our city doesn't fool anybody. Prosecuting criminals is my job. And if that prosecution endangers the lives and reputations of one political clique or another, it's no concern of mine. Well, it's your father. You have one more minute. I know why you're getting rid of me. Because your white legion is mixed up in the worst scandal this state has ever known. And I know what that scandal is. Wow. If you, with your robes and masks, knew what that scandal is, you wouldn't be members of this gang. You'd ask your leaders what kind of money-grafting racket they're running. Ask him, the one that sits there on his mock throne. Oh, 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 Who tore off my mask? You fools, get back. Here it is, Commander. The strap broke. That's odd. I could have sworn I felt someone tear. Come to order, men. Hand the accused over the trap. You are sentenced to die, Alton Parker. You'll pay for this, all of you. There's a power beyond your reach that'll make you pay. If you mean the shadow. <laughs> when the time comes, we'll deal with the shadow in a way he won't forget. Silence. Stand ready at the trap. Give me that rope. I want to dispose of Mr. Parker myself. Ready? The trap is ready. Good. <laughs> in another half hour, Alton Parker's body will be far at sea. The vengeance of the White Legion is now completed. We call the shadows bluff. Commissioner Weston speaking. Good morning, Commissioner. Oh, it's you, Shadow. 
This morning they're bringing Red Collins to trial for the murder of Boss Hausman. You think I don't know Police about... Commissioner, this is urgent. When the trial starts, have a man stationed at each entrance to the courtroom. Don't let anyone in or out without your authority. And wait yourself by the main entrance. I think you'll have a surprise. What's the idea? I'll do it if you tell me what... I can't tell you anything more now, Commissioner, except this. If you don't do it... You'll regret it the rest of your life. Well, I don't know what you're planning, but it better be good. Oh, it'll be good, Commissioner. I'll promise you that. It'll be good. Order, order in the court. Your Honor, I request that this man who calls himself Red Collins... Be reprimanded for his insults to me, the district attorney. Proceed with the case, please. Very well. Collins, who paid you to murder Boss Houseman? Defense objects, Your Honor. Objection sustained. All right, Your Honor. Perhaps you'll answer this question, Collins. Were you ever a member of the White Legion? I was not. I told you that once before already. Defense requests that the prosecutor stick to the case in hand. The murder of Al Houseman. The case in hand, as the defense and everybody else knows, goes far beyond the prosecution of this gangster. I, I intend to prove, Your Honor, that this man Collins killed Al Houseman. But that Collins acted under the instructions of the notorious gang known as the White Legion. The same gang who caused the mysterious disappearance of my able assistant, Mr. Alvin Parker. Confine yourself to the case at hand. The district attorney seems to have some trouble doing that. Here. Yeah. Look at this note, Collins. Do you deny sending that to Houseman the day before he was killed? Sure. I wrote the letter and sent it to him. I told you that once already, so. Why? Why did you write him such a threatening letter? To scare him into paying me the money he owed me. That's why. I told you that once, too. <laughs> Mr. Collins is lying. Hey, who's that? He can neither read nor write. Who is speaking? I demand that he identify himself. Is there someone in this courtroom who wishes to be sworn as a witness? Where are you? Who are you? I am the shadow, Judge Rusko. I have some unsworn testimony that may interest you. The men who paid Red Collins to commit murder are in this room. They are the leaders of the White Legion. They have secretly milked the city treasury of over ten million dollars in the past three years. Their hands are red with blood. I protest that this ridiculous procedure... One of those men is sitting here in this courtroom. His name has been honored in the past. But he is a murderer. His name... It's Hockney Clays. Hockney Clays. A sanctimonious crusading editor who used his influence and position to learn the movements of the law and keep suspicion away from himself. If there is any further disturbance, I will order the courtroom clear. Judge Rusko. Yes, Mr. I Clay. insist this task be concluded. If this, this shadow accuses me, let him present evidence. The evidence is ready. <laughs> you are making a fuss of this court of justice, whoever you are. If you don't stop, I will suspend the hearing. No, no, no. Let the talk. Yes, yes, yes. I have talked enough. I now call your attention to the young man who is just entering the door with Commissioner Weston. Parker. It's Alton Parker. Parker. It's Parker. The assistant district attorney that disappeared. I demand the suspension of this trial. No. This trial won't be suspended until I present the evidence for conviction. You couldn't find that evidence, could you, Mr. Clay's? It wasn't in my briefcase. Killing me wouldn't have destroyed it, because it's right here. After I was kidnapped in the store, these papers were sent to Commissioner Weston. Enough evidence to send Red Collins to the electric chair to put an end forever to this murdering gang of hypocrites who call themselves the White Legion. I order the arrest of Hartney Clay. Commissioner Weston. Right here, Mr. Parker. Stick out your hands, please. You realize what you're doing? Yes, I'm slipping a pair of handcuffs on you, mister. You'll be locked up and charged with the murder of William Devons, among others. Go to it, Parker. I'll have to rat hey, 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 I'll relinquish the bit. Just a moment, sir. Now I move a suspension for the presentment of new charges to the grand jury. Those charges will show that the city funds have been tampered with. They will name the six leaders of the White Legion, including its all-high commander, 
the brains and moving force of its murderous atrocities. The man who sits on the bench at this moment, Judge Matthew Rusko. <laughs> Sergeant, have your man place Judge Rusko under arrest and all four men at the defense table. Right. Quiet, quiet, please. Quiet. Quiet. There's one thing more. I want to pay this public tribute to the one who, more than any other, is responsible for this triumph of justice. The one who calls himself the Shadow. I thank you. But let me remain... A voice. A voice that wakes the guilty conscience, brings terror to the wrongdoer, and comfort to the oppressed. Know me only as the shadow. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you John Barclay, Blue Coal's heating expert. But before we hear Mr. Barclay, we want to remind you that at the close of the program, the shadow himself has an interesting message for you. Be sure to listen. And now, Mr. Barclay. Thank you, Ken. And now a word about heating hot water this summer. Many listeners have had the experience of preparing to take a shower only to discover the hot water supply has been exhausted. Now, this condition should not exist in any home. There can always be an unlimited supply of hot water when you heat it with the efficient and up-to-date hot water tank heaters that manufacturers are turning out today. These heaters are still known in many communities as bucket-a-day or pot stoves. Their cost is trifling, even when installed with automatic draft regulators, which make their operation semi-automatic. They guarantee a generous supply of really hot water at a cost of about one-third present gas bills. I suggest that you ask your blue coal dealer about this hot water heating equipment. He'll be very glad to quote a price on the size best suited to your requirements. Thank you, Mr. Barclay. And now, ladies and gentlemen, that interesting message we promised you. The part of Lamont Cranston and the shadow has been played by one of the most distinguished figures in the theater today, Mr. Orson Welles, famous for his production of Shakespeare in Modern Dress, a director of the Mercury Theater, producer of Broadway hits like Julius Caesar and the Shoemaker's Holiday. Mr. Wells, still a very young man, is making for himself a unique place in the field of dramatic art. We have been indeed fortunate in having Mr. Wells on our shadow programs. But now I know all of you would like to hear a few words from Mr. Wells. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Words can hardly express my great enjoyment in doing this program for you. And now before I leave you, I want to thank our sponsors, Blue Coal, for giving me the opportunity of doing this show. I want to thank our cast for the wonderful work they've done throughout our entire season. And above all, I want to thank you, our listeners, for your loyalty. We all hope you've enjoyed listening to the shows as much as we have playing them. You know, in the theater, we can see our audience. We're able to tell how well we're received by the applause we get. But unfortunately, we have no way of knowing how much... You've enjoyed us over the air. Wait, Orson. May I make a suggestion? I mean, certainly, Agnes Moorhead, or should I say Margot Lane. <laughs> there is a way. If you've enjoyed this program and would like to let Mr. Wells and all of us know about it, simply phone your nearest blue coal dealer and tell him so tomorrow morning. Tell him how much you've enjoyed the adventures of the shadow. A very fine idea, Agnes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, good night and goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wells. And let's all take Agnes Moorhead's suggestion and give the cast the volume of applause they deserve. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow morning. Tell him how much you've enjoyed the adventures of the shadow and that you'd like the shadow programs to resume again in the fall. You have just heard a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow magazine. All the characters and all the persons named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> As you sow evil, so shall you reap evil. Crime does not pay. A shadow knows. 
Ha, 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 ha,